Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. This is Mad Scientific Detective number 137596. Sam, no matter what anyone says, I'll stand by you. You're nothing of the sort. Not scientific? Of course not. You're two-fisted. Well, thanks, Effie, and that ain't all, Effie. I was actually mistaken for a convolutional melancholiac. <gasps> oh, Sam, are you all right now? Wrong diagnosis, Angel. It turned out to be melancholia catatonica. Oh, you poor darling. What is that? Well, it's a thing where you lie motionless and silent with fixed eyes and indifference to surroundings. Unquote. Sam, what happened to you? What hospital are you in? Can I bring you anything? No, Effie, I am now at large. Pull down the blinds, check the corridors for men in little white coats, and set a bottle in the window if the coast is clear. Oh. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the mad scientist caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Nobody has to tell you that a neat personal appearance can have a lot to do with helping you get ahead on the job. Now, the first step to a good appearance is well-groomed hair. And I mean hair that's groomed with Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil always grooms the hair neatly and naturally. It relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Yes, men, to look your best at all times, spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Come in, Sam. The coast is clear. Where are you? Why is it so dark in here? Oh, I had to put the lights out. The blind's stuck. I couldn't get it down. The heat's off, Effie. Let there be light. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. Now, let me look at you. Don't look at me like that and stop whispering. Oh, Sam. Did you get me all upset like that just for a joke? It's no joke, sweetheart. You really sick? Yeah, just sick of some of the types I made in this business. Oh, that. Uh, date, uh, July 25, 1948. To Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the mad scientist caper. I worry so. Uh, dear Dundee, he, uh, looked like a mad scientist, and that's exactly what he was. His eyes had a wild gleam in them, his hair was a wild tangle, and he was wearing a wild assortment of clothing that looked as if they'd been slept in in shifts. He leaned across the desk at me and said, They have stolen my secret formula. They have? Gee, that's too bad. Oh, you think I'm crazy? I don't know yet, I just met you. My name is Raymond Fox. Does that mean anything to you? Raymond Fox, uh, yeah, I think it does, but I don't quite remember what. I invented the helioscope. Helioscope. No, that wasn't it. I also synthesized hydroxylama photocraniton. That was it? Yes, but unfortunately, production costs were prohibitive. Uh Uh-huh, but you didn't let that discourage you. Oh, no, 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 indeed. You see, after a brief illness, I was back in my laboratory perfecting my greatest contribution to science, what may prove to be the greatest contribution of science to humanity. I call it Penetron. Penetron. That is what they have stolen, the secret formula for Penetron. Penetron, huh? Now, uh... What exactly is Penetron, Mr. Fox, and who are they? Uh, Well, Penetron is a plastic with a molecular structure which repels atomic radiation more efficiently than lead, yet weighs less than aluminium. Oh, that. Do you realize the significance of this? Well, uh... Um, Imagine, imagine a motor no larger than a cigar box with a power potential that even I don't believe, but they do. Who's they? Grierson Enterprises. Now, how do I know this? When I applied to the patent office to protect my discovery, I received this letter. Here, go on, read it for yourself. 
Uh, Commissioner of Patents, Washington, D.C. Uh, dear Mr. Fox, your application for patent on formula designated under the trade name Penetron is hereby rejected. Ah, you see. Both formula and trade name, together with descriptive material identical to yours, have been registered by Mr. Albert Grierson, Grierson Enterprises, San Francisco. Oh. Very truly yours, George Sherman, Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner. There, there, there. You, you see? Uh, yes. You don't need a detective, Mr. Fox. What you need is a good patent lawyer. Lawyer? Huh. I have one. A legal ball of fire named Roscoe Manning. You know this scoundrel? Yeah, he's got an okay reputation. And I am paying for it. Three thousand dollars in retainers. And now he tells me he can do nothing. Insufficient evidence, he says. What is this outfit, Grierson Enterprises? Yeah, a snare and a delusion. With, with rented furniture, unscientific ventilation, and dirty work at the switchboard. Mm-hmm. How did they get hold of your formula? Well, it must have been while I was ill. They came and took it away. Out of your laboratory? Oh, well, what does it matter where? I've got to start someplace. Start with the man. I promise you he's a crook. If he steals from me, he's stolen from others. If we can prove that, then I have a case. Well, I can't promise you anything, Mr. Fox, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, uh, will $100 be enough for your retainer? Too much. 25 now on the balance if I can do anything for you. I doubted if I could even earn the 25 but if he wanted to gamble, it was okay with me. The officers of Grierson Enterprises were pretty much as he described them. A beautiful front, especially at the switchboard. Gerson Enterprises, good afternoon. No, Mr. Gerson's out of town. No, I don't know when to expect him. I'll be right with you. That's good news. Gerson Enterprises? No, he is not. No, I do not, and he doesn't want to talk to you in any case, Mr. Manning. Oh, if it would just stop. Can't you shut it off? I might as well. Nobody seems to believe me anyway. You aren't looking for him, too, I hope. Oh, please, just tell me you're selling magazines or collecting salvage or just anything. My card. Oh, detective. Mr. Gerson hasn't done anything, has he? That's what I want to find out. My client says he swiped the secret formula. Oh, not that maniac. You don't look the type. You know he's mad, don't you? Maybe yes, maybe no. Personally, I'm crazy about money. Mad money, pin money, or dirty money. Uh, your employer didn't happen to leave any lying around, did he? No, but he has a charge account at a bar downstairs in the building, and it's nearly 5 o'clock. Could you cross-examine me there? <laughs> I thanked her as gallantly as I could under the circumstances. She said, wait here, I won't be a minute. And while she was gone, I made a quick frisk of the office. The file cabinet was empty. Grierson's desk contained nothing but two unsharpened pencils, tobacco crumbs, a rubber band, some rusty paper clips, an old gas bill, a glass ampule, broken, labeled sodium denadrine for intravenous injection, and a business card from one Roscoe Manning, attorney at law. I stuck the card in my pocket, went back to the switchboard, and in less time than it takes to tell, I was calling her Lois, and she was calling me Sam over cocktails for two. And that's all I know about it. I didn't think anything about his taking his correspondence out of the files. He often took work home with him. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you saw him? Oh, it's been nearly six weeks. You haven't heard from him in all that time? Mm. He was with Mr. Fox just before he left. They had a terrible quarrel. But then Mr. Grierson managed to get him calmed down, and they left the office together. And that's the last time you saw Grierson? Huh? Yes, and it's all very strange. What did that maniac tell you? That Grierson swiped his invention. Do you believe that? I didn't even believe in the invention. Now I'm beginning to think it was worth stealing. Oh, Mr. Grierson wouldn't... He's a brilliant man, you know. Uh, what else has he invented? Well, I don't know. He always had a lot of projects, but... Of course, he never took me into his confidence. Just exactly what is your job? Oh, it's quite simple, really. I just tell people he's an in. Yeah. Look, uh, sweetheart, you really mean to tell me it never occurred to you that there might be something slightly fishy about Grayson and Enterprises? I know. Why should it? Because there's a smell of red herring up there. It's in the air. You mean Mr. Grayson's a crook? Well, what does that make me? Worry that out on his time. Drink up. She looked as if she were telling the truth. Though with women, especially blue-eyed women, that doesn't always mean anything. If she had anything more to tell, she obviously wasn't ready yet to tell it. I asked her to come up and listen to my Herb Jeffries records. She said my apartment needed a woman's touch. I handed her a broom. She hit me on the head with it and left. And so to bed. Up the times and phoned my client. He wasn't in. 
Then I phoned a guy I know who sometimes knows about things and asked him what sodium denadrine was. He said it was a sedative and or truth serum, a mental type drug. I wondered what Grierson had been using it for during office hours. I also wondered what else he'd been spending money for. I phoned another guy who knows about other things, and he called me back with the name of Grierson's bank, Golden Gate Trust. An hour later, to my surprise, I actually had something to go on. Because in the past six weeks, checks totaling 50,000 bucks had been deposited to Grierson's account, all drawn on the Citrus Exchange Bank of San Anselmo, and all bearing the signature of one Carl Birdwell, M.D. He wasn't hard to find. It was a big place on the outskirts, and the sign on the gate said, Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the Mentally Deranged. Dr. Birdwell's cottage was one of five without bars on the window. He was spraying his roses. Ah, yo, know, that's cystodectomy of Dr. Kobler's. How are those convulsions? Uh, Coordination all right? I uh, can't complain. Got the use of your fingers back? Good. Pick up those shears. I want all those ragged edges cut off the hedges. Well, why don't you uh, hire a gardener out of those uh, checks to Grierson and use up all your ready cash? Eh? I thought you were the cystodectomy. Good Lord, you're that convolutional melancholiac. You're not allowed out on the grounds. God! God! Now, wait a minute, doctor. What's the matter? Is this one acting up? Take him back. I sent for the cystodectomy. This is the wrong man. You're huh? crazy. Come, Come on. on. Let go of me. I'm not a patient here. I'm a detective. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Sherlock Holmes. Come on, now. Back to the violent war. Come on, lay off. I got an office in San Francisco. I can prove it. One, three, seven, five, nine, six. Okay, Dr. Watson, but come on, come on. And in more time than it takes to tell, due to the guard's jujitsu, I was disrobed, straight-jacketed, and rolled into a wet sheet. A full-fledged inmate of the Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the Mentally Deranged, which is exactly where I belong for having taken Mr. Fox's 25 bucks. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the mad scientist caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I have been shot, stabbed, slashed, pistol whipped, and sapped into unconsciousness. But until you have spent a night rolled up in a wet sheet, Dundee, you don't know what punishment is. You feel hot and cold at the same time, too miserable to sleep, too exhausted to stay awake. And after four hours of it, you just give up and join the crazies pushing up the daisies. There's only one thing I can say in favor of the Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the Mentally Deranged. They get the patients up early. By 6.30 in the a.m., I had been rolled out of the sheet. By quarter of seven, I had thawed out enough to be taken out of the straitjacket by an orderly. I was glad to be out of it because it was very heavy, and that gave me an idea. I picked it up and swung it. In less time than it takes to tell, I was in the orderly's uniform, out of the violent wing, and shuffling up the walk through Dr. Birdwell's rose garden and through his cottage door. Good morning, Dr. Birdwell. Good, uh, Good Lord, who let you in here? What do you want? I was trying to tell you yesterday when I was so rudely interrupted. Hey? Oh, yes, the detective. Did you say Grierson sent you? I didn't say that. I'm afraid you'll have to be absolutely specific or I can't help you. All right. My client is an inventor who claims that Mr. Grierson stole a formula from him, got a patent on it, and stands to profit to the tune of about a million bucks. The last two items check. I don't know whether Grierson's a crook or not. 
He's into you for 50,000 bucks, so you might know. Uh, this inventor. Pale eyes, contracted pupils, big mop of hair. That's a fair description. Fox. Raymond Fox. He's a patient. Escaped from this hospital. That man, Mr. Spade, is a homicidal maniac. If you jog your memory, you may recall the case. Sacramento, 1935. Sacramento. Wait a minute. Chemistry professor, lab explosion? That's the case. Two of his colleagues, whom he irrationally suspected of stealing the formula for the explosive he used to blow them up. You sure they didn't? The man was adjudged hopelessly insane. He must be returned to us. He may murder Grierson, he may murder you. But he will commit a murder if he remains at large. Perhaps more than one murder. You must help us, Spade. Like you, Doctor, I can't help unless you're absolutely specific about a couple of things. Your connection with Grierson, for instance. I invested in Grierson's firm. Uh Uh-huh. How did Fox meet Grierson? He was allowed a certain degree of freedom here during his rational periods. I I guess that he went through my papers or overheard one of my conversations with Mr. Grierson. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you know he retained a lawyer? Hmm? Manning, smart patent lawyer. You must think Fox has a case. Oh, surely not. Grierson thinks so, too. You've talked to Grierson? No, but I've examined his bank statements. The bank allowed that? I told him I was Grierson's attorney. The point is, Grierson is broke. Why? Because he's paid out every penny you gave him to the order of Roscoe Manning, attorney at law. And you know what I think, Doctor? Yes? I think Raymond Fox is crazy like a fox. And I had the same idea about Dr. Birdwell, but I didn't say so. I didn't feel up to spending another night in a wet sheet. I also didn't feel up to the interview that was awaiting me outside the gates. A limousine, only a little longer than a hearse, was standing at the curb. A round pink head with a gray Homburg on it bobbed out at me from the driver's seat and said... Mr. Spade? Yeah? Roscoe Manning, how'd you do? About 49975 bucks less than you've done in the caper so far. <laughs> the law is a lucrative profession, my boy. <laughs> Get in, I'll drive you back to town. No charge? Uh, I'll even give you some free advice, sans retainer. Well, sir, you are an elusive chap. I've had the devil's own time catching up with you. How did you? I won't ask why. Well, I am not without resources. Now, uh, as to our mutual client, Mr. Fox, uh, obviously you've learned a good deal about him. Dr. Birdwell says he's cuckoo, and it's only a toss-up which one of us he's going to blow up first. Well, just about what you'd expect from a medical man. If you'd listened to as much conflicting medical testimony in court as I have, you'd take them all with a grain of salt. Or should I say, soda mint? Or a uh, sodium denadrine? That's a mysterious remark. I was just trying it on for size. It didn't fit. Mm-hmm. Well, sir, here is my proposition. As to Fox's sanity, it's of no importance. He has money, and I think he has a case. We can always get a doctor to say he's back in his right mind. Where do I fit into your scheme? You just keep looking for Grierson. And uh, watch that secretary of his. I don't trust her. Anything else? Oh, uh, I almost forgot. Here's $500, and here's your ticket to Chicago. I don't know why, but somehow I got the impression that Mr. Manning was trying to get rid of me. He should have used that ticket to Chicago himself. We stopped at Sausalito for breakfast, and the condemned man ate a hearty meal. We drove the last mile through the marina district and pulled up in front of his house. Well, sir, have a nice trip. Or uh, take the car, Mr. Spade. I'll pick it up at the depot. Uh, goodbye. It's been charming. Goodbye. He backed across the sidewalk, waving, and I waved back. Then he went up three steps, put a key in his door, and opened it. It didn't do much damage to the house, but all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Roscoe Manning back together again. Got out of the car and just made it up the steps when it happened again. I hated the look, but I did. Where the limousine had been parked with me in it was a smoking heap of scrap metal. I then headed for the nearest phone booth and pausing only to inspect it for mines and booby traps, dialed the number of Grierson Enterprises. Grierson Enterprises? Lois, Sam Spade. Sam, darling, thank you for the present. What present? I haven't had a chance to open it yet, but I think I can guess what it is. A traveling clock. 
You mean a package arrived and a text? Oh, darling, don't be such a tease. Now, Lois, listen. Oh, all right, I'll open it now. Throw it out the window. No, don't do that. Pedestrians, innocent bystanders. Uh, have you got a metal wastebasket there? I think so, yes. Well, fill it up with water and throw the package into it. And ruin my lovely clock? It is not a lovely clock. It's a lovely booby trap. Oh, go on. I'm You're... serious. Manning just got one of them, and what's left of him is on the way to the morgue. Oh, I think I'm going to faint. Lois! Lois! Wake up! Pour some water on yourself! Hello, hello! Let me through here. Come on, let me through. Lois. Lois. Oh, you're okay. Glad of that. All right, she's all right now, you people. Come on, get out of here. She's all right. Come on, get up. You're not hurt. It exploded in the water. At least you had sense enough to do what I told you to. Oh, this was a new dress. Now look at it. It looks fine here. Put this coat around you. I don't think that was a very funny joke, Sam. Neither do I. Now, uh, try and forget your clothes for a minute. And try and answer a few questions for me. There isn't much time. Sam, what is it? I want you to be very sure of this, Lois. Try and remember accurately. How many people has grass and seen since he opened this office? Well, not very many. It was hardly ever in. It's strange. Now that I think of it, I can only remember two. Mr. You... Manning and that... Mad scientist man, Mr. Fox. Yeah, did you hear any of the conversation between Grayson and Fox? Uh, he just screamed at Mr. Grayson about how his invention had been stolen from him. Then it sounded as if they scuffled, and all of a sudden, Mr. Fox calmed down. Mm -hmm. When they came out, his eyes looked funny, as if he'd been hypnotized. Yeah. Uh, what does uh, Grayson look like? Oh, he must have been quite handsome at one time. He's sort of like Gregory Peck with a mustache, only fatter and balder and older. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have put it exactly like that, but I can see what you mean. But you've never seen him. Don't make book on it, but I think I have. I made three phone calls. One to a crime reporter I don't like very well, giving him a false story on the death of Lois, Grierson's secretary. Another to my client, the mad scientist, alias Raymond Fox, and one to Dr. Birdwell. Then I went to my apartment and waited. My client arrived five minutes before the doctor. When Birdwell came in, my client said, Aha! That's he! He stole my secret formula! Now, oh, now, Raymond, you're getting confused again. No! Oh. I'm the doctor, don't you remember? Th th that's not true. Your name is Grierson. Oh, he's much worse. These identifications. Now, you must try to remember, Raymond. Nobody's going to hurt you. <laughs> but you'll be much sicker if you don't remember. But I do remember. I remember everything. Do you remember setting the bombs at Manning's house and the one you sent to Mr. Grierson's office? No, 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 no. Grierson isn't dead. You're Grierson. No, Grierson isn't dead. Only that poor girl. No, no, no. She didn't steal my formula. It, it was you. Oh, you're trying to mix me up. I'm trying to help you. Now, roll up your sleeve. I'll give you something to quiet no. your nerves and we'll go back to the hospital. Put it away, doctor. You've helped them enough. Huh? Now, look here. This man is my patient. He needs medical attention. I won't argue with you, but I think he'd better get it from some other doctor. Right now, he's making more sense than you are. Ha. Just ha. keep on the way you're going, Spade, and I'll have you back in that wet sheet. I did it once, and I can do it again. Sit down. You got delusions of grandeur. Stop shaking, Raymond. I said you're making more sense than he is, and I can prove it. You think you're very astute, don't you? No, I'm stupid, but I'm lucky. I should have tumbled to the whole caper when I found that you'd invested 50,000 smackers in Grierson Enterprises. When I found out that Raymond was an escaped patient, I should have tumbled to what that Denadrine vial was doing in Grierson's desk. I should have known then that you and Grierson were one and the same person. Ah, I, I, I told when you. When I discovered that you'd paid Manning all that shakedown money, I should have known you were planning to knock him off and everybody else who could identify you. But it didn't work out that way. I got out of the car before it blew up. Dumb luck. And you can identify me as Grierson? I don't have to. <laughs> oh, God. Surely you're not counting on Raymond's sanity to that extent. He can't even remember that I was his doctor. Can you, Raymond? You're trying to mix me up. Did you, you stole my formula. I didn't kill them, did I, Mr. Spade? Now, lie down on the couch and relax, Raymond. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> well, doctor, what now? You relax, too. Okay, Lois, come on in. What? Lois! Why, Mr. Gerson, have you been sick? How dare you? How dare you ruin all my plans like this? You stupid girl! Oh, right. oh. Okay, that's enough. Come on, get back there. Get back. Sorry, sweetheart. I didn't mean to let him get that close to you. What were you trying to do? It was an experiment. Just to see what would happen. It did. So that's the way you scientific dictators work. 
For a hard-boiled chap, you have the vaguest way of doing things I ever heard of. Well, uh, plans are all right sometimes, Doctor, and sometimes just stirring things up is all right if you're tough enough to survive and keep your eyes open so you see what you want when it comes to the top or something. A uh, spade, Dundee. I'm at home. I've uh, got two homicidal characters here, one sane and one insane. Now, if you can tell the difference, I'll let you give the story to the papers. And that, Lieutenant D, is the crop. You uh, picked the wrong one. Figures. It's as simple as this. Raymond Fox was the loony... But Birdwell, alias Grierson, conceived and executed the whole scheme, including the explosions. Don't worry about Fox. He's now back at the hospital working on a new secret formula. I don't know what it is, but it might be an anti-truth serum serum, because that's how Birdwell got the Penetron formula, by using truth serum on the mad scientist to make him talk. Any way you figure it, he's crazy like a fox. His enemies are all dead or on their way, and he's as snug as a rug in a bug house. Period. End of Looney Tune. Well, of all... Well, just imagine. Well, it takes all sorts to make a world, I guess. Well, I guess you never spoke a truer word, Effie, but don't forget, a stitch in time saves nine. Don't feel too badly about it, Sam. Better late than never. You took the words right out of the horse's mouth, but it's later than you think, Angel. Type that up, Angel, and while you're at it, see if you can think up a way to teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> Say, mister, if you haven't tried Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic, why not get it tonight or first thing tomorrow? You'll be glad you did, for Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally without giving it that plastered-down look. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Simply step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil in the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And I've been thinking over what you said. Which? About teaching an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. You're only as old as you feel, Sam. Then send in the application for my old age pension. Oh, Sam, I won't let you talk that way now. You're just tired and nervous and run down. Yeah, backaches, stay up nights, sour racket. You're just feeling sorry for that Mr. Fox. I wouldn't worry about him. As you pointed out, he's safer where he is for all concerns. Mm -hmm. And after all, necessity is the mother of invention. What's that got to do with anything? Well, he's an inventor, isn't he? Oh, that. You see? All's well that ends well. Good night, Sam. Good night, Pollyanna. Pollyanna? Oh, she's a glad girl. Oh, no, Sam, that's Shakespeare, that old... You know best. All ashore that's going ashore. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Gallon Cabs present Pat Novak for Hire. Cinderella lost a shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in, in Gallon Camp Shoe Raid. Four miles to a Gallon Camp. 
Yes, Gallon Camps, the family shoe stores with the yellow fronts, the largest shoe chain in the West with stores from Canada to Mexico to serve the West. G-A-L-L-E-N-K-A-M-P-S, Gallon Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak, for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you don't get prizes for being subtle. If you want to make a living down here, you've got to get your hand in the till any way you can. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then you put it on the cuff. It's a happy life if you don't mind looking up at a headstone, because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big. I found that out Tuesday night. It was about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and I started down the waterfront. It was raining and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. As I got near the corner, an old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because a car started up down the street and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. Well, I started over to him. The car slowed down for a moment and then turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the street light, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and I rolled him on his back. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? Well, that's a big order, mister. Uh, I must talk to you. Well, if you got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. My pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand... In here? Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money for you. You have the other one. So far. The other one, please keep sealed. And you will give it to... John St. John. John St. John? Yeah. Well, where does he live? You don't understand. It's not... I want to tell you. You don't understand. Well, he was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over to the side and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there, no identification, just a card with an address on the other side of town. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray, and I owe some back dues. So I went over to my office and called police headquarters. I told him where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan, a good guy... But to him, a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Dinky, dinky, Derbyshire, dinky, dinky, day. Jocko, fine Jocko, street. I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. It'll keep. I got a problem, Jocko. You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. Yeah, all right, Jocko. You have no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped in a marble staircase. All right, Jocko. Check the bright talk. I just saw a guy get killed. You're like some violent disorder in nature, some large but unprofitable storm. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. And if you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Then yeah. it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes. Get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. Some old guy was killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out fifty feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. Then why do you care? Professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the fall of France. Will you stop kneeling me, Jocko? I told you the guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. 
The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter. I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. I got the license number of the car. I want you to hop down and look it up. Then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record. I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. I gotta go out here to this address. Here. Uh-huh. Well, what kind of neighborhood is it? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's more like an architectural afterthought, a lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right, no speeches. Just check on that license plate. Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address here. Yes, that's always very interesting at this time of night. Uh, goodbye, lover. Well, Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and I left the envelope. I put it in another envelope and stashed it behind some books. Then I headed out to look up John St. John. It must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for-rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third-floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. If they pick a Miss Blowtorch of 1946, she'll be right up there in the running. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. She stood there leaning against the door, smiling and looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. Gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Well... A Spider-Man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? Hmm. I'm Pat Novak, and I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. I don't know a John St. John. Well, I found a dead man lugging around your address. Why? I don't know. Perhaps he admired me from afar. Like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's huh? right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. Yeah, I figured that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Perhaps I could help you. You got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. I told you, I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. Huh? How did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Hello, Lee. If we're early, just give us a magazine. No. Come on in. Well, just enough for bridge. You're right. You're only gone a moment. Who are your friends? Don't suck. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah, that's a pretty name. Don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. Ah, uh, the one I got's good. Let's have it. I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Come on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. <laughs> now, hold him up. Yeah, just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <clears throat> All right, Mike. That's enough. Oh. Well, that's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry. You can't have everything. <laughs> We'll be back to Pat Novak in just a moment. Have you ever worn uncomfortable shoes? Perhaps the size was wrong or the shoe was the wrong shape for your foot. But no matter why, there's nothing more uncomfortable than shoes that don't fit. The more you're on your feet, the more you know it. Gallon Camp specialize in properly fitting shoes for the whole family, right from the toddler's first important step. And Gallon Camp's good shoes are built to give support to active feet. Listen to an authority on shoes. He's Mr. John F. Stahl, 64 years young, a retired postman with a hobby. <laughs> you guessed it, he likes to walk. He says, I've been on my feet most of my life. Since 1935, when I retired as a letter carrier, I walked 10,000 miles. I just walked to San Francisco from Trinity Center, California. That was 410 miles. Walking is fun, but take it from me, you must have good shoes. That's why I stick to gallon camps. Gallon camps are good shoes. And there you have it from a man who knows. Gallon camps are good shoes. That's why gallon camps are the West's favorite shoes, and gallon camps' tremendous volume makes possible gallon camps' reasonable prices. For style, for quality, for reasonable price, 
For good shoes for the entire family, visit the stores with the yellow fronts. Mr. Stahl walked 410 miles to shop at Gallon Cabs, but there's a store in your neighborhood. And now back to Pat Novak for hire. You know, it's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two gunoffs were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. Next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. Here you go, Patsy. Up on the couch. (coughs) What's the matter? Nothing. If you're a kitchen stove, the room's full of gas. Oh, some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah. What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? A girlfriend. It was love at first sight. Did she get the letter? I left it home. You're getting smart. Yeah, three hundred dollars worth. They lifted my dough. Uh, you couldn't use it where you were going. I uh, checked on that hit and run card. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. Well, oh, everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. It'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> Wait until I wash my hands. Sure. Patsy. Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah. Those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides send out vibration? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yeah? She picked up a bait like a hungry bass. Also, look at that ring. How did you get around to that? The insignia on it. It's the same one that's on the envelope. Spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patsy. The police will be here. Yeah. Even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we be... On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah. Be quiet or you'll wake her up. Now, tiptoe. She always cut her throat before she goes to sleep. Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Huh? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, praising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. Those boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. It'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night, come up here and find you standing over a dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. The view's fine, Hellman. And if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't... Yeah. Oh, forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Book Jocko here, then. I love you in a generous mood. You got a string, then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Uh, Who's going to find Jocko? Stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You'll let him die on the vine. Helen, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this? What else can I do? The guy likes you. Now, it was a bum curve to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole, and Jocko wasn't the boy. You can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. 
There was that insignia, too. The one on the letter and the girl's ring. Oh, sure, it could be coincidence, but that's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter. So I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long, silk legs and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. I just want to let you know the gas jet's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't shout. I'd like you better if you purred. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know John St. John. Is he worth breaking your heart over? There's a good guy down on the clink sweating out a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. Mm, you've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belong to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. I told you. I got a friend in the jug. Mm, loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Well, don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chair. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? You're hard to see that far away. Come on over into focus, Patsy. Yeah? You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you want a bill of sale. I'm the gentle kind, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go ahead. I can get a brace. Come here. Mr. Novak, I'll bet you do a swell rumba. Yeah? What's on your mind? What you're going to say when you find out about this gun. Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. Hmm. Well, you got to that purse, huh? That's right. Well, you've ruined my confidence. Now, I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. Mm-hmm. It's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top drawer. <coughs> oh, let go. Stay away from me. I'm already here, lady. Come on, all right. Drop the gun, sis. Drop it. Well, you can let go of my arms now. Well, that's your version. Let go of me. Let go of me. I... Oh. What was that for? A little something on the house. Now beat it. Well, you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Hmm? It yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy. Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Huh? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon. <laughs> Dad began to look like a big, fat, well fed double cross. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse because the letter was gone. Well, things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. Now, that's pretty close. What's he got, a stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong-arm men. Well, that's new for L.A. You got a call out? We already picked them up. Your favorite's named Welcome Dangliers. I could make a joke. I already got one. They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. That means I killed a girl. Nobody's arguing. I got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at the Seal Rocks. You got the figure for it. We just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope, so what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. Well, that only meant one thing. Whoever took the envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed a cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down in the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Patsy. Hello, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
It's the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. Hmm. This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, the spliced cross really gets around. Eh? Keeps bobbing up. Here it is on this guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah? Sure. We want you done with us. That's right. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. It was close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and I looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over. The place was locked and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out that his wife had a birthday coming up. Well, I found something in the apartment. It was a card and it said, Bellcrest Sanitarium. And down in the corner there was a guy's name. Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna, without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down on the peninsula, so I borrowed a car and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. I woke up on a couch in Schoenig's office. It was dark outside and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine. The radiator sitting beside me was Sidney. You're a deep sleeper. I think I got some help. What happened to my arm? Hypodermic. You only need one arm, anyway. In your case, I need a spare. Who did it? Dr. Schoenig. Oh, he's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone, trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm, that's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Hmm? Do you want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's given you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. The trail in the field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. A guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning, making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. Yeah. Thanks, Betsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots? What's the difference? Oh, none, I suppose. Uh, why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. Well, that's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? Well, you'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emil. Thank you, my dear. As to you, Mr. Novak. Sorry, there's no drink for you, Mr. Novak. He probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Emil, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. Mm, So do I. I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around until you got rid of me, too. That's a bum joke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of your boys on the plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sidney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. I might as well tell you now you're all through. I carried the whole bunch along and... <coughs> and I'm all through. Steady, Emil. What's the matter with me? <coughs> What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just had a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. You got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Emil. <coughs> put down that gun, Emil. I want you to, Sid. Please, Emil, put down the gun. I will... Selfish fellow. (coughs) This happens kind of fast for you, fellow. Lots of noise, huh, Patsy? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. Uh, You get mercy, not love, baby. Thanks for small favors. How do I look? Not so good. That was the three-and-two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. 
I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. You found out a little late, but it's always that way. That's the way I found out about you. Yeah. You had a funny little hunch about you and me. I found out a little late. But I know now, Patsy. Does that help? Well, John St. John was the name of an organization buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sidney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He trailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him and threw him to the fish. He was trying to shake Sidney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Well, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. We'll return in a moment to find out what bothered Inspector Hellman. But now it's Cinderella time. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in gallon camp she'll rate. A pretty face, a graceful figure, lovely shoes. That's a combination that no man can resist. What a delightful feeling to know that from the top of your head to the tip of your toes... You are the picture of glamorous perfection. Here's what Marilyn Buford, Miss America 1946, says. Probably the most fun of being chosen Miss America is modeling the gorgeous clothes. What girl wouldn't be thrilled to select costume after costume from a collection of America's leading designers? And after seeing the importance they attach to the right shoes for every costume, I'm glad I learned about gallon caps years ago. Yes, Marilyn, there's magic in a pair of shoes, as every woman knows. And having the right shoes is no longer a luxury thanks to Gallon Camps, the home of lovely shoes at shh, reasonable prices. And that's why Miss America's favorite store is the favorite store of America's Misses. Cinderella lost a shoe and so she got a maid. The modern Miss has learned from this in Gallon Camp shoe rate. And now back to Pat Novak. Oh, it worked out all right. They found the letter out at Shoney's place, and there were some plans for jet planes and a few other trifles. Hellman asked only one question. How come Shoney didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? <laughs> it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Be sure to join us next Sunday evening and every Sunday, same time, same station for radio's newest show, Pat Novak for Hire. And don't forget the store with the yellow front is the Gallon Camp Shoe Store. Gallon Camp Shoes are good shoes. There's something about them you'll like. Franklin Evans speaking. This is ABC, the American broadcast. The Casebook of Gregory Hood. Presented by the American Broadcasting Company. His office is high in the tower of a skyscraper overlooking San Francisco Bay. His name is Gregory Hood. By day, president of the Hood Importing Company. By night, criminologist and man about town. Tonight's story from out of his casebook, The Carnival of Death. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gregory Hood. Let's understand this from the start. I'm not a playboy. But when a hot blonde who's due to inherit a cool million suddenly writes me, Be sociable, Greg. Drop around for a drink. <laughs> it's three to one. I'll drop around. That's how I got involved with Leora Thorne. 
I was in my office with Sanderson Taylor, my attorney, nose to the grindstone, sticking to business, when along came Leora's invitation. Oh, excuse me, Sandy, but this letter's been lying on my desk all day. <laughs> ah, perfume. Mm-hmm. Dear Greg, just because an old flame has got herself happily married, that's no reason to cross her off your book. How's about dropping around for a drink tomorrow afternoon? I want you to meet Bradley, my new husband. You'll like him. From uh, <laughs> quite a lady, Greg, judging by your smile. Remember Leora Littleton? She's now Leora Thorne. Oh, the one who's coming into old Colonel Littleton's money? One million dollars next year. She wants me to drop over this afternoon. What for? Just for Auld Lang Syne, I guess. Probably giving a big cocktail party. Has she still got that big estate on Shore Drive? Mm-hmm. Swimming pool and all the trimmings. Oh, uh, take my advice and you'll stay put. I'm sort of curious to see Leora again. It's been a whole year. Now, Greg, don't get involved. Oh, oh nonsense. The gal's happily married. She says so. <laughs> Haven't you ever noticed, Greg, that your ex-girlfriends never invite you to their homes unless there's trouble brewing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sanderson, you're a cynic. <laughs> I'll be back later to finish those contracts with you. Greg, I'm warning you! My attorney, Sanderson Taylor, is heap smart engine. I should have avoided that perfumed billy do like rat poison. Because when I got to Leora's, there wasn't any party. There wasn't so much as a friendly Greg. How have you been instead? Greg... You're just in time. Hey, what gives? This is Brad, my husband. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Hood. I've been meaning to drop around ever since I read about you two getting married. Never mind the chit-chat. Go to that small room over there. And listen. Listen to everything that's said. Wait a minute. All I came for was a nice sociable visit. Greg, I need you. I'm desperate. That's right, Mr. Hood. We're both desperate. Before I could say, I'm booked for this waltz, thank you, and walk out, they pushed me into a small powder room. I watched them go into the library right alongside. I watched the butler usher in a little runt who wore a face like a dachshund plus a twitch. An unsavory type. I listened to Docko Face talking to Leora and Brad. My boss says to tell you an old Chinese proverb. Confucius say... A Welsher gets it in the neck. I'm not Welshing. Three grand worth. I don't owe him a penny. What about the IOU? The game was crooked. I only signed it to get out of the place. Better pay it, girlie, to stay out of a coffin. Say, look, whoever you are, have a heart. That crap game was rigged. My wife was cheated into losing all that money. Please, I need time. Tell your boss to give me time. A week from today, my boss says. What? What about a week from today? That's how long you get. Or else... Girlie, that chassis of yours won't look so pretty with a bullet in the upholstery. <laughs> oh, Brad, Brad, what am I going to do? Oh, precious lamb, you, you've simply got to pay off. I can't, I can't. Now we'll sell your jewelry, rent this house, anything. Just so your life isn't in danger. Oh, please, please, precious lamb. Now, look, you two. You've roped me into this, so you'd better give me the lowdown. Great. You heard that, little man. Mm-hmm. Where have you been gambling, Leora? Out at Pacific Playland. Pacific Playland? That's an amusement park. I beg, Leora, to stay away. You didn't drop 3,000 on ping-pong and darts, did you? There's a floating crap game out there. People never tell me these things. Who runs it? I don't know his name. They just call him the boss. A rigged dice game with a hunky-tonk carnival. Leora, have you lost your senses? I... I can't explain it, Greg. Every now and then I get this itch to gamble. It just grabs hold of me and... Well, this time I got in too deep. I tried to stop her, Mr. Hood. Mm. Well, my advice is square up. I didn't like the looks of Jojo, the dog-faced messenger boy. I can't pay, Greg. What? I haven't the money. Leora Littleton, NG on the credit? I don't come into the bulk of Grandfather's estate for another year. You know that. Right now, I'm in debt all over town. Oh, darling, we'll sell things off. It's the only way. You're right, Thorne. Take that wristwatch you're wearing, for instance. What about it? I handle lots of fine Swiss watches at the Hood Importing Company, but nothing that unusual. I've never seen a heart-shaped design like that. I had it made like a heart because I gave it to Brad. As a wedding present. Well, that watch alone at some high-class hawk shop. Oh, no, I can't let Brad part with oh, it. Oh, but precious lamb, for your own safety and for my peace of mind. Your husband's very sensible. 
Don't risk your life, Leora. Well, then help me, Greg. Find out who's after me. Well, I'll think it over. Oh, you were the one person, Greg, I knew I could turn to. If you help us, Mr. Hood, you'll never find two people more grateful. Well, I have to go now, but you'll be hearing from me, Leora. I'll show you to the door, Mr. Hood. This way. I'm so worried about her, Mr. Hood. Naturally. Oh, sometimes I wish Leora didn't have, well, all this. She's a swell kid. She just needs taking care of. I'm doing my best. You know, I think you are. I think you have a pretty level head in your shoulders. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm so crazy about her. A lot of folks probably think I just married her for the money. Well, anybody can see that isn't the case. Well, chin up. Don't let Leora get too upset. Well, I'll try not. Good meeting you, Thorne. It was grand meeting you. And please, help us out of this mess. Well, Greg, uh, how was Leora's cocktail party? What cocktail party? Ah, oh. I thought so. She only got you out there to rope you into something. Put your hat on, Mr. Taylor. We're going places. What, what, what about these business contracts? They'll keep. We're going to Pacific Playland. The amusement park? What goes on out there, it seems, isn't so amusing. What did you find out, Greg? I've been pumping some of the concession owners. Do they know anything about a floating gambling game? They do. They're keeping mum. What about the man they call the boss? Couldn't learn a thing. Oh? Uh, what about the little man who threatened Leora? Dockleface? Yes, he works out here. They recognized my description of him. Who is he? Name's Benny Baker, known as Hot Licks Baker. <laughs> Hot Licks? Used to be a trap drummer until he found an easier pitch. Well, he sounds like a charming character. They tell me he works at one of the concessions, some daredevil trapeze act, the incomparable florette, whatever that yes, is. Yes, it's over there. You see that neon sign? Well... Hanging over that big tent. Well, come on, let's go visiting. Ten cents, ladies and gents, only a tenth of a dollar. See, Florette, Florette the incomparable. Watch her death-defying leap through the air. The trapeze act of the century. At 200 feet. With perfect precision, the little lady will defy gravity. Buy two tickets, Sandy. Uh, Greg, hurry, uh, hurry, hurry. Uh, that Barker. What about him? I have a feeling he's looking at us. No law against giving his customers the once over. No, it's just that, well, he kind of nodded when he spotted you. As if, look out, Greg, that neon sign is coming loose. Greg, get out of the way. Are you all right, Greg? Me? Sure, Sandy. Oh, you. Lucky thing you pushed oh, me. Oh, I, I had heart failure. You were standing right under it. You had heart failure. Uh, Brother, I could feel the breeze as that sign went past me. Uh, Everybody okay out there? Oh, boy. Uh, accidents will happen. We'll have the debris cleaned up in a jiffy. In the meantime, just step up, ladies and gents. See, Florette. Florette be uncomfortable. Florette, the wonder girl. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, Greg. That was not an accident. Sure it was, Sandy. The sign just tore loose. When you were directly under it, I think somebody wanted to kill you. Oh, nonsense. He's right, Mr. Hood. Huh? I said your friend is right. Two hundred percent. She was dressed in a kind of spangled costume. A carnival performer. She'd inched her way to us through the crowd. She pulled Sandy and me over onto one side and talked in quick whispers, as if there wasn't much time. He knows you're after him. Who does? The boss, the man I work for. Who is he? What's he look like? Where does he hang out? What's it worth to you, Mr. Hood? To find out who's threatening the Lord Thorne. Suppose you tell us first who you are. What's a dip who I am? Make with the cash offer and you'll get what you really want to know. Fifty. Oh, chicken feed, Mr. Hood. A hundred. Come again. Double or nothing. Step in, folks. Big show's about to commence. You will see Florette be uncomfortable. Oh, that's my cue. i got to go in the tank. You're Florette. You yeah, yeah, for a crummy 65 a week. All right, you win, Florette. $200. Let's have it. Where can I find this man they call the boss? Well, he's always at the same place. You'll find him. Oh, look, I, I ain't got time to talk now. Why not? Wait. Come back here. After my act. Meet me back at the tent in my dress. Room. We 
bought our tickets, Sandy and I, and followed the crowd into the big tent. Pretty soon, the girl appeared and climbed a rope ladder, a hundred feet up at least. Four times a day she did this stunt. She must have had nerves of iron. Don't get it, Greg. Get what? Well, uh, a trapeze artist, a honky tonk character. What possible connection can she have with a girl like Leora Thorne? That is what we're going to pay her two hundred dollars to find out. Are you ready, Miss Florette? All ready. Ah! Greg, she missed. They're taking her to the dressing room. She'll never live after that fall. Wait, let's get out of here, Sandy. Keep your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Please keep your seats. It was an accident. An accident. Please keep your seats. Excuse us, please. We have to get through. Keep going, Greg. I'm right behind you. This time, I'll bet my most sincere necktie on it, Sandy. That was deliberate. What? Did you notice the fellow who was beating the temple for her? Oh, the little fellow with the drum? Uh huh. Yes, what about him? He took a powder as soon as she missed that second trapeze. Well? He was Benny Baker. The man who went to see Leora Thorne? That's right. And this was murder, pal. Deliberate murder. In her dressing room, the incomparable Florette was dying a death I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. We pushed our way through before anybody could stop us. An ambulance intern was already there, shaking his head. A policeman was there, too, making duck tracks in his notebook. I could see what was in the wind when I heard the copper say, Open and shut case, looks like. Just an accident. We may as well get out of here, Greg. Not yet, Sandy. But it's too late. The girl won't be able to talk to us. Maybe she will. Look at her eyes. Her eyes? She's staring at us. I think she wants us to come closer. Can you speak, Florette? Try. Try hard. Who is he? This boss person. The man who made them do this to you. Oh, Greg, it's no use. Wait, wait. She's moving her lips. Did, did that... Did that right? What's she saying? Something about death. Something about a death ride. Shh, listen. Last boat. Come on, Greg. She's dead. Well, we didn't get very far, did we? Not yet, but you may quote me as saying I'm hopeful. Oh, Greg, for Pete's sake. What? Call Leora Thorne. Tell her you're washing your hands of this. Not a chance. But we have we have work to do back at the office. But this is ridiculous, traipsing around an amusement park. I'm going to find out who the gentleman known as the boss is. He's responsible for Florette's murder. What makes you so sure that Florette was murdered? You'll see. Right now, I'm wondering what she meant by that death ride, death ride stuff. She may have been referring to Leora. It could be. But on the other hand, hey. What, Greg? Down there on the midway in colored lights a mile high. The death ride. 
Twenty-five cents. An amusement concession. Well, things are adding up. Come on. We ran down the midway, past the bingo joints and frozen custard stands. For only two bits, the death ride looked entertaining enough. It was a long tunnel filled with water. Flat-bottomed boats chained together took you on a dark and dismal voyage. But we didn't go on it. Not yet we didn't. Because just as we got there... What's the matter? Did you see what I saw? Where? Over there, the ticket booth. He was buying a ticket on the death ride, then he spotted us and ducked. Who? Benny Baker. There he goes, up that alley. Quick, Sandy, we can corner him. Hit him off, Ray. I'm trying to... All right, slow up, Baker. End of the line. Okay, okay, okay. You're out of training, Hotlicks. It's the life you lead. Who do you want? Hold him, Sandy. Got him. Get me alone. Quite a trick, Hotlicks. Who put you up to it? Up to what? Lorette's belly flop. That was an accident. Slight correction, a murder. You're wacky. Listen, Benny, I know how trapeze artists work. They practice a certain beat till every muscle is adjusted to it. And when that beat is changed, even by a split second... So that's how he did it. That's how he did it, by changing the drum beat. A couple of Weissenheimers, huh? Well, try and pin something on me. We both heard that drum. So did a hundred other people in that audience. You're cooked, Benny, unless you talk. Who put you up to it? Sup- suppose I sing. What then? The deal? Yeah. I don't do business with rats, Benny. Here's what I do. Hey, get it out. I'm sick, I tell you, I'm sick. Who's the man that get- hires you? Start singing. All right, all right, only stop. I figure he's a middle-aged guy, maybe. Kind of fat, maybe, judging by his voice. I, I never actually seen him. But he paid you to threaten Mr. and Mrs. Thorne and to take care of Florette. Yeah, yeah. Only I never actually seen him. Well, where is his gambling place located? He ain't a gambler. He ain't the guy Leora lost the money to. No? He's only using that, see? To pull some other racket on Mr. and Mrs. Thorne. Some other racket? What kind? Don't ask me. I just follow orders. Well, how if you've never seen the man? The boss gives me orders on the phone. How does he pay you off? Well, he meets me now and then, but always in the darkness. In the darkness? Oh, Greg, he's lying to us. I ain't. I ain't. I swear I ain't. Look, over there, where I'm pointing. That's where he meets me. On the death ride? Yeah, the last boat. You believe him, Greg? Hmm. Could be. Remember the girl's dying words to us? Yeah. I think he's telling the truth. What uh, what, what are you going to do to me, mister? Until the police take over, I'm leaving you in the capable hands of Mr. Taylor here. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, where are you off to? A sudden yen has come over me, Sanderson. I haven't tried one of those amusement rides since I was a small boy. You're, you, you're going on the death ride? If anybody wants me, I'll be in the last boat, keeping a date in the darkness of the tunnel. <laughs> I strayed over to the ticket booth and put down my quarter. It was past midnight now, and I was the only customer. I waited by the entrance gates. The string of tiny boats emerged from the tunnel, slowed up, and disgorged a load of giggling bobby soxers. Then it was my turn. I asked the old geezer who was in charge... Mind if I ride in the last one? Ride anywhere you please, mister. The death ride got underway, with yours truly as the only passenger. Suddenly, I felt lonely, as if I didn't have a friend in the world. The boats headed into the long, black tunnel. I couldn't see my hand two inches in front of my face. In the inky blackness, I lost all sense of direction. I felt stifled. Beads of perspiration collected on my forehead. But, so far, no fellow passenger. You know that feeling you get in a dark room? That a stranger is right alongside you? Well, suddenly I knew. I could sense him sitting behind me in that last boat. I waited for him to speak. But all I could hear was the water in that tunnel and his watch. The ticking of his watch. I remember how it echoed. Finally, when he talked, his voice was muffled. When I answered, I tried to sound like Mr. Benny Hotlick's dockle-face baker. That you, Benny? Yeah. Take care of Florette? Yeah. Good boy. 
Got another job for you, Benny. Okay. Up near Tahoe. Gonna be an accident up there. Tomorrow morning. What kind of accident? Falling rocks. Automobiles gonna get out of control. Will someone get killed? A girl. Suddenly a shaft of light. There must have been a torn place in the canvas that lined the tunnel. Suddenly he must have seen that I wasn't Benny because... Okay, one boat. I couldn't turn around. His hands were on my throat. I still couldn't see who he was, and the hands kept gripping tighter. Tighter. And then Roman candles started shooting off in my brain. Bonfires danced before my eyes. And then I blacked out. So long, Hood. Here's where you get off. Only two feet of water, but enough to drown you. <coughs> Greg. Um, take it easy, old man. Oh, my throat. Just lie on that bench for a while. <coughs> Where'd you find me, Sandy? On the death ride. Floating face down. You deserve a Carnegie Medal for life-saving. How come such perfect timing? Well, uh, he got away. Baker? I was running after him. <clears throat> Just as we passed the death ride, I saw a passenger climbing out of the last boat. It wasn't you, and I got worried. That passenger? What did he look like? I didn't wait to see. I grabbed a flashlight from the old man and went sloshing into the tunnel to find you. I never saw that other passenger either. Too dark. That was the boss. Yes. Any idea of his identity? None. His hands suddenly... Sandy. Yes? I just remembered that fellow's hands, his left wrist. What? Never mind, it'll keep. We'd better get after Benny Baker. I've learned he's a professional killer with another job on tap for tomorrow morning. Oh, and I let him get away. Come on, we've got to stop him. What are you stopping for, Greg? We won't have to look any further for Mr. Benny Hot Licks Baker. Where? I don't see him. Look... Now, do you see him? Where you're pointing? Yes. That concession over there. Hilbert's Waxworks Museum. Those figures on display outside. Look at those wax figures. Oh. Oh. Craig. How fantastic. Fantastic was the word, all right. Three of them standing upright and motionless. Napoleon, Mary, Queen of Scots, holding her head in her hands, and Jack the Ripper, all built of wax. Alongside, slumped over and equally motionless, was Benny Baker. They made a lovely foursome. Oh, that, that green spotlight on them, you'd, you'd almost swear that Benny was a wax figure, too. Yeah, except for the bullet hole and the blood. Sandy, let's get back to the car. Ah, Greg, where are you driving to? You'll see. This isn't the direction to my house. I'm not taking you home, pal. Oh, now see here, Greg, enough is enough. Well, I've got a home and a comfy rest mattress waiting for me. Yes, and a wife who's probably ready to divorce me for staying out all night. Here we are, Leora Thorne's house. I, I know it's late, Leora, but I've got to see you. This is Sandy Taylor, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? Come into the library, Leora. I want to talk to you. I'll wait out here in the hall. Yes, Greg? Are you, by any chance, planning an auto trip? Well, how did you know? A little birdie told me. In the morning, Brad and I are driving out of town for the weekend. Up to Lake Tahoe? Who told you? You're not going, Leora. But, Greg, Brad and I were the counting... The trip is on... off for a very simple reason. If you value your life... If I... Greg, what are you talking about? Why, hello, Mr. Hood. Oh, glad, darling. You better come in and listen to this. Well, I woke up as I heard you going downstairs, precious. Greg insists that we call off our trip to Tahoe. Oh? 
Well, why is that, Mr. Hood? Falling rocks. What? There's to be an accident on that mountain road to Leora's lodge. Leora is scheduled to be a corpse. Greg! You mean they actually kill her because of that gambling debt? That petty crap game operator hasn't been threatening Leora at all. Well, then who... Somebody who figures this is a perfect time to put you in a nice marble mausoleum. While he can use that gambling debt as a cover-up. But who? Oh, I haven't any enemy. But you're absolutely sure of this, Mr. Hood. I've met the gentleman in question. You've seen him? I didn't say I'd seen him. We met in the darkness. He tried to kill me. What? Oh, he's a bad boy. He had two Confederates working with him. When they talked too much, he put them both out of the way. It, it all sounds so, so fantastic. I... Mrs. Laura's right, Mr. Hood. Like a bad movie. You don't care for melodramatic doings, eh, Thorne? Well, I... Guess I'm just not used to them. You like things to be calm and serene, eh? Well, yes, I guess you'd call me the matter-of-fact type. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me something, Thorne. Yes? Don't you ever get tired? Well, tired of what? Of playing cat and mouse, you filthy... Greg, swing. you're out of your mind! He knows you love him now, Leora. He knows he's mentioned in your will. He also knows how changeable you are, and he'd rather be a rich widower than a poor ex-husband. Hark, get out! I'm not listening, Brad. I'm just not listening. You used to work in carnivals in the old days, didn't you, Thorne? With Florette and Benny, you knew they could be hired for a price. Brad, don't let him say these things. That's right, Thorne. Don't let me say them. Okay, Hook. This is how you want it. Stand up. Brad, that gun! You too, precious lamb. You once told me you'd die for me. Here's your big chance. Oh, no. You see, he's right. You are too changeable, precious. You'd be getting tired of me one of these fine days, and we mustn't have that. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Finish up what I started. Okay, Sandy, you can come in now. Watch out, Sandy! Ah! I'm okay. He shot with wire. Drop that gun, Thorn. Drop it. You dirty... Drop it. Drop it. Grab him, Sandy. I've got him. All right, Thorn. Uh... You come in quietly to the police and we play more uh, patty cake. How come? Quietly. I knew it was you ever since that excursion on the death ride. You knew? How? Say goodbye to your wife. Goodbye. Precious lamb. Now take off the wristwatch and give it to her. I don't want it. But your love gift to him is what put me onto him. What? In the darkness, Thorn, it was like an engraved calling card. Uh, a wristwatch? Heart shaped. Extremely unusual. And you forgot all about the luminous dial. You have heard The Carnival of Death, an adventure from the case book of Gregory Hood, written this week by Jerome D. Ross, directed by Martin Andrews and produced by Frank Cooper Associates. Listen again next week at the same time over this ABC station for the story of the Mutton Jade Buddha, another adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. This is ABC. Of the larcenous lark. It's late Wednesday night in New York, and in Arnie Kessler's very private gambling club on East 69th Street, tall, handsome, gray haired George Watkins stands at the end of the dice table shaking the dice cup in his manicured hand and makes his roll. Five's your number. Right off. Once again, Watkins shakes the cup. Come on, little five. And makes his roll. Seven. Watkins smiles wryly, shrugs lightly, puts down the cup and pushes through the crowd. He finds the door to Kessler's private office open and walks in. Kessler is seated at the desk. Oh, Watkins. Sit down. Thanks. How'd it go tonight? Well, for you, fine. I'm clean. Tough luck. Oh, I'm bound to change. Uh, how's my credit? Strain to the limit. I'm afraid I'll have to close the book on you. That's all I wanted to know. Good evening, Kessler. Uh, you're down for 35 grand, Watkins. That's a lot of groceries. I understand. I, I'm a realist, Kessler. Don't fool myself. No false pride, so I have to face the fact. 
the moment I'm no big shot, I'm flat. Bum investment. I'm surprised you carried me this far. Oh, you'll pay off. I'm glad you're so sure. It's my business to be sure. In that case, a uh, little more credit? Uh, now, let's not overdo a good thing, chum. Got to draw the line somewhere, you know. You just pay that 35 and you can have all the credit you like. All right. I'll get it. You bet you will, Watkins. You bet. All right, Rex, here you are. Just sign these papers and I'll run along. Yeah, just a minute, Watkins. Wait to get this. How do you like this phrase? Da da di da da da. Uh-uh. Uh, you're right, it's corny. Uh, maybe it's better like this. Now, it was better before. Rex, please, I've, I've got to be going. Okay, Watkins, give me the papers. Here you are. Here's the pen. Okay. You know, it's funny, I had it the right way in my head, but it's gone. No. I tell you, if I could remember, it's terrific. All right, Rex, but look what you're doing. Signing my name, i got to look for that. Don't you even read what you're signing? I can't be bothered. That's what I pay Watkins for, my business manager, huh, Watkins? <laughs> That's right. Now, now these checks... Right. I think you'd be interested. Interested? In whereases and double entries and capital gains? I say it's spinach and to Watkins with it. Okay, Watkins, there you are. Right, Al. Now you can get back to your work. So long, Rex. Goodbye, Miss Long. Yeah, I'll be seeing you. Bye. Catch it. It's a natural, believe me. What do you know about him? Who? Watkins. Oh, great. Saved me nearly ten grand in income taxes last year. Well, if you don't even check on him, I... Rita, Rita, I know what I'm doing. I make the moolah. Watkins sees that I don't spend it faster than I make it. That's Who's all. to see he doesn't spend it? Oh, for the love of Pete, Rita. I mean it. If you expect me to marry you, you've got to have some sense of responsibility. Yeah, sure, sure. Baby. Baby, there it is. Da, 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 dum, dum, dum. I know, I'd get it. You like? Not bad. Not bad, it's great. What are you doing? Just call him I no good of an agent. Rex, I'm trying to tell Yeah, not now, honey, not now. Hello? Uh, Halloran, Halloran, listen, I've got a number, even you'll be able to sell it. Who is it? Who is it? The cold porter of the 50s. I'm telling you, I've got something that'll make you. Rex? Who else? Look, Rex, before you get all... Now, will you up... shut up? You haven't even heard it yet. Goes with those lyrics I showed you yesterday. Now, listen. <laughs> You hear? Yes. Well? It's a nice tune, Rex, but you know that you No can't. buts, Halloran. This is it. How soon can you get it to Sinatra? Be reasonable, Rex. We can't. Now, look, I don't want any argument. All the time I bang out songs that sell themselves, you try to sit on them. If it wasn't for that contract, believe me, brother, you'd be out, but fair. Listen to the cornball. Where were you before I took you over? Strictly minor leagues. Now it's the big leagues and you beat them, huh? You got a nice tune. I'll do what I can. Now, for look, you. shut up. I want you over here this afternoon, understand? Uh, that creep always got to give me conversation. You'd think a guy'd get some encouragement once in a while, but no, nice tune, he says. And you won't even listen. Got to yap about what? I listen, Rex. It's just that I'm worried. Do you have to turn everything over to Watkins? All right, look. Look, I'll take it once more, slow. Now try to dig it this time, baby, will you? When you get in the chips, you hire yourself a business manager. Everybody does it. I'm not the only one. Thanks so much for telling me. But everybody doesn't just sign papers and checks without even knowing what they are. All right, let's not get in a hassle about it, huh? Well, if we're going to get married... Who says we're going to get married? Rex! Well, if it's going to be nag, nag, nag all the You're time... You're not serious. Maybe I am. I don't know. Well, I was only trying to be helpful. I don't see... Why you have... Why you have... Oh, have for to... Pete's sake. <laughs> Look, baby, I got a great idea banging around in my head. I want to get it on paper. Do you have to pitch a hissy now? I'm sorry, Rex. I don't... Now, will you cut it out? <laughs> Honey, honey, look. Doggone it, listen, will you? All right, I'll call Watkins. I'll get an appointment, see. He'll explain just how I stand financially, black and white. Get it all figured out, see. Now, will you please turn off the Niagara and let me get to work? Oh, oh, Kessler. Hello, Watkins. Mind if I come in? No, of course not. Thanks. As a matter of fact, I... I have something for you. Glad to hear it. Yes. Here you are. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five grand. Mm. Good. 
At least an even 30. It uh, may take a little time. Oh, that's all right. Just so long as you settle up before you leave town. Leave town? What makes you You think... bought a ticket for Chicago this morning. How do you know? Have you been having me followed? Let's just say I have a very sensitive Ouija board, hmm? You see, Watkins, when I have money outstanding, I like to keep in touch. That's why I don't want you going away until the account is closed. I should have expected this. Very well, Kessler, you, you've got me. No use denying, there's the ticket. I, I was leaving. As a matter of fact, I'm on a bit of a spot. Let's, let's face it, I, I'm trapped. How so? Well, I'll tell you, always was one for cards on the table. It, it's like this. That 5000 I just paid you came from Rex Elber. Only, Elber doesn't know it. Mm-hmm. I had counted on him for considerably more from time to time, you understand. You can't rush these things or they show up. Well? Well, Elber called a few minutes ago, wants to go over the account. I don't know what's gotten into him all of a sudden, but there it is. Have to face it. He wants an accounting, and I can't possibly explain the check I cashed. It... If it hadn't happened so fast... So you were going to run out. Well, what can I do? Uh, perhaps if you give me back that 5000 and I return it to Rex, he he may not press the charges. Sure. I blow five grand, and if Elba decides not to play ball, you're in the soup anyhow. Well, it was a thought. I don't call that thinking. Well, what can I do? Elba isn't your only client. You have others. That's why I gave you credit. Now they watch closer. Still, I... I suppose over a period of time, I could raise the rest. I... Take your time. I won't rush things so long as I get payments on account like this every so often. But I don't have time. That's just it. Elber wants a showdown today. Well, can't you stall him? No, not for long. If only I could keep him from asking about that check. That There must be something I can do. Not only there must be Watkins. There better be. <laughs> Okay, now what can I do? Hey, wait a minute. Hey, what's the idea? where Mike Waring lives, the Falcon? Yeah. You him? I'm he. Well, Halloran's my name, Vic Halloran, Rex Elba's agent. Well, congratulations. On what? Being Elba's agent. He must be a gold mine. Golden goose, more like. Somebody killed him. Oh. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I need a detective. Heard a lot about you. Always figure anybody has a reputation, he must have something on the ball. Well, I'll concede the point. Shall we go inside and talk business? No need. I'll only be a minute. I discovered the body, see? So I'm on the spot. Cops just put me through the ringer. Any reason you should be suspected, other than discovering the body? They suspect everybody. Oh, well, and you've got nothing to worry about. No more than anybody else. All right. It's like this, see? Who likes his agent? All the time gripes, how come you aren't doing more for me? Rex and me had words often. Loud words. Uh -huh. But he's my meal ticket. I'm going to knock off my own meal ticket? Ah, oh, yes. The golden goose. Get on it, will you, Waring? Okay, Halloran. Try Rita Vaughan, warbler at the Zigzag Club. You think she did it? She's mixed up in it. How do you know? She's a dame. Rex is current. And believe me, in a thing like this, always include the dame in. I'll make a note of it. Dames are trouble. You can count it. Nothing but trouble. Halloran, you're speaking of the women I love. Take it from me, Waring. Nothing but trouble. <laughs> Spoken like a confirmed bachelor. Bachelor? I'm paying alimony three ways. Now get on it, Waring, will you? <laughs> Mike Waring has been in Vic Halloran's employ for 20 minutes. Just long enough to get from his own place to the Zigzag Club, where Rita Vaughn has just admitted him to her dressing room. All right, Mr. Waring, now what is it? Well, there's no question about it. You're a dame. What a detective. And dames are trouble. Oh? Mm-hmm. I have it on the authority of a three-time loser. And you're looking for trouble? Rex Elba's trouble. Were you it? I was his dame? Mm-hmm. But I had nothing to do with his death. Uh-huh. So if that's all you want, you might as well run along. Who said it's all I want? I can tell you who killed Rex, if that's what you want. 
Well, I'd like to get around with that angel, but uh, I'm in no hurry. His business manager, George Watkins. Why do you say that? Rex had an appointment with Watkins today to check on Watkins' handling of Rex's affairs. The murder was a little too opportune to be a coincidence. All right, Rita, I'll check on it. Well, you can't check on it in here. Hey, you seem in a hurry to get rid of me. I'm on in a few minutes. I'd like to get ready. And the show must go on. You said it, Mr. Waring. Maybe you think I'm taking Rex's death too... Maybe you think it doesn't mean anything. Could I... Oh, get out of here, will you? Hello, is George Watkins around? Who wants to know? Mike Waring. Well, well, the parking. This is an unexpected pleasure. Uh, you must be Arnie Kessler. I must be. Can I offer you a drink? No, thanks. You uh, get around a lot. 33. How come you got around here? Could be I like roulette. Oh, you know better than the buck the house percentage, Waring? <laughs> That's no way to encourage business. Some kinds of business I can do without. So you're uh, looking for George Watkins, huh? Yeah, I understand he's a regular patron here. I wanted to confirm it. You expect an answer from me? No, I guess not. Is that all you wanted? Well, I'd like to know how Watkins was doing. <laughs> da, da, de, da, de, yeah, well, I didn't think you'd tell me. Da, da. I'm not crazy. I start talking about my client's affairs, I'd be out of business fast. Well, in that case, I guess I'm just wasting my time around here. I'm glad to realize it. Might as well be running. Oh, no need to run, Waring. You can walk. As long as it's to the nearest exit. Hello? Hello, Watkins. This is Arnie Kessler. Yes, Kessler. What is it? Who knew that Rex Elba wanted an accounting with you today? Well, I didn't know anyone did, except you. Why? Mike Waring was just here, the Falcon. He guessed you'd been losing at the tables. Oh, dear. Relax. He's still guessing. I didn't give him anything. But if he's checking... I don't think he can prove anything, but I thought you ought to know. Yes, yes. Thanks, Kessler. But, but who could have put him on to... Of course. That girl. What girl? Rita Vaughn. Never did care for her style of singing. Maybe I can figure a way to make her change her tune. Hello, Rita. Oh, Mr. Waring, back again, huh? Yeah, I thought I'd catch the last show. But as long as you're table hopping, uh... How about perching at mine for a while? Well, I only have a minute. I'll settle for that. All right. I've been checking on Watkins. Find out anything? Uh-huh. He likes to gamble. Oh, well, that could explain... Uh-uh. What's wrong? Speak of the devil. Hello, Mr. Watkins. Hello, Rita. Am I interrupting anything? Yes, you certainly are. But sit down, you old devil. I beg your pardon? Uh, Mr. Watkins, this is Michael Waring. Waring? Oh, yes. Yes, I've heard of you. From Arnie Kessler? Why do you ask that? Why don't you answer it? Uh, I want to talk to Rita. <laughs> Get in line. I was here first. I'm afraid I'll have to disappoint both of you. Time for my number. See you later. Has Rita been talking about me, Waring? As Rita, I intend to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now here she is. The little lady you've all been waiting for to play and sing for you, Rita Vaughn. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Well, I have something that I hope will be a treat for you. It's a brand new number that I wrote myself. And here it is for the first time anywhere. I hope you like it. I wonder why she didn't come back to the table, Waring. She said something you... scared her. Didn't you see her face when she left the floor, Watkins? No, I didn't notice. That's why I wanted to get back here to the dressing room. There it is. Hey, somebody's in there. Yeah. Look out, Watkins. Let's see if this door's unlocked. Yeah, it is. Mr. Waring. Yes, Rita. Come to take you in my arms. No, let's go. Not while you're waving shooting irons. Sorry, Waring. She missed. Yeah, so I see, Halloran. But let's not give her another shot at you. 
What are you doing here, anyway? Telling her off. She's a crook. She hit me. That's why I grabbed the gun. It was self-defense. She's a crook, a grave robber. Did you hit her? We were arguing. Did you hit her? What difference did you... Did you hit her, Halloran? Well, maybe I did. Then the gunplay really was self-defense. I told you. Uh Uh-huh, but I want Halloran to tell me. Well, yes, it was. All right. Then I can let her go. Much as I enjoy holding you in my arms, Rita, I like it under different circumstances. Now, what went on in here? Well, when I heard her singing that song, Did you hear... I didn't see you in the club. I was over at the side, near the door. All right, you heard the song. Yeah, she said it was her song. She made it up. I did. Rex called me this morning, all hopped up. Here's a new number. Plays it for me over the phone. It's this very song wearing, this very song. I played it for Rex. That's where he got it. He said it was his. We were going to publish it under his name. We thought it would be more popular. Look, I know Rex's style. You can't I know his style, too. I was influenced by it, I admit that. But I wrote that song. That's a lie. Well, even if it is, Halloran, is that any call to slug the girl? Or did you just toss that in because you don't like Dane? I couldn't help blowing my lid wearing. I'm I'm sorry, but this crooked Dane All right, here... all right, hold it. Rita, you say you made up this song? Yes. When? This morning. Drex was working on a tune. It was something like this one, but not the same. Watkins, you were there, you remember. Yes. Well, then Watkins left and Rex and I were talking and all of a sudden it came to me. And you played it for Rex? Yes. And he played it for Halloran? Yes, and he told me that... I know the... what he told you. Did you play it for anyone else, Rita, until tonight? No. And it's just your word against Halloran's. Well, yes, but I... I don't but know I... what you hope to prove, Waring. Each one will stick to his own story. Oh, I think I've proved plenty, Watkins. What? Who killed Rex Elder? You what? I've proved who killed Rex Elder. Maybe that isn't as important as who wrote the music, but it should determine who's going to have to face it. Who, Waring? Well, considering that Watkins is in deep to Kessler... And... Where'd you get that idea? Maybe from Kessler himself. You couldn't. Why not? Because I... Because I don't owe him. That's not what Kessler told me, Watkins. He didn't tell you anything. What makes you so sure? He told me he didn't. Then there must be something he could... Wait up. Look out. Oh, oh, don't. Too late, Waring. I've got the gun from her. Now, what good do you think it's going to do you? Well, there's one sure thing. Won't do you any good if you make a move. So stay where you are, all of you. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Fifteen minutes have passed since George Watkins grabbed Rita's gun and beat a hasty retreat from the zigzag club. Mike has used that time to hurry to Arnie Kessler's apartment, where Kessler's thug Rocky has just ushered him in. Here he is, Mr. Kessler. Yeah. All right, Waring. What is it this time? Well, I put you on kind of a spot, Kessler. I figured I ought to tell you. What kind of a spot? I told George Watkins you tipped me about his owing you. He grabbed a gun and cleared out. I thought he might come here. Thanks for the warning. I can take care of myself. Yeah, sure. Still, I thought you ought to know. All right. But uh, how come he fell for your bluff? Oh, I guess he's out of his element. I imagine that until today, except for weakness for gambling, Watkins stuck pretty close to the straight and narrow. Yeah. And since he really is in the hock to you... Is he? ...his running out ought to clinch it. How do I know he ran out? Just because you say so? <laughs> well, I see you're not as green as Watkins. Disappointed? No, I expected it. Well, there could be the answer to if I'm bluffing. Yeah. Rocky. Okay, Mr. Kessler. And just in case Waring isn't bluffing you, that's Watkins. Check him for artillery. Right. I want to see Kessler. Sure. Turn around. Why? So far, you're right, Waring. It's Watkins. When you get to know me better, Kessler, you'll never doubt me. Oh, bad. All right, Mr. Kessler. Here he is. And here's his heater. Waring. Hello, Watkins. I've been expecting you. I should have known. You are on his side, That's Kessler. what he wants you to think, but if you shut up and let me do the talking... Well, certainly, certainly. Uh, might as well face it. I, I bungled again, played right into his hands. Maybe, but now we have him on our home ground. And please, Kessler, no violence. That's not I... what I had in mind. At least for now. But as long as we're both here together, he can't play one off against the other like he's been doing. No, that's not necessary. I've proved my point. I wouldn't say so. You rattled Watkins. He lost his head. And came running to you. Why? To check on what you told him. He thought I might have lied about him. You mean he wanted to see if you told the truth about him? (laughs) It's no use, Kessler. I know he's in hock to you. Now that I know who the murderer is, it's the only thing that makes sense. Oh, you know that? Too? Uh, sure. Waring, I know how it looks. Out but... of the talking, Watkins. Are you uh, suggesting that Watkins killed Elba, Waring? Oh, I haven't said that. But I thought... You he... shouldn't jump to conclusions, Watkins. Well, but then it... 
I, I don't understand. Unless you think I'm the murderer, what difference does it make if I owe Kessler money? My relation with him doesn't affect anyone else. It affects Kessler. And... But surely you can't think he killed Rex. Why, why, they didn't even know each other. I know they didn't. Well, then... Now, wait. Elba demanded an accounting with you today, didn't he, Watkins? Never mind, don't answer, but you know he did. And you've been juggling the account to pay off, Kessler, so you got panicked. Well, well... Shut up, Watkins. Yes. All right, you told Kessler about the spot you were in. You paid off part of what you owed him, but there was still a heavy balance. Now, if Elba sent you to jail, Kessler would never get his balance. So he killed Elba to protect his investment in you. So that's it. How many times do I have to tell you to shut up, Watkins? Oh, I'm the one you'll have to shut up, Kessler. But before you decide on the rough play you so thoughtfully postponed before, you ought to know the police know I came up here. Yeah? You think I'd have stuck my neck out like this otherwise? Let's face it, Kessler, the jig is up. One thing I don't understand, Waring. What's that, Halloran? You said my argument with Rita about the song is what tipped you to the murderer. Yes, it did. But if Kessler's the murderer, he had nothing to do with the song. That's just the point. What? He didn't know, Elder. Had nothing to do with him. Then how could he... look, look, Halloran. Regardless of who really wrote the song, either way, we know that until last night, only you and Rita and Elder had ever heard the song, right? Yes. But when I was at Kessler's before Rita played it at the club, Kessler was humming the song. He was? He was. So I knew he must have been at Elber's. Remember Elber was at the piano when he was murdered? He must have been playing the tune when Kessler killed him. I see. Uh So that takes care of the murder. Now everything is settled except who really wrote the song. Oh, oh, that, that's settled, too. Oh, it is? Yeah, yes, I was wrong. Rita wrote it, all right. We had a long talk, and she convinced me. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, quite a dame, Waring. Quite a dame. <laughs> but you didn't like dames. Who, me? Oh, all I said was, anybody who falls for a dame must be nuts. Uh-huh. Well, Waring, shake hands with Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> The makers of epic pure sunflower oil, purine and fret cooking fat, yum yum peanut butter, maple margarine, and niblet's cheese twists present the epic casebook. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. It will not have escaped the notice of regular listeners to my casebook of crime that there are clearly defined organizations to deal with matters of British security. Now, when I say security, I don't just mean it in its generally accepted sense, that is, safeguarding the military and political secrets necessary to a country's defense. I mean security in all its ramifications. Keeping a country and its people secure from the effects of lawlessness, industrial unrest, economic upheaval. From time to time, my stories have featured the ramifications of MI5, or the special branch. Yet despite opinion to the contrary, any death, where murder is suspected, is handled by the criminal investigation department of a police force, and not by what are commonly known as the cloak and dagger boys even if the persons concerned are known to be actively engaged in political or diplomatic negotiations of the most confidential nature. Why all this? Because the story I'm going to tell you tonight concerns the death of someone who, in his lifetime, became one of Britain's most distinguished foreign office officials. His name was Sir Roland Makepeace. I've called my story The Threads of Death. The unusual aspect of Sir Roland Makepeace's death can be gauged from the way operations brought matters to my notice. Car? Operations here, Inspector. No, who's been murdered this time? Well, sir, we don't know that he has been murdered. He? 
Uh, who in the name of goodness is he? And if a murder hasn't been reported, why are you telephoning the duty officer of the murder squad? Well, sir, it was first reported to the foreign office. Foreign office? Yes, sir. We've just had a Mr. William Banbury from the foreign office on the line. He's coming down to see you, sir. Hmm. Mr. Banbury, is he? That's right, sir. Seems as though there's some doubt as to whether the man found dead was murdered or committed suicide. You may have heard of him, sir. His name is Sir Roland Makepeace. Makepeace? Oh, yes, yes. I've uh, seen his name in the newspapers. How is he killed, do you know? No, sir. Wouldn't give any more information. Oh, if he wouldn't, he wouldn't. All we can do is await his arrival. Mr. William Banbury could not have been bettered as the epitome of the British Foreign Office official. Tall, with a slightly stooping academic air and a deceptively slow manner of speech, he painted a word picture that was succinctly clear in a matter of minutes. The servant found Sir Roland hanging from a rope less than 30 minutes ago. Now, Inspector, there's nothing to indicate that he was murdered. Without going into the whys and wherefores, I must tell you that Sir Roland was head of our Eastern European Division and was on the point of preparing a memorandum that would profoundly affect the member states of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Mr. Banbury, you wouldn't have got in touch with Scotland Yard unless you yourself were pretty certain that this gentleman was murdered. Have you any other reasons for suspecting foul play other than some foreign power wanting to stop him issuing his memorandum? Well, it's not quite as simple as that. Oh? I myself think he was murdered. Assuming it was suicide, we still need your help. I might as well tell you that the servant who found the body is a member of our security organization. Well, how can we be of help if we do decide the gentleman committed suicide? Well, it's now 9.30... It's going to be absolutely impossible to keep Sir Roland's death a secret. By midday, the papers are going to carry the story. Now, if it's suicide, certain overseas newspapers will play it up tremendously. They'll say that Sir Roland took his life because he didn't want to be a party to wicked intrigue against the Balkan states. You realize that this memorandum he was preparing was due to be presented to NATO in ten days' time. It must be murder. Because Sir Roland Makepeace was not the sort of man to take his own life? Well, frankly, at the moment, I'm not concerned with the dead man's reputation. Inspector Carr, we want it to be murder. If we can demonstrate that Sir Roland Makepeace forfeited his life, died because of his efforts to reach an understanding with Yugoslavia, we can go to the conference table with the knowledge and show that one of Britain's top foreign office officials was murdered by the enemies of Yugoslavia as well as Britain. On the other hand, if by then the inquest brings in a verdict of suicide, the ground will be cut from under our feet. Can't you prevent the inquest? It's possible to do. I wish we could. But the law says that an inquest must be held within a reasonable space of time after death. If we break the law, the boys on the other side will play that up too. Get the message? No, I don't care. Yeah. Except for one thing. Supposing I investigate his death... And my conclusions are that this gentleman took his own life. What happens then? We at the Foreign Office will have to bow to the inevitable. I'm hoping and praying it is murder. Hmm. Well, we'd better get cracking. I assume you've brought me all the relevant facts concerning Sir Roland's age, background. Of course. I've got his personal security file here. Good. You'll find ample reasons for rejecting the theory of suicide. He was a man in late middle age, a charming wife, three married children, five grandchildren. He's, sorry, was completely integrated in every way. No financial worries? Gambling, anything of that sort? None. Okay. What's the address? 106 Ensley Gardens, Knightsbridge. Mm -hmm. Who's in the house now? In other words, um, who knows of Sir Roland's death? No one except Lady Makepeace and the household staff. Oh, local police haven't been brought in? No, you see, two of his staff are highly trained security men with an elementary knowledge of first aid. Sir Roland was dead when they cut him down. Mm -hmm. Who cut him down? Uh, the butler. All right, Mr. Banbury, leave it to me. <laughs> this is the very first time in my checkered police career that I'm going to the scene of a death hoping that the person lost his life because of a deliberate act of murder. Uh, have you sent anyone from security? Yes, there'll be a chap outside, Miller. Uh, he'll meet you and take you in. I don't want to arouse more curiosity than necessary, but I have to arrange for fingerprint experts, photographers. Of course, the body will be examined by our own police surgeon. Of course. And one other thing, mustn't take this amiss. 
while I'm in charge of the investigation, I am in charge. In other words, I don't want any of your plainclothes men coming up to me and flaunting MI5 cards. Security or no security, the scene of his death will be my zone of investigation and I will give the instructions, right? Perfectly all right. Just one last thing. Oh, uh, where was the body found? In his study. Excuse me a moment. Yes, Inspector? My compliments to the senior police surgeon. Tell Dr. McPherson that an extremely urgent case has cropped up. Would he meet me at transport in five minutes? Very good, sir. Well, I'll get back to Whitehall. Terrible, terrible business. If you need me urgently, Sir Rowland's valet will get me on the special line. Special line? From their residence to security. Oh, right. Thank you very much. Uh, if I need you, I'll call on you. Together with my friend, the senior police surgeon, I set out for Emsley Gardens, giving the worthy doctor all the information vouchsafed by Mr. Banbury. We were met by Banbury's MI5 man, Miller. Uh, studies on the right, gentlemen. You're Inspector Carr, I take it. Oh, that's right. Um, this is Dr. McPherson, senior police. How do you do? How do you do? Lady Makepeace is resting. Oh. Poor woman, she's quite distraught. I gave instructions that no one was to touch anything. Uh, that's the study. Oh. Now then, let's check our watches. What time do you make it, Mac? Uh, ten minutes past ten. You, Miller? Ditto. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to get the estimated time now? Yes, Mac, and try not to touch the clothes. The dead man was lying on a sofa that ran along one side of the study wall. In the center of the high ceiling was a chandelier, baroque in its splendor. From it dangled a thin nylon rope. About two feet away was an overturned occasional table. Well, he seems to have taken the precaution of removing his jacket and tie. I feel I'll have to loosen his collar. Oh, there's no reason why he shouldn't. It was the rope, all right, wasn't it? That's a pretty ugly wheel. Not the sort of thing one wants to look at at half past ten in the morning. It looks suicide, all right. But why remove the jacket and tie? And why not the shoes? I should have thought that it would be suicide, particularly the meticulous sort of individual Sir Roland appears to have been, would have removed his shoes before stepping onto what uh, looks like a highly expensive and beautifully polished table. Hmm. Look, Mac. Look at that dried mud on his shoes. It was raining cats and dogs all night. I don't know. A man so worked up as to be on the point of hanging himself wouldn't worry about spoiling a table. That's not the point. Once a person plans his suicide, which he did if we accept suicide, and goes to the extent of removing his jacket and his tie, it would be almost a reflex action to remove his shoes. Now, it's pretty obvious that when he was cut down, he was placed on that sofa. Oh, he can tell you about that. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I heard voices and I came down. They should have told me you were here. It's all like something out of an American film, isn't it? I, I still find it difficult to accept. Uh, are you some of my husband's colleagues? I wish I could have introduced myself under better circumstances, Lady Makepeace. My name is Carr, Inspector Carr, New Scotland Yard. This is Dr. McPherson, our senior police sir. How do you do? How do you do, Lady Makepeace? I suppose you've come for information. Is it for the inquest? Will they say... That but he took his life while of unsound mind. I don't believe it. Roland was tired, overworked, worried about the NATO conference. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Is there somewhere we could talk, Lady Mavis? Yes, of course. Come through here. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Mac. When you're finished, you can take a car on the drive, or I'll ring when I'm ready to leave. All right, you are. Perhaps you can talk in the music room. Uh, you say your husband was overworked, tired. Was he depressed at all? Sometimes. His was a thankless job, Inspector. Mm -hmm. So selfish. I keep thinking what the publicity is going to do to my children and my grandchildren at school. Please sit down. Thank you. <clears throat> well, of course, we shall see to it that there is a minimum of publicity. The thought of an inquest terrifies me. People will be talking about my husband as... as, as, as oh, 
forgive me. The publicity is inevitable, Lady Makepeace, whenever an inquest is held, but there may not be an inquest. What? Lady Makepeace, it seems to me that there is a strong possibility that your husband did not take his own life. I don't understand. I can't justify it at the moment, but I think your husband was murdered. Oh, how horrible. Then they followed him. I must have known something like this would happen. Eh? Yes, strange people. You realize, Lady Makepeace, that a man of such importance would have security people following him in order to protect him? Protect him? How protected was he? I knew it. I couldn't accept the thought that Roland killed himself. Even if he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, he'd never do a thing like that. Do you think he was? I don't know. He used to come home, say he had an uneasy feeling that people were following him. People who didn't belong to security. I see. I'm sorry to have to ask you this, Lady Makepeace. When did you see your husband alive last? Yesterday, about midday. Oh, dear. I've got a feeling I'm deceiving you, Inspector, that I'm not telling you the truth. I gazed at the grey-haired lady sitting upright in her chair and wondered whether she was holding something back, something vital to my investigation. Why did you use the phrase, not telling me the truth, Lady Makepeace? Because, because I would rather my husband was the victim of a murderer than the humiliating thought that Roland was willing to leave us all just like that. We who loved and respected him so much... It must have been murder. Yet it looked like suicide. Oh, I'll never forget the sight as long as I live. All those shouts from the butler. Good heavens! Lady Makepeace! Lady Makepeace! The lady, come quickly! What on earth's the matter, Hobson? It's, it's, it's Sir Roland. He's, he's hanged himself. I rushed into the study. Hobson cut the rope. Then I went to my room. I... I didn't want to lose control in front of the servants. Uh, may I suggest, Lady Makepeace, that you go and rest. And thank you for spending so much time with me. I'll go and catch Dr. McPherson. He's probably still in study. I'm about through. What a way to end one's life. And I see he was a brilliant diplomat. Did you learn anything? He was murdered, all right, Mac. There's absolutely no reason for this man to have taken his own life. Uh, who knows what prompts a man to commit suicide? For all we know, he might have been selling secrets to a foreign power and was afraid of discovery. Estimated time of death about 2.30. Now, you've been reading too many lurid espionage stories, Mac. Oh, well, I'll make my report to that foreign office, Johnny. I am now convinced, Mr. Bambury, that Sir Roland Makepeace was murdered. Good heavens. Terrible thing to say, but I hope you're right. An awful thought to contemplate, but better than the knowledge that he committed suicide. The audacity of it. To kill one of our senior diplomats in his own home. I notify security and let them take over. Why? If you remember, I took on the investigation under the strict condition that... But now I... it's different. Our special branch... The circumstances are not different at all. You've placed me in charge, and I'm far from finished. But in... I never give up halfway through an investigation, Mr. Banbury, and I don't propose to start doing so now. But what about the inquest? I'll give certain evidence and convince the coroner and jury that Sir Roland was murdered by some person or persons unknown. That is, if I don't have my suspects under lock and key before... Before then, you say suspects. That suggests more than one involved. I think so. Now, please don't ask any more questions, Mr. Banbury. At this stage, I'll not be able to provide you with satisfactory answers. But I will in due course. Never fear. I displayed a hearty optimism I didn't exactly feel, because I didn't want Mr. Banbury to use his secret powers to deprive me of the results of the investigation so far. We removed the body to the police mortuary, and there I voiced my suspicions to Dr. McPherson. I'm reasonably confident that the suicide was staged. Now, were you able to tell whether Sir Roland was alive when he was strung up, eh? Oh, he was alive, all right. Otherwise, the blood wouldn't have seeped through. Had he been dead, the heart would have stopped pumping. Mm -hmm. and just uh, look at those spots of blood on the man's neck. 
Mm. Yes, I see. But he, he wasn't conscious, even if he was alive. Still think the suicide was a fake, do you? More than ever. He'll be a good chap. Have another look at his scalp. Right. Must have been stunned or chloroformed or something. Uh, just a minute. Stunned. Stunned? Aye. Run your fingers over the back of his head. Oh, eh? Yeah. You feel that bump? Mm. Well, mm. I'll... You know, I should have noticed that before. Oh, nonsense. Not with that thick mat of grey hair. Recent bump? There's no question about it. If that was an old... No, he, he could have hurt his head days ago. The bump would have subsided. He was hit less than 24 hours ago. I'd stake my reputation on it. Don't save it for the inquest. You're a great guy, Mac. I think I'll go and have a word with that butler. Do you live on the premises, Mr. Hobson? Yes, I do, sir. I and my wife, who acts as cook general, occupy the two attic rooms. And did you hear anything at all during the night? Well, I awoke at about uh, one or so. I, I thought I heard a taxi. Why taxi? Why not an ordinary car? Because I heard a voice say, thank you, and then the uh, taxi drove off. Tell me about the mate pieces. Were they happily married? Devoted to each other, sir. Mm. All right, Mr. Hobson. I want you to tell me exactly what happened. You shouted, Lady Makepeace, come quickly, Sir Roland has hanged himself. Hmm? Yes, that's right, sir. And then what happened? I rushed to get a knife and cut the poor gentleman down. Did you knock over the occasional table? No, sir. Now, according to your statement, apart from putting Sir Roland on the sofa, you didn't touch anything. No, I did not. And who notified the police? The chauffeur. Patterson did. All right. Thank you. Oh, uh, is there anything else you can tell me? Well, what is there to say? <laughs> well, nothing at the moment. Thank you. Taxi, you say? You want a general call for a taxi driver who dropped a fare at 106 Enslick Gardens. Very good, Inspector. Yes, I want you to get through to the Foreign Office, too. Find out what time Sir Roland Makepeace left Whitehall and what transport arrangements were made by security. Right, sir. Quickly as you can. Yes? Can I come in? Oh, just the man I want. Oh, please do come in, Mr. Banbury. I was about to telephone you. Any news? Don't hear. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, it's now a foregone conclusion that Sir Roland did not commit suicide. In my opinion, the murderers had nothing to do with the machinations of some foreign power. But that's incredible. I mean, who... Never mind that now. According to Lady Makepeace, her husband was working under such pressure that he had a room at the foreign office where he occasionally stayed the night. Yes? Uh, excuse me. Yes? I telephoned Whitehall, sir. Security says Sir Roland telephoned his wife at about quarter to nine telling her that he would be staying the night at the foreign office in order to complete the memorandum on the Balkan conference. Mm -hmm. However, he called for a foreign office car at 2.15. I see. Thank you. Did you know that Sir Roland was due to spend last night at the foreign office? Well, I saw him there at 10 o'clock. He told me that if he didn't complete his memorandum, he'd work through the night. But he obviously didn't do so. It's less than 10 minutes from Whitehall to Wednesday Gardens. That means that the driver dropped him at about 2.25. Unless... Well, let's see what happens about the taxi. So, uh, this is your statement, Mr. Baines. Hmm? Oh, would you care to read it through? All right, sir. In response to a telephone call received at a taxi rank at the corner of Brook and Sackville Streets, I proceeded to 8 in Cadogan Square. I rang the bell... A gentleman answered immediately and asked me to take him to 106 Ensley Gardens. We arrived at the destination at approximately 20 past one. He paid me off, and I drove back to the rank, and that's all I know. Thank you very much, Mr. Baines. Uh, Sergeant, we're calling on 18 Cadogan Square. In the meantime, get through to control. Find out if the occupant of the flat is home. Uh, you, Mr. Baines, will come with me for purposes of identification. I'll see that you're suitably recompensed for a lot of time. What on earth is all this about? I was just on the point of going to bed. All right, Mr. Baines, was this your fare? No, it seems, sir. Can somebody please tell Inspector me... Inspector Carr, New Scotland Yard. Oh, uh, my warrant card. 
You took a taxi at twenty past one this morning. You took it to a hundred and six Ensley Gardens. Well, so what? Is that a crime? That's what I'm trying to find out, Mr. Duke. Oh, your name is Duke, isn't it? So it says. Yes, my name is Duke. I don't know what all this is about. Who did you go to see at 106 Hensley Gardens? Well, so I think you'd better come with me. There are one or two questions we want to ask you. Oh, on second thoughts, we won't go back to the yard. We'll call on Lady Makepeace. So I'd have had to telephone you at this atrocious hour. You didn't waken Lady Makepeace, I trust? You said it was unnecessary, sir. Mr. Duke. Hi, Hobson. Uh, <clears throat> won't you come through, gentlemen? Duke. Let's go into the study, shall we? Did you let Mr. Duke in last night, Hobson? Last night? No, sir. I didn't see Mr. Duke last night. Through here, gentlemen. When did you see Mr. Duke last? I've, uh, only seen this gentleman once or twice. Why, sir? Got your own key, Mr. Duke? This is nonsense. Key? Who let you in? Well... Oh, come on, Mr. Duke. You said you called round last night. Mr. Hobson, the butler, was asleep. Who let you in? Uh, Rosalind. Lady Makepeace. My compliments to Lady Makepeace. Would you come down, please? Sir... Do as I say, as a good chap. Very good, sir. Duke... Your face is familiar to me, Mr. Duke. I suppose I'm permitted to ask what this is all about. Don't tell me you haven't read in the newspapers that Sir Roland has been found dead. I heard it on the radio. Then why do you want to know what it's all about? What do you think I'm doing here? Well, I'll be... Flash, Duke. <laughs> I haven't seen you since you used to work the boats. Remembered him all right. Flash Duke started off in life as a professional dancing partner for the transatlantic shipping line. Took to card shopping, gambling, confidence trickery. Uh, it's all beginning to fall into a pattern, particularly when Lady Rosalind arrived. I resent being dragged from my bed. In Mr. Bed. Duke tells me that he paid you a call at twenty minutes past one. Last night. Rosalind, the taxi driver. You... I might have known. You contemptible little gutter snipe. The first sign of danger and you confess everything. Oh, shut up, you idiot. But the damage was done. I rested them both. Poor Sir Roland make peace. While he was busy serving his country, this charming grey-haired grandmother was being escorted by Flash Duke. Whether he hit Sir Roland with a blackjack on impulse, as he said in the trial, and then strung the husband up in order to fake a suicide, or whether the whole thing was premeditated from the beginning in order that Lady Makepeace should inherit Sir Roland's not inconsiderable wealth, was not clearly established. Both paid the penalty for the crime... But what was the clue that convinced me it was murder and not suicide? Not sure. If you remember, Dr. McPherson and I looked at the shoes. Look at the mud on the shoes. Rain, cats and dogs all night. Yet the overturned occasional table was as clean as a new pin. Got it now? Of course, what really happened was that the poor husband arrived back. Duke coshed him tied one end of the rope to the bracket of the chandelier and the other round the neck of the unfortunate foreign office official who was strangled to death. And the moral of the story, ladies, if you decide to string your husband along, that's your business. When you string him up, that's ours. Good night. <laughs> The Epic Casebook was produced by Michael Silver for the makers of Epic Pure Sunflower Oil, Maple Margarine, Yum Yum Peanut Butter, and Niblet Cheese Twists, with Hugh Ross as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our Epic Casebook. Oh, the, Bill, it's Rogers. Rogers, Rogers, look out! Billy, 
He's falling! Mr. and Mrs. North. Starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Background for Murder. A nightclub in the middle of the afternoon isn't a very romantic background, and the man at the piano doesn't sound as if he's serenading his love. Still, the light in his eye as he looks at the fresh-faced young girl seated next to him is unmistakable, and the background becomes unimportant as he woos her in his own special language and with an odd, rather frightening intensity. I got eyes for you, Judy. You're the greatest. (laughs) Stop it, Hip. You just think you're interested in me because I'm something new. Interested? Judy, baby, I flipped the first time I saw you come into the place. Fresh from the corn belt and really wide-eyed at meeting the great Hip Rogers. The great Hip Rogers is a no-good heel. Why, Hip, you mustn't say things like that. I think you're a wonderful person. That's because you're not sharp, Judy. Maybe not, but I'm sharp enough to know a nice guy when I meet one. Sorry, Judy. That's nice. I like that. What's the name of it? No name yet. It's just something I play when I'm thinking about you. <laughs> Call it Hip Rogers Blues. Or maybe uh, Trouble in A-flat? <laughs> That's almost the title. Title of what? Nothing. It just sounded familiar. Where's your friend Mitchell? Haven't seen him around recently. He's no friend of mine. I wish he'd stop making noises like a spot artist. A spot artist? A cop, detective. Always asking questions. Like, uh, what does Mitchell do for a living? Yeah. That's all he put it down Translation, it's no good, forget it. You see, I'm learning. And learn this. Don't go around asking questions about Mitch. It's... What's the matter? I thought I heard the door open. Oh, you're frightened. What is it here? Take off, Judy. I'll see you later. But... but... Don't you dig me, honey? Cut out, out. Got work to do. Sure, Hip. I'll go now. Hello, Mitch. How long have you been here? Not long, but long enough. Depends on why you're asking. Maybe I don't like the way you walk in here like you own the place. No, Hip. You own it, but I own you, and don't you ever forget it. How can I? Yeah, that's better. A few days ago, you were crawling to me on your hands and knees, begging me to keep you from falling apart, begging me to give you... All right, what do you want? Some straight answers to some important questions. Lay it on to me. How do you know about this Judy Gregg? Why? What do I have to know about her? I said I wanted some straight answers. You rented the apartment upstairs to her. You've got eyes for her. What do you know about her? She's not sharp, but she's George. I've rather got eyes for her. That's nice. She's always poking that peanut nose of hers into things. I know. I heard her working on you when I came in. She's dangerous. Judy? <laughs> You're flipping, man. Am I? Let's find out. I don't dig you, Mitch. Well, she's out now. We're going up and search her apartment. But we can't do that. Why not? You're the landlord. You got a pass key. Come on. Mitch, if you ask me, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Now get that key while you can still walk. Right? All right, Mitch. Yes, Miss Pennington. Your wife is here, Mr. North. Oh, have her come right in, Miss Pennington. <laughs> well, you're in a gay mood, darling. Mm-hmm. And why shouldn't I be? Look. Hey, the plane ticket. Uh huh. Oh, golly, it's Jerry. It's the nicest possible present you could give me. And you know what? What? Our reservations are for that new plane American Airlines that's flying nonstop coast to coast. We leave Idlewild at 1 p.m. and we're in Los Angeles at 5.55 in the evening. Isn't that wonderful? Great. Honestly, darling, I'm so excited. I... Oh, Jerry, it's almost 4.30. Couldn't you leave now and we can... Oh, Pam, I can't possibly knock off now. With Ray Gordon out of town, I have more work than I... Yes? Excuse me, Mr. North. What is it, Miss Pennington? There's a man outside, an elderly gentleman who... Who what? Well, he's... 
He's acting so, so strangely. Well, strangely. In what way, Miss Pennington? He absolutely refuses to leave until he sees you. Until you tell him what you've done with... With his daughter. What? His daughter? That's what he says. Well, well, well. Pam, what does he mean, what have I done with his daughter? I don't know. I haven't done anything with anyone's daughter. Are you sure, darling? Pam, please. What's what's the man's name, Miss Pennington? Greg. Greg. Greg? Think hard, darling. No, Pam, stop it. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you, you look so wonderfully guilty. Now, listen. <gasps> there, no, I... You can't come in here. I told you that. That's all right, Miss Pennington. You may go. Yes, sir. Mr. North, I'm Joseph Gregg, Judith's father. How do you do, Mr. Gregg? This is my wife. How do, ma'am? How do you do? I... Maybe we'd better talk alone, Mr. North. I don't think so, Mr. Gregg. I have no secrets from my wife. Oh, is that so? Well, I put it to you straight. Where's my daughter, Judy? You'll have to put it even straighter, Mr. Gregg. To the best of my knowledge, I've never even heard of your daughter. That's your story? That's the truth. Now, what is all this? She's disappeared. I can't find her... You've got to tell me where she is. You've got her. Now, calm down. I know you're upset, but what makes you think I know where to find her? Well, this, these letters I got from her, read what it says. Read it right there. Don't worry about me, Daddy. Mr. North is the kindest, handsomest, most wonderful man what? in the world, and he's promised to take care of me until he publishes my book. Well, and that's only one of the times she mentions you. You want to read some more? No, thanks. It's... <laughs> just can't understand it. it. It doesn't make sense. Have you been writing to her, Mr. Gray? Yes, twice a week since she left home. But care of the North Publishing Company was the only address I had, and all my letters came back marked unknown at address. Something's happened to Judy. Must have. She wouldn't... Now take it easy, Mr. Gray. There must be some explanation for this. Maybe Ray Gordon, my story editor, has met your daughter. He'll be back in town tomorrow, and I'll see what he has to say about it. We'll help you all we can, Mr. Gregg. Uh, have you been to the police? No, I came here straight from the train. Well, the Bureau of Missing Persons is a very efficient outfit. We could check with them. And we have a friend named Bill Wigan who's on the force. With Bill behind it, we'll find your daughter in no time. You, you're both mighty kind. I'm real sorry about all the fuss I stirred up. Don't forget it. Oh, I won't forget it, Mr. North. When I get back home, I'm going to tell all the folks that there's some mighty good people in New York. New York's like any other town, Mr. Gregg, only it's bigger. There's some mighty bad people here, too. Let's cut out of here, Mitch. We haven't found anything. Judy could be coming back any time now. Come on over here and give me a hand with this drawer. It's locked. You're not going to break it open? Shut up and lean on this. <laughs> Says it. Now, let's see. Uh, yeah, down here, underneath this other... Yeah, look at this. It's a book, a notebook, so what? Well, read it. Go ahead. Here, right where I'm pointing. I don't dig this stuff. Why would she write all this down? For the police, you fool. She's got enough in here to put us both away. That's all, the man. I won't buy it. That's just what you might have to do, Hip. You might have to buy all of it. You mean she's doing this for the loot? If that's what she's after, she can bleed us dry. She's got us pegged, Hip. But the stuff in here is just a mess of words. Special talk she picked up here in around the club. Is it? <laughs> You're a soft touch. I tell you, she probably doesn't even dig half this stuff herself. All right, let's go along with that for a minute. Let's say that the stuff in here doesn't make any sense to her. I'd bet on it. You'd bet what? Your skin and mine, too? Even if she doesn't know what she's got, there's plenty around who wouldn't need a diagram to figure it out. I don't see what... Read it! I'm supplying the stuff. You've got to push it for me. The Sapphire Club is our number one store. It's all there in the book. Go ahead, read it. What are you going to do? I'm going to wait here. When she comes in, I'm going to... There she is now. Get over there by the door. Jack. Shut up and move. Come in, Miss Gregg. What are you doing here? What do you want? Look, Jack, let's... Stay out of this, Hip. What is it, Hip? What does he want? It's about this notebook, Judy. That's mine. Give it to me. You'll get it, all right. How much were you figuring on asking for this stuff? Uh, what do you care? Come on. No! You're hurting my arm. Let her talk, Mitch. Tell him, Judy. You gotta tell him. Notes for my novel. Oh, that's a new one. Well, it's the truth. I'm rewriting the book, and I, I need this for background material. Who's printing it for you, the police department? I don't know what you're talking about. 
I'm hoping the North Publishing Company will take it. Is that solid, Judy? You're not just jiving? Why should I lie about it? She's leveling with us, Mitch. Let her go. You must be out of your mind. I'm telling you to let her go. Get it straight. You're not telling me anything. How long do you think you'd last without me? Take it easy, Mitch. You need me like you need the air you breathe. Now step aside. Hip, stop him. Judy! Judy, baby! No! Don't be! What's that? Uh, the phone's ringing. I answer the phone. Oh, no. Oh, pitch dark. Where's that light? There. Hello. Jerry, this is Bill. Oh, holy smoke, Bill. It's five o'clock in the morning. I know, and I'm sorry, but it's about Judith Gregg, the girl you phoned me about yesterday. You found her? Yeah, we found her. Oh, fast work, Bill. That's very good. Not so good, Jerry. She's dead. What? Suicide, according to the preliminary report. She'd been living in a small apartment directly above the Sapphire Club on 52nd Street, and that's where they found her. Well, how did she... How did it happen? The gas jets were wide open. She was lying on the kitchen floor. Must have been lying there for some time. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, but the toughest part is still to come, and I'll leave it for you and Pam, if I may. <clears throat> well, what is it, Bill? I'd like you to break the news to the girl's father and then bring him over to the apartment. I'll meet you there. All right. All right, as soon as possible. Check. What is it, Jerry? What's the matter? Mr. Gregg. Oh, that poor guy. Is... is this the place? Yes. Your daughter's apartment was upstairs, Mr. Gregg. If you don't mind, we'll go in through the nightclub. Anything you say, Lieutenant. Rogers. Huh? Oh. Back again, Lieutenant. Uh, Rogers, this is Mr. Gregg, Judy Gregg's father. Hello, Mr. Rogers. Hi. Rogers owns the building. Judy rented from him. He, uh, he discovered your daughter's, your daughter's body. That's right. And this is Mr. and Mrs. North. North? Your name is North? That's right. You, uh, publish books? Yes. And Judy was... Was what, Rogers? Nothing. Nothing. Forget the piano for a minute, Rogers. Rogers. Okay. You started to say something about Miss Gregg. Judy. She, uh, told me she was working at a book. You didn't tell me this before. You didn't ask me. Well, let me ask you this. Have you any idea why she might have committed suicide? Well, a chick alone in the big city. No friends, maybe no loot. Could be, she says. That's case. I'm going to put it down. I'm not sure I understand you, Mr. Rogers. But if you really believe that my daughter was the type who could have taken her own life, then you just didn't know, Judy. I knew her, Mr. Gregg. That chick was... She was the greatest. Mr. Rogers, my daughter was murdered. Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Gregg. Mr. Rogers, I'd like to have your pass key. We're going upstairs. The key? It's right here. Thanks. All right, let's go. It's going, Hip. Lay off me, Mitch. Why didn't you open up and tell him the whole story while you were at it? Maybe I should have. Now, let me alone. Don't you ever even think that way, Hip. You were there, and if I go, you go too. But I tried to stop you, and I couldn't. We're in this mess because you don't know how to keep your mouth shut. You just sit tight where in the clear. If you don't, you're not going to like what happens to you, and that's a promise. I'd know my Judy lived here even if if I hadn't been told. She's made it kind of a little home. Judy is... Well, she was good at that sort of thing. Just take it easy, Mr. Gregg. We won't be here too long. Oh, don't you fret about me, Mrs. North. I'm all right. I'll go see what Bill's doing. All right, Jerry. Find anything, Bill? No, not yet. Oh, uh... See if there's anything in that hat box, will you, Jerry? Okay. No, no 
nothing but a couple of silly-looking hats. Uh, are you looking for anything in particular, Bill? Yeah. What? Oh, it's just a hunch. I'll tell you if I find it. Incidentally, I've ordered a full investigation and a complete medical report as soon as possible. Now, yeah, that ought to satisfy Mr. Gregg. Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, let's see what's in here. Well, lingerie, blouses, stockings, and... And what? This. What? A hypodermic and a small quantity of white powder. Dope? Dope. Oh, brother. Uh, look, Jerry... Let's don't let Mr. Gregg see this, huh? I understand. But is this what you were looking for? Let's say it was a possibility. Come on. All right, Mr. Gregg. Uh, we're leaving now. I'm... I'm going to stay here a while longer, if you don't mind, Lieutenant. I, uh... I don't think it's the wisest thing for you to do, Mr. Gregg. Why don't you come home with me? You can have some coffee and relax and even take a little nap. Oh, thank you, Mrs. North. You're very kind, but... I feel close to Judy here, and I'd really prefer to stay alone for a little while. I really think it'd be better for you if you if we took you back to our apartment. I guess I know what you're all thinking, but I wish you'd put it out of your minds. My daughter was murdered, and I intend to live long enough to see the murderer pay for that terrible thing that he did. Until then, I'm I'm not going to do anything foolish. <laughs> Yes, Miss Pennington. Mr. Gordon just came in, Mr. North. Oh, good. Ask him to come into my office right away, please. Yes, sir. Well, well maybe we'll find out a little more about Judy Gregg. You don't mind if I stay, do you, Jerry? No, of course not, but I think you'd be better off at home getting some rest. Oh, I'm all right. Hi, Jerry. Hello, Ray. Come on in. Hello, Ray. Hello, Pam. Have a good trip? So, so. I have all the figures in my briefcase. Uh, later, Ray. Uh, there's another thing that comes first. Did you know a girl named Judith Gregg? Judith Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. She submitted a manuscript entitled Murder in A-flat. I remember her very well. How is it that I never met her? Oh, you are busy at the time. Her book didn't strike me as having sufficient possibilities to interest you. It was her first attempt, and it was... Well, I thought it was rather amateurish. Mm. Yeah, what was it all about? It was a murder mystery. The plot revolved around a narcotics ring that was operating among what they call... Bop musicians and fans of bop music, if you're familiar with the word. Well, you haven't lost me yet. Go on. Well, that's about it. Gee, she was a persistent kid. I made some comment about her obvious lack of familiarity with the background she'd used. <laughs> she called me only last week. Do you know what she said? What? Well, she said she was gathering material that would turn her book into a sensational expose and make me eat a large portion of humble pie. You'll forgive me <laughs> if I don't seem overly amused. Huh? Oh, what's the matter? Is there something wrong? Plenty. Miss Pennington. Yes, sir. Get Lieutenant Wigand of Homicide for me. Yes, sir. Homicide? What is it, Jerry? What's the matter? Judith Gregg is dead. Dead? Suicide. Good Lord. Oh, it's Jerry. It looks like Miss Gregg was doing some pretty dangerous research for that book of hers. Well, that's putting it mildly. It also begins to look like Judy's father may... Yes? I have Lieutenant Wigand for you. Right. Hello, Bill. Look, I think I've picked up some information about Judy Gregg that you should have. My story editor, Ray Gordon, just told me that... What's that? When? Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, we'll be waiting for you downstairs in front of my building. Oh, what is it, Jerry? What's happened? Well, Bill just got a complete report from the medical examiner. Judy Gregg was slugged and given a stiff dose of chloroform. She didn't commit suicide. She was murdered. <laughs> Who is it? It's me, Mr. Gregg. Hip right. Oh, just a minute. You... You here alone? Yes. I thought so. Look, I, I'd like to... like to talk to you. Oh, well, sit down. Uh, no, thanks. I'm too jumpy to sit still. Well, is something the matter, Mr. Rogers? Matter? No, nothing's the matter. Well, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? Nothing special. I, I was downstairs in the club below, and I was thinking about Judy can't get her out of my mind. I know. Uh, I was just sitting here kind of remembering things about her. Still hard for me to realize that she's... That I won't... Stop ever... it. What? Don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. What's the matter, Mr. Rogers? Nothing. I just got the jumps with that's all. What are you afraid of? I... Too many things. Look, I'm no good, Mr. Rogers. I'm rotten. Clear down to the core. But you got to listen to me. Judy was... Well, she was the most. I told you that. That the cops are messing around. They may come up with something about her. That looks pretty bad. What? Never mind, never mind. Just listen to me. There'll be a lot of jive. Don't you believe it? 
Judy was a good, clean kid. She never did a thing to be ashamed of. I know that. You don't know anything. You don't know what the cops might say about Judy. But don't you believe... What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Rogers? Nothing except... Nothing. Mr. Rogers. What? Do you believe that Judy killed herself? Well? No. I know she did. Then she was murdered. Yeah. And you know who killed her? I'll take it from here. Mitchell! Mitchell, how did you... The back... Who are you? Sit down. Pop. Who are you? The name's Mitchell. Jack Mitchell. Are you the man who... Yeah, I killed you, kid. You... Then your friend here helped me make it look like suicide. That's a lie. I didn't help him. I tried to stop him. What do you think you're doing, Pop? I'm going to call the police. That's a lie. Operator! Jack! Skip it, operator. Jack! Jack, you killed him! No. And I'm not going to. You are. Me? Yeah, the old man's going to take a suicide dive out that window, hip. And you're the guy who's going to start him on his way. You heard me? He's going out this window. Drag him over here. No. Bring him over here. I'm not going to do it. Why, you little punk. I'm through with you, Mitchell. I'm through. I mean it. How many times have I heard that before? This time, I mean it. Sure, sure. You mean it every time. But every time, you come crawling back to me because you can't live without me. I can't. Like I told you this morning, I'm the air you breathe. I'm the blood in your veins. And pretty soon, you'll be screaming for me to help you. No. Pick up the old man and carry him over to the window. I'm hit. not going to do it. No. And you can't make me do we'll it. We'll see. Not even with that gun. I'm going to call an ambulance. Get him to a hospital. Stay right where you are, Hip. Get out of my way. I want you to call Hip. Are you heard me? Get out of the way. Look at you, crazy fool. If you take one more step, I'll blow a hole right through you. I said get out of my way. Roger's place is in the next block, Jerry. Right. Uh, look, and when we get there, I want you and Pam to go upstairs and get Mr. Gregg while I find Roger's and ask some questions. Okay. What's your theory about that hypodermic needle and dope you found in Judy Gregg's room? I think the stuff was planted there, but the medical report shows that Judy Gregg wasn't a drug addict. Now, here we are. Okay, let's go. You think this man here, Rogers, killed Miss Gregg, don't you, Bill? I think that Rogers knows a lot that he hasn't told me. That's why I think... Hey, what? Where'd that come from? Jerry, Bill, look! Oh. Look down the window ledge! Rogers! Fighting with someone! Rogers! Rogers, look out! Oh. Oh. Golly, Jerry, I'm glad that man Rogers is going to be all right. Especially. Mr. Gregg says he saved his life. But Rogers was lucky he wasn't killed along with Jack Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Happy? In heaven. Well, not quite, but you're 15,000 feet closer to it than you were an hour ago. Yes, isn't it a beautiful big plane? Yeah. I was reading the other day that they'll have jet airliners that, that'll fly from New York to Los Angeles in three hours. Three hours? Three hours. And because of the time difference, you'll arrive on the West Coast at the same time you left the East. You'll leave at 7 in the morning and arrive at 7. One breakfast in New York and another breakfast in Los Angeles. Well, let me tell you something, Jerry North. I'm never going to fly in one of those planes. Hmm? Well, why not? One breakfast in New York and another in Los Angeles. Why, I, I wouldn't think of traveling that fast. Oh, but darling, those planes will be just as large and comfortable and safe as the one we're on now. Well, of course it will be. Well, then what's worrying you? Oh, for heaven's sake, Jerry, I couldn't possibly eat two breakfasts. <laughs> Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
though it hath no tongue, murder will out. <laughs> Rainier Brewing Company, Brewers of Rainier Beer and Ale, presents Murder Will Out. Starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke, Chief of Homicide, with Eddie Marr as Detective Nolan, in another challenging story written and directed by Lou X. Lansworth. The mystery of the swindled songwriter. On the second floor of a drab downtown office building was located the American Institute of Music Composers. Despite its impressive name, this establishment was not an institute. It was a bunco racket operated by song sharks. Their victims were unsuspecting amateur songwriters lured by the promise of fame and riches. On the morning of Saturday, April the 20th, 1946, a burly young man entered the institute's outer office. Hiya, miss. Well, here I am again. <laughs> I guess you remember me, all right, huh? Oh, why, yes, I... I, I... Bailey, Bill Bailey. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Bailey. <laughs> uh, Mr. Morse said he'd have my song published today. Oh, I'll tell Mr. Morse you're here. Yeah. Oh, thanks, miss. Hello, lady. How do you do? Do you mind if I sit down here? Uh, please. Are you a songwriter? Yeah. Face one, you're off to press today. And between you and I, lady, I sure am a lucky guy. Indeed. Yeah. Love song. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Today's Shirley's birthday. Shirley? Yeah, that's my girl. I'm going to give Shirley this song I've been. Birthday present. No, oh, how beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. But believe me, lady, I sure had to work. I don't mean writing the words. That comes natural to me. I mean getting the dog to pay Mr. Moore for composing the music and pay, pay him to, to publish the song. Uh, I've come to see Mr. Moss about some words uh, I wrote. No. <laughs> well, congratulations, Miss... Uh, uh... Uh, uh, Mrs. Swope. Mrs. Henry Swope. Well, Mrs. Swope, it's a pleasure to have met a fellow songwriter. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I'm not a songwriter uh, yet. Uh, no? I-, I hope Mr. Moss thinks I have enough talent to let me join the... Uh, Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, how much does he charge? Well, he... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey, Mr. Moss will see you now. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks. Well, excuse me, Mrs. Uh, Swope, and uh, good luck. Uh, thank you. Hiya, Mr. Moss. Mr. Bailey, let me shake yeah. your hand. You have genius. True genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you could call it that. Oh, the lyrics you wrote. Such yeah. words inspired me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. It, uh, here, yeah. here, the piano. Yeah. I want you to hear the song even before I show you the printed copies. Uh, uh, listen. Yeah. Your hands are soft like baby skin. Your lips are just like berries. Oh, the way I love you is a sin. And I think you're the berries. We ought to get hitched like a trot to a trailer. I'll stay in like you was my jailer. My pearl of the deep blue sea. If you say yes to me, I'll be a happy deep. Well... You like it? Uh, don't sound a lot like Peggy O'Neill? Sister, <laughs> Peggy O'Neill has been close to the hearts for people for two generations. Well, you're in a hurry. I'll get your copies. That'll be fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? Printing charges. But I, I, I already paid fifty dollars. Twenty-five for music. Twenty-five for printing. You made a down payment. The full price is a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Hey, wait a minute. You said I could have professional copies for 25 bucks. Professional copies? Why, Mr. Bailey, you ordered the deluxe sheet music edition. Specially dedicated to Shirley Hobson. I have your signed order right here. Yeah, but but you said it was for free. For 50 bucks, I could dedicate my song to Shirley, and I ain't going to spend no more. No, 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 don't get excited. No, no, I've got to have my songs today. Today's Shirley's birthday. Mr. Moss, will you step in the other office, please? Excuse me, Mr. Bailey. Yeah, but I ain't going to leave till I get my songs, you hear? What is it, Ruth? Outside. Two men want to see you. I think they're the police. Plain clothes. Police? So starts the mystery of the swindled songwriters. Another Inspector Burke mystery drama brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company. After the mystery, four contestants chosen from our studio audience as amateur detectives will compete for prizes. 
They'll be asked a number of questions regarding police findings and who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. But first, here's Larry Keating. What's it going to be tonight, Larry? I was just thinking about that tune, Reed. It's been a long time since I've heard Peggy O'Neill. Well, you know how it is, Larry. The old favorites come and go. Mm, But not all the old favorites. Some come and stay. Sixty-eight years ago, and that's longer than most of us have been around, a favorite was born that's still going strong. And I mean Rainier beer. Yes, Rainier had to be good to please so many generations. And it is. What's more, today it's better than ever. The Rainier you buy today is made best to taste best. Yes, made best to taste best. Rainier's own hops, Rainier's own malt. But above all, the priceless ingredient of tradition. Sixty-eight years of brewing skill bring you the beer made best to taste best. Rainier for good cheer. Now back to our story, The Mystery of the Swindled Songwriters, starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke. In here, gentlemen. Just up in this other office. You're Dave Moss? Yes. Now, what can I do for you? We're police officers. I'm Inspector Burke. This is Detective Nolan. Oh, uh, how do you do? How are you? We're looking for a Hubert Collins. Know him? Hubert Collins. Hubert Collins. Yeah, Hubert Collins. You published three or four songs he wrote. Oh, uh, my my partner, Charlie Reed, might be able to help you. Yeah, where is he? Oh, he's out right now. Mr. Reed takes care of all financial matters. I take care of the artistic side of the business. Uh Uh-huh. Well, have you any idea where we might find Hubert Collins? I know. uh, Oh, is something wrong? Yes. Last night, an unsuccessful attempt was made to rob the store where Collins works. And the description we have fits this Hubert Collins. The person attempting this robbery was surprised by a special patrolman. There was some gunplay. The patrolman's condition is serious. Oh, how terrible. Oh, young Collins had such talent. Uh, look through your records, your files. Any information you and your partner can give us, no matter how small, phone headquarters. Where you been, Charlie? I came in while they were here. Ruth tipped me off. I waited till they were gone. That Hubert Collins. He's in trouble. So what? So he might make trouble for us. Drag us into it. How? Oh, we're operating within the law. Who's that? Some sucker told him to wait in my office. Get rid of him, Joe. No, 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 no. Not yet. He's good for another 50. Listen, I ain't got all day. I want well, my song. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey. Why, this is my partner, Mr. Reed. We were just discussing your talent. Yes, yes. Uh, Dave tells me you're a genius. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. But I want my songs now. No, Mr. Bailey, I already explained to you, you, you owe $50. Are you dirty, rotten crook? I already paid $50. No, 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 just Stalin. a minute. You... Don't sell any rough stuff, Bailey. No I'll rough stuff. take the joint apart if I don't get my songs. Let me go. Let me go. Do I get my songs? Songs, or do I must you up? Let me do it. Shove your little nose down to your ankles. Don't hit me. Don't hey, hit me. Bailey, let go. Let go of him, you hear? Huh? Don't make a move. No, 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 wait. That, that gun. Don't, don't, don't use that gun. Get out of this office. O- okay. But I'll have you arrested pulling a gun. No, no, you won't. We'll have you arrested. Yes, we know the law. You threatened my partner's life. We'll swear out a warrant. That side door goes down the hall. Use it. Okay. Okay. But but I'll be back sooner than you think. And come back with $50, or we'll sue you. We'll attach your salary. You? You? you, Yeah. yeah. Wait. Did he get his songs? I don't know. Come on. We'll look. In my office. Now, his songs are all here. My desk drawer. All 12 copies. Okay, put them back. <laughs> if the sucker wants them, he'll be around. Yes, he'll cool off. He'll show up with the other 50. What's all the commotion? Oh, some chump was in here. Must have had to shout to cover up. What is it? That old lady sitting out there, Mrs. Swope. What about her? She wants to join the Institute. And she's got all her savings with her. Five hundred dollars cash. Well, 
Well, well, sit down, sit down, please, Mrs. Swope. Thank you. You're a songwriter. No, 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 no. Don't tell me you aren't. I recognize talent when I see it. Well, I I don't know if I am or not, Mr. Moss. I've, I've written some words for a song. Here, here they are. Oh, thank you. I, I want you to tell me if they're any good. Oh, I'll be brutally frank, Mrs. Swope. You, uh, you will tell me the worst. Oh, you can count on me. Now, let's see. <clears throat> We weathered in the springtime like the birds and bees. Oh, Mrs. Swope. Brian, oh. what is it? Beautiful, beautiful, Mrs. Swope. Genius, pure genius, that opening line. It inspires me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. Here, here, sit down by the piano. I don't want to lose the mood. Listen, Mrs. Swope, listen. <laughs> We wedded in the springtime Like the birds and bees The bleeding hearts were bleeding The love bark was on the tree Then the angels took you I saw the song I wrote For my dear dead husband Name Henry Swope in memory of Henry Swope. Oh, Mrs. Swope. Pardon me while I have an emotion. Uh, what is it? Is something wrong or are you ill? Oh, I'm overcome. Dear Mrs. Swope, the beauty, the poetry, the sheer magnitude. I wrote that in memory of my dear departed husband. Mrs. Swope, you're a genius. I demand you become a member of the Institute. I won't take no for an answer. Really? We'll make your song as famous as the end of a perfect day. We'll print thousands of copies. I'll even make a recording with my own voice now. Well, uh, how much will all this cost, uh, Mr. Moss? Mrs. Swope... Such talent as yours should be given to the world. I insist you become a senior member. What, what does that mean? We will publish every song you write. You will be famous, wealthy, from the royalties you receive. Well, uh, uh, how much will it cost? Only $500, Mr. Swope. You owe it to yourself. To the memory of your dear departed husband, Henry Swope. <laughs> Another cup of coffee, Ruth? No. This might be it, baby. What we've been waiting for. A light, Charlie. Still want to go through with it? Takes money. I'll get the money. How? Simple, baby, simple. Let Dave take the 500 away from the old lady. Then we take the 500 away from Dave. Why not? Cops were nosing around. Sure. Cops start asking questions. Get wise to the racket. This is our chance, baby. We'll skip out. Let Dave hold the bag. What time is it? Uh, a little after two. I uh, I told Dave we'd meet him at five, the office. What do we do till five? Go to a movie, relax, enjoy ourselves. Let Dave do the dirty work. <laughs> <laughs> Hubert Collins. What are you doing here? Listen, Mr. Moss. Hubert, you sap. The cops were here this morning. You've got to help me, Mr. Moss. I've got to get out of town. Look, it's almost half past two. There's a bus leaving at three o'clock back east. You're out of your mind. Cops will spot every bus depot in town. I've got to take the chance. I can only get some money. Get back east. I can... No, no, no. No dice. Listen, Mr. Moss. I've spent over 500 bucks with you. All I'm asking is a loan of 50 bucks. Give me a break. I haven't got any money. Okay. I tried to pull a job last night. Know why? I'm not interested. So I could get more dough. You little fool. I didn't tell you to pull a stick up. You told me if I got more dough, you'd promote my songs. I'd be riding high, hit the big town. Get out. Not until you let me have some money, Mr. Moss. And if the cops pick me up, I'll drag you in. I'll tell them why I did it. To pay you. <laughs> Hello? Police headquarters? 
This is Dave Moss, Institute of Music Composers. Yes, yes. Some officers were here this morning looking for Hubert Collins. Robbery last night. Yes, that's right. Collins just left here, not five minutes ago. He's headed for the Central Bus Depot. Blackmailed me out of $50. Said he'd tell a lot of lies about me if I didn't... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, all right, all right. Send some men right down. You can pick them up. This way, officers. In this office. You two discovered the body? Oh, yes, we... We called the police. Yes. Ruth and I came back from a movie a few minutes before five. We entered my partner's office All right, and... uh, you two stay in this outer office. Right. Close the door, Nolan. Okay, Chief. Well, looks like a cyclone hit this office. Yes. Let's take a look at the body. Why, it's that fellow we were talking to this morning, Chief, Dave Morse. Hmm. Looks like two bullets did it. Both, both bullets struck in the vicinity of the heart. Yeah. Desk drawers open. Looks like the place was thoroughly searched. Uh-huh. Robbery might be the motive. Uh, what if this was an inside job, Chief, made to look like robbery? Might be. Well, we let the medical examiner, the fingerprint men, go to work. Have a detailed search the officers thoroughly. Come on. Where to? Talk to the victim's partner and that girl. Check on every person known to have entered this office today. Come in, Nolan. Well, we got all the people lined up, Chief, holding them separate. Good. Uh, I had a talk with the girl, Ruth, and that uh, Charlie Reed. Oh? Got their story. What about the reports? Anything new come through? No trace of the murder weapon yet. Ballistics identifies the two death slugs as having been fired from a 32 Smith & Wesson. Uh-huh. Medical examiner definitely establishes Dave Moss met his death sometime between 4 and 4 and 15 p.m. Well, uh, right now, as far as we know, there was only two persons know Dave Moss's death. Yes, the girl, Ruth, and the victim's partner, Charlie Reed. What do you think about our plan? You think it might work? I can't tell. The shock impact uh, might be a complete surprise to our suspects. Uh, we'll watch their faces carefully. Well, I got the record player rigged up in Lieutenant Williams' office and that record we found in Morse's office. When we're ready, uh, I'll press the buzzer, signal the lieutenant. He'll phone me, and then we'll listen to the record on the intercom. Good. That way everybody in the room can hear. Well, let's go to work, Nolan. Bring in our people. <laughs> All right, all right, everyone. Sit down, please. Mr. Swope here, Mr. Reed. Oh, Chief, this is Miss Shirley. Uh, Shirley Hobson. And my girlfriend, Shirley. She come with me. Protect my interest. Yeah, here, officer. These songs Mr. Moss printed for Bill, all 12 copies. We want our money back. Yeah, or we make trouble. Mr. Bailey and me want to swear out a warrant and have Mr. Moss arrested. Arrested? Well, I don't understand. Mr. Moss is a dear, kind man. He's a philanthropist. Well, I don't know what that means, lady, but if you ask me, he's a dirty, rotten crook. That Bill's beautiful words to Peggy O'Neill. It's a dirty jip. Why, when Bill gave me those songs for my birthday, I could have cried. And then when I heard Mr. Moss charge $50 for that tune, I knew he was a crook. That's right, Inspector. Moss was a crook. He stole my money. He and his partners, Charlie Reed and that girl. What do you we don't mean? know what you're talking about. Just a minute, all of you. Hello? Lieutenant Williams, Inspector. All set. Who? Well, hello, Mr. Moss. Moss! Quiet, quiet, both of you. Can't you see the inspector's talking? Why, uh, some friends of yours are in my office, Mr. Moss. Uh, you what? Compose the greatest song of your career. Well, we'd all like to hear it. Go ahead and sing it, Mr. Moss. We went it in the springtime Like the birds and bees the bleeding hearts were bleeding. The love bark was on a tree. Why, that's my song he's singing. He's not singing that song. This is some trick. Yes, why are you doing this? We thought Mr. Moss might tell us who shot and killed him. Why, uh, Mr. Moss, what about it, Hubert? Why, I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But last time I saw Mr. Moss, he was alive. He loaned me 50 bucks. The police picked you up shortly after four this afternoon. Yeah, but I was miles away. I didn't go to the bus depot like I told Moss. When did you last see Moss alive? Uh, about half past two, when he loaned me the money. Yeah, and the last time I seen Mr. Moss was this morning when him and his partner pulled a gun in No, the... no, wait. We can prove where we were. Yes, we were in a movie until almost five o'clock. Oh, dear. What will happen to my beautiful song? We don't know about your song, Mrs. Swope, but uh, we'll return your $500. 
450 was found on Mr. Reed's person, and Hubert Collins had the other 50. I already explained to you, Inspector, I had nothing to do with killing Moss. No, when we saw Dave Moss on the floor, Charlie looked in the drawer in the cash box. The $450 was there. I took it. We were partners. Here you are, Mrs. Swope. Your $500. And we're holding one of you for the murder of Dave Moss. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the testimony of the suspects. You know all the facts and clues in tonight's mystery. Did you find the one clue that reveals the killer? In a minute, Larry Keating will question our four amateur detectives who were chosen from the studio audience about tonight's police finding. But first, have you ever heard this at your house? Gee, Mabel, I hope that isn't more company. We've got a house full now. Well, chances are it is more company. That's the way things happen. So why not be ready for them? The economical way is to keep a good supply of Rainier Ale on hand. It's the West favorite, bound to please whoever's at the door. It's convenient to serve, too. Just uncap a few cold bottles, and your refreshment problem is solved. Rainier Ale, the West's favorite, economical and convenient to serve. I'll remember that. Yes, and remember Rainier is made best to taste best. It's Rainier for quality, for flavor, for good cheer. And now here's Larry Keating, ready to question our four amateur detectives regarding the evidence furnished by Inspector Burke. Our amateur detectives tonight are Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood, California, Mrs. Molly Malone from Springfield, Missouri, Mr. Keith Williams of St. Louis, Missouri, and Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California. Before we get underway, I'd like to point out the rules of tonight's crime quiz. To each contestant who finds the murderer and the correct clue, Rainier Brewing Company will pay a $50 savings bond. If our amateur detectives find the murderer but do not have the correct clue, they receive a $25 savings bond. And here's something else. To each contestant solving tonight's mystery, Rainier also awards a special gold detective certificate, suitably framed. The winners of this award rate the honor of joining the ranks of expert amateur detectives. And now, Inspector Burke has given me the basic evidence in tonight's mystery. Each contestant will be asked several questions. For answering correctly, Rainier Brewing Company will pay $5 in saving stamps. Now... Let's review this evidence. First of all, here is Mr. Irwin Hershon. Is that the correct pronunciation, Mr. Hershon? That's correct. All right, fine. Here is your question. The victim, Dave Moss, was shot and killed. At approximately what time did the medical examiner establish his death? Between uh, 3 and 4 o'clock. 2 and 4, I think. Between 2 and 4? No, it couldn't have been 2 and 4. It was... Take your time. Between about 2.30 and... Well, three and four o'clock. Well, I'm sorry, old man, if you had said between four and four fifteen, you would have had it right on the nose. Better luck next time, and let's talk to Mrs. Molly Malone now. Mrs. Malone, the Ballistics Bureau identified the two slugs that caused the victim's death. What caliber were these two bullets? Thirty-two you know? Smith and Wesson. Thirty-two. I see you are consulting all the data you have there. Very good. That's the way. Give this thorough. I knew the time he was killed. You did? Great. Well, I'm sorry, but we asked that to the young man. But now here. <laughs> All right, you know so Maybe much, I won't Mrs. Maybe I'll know Mo- the next one. I'll bet you will. Uh, do you know what make the gun was? Smith and Wesson. Oh, how easy! Well, oh, I'm sorry we can only give you five dollars for all this information. Five dollars in saving stamps, but you'll be back again and get some more money. We hope. Now here is Mr. Keith Williams. Mr. Williams, you're quite a big boy. How tall are you? A six feet three and a half. Six three and a half, and you are from St. Louis, eh? That's correct. And I see you're with the amphibious forces in the Navy, right? That's right. Here's your question. The receptionist Ruth found out Mrs. Swope carried her savings with her. How much money did Mrs. Swope have? Five hundred dollars. That's a lot of coconuts, isn't it? That's certainly. Good. You get five dollars for giving us the correct answer, Mr. Williams. Now, Mrs. Rita Hatton, if you please. Shortly after 4 p.m., Hubert Collins was picked up by the police. How much money did Hubert have in his possession? Fifty. Do you know where he got said fifty? From Mark. From Moss, he, he sort of borrowed it in a... Rather blackmailed the money from Dave Moss, didn't he? Yeah. But you get $5 in saving stamps from Rainier with our very hearty congratulations, Miss Hatton. Now here is uh, Irvin Horshawn once more. The victim's body was found by Charlie Reed and the girl Ruth. At about what time did this happen? At... Uh... Quarter to five. A quarter to five, I would say, would be very close to it. A few minutes before 5 p.m. Uh, where did these two claim they were at the time of the killing? They were at a movie. And five dollars to you, sir, courtesy of Rainier. Very good. Mrs. Malone, once more. Mrs. Malone, I see you have the books at hand again here. <laughs> You're studying your Gladstone, I see. Here is your question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? 
Look it up. Take plenty of time. Don't. Just go ahead. That's on page four, I think, Mrs. Malone. What? This is, uh, we're, we're discussing Dave Moss. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw him alive? That might be in the footnotes there. Do you want to look for it? Have we got it? At 2.30, uh, he pulled the gun on Collins. He pulled the gun on Collins at 2.30. But now we want to know when, uh, when Bailey's... That's the wrong page. Yeah, wrong page. Now the question, I re... may I repeat the question? <laughs> Granted. Here is the question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? Is your secretary here? We could no. send... No. <laughs> Mrs. Malone has it all written down on but the back of all envelopes, everything. laundry bills, everything. No. What? Haven't got it? Would you care to make a, a stab in the dark? When did... Now, think this over. You, you heard the story. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? I guess I don't know that one. Well, I'm sorry. It was in the morning when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him out of the office at the point of a gun. Too bad. Now, Keith Williams again. When Bill Bailey was tossed out of the Song Shark's office, did he have the printed copies of his song with him? No. Where were these songs? They're in the desk drawer. You're right. Five dollars more to you, young man. Now, Miss Rita Hatton, please. A nice hand for Mr. Williams. Good. Miss Hatton, Mrs. Hatton, rather. Bailey's girlfriend, Shirley Hobson, came to police headquarters with him. Shirley brought Bill's birthday present with her. What was this present? His song. Oh, what a present. Five dollars to you, young lady. Very good. And now let's see what this evidence revealed to you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Inspector Burke to check the papers each amateur detective received at the start of tonight's mystery on which to write who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. Thank you, Larry. Well, I've checked the deductions of each of our amateur detectives and I find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, Ma uh, Missouri said that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she's wrong. Uh, Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California said uh, also that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she is wrong. However, Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri, and uh, Irwin P. Hershon of Hollywood, California, both said that Bill Bailey was the murderer, and they're absolutely correct, and both also gave the correct clue. Now let's see exactly what happened. We held Bill Bailey for the murder of the song shark, Dave Moss. According to Bailey's story, he claimed the last time he saw Dave Moss alive was on the morning of the murder, when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him to leave the office at the point of a gun. Now immediately after Bailey left the song shark's office, the two swindlers looked in Moss's desk and found the 12 printed copies of Bill's song. Yet later, when Bailey's girlfriend, uh, Shirley Hobson, appeared at police headquarters with Bailey, Shirley had all 12 copies of this song. Unwittingly, and in a state of righteous indignation, Shirley gave Bill away. Because only by returning to Moss's office at a time later than he claimed could Bill have obtained these songs. It was this obvious slip-up that trapped Bill Bailey. Shortly before 4 p.m., Bailey returned to the office, demanded his songs. When Moss refused, Bailey started taking the place apart looking for his songs. Moss threatened Bailey with the gun. In the struggle that followed, Moss was shot and killed. Hurriedly, uh, continuing his search, Bailey finally found his songs, left the office, taking the murder weapon with him. Bill Bailey pleaded self-defense. Hubert Collins was held for the attempted robbery of the store he worked in and wounding the patrolman. Charlie Reed and Ruth were arrested by the Bunko Squad. Their racket was exposed and smashed. Thank you, Inspector. And so tonight we find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, Missouri, has won $5 in saving stamps. Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, $10 in saving stamps. We have two first prize winners tonight, Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood and Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri. They each receive a $50, $50 in savings bond, won $5 in saving stamps, and Keith Williams, $10 in saving stamps. Congratulations. And each of the winners bring their awards a special gold detective certificate honoring our guest as expert amateur detective. And now, Inspector, what about next week's story? Next week's story, Larry, is about an innocent witness to one of the strangest cases on record. Threatened, terrified for his life, this person came to the police and revealed a fantastic plot. What this strange plot was will be told in the mystery of the startling secret. I'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Good night, Inspector. So we bring to a close another Inspector Burke mystery drama, starring William Gargan, and brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Brewers of Rainier Club Extra Pale Beer and Rainier Old Stock Ale. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Larry Keating saying good night for Rainier Brewing Company and inviting you to listen in again at the same time next week. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network 
one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. sign out in front of my office says, Pat Foghorn for hire. Oh, there are other ways to say it, but down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to put your best foot forward, especially if you want to trip up a friend. Down here, a friend is anybody who's been dead more than 10 years. And then it pays to watch out, because if you relax, somebody will come along and knock you on the back of your stomach. Works out all right, though. If I rent boats and do anything else, you can hide in the dark. It's about all you can ask, because along the Embarcadero, nothing's perfect except the heels. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. She was a lovely girl. The sort of person you'd expect to see in a choir loft about three hours after choir practice. Her hair was red. Her eyes were as cold as rigor mortis. And you knew the first time you met her that you'd been seeing her too often. Must have been about five o'clock in the afternoon. I was walking down toward Pier 19 when she pulled up alongside of me in a cream convertible. Can I give you a lift? You already have. Well, is that love or reflex action? What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Novak, but don't put on your tracksuit. It's a business matter. Well, in that case, you've got a name. I'm Con Regan. I went by your office a few minutes ago, but you were out. I'm in now. Go ahead. It won't take me long, Mr. Novak. Stay away from Rory Malone. Well, I'm doing all right so far. Who is he? He's important to me. I don't want to lose him, Mr. Novak, so please stay away. Go tell a girl. I don't even know the guy. You will. You're not lying now. He's a prize fighter, and someone's going to try and hurt him. Then you'd rather hurt him first. I'm willing to pay you to stay away from him. Suppose I'm going to see him a lot. Will you pay a lot? I'll give you $300. All right, Mr. Novak? You know, you're not smart, Angel. If you're pressing that hard, the other team's going to bid, too. The answer's no. I'm afraid that's up to you. But I'm warning you, don't do it. That's Please what... don't do it. Yeah, that's what Mother used to say. I'm still all right. Maybe Mother liked you better, Mr. Novak. See you later. Well, I watched her for a minute as she brushed her hair back and started the car. It was nice hair, and the dress helped, too. It was dark blue and had a V-neck, but the designer believed in big letters. She pulled away and gave me a look you could take on a safari. It was enough to tell me that she was as safe as a tap dancer on a floor full of dynamite caps. I walked up and turned in at Pier 19. When I reached the door of the office, I could see the old man sitting by the desk. He looked tired and a year older than the Bible. His hands were shaking and his skin was coarse in the color of an old razor strap. When I walked in, he glanced up at me and looked about as happy as a cocker spaniel with a stomach ache. Uh, I could talk to you, please, Mr. Novak. We'll try it once. Go ahead. I'm an old man. You want to argue or go on? Uh, I'm too old, so I must come to someone for help. Uh, my name is Hans Neumeyer. I would like you to watch someone for me. Someone like Rory Malone? Yeah. But you do not What know is what... this? Save Rory Malone week? What's he to you? I am his uh, manager. Oh, you don't ever hear of me because I'm old and uh, not a very good manager, I guess. After this fight, Rory find new manager, maybe. Yeah? What's, when's this fight? Uh, tonight. Oh, you, you don't know Rory. He's a good boy. He's a very good boy, Rory. Is. Yeah, well, good boys don't need watching. Has he got some bad coming out? Uh, something funny about this fight. He meets with bad people. And Rory is a good boy. Yeah, I just met one. How deep do they run? At the West is a fellow named Joe Slagle. He's a bad man, a gambler. 
Please, Mr. Novak, you just watch Rory tonight and see he's all right. Are you that rich? Oh, please, I don't have much money. Just uh, $300, maybe, what I got from the fight. Maybe 300 I don't know. I just got a little money. It's a tie, Pop. You win the toss. Uh, please, you, you don't help me. You win, you win, Pop. When do I look at him? Uh, tonight you come before the fight in the dressing room. I show you to Rory and you see he's all right. Yeah, about nine. Yeah, please, Mr. Novak. I, I thank you all my life. You watch Rory. I, I thank you all my life. Yeah, well, I'm getting short shift on that, but I suppose it's not your fault, Pop. See you at nine. <laughs> sorry for him when he turned and walked out of there. I could afford it. With 300 bucks, you can buy a lot of crying towels. At the door, he turned and smiled once before he shuffled out. He moved down the pier with a nervous, uncertain motion like a flower petal in a warm wind. When he disappeared, I took a cab and rode up to the press club. Oh, I found out a lot about Rory Malone, and most of it was good. He was a lightweight and... Hans Neumeyer had picked him up and brought him through the prelims up to main event stuff. He was fighting tonight against a Cleveland boy named George Zarek, and the betting was even. I ran into a Chronicle man whose wife divorced him and named a fight club as correspondent, and he said not to worry about Joe Slagle, that Rory Malone fought for purses, and that's all. He knew about the girl, Con Regan, but he didn't want to say much, just that she was a fast, five-gated horse trying for seven. Well, I had some dinner, and I went over to the arena about 8.30. When I walked into Roy Malone's dressing room, Hans Neumeyer wasn't anywhere around. I stood over in a corner and watched him get ready for the fight. There was enough liniment being thrown around to keep an old lady's home spry for years. The other handlers were in, watching him tape up Malone and put on the gloves. Most of the people cleared out then. Malone shadowboxed a minute before a second threw a robe around his shoulders and shoved him toward the door. As he passed, I fell in beside him, and we started walking under the arena. A few feet down, I bumped up against him. What? Sorry? About what, Hans Newmeyer? Who are you? Where's Newmeyer? What do you care? My name's Novak. I'm supposed to meet him here. Do you know where he is? No, he didn't show up. He's probably out drunk. Does he drink? No. Well, that's a funny answer. I don't know where he is. All I know is I need him tonight. I gotta get up to the ring. I'll go with you. Suit yourself. You gonna win tonight? You never know. Sometimes you do. Mister, you're either too smart or too dumb. What's the difference? You can't fight twice in one night. I want to talk to you, Rory. Not now, Kitty. After the fight. Please, Rory, talk to me now. Kitty, you're crazy. This guy's standing around. A lot of other people. What do you want to do? Put him on the radio? Where's Hans? He hasn't been around. Where is he, Rory? I don't know, Kitty. If I knew, I'd get him. There's something wrong, Rory. I've been watching, and I know there's something wrong about this fight. Yeah, yeah, there's only going to be one guy fighting if you don't let me Please, out. Please, Rory, don't brush me off like a dumb fly. I, I know there's something wrong. I don't want you to get into trouble. All right, Kitty. Oh, don't say all right when you know how I feel. Well, let's talk about you and Joe Slagle. Please, Rory. You don't know what it's like to see somebody in love go crazy. Your dough is safe, Kitty. <laughs> that doesn't count. You know that doesn't count, Rory. A little money I've saved doesn't count next to you. Oh, please, Rory, don't do anything wrong. I'd, I'd die. I'd, I'd die of terrible heartbreak. It hurt me all my life. Stop it, will you, Kitty? Now stop crying. Don't worry, I'll win. Just, just don't let anything happen, Rory. I won't. I'll see you after the fight. Coming, Novak? Yeah. You're real good with your women, Malone. After this fight, I want a match with you, Novak. I've met two of them, and they both have you and their dream books right on the fly leaf. I'll remember. Talk some more. I'll talk enough to tell you that you're being followed about 12 inches behind. That's right, Malone. Keep walking. Turn in the next door. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You better walk, Malone, unless you can outrun a bullet. You too, mister. I agreed an hour ago. All right. Open the door for him, Eddie. Okay. You stand over here. Now, Malone, take off your glove. I'm going to need it. You're going to be eating teeth. Take off your glove. Help him, Eddie. Yeah. That's it. Hold him on the other side, Steve. Put his hand on the table, Eddie. Now, give me the block. 
Yeah. You can cry, Malone. It's gonna hurt. Hold him up. Keep his hand out there, Eddie. Put the glove back on, Malone. It's too smashed up. It'll hold the pieces. Put it on. You better put it on, Malone. You're overmatched. That's it. Now, go on up there and look good. Yeah, why don't you loan him the gun and he'll win in two rounds? Look, mister, I don't know who you are, but I'm sick of your mouth. It's a big floor, so stretch out. two hours, they either moved me or the arena because I woke up in an alley down near the Golden Gate Theater. It was in back of a restaurant, and I was lying there trying to look good in a mixed green salad. My head was about the size of a diving bell, and my clothes were so rumpled and dirty, I looked like a leg man for the hobo news. I tried to get to my feet once, but it wasn't easy. It was like trying to push a basketball through a stovepipe. I think it was close to 11 when I got out to the street. I didn't even buy a paper to find out about the fight. I grabbed a cab and went up to my apartment to iron out my spine. It was a good idea, but the girl at the desk had a message from Hans Neumeyer. He was out at the California General Hospital, and he wanted to see me right away. When I got there, he was at the end of a ward on the third floor, but the duty nurse wouldn't let me by. Oh, she was a real pretty nurse, if you like pure mammal. Somebody buzzed, and when she oozed down the hall, I ducked into the ward and started looking for Hans Neumeyer. It was dark, and he was away down at the end behind a white screen. He looked tired, and his eyes were moist and soft, like a ripe fruit that's just been squeezed too hard. Uh, please, Mr. Novak, you come to see me. Yeah, just as soon as I got your message. Uh, you make mistake, Miss Hunts. Uh, I don't send message. Somebody wants to be your secretary. What happened to you? In my room. I just go to my room. Somebody is there. <laughs> I don't know. War is all right. I limped a little, mister. Your boy got his hand smashed. Uh, War is a good boy. He's got a good girl. Who's Kitty? Oh, she's go with War a long time. Save money to marry this. Wait a minute. Keep still. Something the matter? Yeah. Somebody coming. Down this way. Coming up behind that curtain. Maybe War comes to visit me. came to visit him didn't stay long. The old man leaned back in the bed and quit without any fanfare, like a long summer coming to an end. Well, I went out to get the nurse, and I found her down at the end of the hall giving an intern some greedy talk. She hadn't heard the shots, and they hadn't seen anybody come out of the ward. I told her as much as I could, and then she wheeled the old man into another room and called homicide. Well, that call to homicide didn't help, because from now on, things weren't going to improve. I was fighting a forest fire with a can of kerosene. About 20 minutes later, Inspector Hellman showed up. He was full of finesse and fury, and he came charging over about as graceful as a lame lobster. Hello, Novak. You're up late. I had company most of the time. Yeah? And did he bore you? Somebody got tired of him. It happened behind a screen down there in the ward. Who is he? guy by the name of Hans Neumeyer. He manages a fighter named Rory Malone. Yeah? The killing's mixed up with a fight fix. Not the Zarek fight. Yeah, that's right. They got to Rory Malone ten minutes before ring time. You got a thin story, Novak. Look, I got a fat one. And I got all the gambling going town on my side. The old man got it because Roy Malone was dumped in that fight. I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it, Hellman. They smashed him up. His right hand was as limp as an old piece of lettuce when he climbed into that ring. They should have smashed both hands. Huh? Because Roy Malone won by a knockout in the fifth round. Try another page, Novak. When Hellman told me Rory Malone won that fight, I might as well have handed him a feather. I stood there feeling like a guy peddling dope at his sister's wedding. How could Rory Malone have won that fight with a, without a hand grenade? When I saw the hand, it wasn't strong enough to flatten a piece of silk on an ivory table, and yet he won by a knockout in the fifth round. I pointed to one thing. Zarek had taken a dive. 
But why the double fix? Why had they smashed Rory's hand? Oh, it was a goofy pitch, like sending for a plumber to fix a hole in Boulder Dam. I didn't have time to wrestle around with it because Hellman had talk on his mind. You can't get a bookie in town to take bets on this one, Novak. No, not with you setting the odds. They were that way when I got here, so don't write up a clean bill of health. The guy's dead and nobody else is volunteering. Oh, you'd muff a confession anyway. Before you tumble, they'd have to cut it in stone across the front of City Hall. What were you doing with the old man? Helping him over the rough spots. Or taking him over the hurdle. He hired me to watch Roy Malone. They were stepping up the pace on his boy. For instance? For instance, Joe Slagle. Everybody says he had a stake in the fight. You don't throw a fight by winning in the fifth round. That's what the book says, but sometimes the book's wrong. You better look up Joe Slagle, and on the same trip, you can stop by and see a gal named Con Regan. Yeah? Why? She's Malone's new sparring partner, a tall redhead with lots of dry cells. Oh. She sounds nice. I'll talk to her. And Slagle, too. But I'm going to find out about you and Rory Malone first. I'm going to run down the stuff on this fight, and I'll find out where you fit in. Don't worry, Novak. I'll dig you out. You could take the jelly out of an omelet, Hellman. Look up the girl and Joe Slagle. They'll talk. Not about each other. There's some connection there. I'll give even money their friends. They ought to be. What? They were married a month ago in Las Vegas. Or don't you know about love? <laughs> Hellman stood there a moment and smiled like a guy who's just killed a landlord. And then he turned around and walked out. Well, I stayed until they wrapped up the old man. And after that, I went to the Chronicle office and pulled the clips on Joe Slagle. He'd been to three jails and gotten his masters at Alcatraz. And there were some pictures of him at the racetrack. He had a face any museum would buy and a forehead that was so low he must have had to look down to see his hairline. There was one other thing about him I noticed. He was the same guy who'd smashed Rory Malone's hand. I began to wonder about that friendship, but it was getting late and I had to work fast, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he's a smart guy, and until he decided a head on your beer is worth more than a head on your shoulders. I finally found him in a little joint down on Geary Street talking some woman into giving up all men under 50. Ah, Patsy! I've missed you in a rather trivial way. Yeah, all right, Jocko. I'm giving this woman a lecture on diminishing returns. Jocko, will you stop drinking long enough to listen? Patsy, you fail to understand my drinking. Actually, I hate whiskey, but I go on drinking as a sort of sop to providence. Yeah. Because everyone knows the guardian angels take care of small children and tipplers. And since I've passed the age where I look well in rompers, this is a very clever dodge to get a little outside help. Jocko, are you ever going to change? Patsy, don't. Don't you know what a burden change is to a man as old as I am? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's not the change we mind. It's the way it happens uh, by degrees. Never giving you a chance to remember anything else. So it's heartbreaking, Patrick. All right, all right. It's like visiting a half-forgotten neighborhood. It hasn't changed completely, just parts of it. A few old houses and some human remnants is still around. Enough to remind you of the change, but never enough to make you happy. It's that way with growing old. Will you listen? They don't allow you to grow old suddenly and leave. They insist on this policy of having you dribble off into eternity. It's undignified, Patsy, feeling like a bowl of old dishwater with the stopper pulled out. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Why didn't you say so? What's the matter? An old guy by the name of Hans Neumeyer is dead. Oh, bless him. Homicide's full of fever. They think I killed the old man. What did he do before he uh, stopped doing it? A fight manager. He hired me to watch his fighter, Rory Malone. He should have hired a team because somebody got to him in the hospital tonight. How do you fit in? Well, I was just passing through when the noise started. Uh, that was General Custer's problem. It's tied up with tonight's fight. Newmeyer was afraid of a gambler named Joe Slagle. He was around tonight and smashed Malone's hand before ring time. That's a hard way to lose. Yeah, well, it's a harder way to win. Malone won by a knockout in the fifth. Was he fighting his father? I'm not getting any place, Jocko, and I'm doing it in a hurry. It's a bad fit all the way around. They took two tries to get the old man, and if Slagle bought the fight, why'd he smash Malone's hand? Let's have a drink. Jocko, you've got to help me. Oh, it's the thirst that's confusing. I want you to get up to Roy Malone's place. You can find it in the book. Go through his stuff and try to pick up a lead, will you? Why don't you do it? I'm going to look up a girlfriend named Con Regan. She's married to Slagle, but she's trying to work Malone into the act. Oh, well, in that case, uh, I'd be in the way. Look, I'm in a spot, Jocko. Now get up to that apartment, will you? What if Malone walks in and finds me going through his stuff? Stop worrying. He almost killed a man with one broken hand. Suppose someone smashed the other one. <laughs> I 
had to do something quick because the kettle was on to boil. By the time Hellman got to him, Slagle would have an alibi, and my story about the smashed hand wouldn't prove a thing. Oh, I had to grope around and pretend like a guy on the second verse of the national anthem. I decided to tag by Slagle's place, and on the way, I bought a paper to read about the fight. Malone looked real bad for four rounds and then came out of the woods fast with a left hand in the fifth. It was about midnight when I got to Slagle's apartment and began to look more and more like it when Con Regan opened the door. Oh, I could see Rory's point. She was the sort of a woman you'd never give a second look because the first had paralyzed you. Her red hair looked brighter now and, well, legs like that are the reason silkworms are born. She smiled, and you knew if you never made Naples, you could die happy with her. But I guess she picked her friends. It's too late for the 300 now, Mr. Novak. I'm working free. Invite me in, huh? Sorry, darling. (laughs) You look lonely. Where's Slater? I agreed to marry him, not follow him. How about Malone? Somebody killed his manager. I'd like to help you, Mr. Novak, but I don't like you well enough. Well, you can make love later. Give me answers now. Where are you going? You're not welcome. I want to know what those bags are packed for. I don't trust the drawers. Now get out of here, Mr. Novak. Calm down and put the gun away. Get out of here. You came uninvited. I'll kill you the same way. Hello, Novak. You gonna lose an argument? Well, it looks that way. If she's yours, call her off, Malone. You're too tough, Con. Let him walk out. He's steamed in here full of questions. That's a bad way to answer. Relax. That's what your man Newmeyer's doing. Somebody killed him tonight. I know that, Novak. Your eyes aren't very red. I can't help it, Novak. All I can do is square his beef. Well, you can start with your girlfriend. She's leaving town, or did you buy the tickets? Let's you hurry, Con. If I want to leave, I can leave, Rory. I'll argue with you. You'll get the short end, Rory, because I'm leaving. Stay away from me. You're too close. Rory, stop it. Someday they'll match you even, Rory. Maybe it's a referee. I'll get it. Yup. You got a deep voice, Miss Regan. What's on your mind, Hellman? Joe Slagle right now. He cleaned up in tonight's fight. Not with a betting even. It wasn't after the first round. Word got out that Malone broke his hand. The betting changed. And Slagle covered every bet in the house. That's right. Well, the old man tumbled before it happened. That's what he was afraid of. And the shock killed him? Slagle did. You got a motive now, Hellman. You better look him up. We did. He's dead. He couldn't be dead. If he's not, the bullet holes are good fakes. See you soon, Novak. Well... I didn't talk to the girl and Rory because I knew they'd dummy up on me and I had nothing to go on. Oh, it was like trying to build a wall out of jelly consomme. Nothing added up now. Whose side was Rory on and where did that other girl, Kitty, fit in? My luck was on the black market tonight and I knew it. So I went by my place to check with Jocko. He was in the kitchen and he looked worried. Ah, Patsy, uh, you know, I was going to break open the thermometer until I found this bottle in the closet. All right, Chuck, what'd you find out? That it pays to know Joe Slagle. There's a $20,000 check in Malone's desk. Slagle signed it. He could afford it. Somebody killed him an hour ago. Where was Malone? I don't know, but that's not gratitude. Maybe he'll wire regrets. Hmm? You'd better get up there. All his stuff's packed for a long trip. Well, well. A couple of trunks and all his bags. Uh, Does that sound like a weekend party? I don't know, Jocko. He's kind of fancy. Maybe he likes a lot of laundry. Up to now, it was like trying to melt a pound of diamonds. But when the turn comes, everything happens in a hurry. And things began to fall faster than snow off a warm roof. If Jocka was right, it meant Rory and the girl fought, but they did a lot of clinching between rounds. Well, I got a hold of Hellman and brought him up to date, and then I started for Rory Malone's apartment. When I got there, Hellman was outside the door listening, as quiet as a washing machine full of pebbles. They must be in the back room. I can't hear a thing. You couldn't hear a rifle shot in a boxcar, Hellman. Let's get a better view, huh? Hello, Novak. Gonna miss your train, Malone. I don't believe you. It's a chance to bet, Mr. Novak. This is Inspector Hellman from Homicide. Well, you guessed wrong, Inspector. I'm covered for Joe Slagle. Novak here's alibi for Miss Regan. We can check. You're scraping bottom, mister. We can start with that $20,000 check from Joe Slagle. That's where you'll stop, too. That $20,000 covered a sale of my contract. The fight commission can beef, but that's all. You ready, come? I hope you are, too, because you're going downtown. Look, fella, you can make us miss a train, but we'll catch the next one. You're wishing now, Rory. Who's this? A fast friend with a slow burn. Hello, Kitty. Your boyfriend's gonna leave. Say goodbye. Please, Rory, you're crazy to go with her. She makes me that way, Kitty. I'm sorry. Rory, I've done too much for you. 
I've kept loving you all this time. You can't leave. You can't leave now. I don't want to be alone. Buy a dog, then. Oh, no, Rory. No, I won't let you go. You're too good with guns. Drop it. <laughs> you better take her, Helmut. She's anxious. Oh, please, Rory. I loved you too much for this. I loved you enough to kill somebody. You can't leave, Rory. You can't leave me to myself. When the guy comes, tell him where the baggage is. What'll become of you, Rory Malone? What'll become of you, Rory Malone, when you have to think about me? When you hear the sound of me in your head? Oh, you're brave, Rory. You're brave to leave me alone. Come on, Con. In a place like this, we're wasting you. Come back! Come back, Rory Malone! Come back long enough to watch them laugh at me! <laughs> watch them laugh at me for the fool I am! Oh, it's the great fool of the world I am! <laughs> It doesn't prove much, except the right kind of a heel can grind you into the dirt fast. Well, Hellman pieced most of the story together. Slagle and Malone planned the fight, and it went off without a hitch. Slagle bought off the other fighter so that Malone could win as soon as the bets had been covered. Hans Newmeyer had an idea, but he liked Rory too much to believe it. They found out he was coming to me, and Con Regan tried to scare me off. She looked too good to Rory, and the scheme started to grow. He lied to Slagle after the fight about Newmeyer, so Slagle went into the hospital and killed the old man. That left Slagle around to cloud things up, so Rory Malone told a phony story to his girlfriend, Kitty. She loved him enough to kill Slagle. There was no way to stick Rory Malone. He could never fight again with that hand. But he had a check for 20,000 bucks to start on. That's enough to keep love in the living room. Well... Hellman asked only one question. Why would a smart gambler like Slagle take a chance on giving Malone a check for 20,000 bucks? I guess Malone found out when he tried to cash that check because Joe Slagle was big-hearted but broke. American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the sixth of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Orlean. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Patey, Stephen Schnabel, Frank Lovejoy, William Bayef, and Ted DeCorsia. This program is being released to our service men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. listening reminder. Don't miss Gene Arthur and Robert Morley when they star in the compelling drama Yesterday's Magic on Theater Guild on the air tonight. This is ABC, the American... A startled corpse, a blue-eyed woman, and a cryptic message scrawled by a dying man with the pieces of a Chinese puzzle that wouldn't fit together until I found out what was deadly about the orange dog. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Orange Dog. By 
by six in the evening of a very slow day. I'd resigned myself to the business of no business. So I took my feet down from my desk, switched off the lights and started out the door for home with the prospect of a nice, quiet evening ahead of me. But I didn't make it. Even as far as the door. Oh. Hello, Philip Marlowe. Marlowe, my name is Shelley Martin. I'm at 8412 Los Feliz, a private residence. I want you to come out here right away. My sister is in a jam, a nasty one. Well, Miss Martin, as a matter of fact, I was just closing up for the night. Look, you. I need the services of a private detective right now this minute. And I'm prepared to pay for them. There are plenty of others in town. Are you coming or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, and thanks for the reminder. That's me you hear sprinting up your front walk. That's much better. And Marlo, bring your brains along. You're going to need them. And that was the end of my quiet evening. But I just couldn't resist those government engravings of Mr. Lincoln. So I drove down to Weston, turned off on Los Feliz, and found the number 8412. The yard was an overgrown tangle of perennial plants losing their battle with the weeds. <laughs> it was like a girl in a strapless evening gown with her hair up in curlers. However, I could see a light through the Venetian blinds and the doorbell worked with a resonant two-tone chime that caused the door to open just far enough to allow a pair of eyes so blue they were almost purple to peek out at me. Yes, what is it? I, uh, I'm delivering that private detective you ordered. Oh, Marlowe, come in. Thanks. Sit down, won't you? Thanks again. All right, what's the next move? It's about my kid sister. Mm -hmm. She's involved with a man named Lou Horner, a San Francisco broker. She's quite deeply involved, I'm afraid. Oh? You see, some very strange things are going on, Marlowe, and my sister is a naive kid caught right in the middle of them. Yeah, I see. What sort of strange things, Miss Martin? Shelley. Sweet. Well, to begin with, when I arrived from San Francisco today, my sister called me and asked me to meet her here in this house. When I got here, the lights were on, the radio was playing, and the front door was open. But the place was deserted. Whose house is it, Horner's? No, I think she said it belongs to a friend of his who's in Europe now. This Horner person uses it when he's in Los Angeles. Well, couldn't they have stepped out for a while? Mm -mm. You know, you don't look the type, Shelley, but maybe you're just panicky, huh? No, I'm not being panicky. All right, all right. Where's the nasty jam? Right behind the couch. Take a look. Okay. But you know, I... Oh, I see what you mean. Who is he, Shelley? How'd he get here? Maybe it's Horner. I don't know. I uh, tried to search him, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't have helped anyway. Whoever shot him cleaned him out. No wallet, no papers, nothing. I found this magazine lying under his hand. Look here. Mm -hmm. He must have written this just before he died. Where's that? Here. Oh, oh. It says, call Marion tonight about the orange dog, a foe. Orange dog, a foe. For what? That's why I called you, Phil. Marion is my sister. And whatever the orange dog of foe is, it must be awfully important. We've got to find out what it means, Phil, for Marion's sake. So far it means murder, honey, and that's for the cops. No. I... Well, all right, call them. But keep Marion's name out of it. A thing like this could destroy her. But look, maybe she pulled the trigger on our friend here. Maybe, you know? but I don't think so. She's a sweet kid, Phil. Give her a break. If I'm wrong, I swear I'll help you bring her in myself. Is that fair enough? Okay, Shelley, it's a deal. It makes just as much sense as the orange dog of foe, but no more. <laughs> After I checked as far as I could on my client and set her home, which was to the Villa 12 at the Wilshire Gardens Hotel, I ripped the general squeegee tire ad with a message scribbled across it out of the magazine, folded it up and stuck it in my pocket. Next, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide and told him where I'd found a body, probably named Lou Horner, leaving out all the details about Shelley, Marion, and the orange dog. Then I started out the door, but got back as the shadows slid across the walk. I caught a glimpse of a large, ugly head of long, dirty hair set on a small, ugly body that was moving fast. By the time I got out on the walk, long hair was already putting mileage on a green coupe with a broken taillight. It winked mockingly as it went out of sight. So I got in my car and headed for New Chinatown. It was the logical place to get some information regarding a Chinese dog. I saw a light filtering through a dingy window. 
illuminating the words James Tang, dealer in Oriental Curios. Inside the musty shop, a little man, dressed in a black kimono, drifted forward softly. Yes? I, uh, uh, think perhaps you can help me, huh? I am honored. To be able to help will bring fragrance of plum blossoms to my nostrils, carpet of rose petals to my humble floor, and thousand blessings upon my head. Oh, that's very pretty. Tell me, what is the dog of foe? The, the dog of foe? Why? Why this? This fantastic creature here is called the dog of foe. His fierce eyes and snarling mouth are to frighten away evil spirits from temples of Buddha. Why do you say called the dog of foe? Amateur collectors and auctioneers have named him that. It sounds exotic to cash customers. Actually, he is a lion. The lion of Korea. I see. Tang, would you happen to have an orange dog of foe? Very strange that you should ask that, my friend. Strange? Why? Reason number one. There is no authentic orange dog of foe. That's a good reason. Why not? Because to Buddhists, orange is color of sorrow. The piece you speak of could not possibly be authentic. What's reason number two? You are second person to inquire after this non-existent orange dog of hope within the last few minutes. Was it an ugly little man with long hair? Quite contrary. It was very pretty girl with short hair. Was her name Marion? She made point of not leaving her name. Now it proves something. However, my friend, old Chinese proverb loosely translated says, a little knowledge is the instrument of a fool. There were nine other curio shops in the neighborhood, so I started making the rounds for the non-existent orange dog of foe and a girl who was interested in one. From the first three shops, I got a fast horse laugh in the fact that the girl was still ahead of me. The next two netted an insult apiece and a total blank on the dame. And from the six called Saxons, a glossy, well-ordered place on West 7th Street, the only effect was a coldly curious raised eyebrow. The man in front of me, whom I took to be Mr. Saxon himself, was a gaunt, white Russian, with a high, naked head the color of warm paraffin. His slender fingers played nervously with each other as we talked. The orange dog of four. Yes, I have heard of such a piece, I think. It would be porcelain. Probably. This is your business. Who has it, Mr. Saxon? Can you tell me? No, no, I'm sorry. I believe I heard this orange dog mentioned just once somewhere down in the village. But I'm sure I could never remember who spoke of it or when. Oh, no idea of its value then, huh? Now that you mention it, I seem to remember the figure 20,000. You mean yen. How much in American money? I am speaking of American money. It would be an importation from China, you know. How could it be worth that much? It's not even authentic, Mr. Saxon. Authentic? <laughs> you seem to know a good deal more than I about this orange dog. Possibly one would have to see it to appreciate its value. Yeah. Tell me, has a girl been in here tonight looking for this orange dog? A girl? I know. Know anybody named Marion? Marion. Marion. No, there is no one in my acquaintance by that name. But why do you ask? Because Marion has quite an interest in the orange dog. I have a feeling they'd make a great team if we could get them together. I see. And what is your name, sir? It's not Fu Manchu, Mr. Saxon. Good night. Saxon's expression didn't change. I turned and walked out of the place, and then because with both of us using double talk, the conversation was bound to deteriorate. At least I had found out that the orange dog of foe existed and was going for a very high figure, especially for a phony. And it didn't take an abacus to figure out that Saxon knew more than he told me. Well, I started up the sidewalk for the next brick of brack emporium when I saw something parked on the side street which brought me to a halt. It was that green coupe with the broken tail light. I went over to it, found it empty, and stuck my head inside to check the registration card for Longhair's real name. Yeah, it was a very foolish move because Longhair at that very moment prodded my kidney with the muzzle of a thirty-eight. And neither he nor the gun had a sense of humor. All right, Mr. Wise Guy, come on, walk. You and me are going up the alley here. What's the matter? Don't you feel at home in the light? Shut up. I don't like you much anyway, so you better ease off with the smart science. Okay, this will do us far enough. Well, Mr. Wise Guy, did you find what you're looking for? 
You mean the orange dog, Shorty? The answer's no. The orange dog? So that's where the plates are. What plates? You're working for Horner. You don't know what plates. Look, chum, when you get your next haircut, have your brains dusted off. Nobody works for Horner anymore. Horner's dead. Dead? Since when? What's the surprise act for? You saw the body. You were sneaking around that house on Los Feliz. In fact, you might have killed Horner yourself. That body wasn't Horner. Why, Horner is three times the size of that guy on Los Feliz. He's bald. Also, he's so dumb he can't remember his own phone number. Oh, holy. I'm looking for Old Van Street where they sold those insurance. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I don't want to intrude. Hey, I'll blow your brains out. All right, now, come on, Mr. Wise Guy. Tell me what Horner's got on his mind. You know all right. I saw you taking orders from his girl. You mean Shelley Martin? Who else? Thought maybe you meant Marion. Marion? Who's Marion? Shelley Martin's sister. And don't let her worry you. Marion's got the orange dog eating out of her hand. I don't say. It ain't funny, mister. It's just peculiar. Because Shelley Martin don't have a sister, I know. So it seems like you're a very mixed up character. In fact, Mr. Wise Guy, you're so mixed up, you're no good to me at all. So get over there with the rest of that. No. <laughs> took my time getting up. A dirty, long-haired little man was gone. My head ached from the rap he'd given me with a pistol barrel. And I was disgusted with myself. Dry, dirty, disgusted like a drunk at sunrise because a nasty little jerk with an oversized head and a blue-eyed dynamo with auburn hair had me jumping through hoops like a trained ape. I stood in the alley and swore at myself until the futility of that routine dawned on me. Then I decided to go hunting. But I made one stop first at a telephone to at least get Ibarra off my conscience. Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, Lieutenant. I just found out that body on Los Feliz isn't Horner. I knew that an hour ago. Huh? The body isn't Horner, isn't Horner, is no broke. He's a counterfeiter, a big one. Oh. The dead man was a treasury agent named Slade who was closing in on Horner. So if you've got anything you haven't told, Phil, you better get it off your chest. At this point, it's a pleasure. A girl named Shelley Martin's calling the signals about now, and she can be found at Villa 12, Wilshire Gardens Hotel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hurry. You'll just about meet me there, Ibarra. Now, wait. Suppose you go alone and find out what you can first. That's a switch. I'll follow in half an hour. Let's not freeze her up, Marlo. Let's keep her talking, okay? Okay, Ibarra. That's easy for her. She's got a forked tongue. Only this time it's going to wag strictly on the straight and narrow. I guarantee it. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, it's no mystery that hunger and cold confront many families abroad this winter. CARE will help feed and clothe these needy people. CARE, the safe, sure, non-profit way to send supplies to Europe and Asia. A check to CARE for $10 will send a 21.5-pound, 41,000-calorie food package or a baby food package or a layette or a baby blanket package or material for clothing. CARE guarantees delivery. You get a signed receipt that your package has reached its destination. Write your check tonight. Mail it first thing in the morning to CARE, C-A-R-E, 50 Broad Street, New York City. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Orange Dog. pointed my car toward the Wilshire Gardens and a beautiful liar named Shelley Martin. I was sure of two things. The plates that long hair had wise cracked about just before he piled me into a row of garbage cans were the engraved kind that counterfeiters used to make money the easy way. And second, both long hair and Lou Horner were racing for the plates as well as the orange dog, which could be one and the same thing. But 20 minutes later, as I pulled up near Villa 12, which was strips of yellow light and raised voices drifting out of half-open Venetian blinds, I forgot about the gentleman involved and concentrated on a lady who didn't have a sister called Marion. I went around to the back of the villa where I found the service door unlocked and the kitchen beyond dark. And when I entered and quietly moved to a spot near the living room where I could see Shelley snapping at a pompous, excitable man with a red face, I figured that a little eavesdropping might pay off. I'm here in Los Angeles. Is there anything wrong with that, Mr. Horner? Yes, everything. 
Why, I wouldn't even have known you were in town if I hadn't gone back to the place in Los Feliz where I saw you and some man having a delightful little chit-chat over the body of that tea man. Treasury man? Yes. Is that who he was? A meddlesome fool I caught snooping through my papers. Then... Then you killed him, Lou. Of course I killed him. I had to. Now stop asking questions and get out of here. Because this is business, not pleasure, Shelley. And that leaves no room for you. Or Marion. What do you know about Marion? Not enough. But what I do know, I don't like. Look, Lou. Who is Marion and what does she mean to you? Marion means money to me, Shelley. Nothing more. So just leave me alone here so that I can make a call according to schedule. A call about... Lou. What's the matter, Shelley? Behind you, Lou. They're in the garden. Lou! <laughs> crashed through a closed window didn't stop until it got to Horner, who grabbed at his chest and dropped to the floor even before the glass quit flying. And by the time I got outside to where the shot had come from, I found nothing but a little wind. I got back to Shelley and the blood of a tweet on the carpet. Horner was already dead. Marlowe. Marlowe, the man out there was Henry Peel. Peel? Something in long hair and dirty clothes? Yes, I met him in Horner's office once. Lou said he was a broker from Chicago. Come on, both Peel and Horner are counterfeiters. What? Lou, a counterfeit. That's right. Never mind the carefully arched eyebrows, honey. They mean nothing. But, Marlowe, I swear I never knew that Horner was anything but a broker. A broker maltreating poor sister Marion? You're a liar, Shelley. About Marion, yes. I haven't even got a sister. But from there on out, I'm telling the truth, Phil. Then tell some more and fast. All right, here it is. Lou Horner's been my boyfriend. And, uh, checkbook? For the past year and a half. But about a month ago, he suddenly stopped being very attentive. And I couldn't figure out why. So you decided to keep your big blue eyes wide open, huh? Exactly. And it paid off. Because I found out that, one, he had taken better than $20,000 out of his bank account. Two, that he was coming down here to Los Angeles. And three, that an item named Marion might be beating your time. Yes. And that part of it upset me plenty. Until ten minutes ago. But then I found out that Horner here was a murderer, and that, Marlowe, I don't buy. Three cheers for the all-American girl. Oh, skip it, Marlowe. I'll live my way. You live yours. Don't worry, honey. Nobody wants to change places with you. Hey. Hey, look. Why does Horner wear a little rubber band on his little finger, do you know? Oh, he had a bad memory. He used every kind of gadget in the books to keep himself from forgetting things, especially numbers. Well, yeah. so, for example, that rubber band might mean oh, 10 o'clock. How do you figure like five and five. The fingers on each hand reading from left to right. He used things like that. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hmm? Horner was going to make a call to Marion just now, and the message the tea man left was... Call Marion tonight about... About the orange dog of foe. Shelly, baby, where's your phone? Fast. Come on, it's quarter after ten already. Well, it's out there in the hall, Marlowe. Oh. Well, what are you talking about? A line, honey, a line on your ex-sister, Marion. This is Mr. Saxon. Oh. Uh, Lou Horner, Mr. Saxon. I, I, I know I'm some 15 minutes late with this call, but I'd still like to see you about the orange dog of Poe. Certainly, Mr. Horner. The orange dog is here, waiting for you. Good. I'll be right over. Marlowe, who is Mr. Saxon? A man very close to a lot of trouble, Shelley. Now, look, you wait right here for the law, and in particular, one Lieutenant Ibarra. Tell him nothing but the truth about Horner and what he meant to you in dollars and cents, and you may be all right. But where are you going, Marlowe? To a curio shop on West 7th Street to see, among other things, the orange dog of foal. You are the Mr. Horner who called? Yeah, yeah. Also the one who was here this afternoon, you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry I didn't call you at 10, Mr. Saxon, according to schedule. I hope it hasn't inconvenienced you. No, that's quite all right, Mr. Horner. One moment, sir. Ah. What's the matter? Is anything wrong tonight? You seem on edge, Mr. Saxon. I am. So please, Mr. Horner, don't make a single stupid move. What? Wait a minute. Why the gun, Mr. Saxon? I promise not to bite the orange dog. You won't even touch the orange dog. Now, who are you? Now, we've been all through that. I'm Horner, Saxon. Lou Horner of San Francisco. No, you're not. Horner would have had no reason to wander around curio shops as you did this afternoon, asking any and everybody about the orange dog. Now, once more, who are you? And where is the real Lou Horner? All right, we'll take him in that order. I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe, and Lou Horner's a corpse. Hmm. 
But also, I'm a good friend of yours, Saxon, because I'm going to give you a little bit of advice for free. Call it quits, Buster. You're licked. What are you talking about, Marlowe? A tea for treasury man named Slade. Before he died, Saxony talked. I see. And believe me, he said enough to put you away till orange dogs were as popular as lifesavers. And what do you say, Saxon? Do we play it smart? Very well, Marlowe. We will play it smart. My kind of smart. Now, turn around and walk through that curtain there. I want to show you something. Orange dog, maybe? Yes. The orange dog of four. I want you to see it for yourself. Before you die. Saxon said die like it already happened. And after he relieved me of the comforting bulge of the gun in my pocket and marched me to a large, windowless room that was a little darker than the lining of an eight ball, he told me to stand very still. Then he turned on a single lamp that rested on a large, scarred table. And next to it, an ordinary shipping crate and cushioned on all sides by white wrapping paper, I finally saw the orange dog of foe. It was a porcelain lion, pop-eyed and majestic in a crazy way. And also it was colored orange, bright and clear. But now that I'd seen it, I knew that the next move was Saxon's. And I turned to face him. It was then that I noticed the black curtain behind him moved slightly. And long hair quietly stepped into the room. This Mr. Saxon did not know about. Well, Marlowe, now that you have seen the orange dog for your first and last time... What do you think of it? He thinks it's just jet dirty, mister. Now drop your gun before I blow the top of your head off. Go on, drop it. It's uh, better. Now sit down there and stay put. You, Marlo, get across the room. Okay. Thanks for showing up, Peel, before Saxon here ran out of small jokes. Don't kid yourself, Marlo. I didn't just show up. I've been right behind you all the way. That's how I work. So what do you want, Peel? A couple of very fine and gray plates that I've been after for six months now. Plates which could be in the orange dog of full? No place else but... Or do you think that maybe the late Mr. Horner wanted as an ornament? But that's all it is. There are no plates in the orange dog. It is only a collector's item. Now, you're a liar, Saxon. And I know the best way to prove that. Marlowe, pick that thing up and toss it against the wall. No, no, don't. I tell you, there's nothing in it. Toss it, Marlowe. Go on. Okay, Peel. Ah. Now, we'll see who's right about the plates being here. Nothing, huh, Peel? No. Nothing. All right, Saxon, get up. Now, I want to know what a plate saw, so I'm going to count to three. That's how long you have to live if you don't tell me. No, no. Peel, believe me, there are no plates. One. Two. Hold it, Peel. Wait. Here are the plates here. In this jewel box. Look, I... right here, under your nose. Is he... Is he out, Marlowe? Yeah, he's out, all right. He took the light with him, too. Is there, is there another lamp in here? No, no, there isn't. Nor is there another gun. Why, you stinking little... Wait a minute, those sirens, Saxon, they're heading this way. Police? Yeah, the police. Looks like sooner or later everybody gets together in the back room at Saxon's, But huh? not everybody stays here, so I'll take this wrapping paper and leave now. Wrapping paper? The stuff that was around the orange dog? Yes, a sample of the best grade of counterfeiting paper made, Marlowe. And that's what Horner was supposed to buy, not plates, those he got a month ago. Still makes you a crook, Saxon, and one will never get past the front door. Oh, no, we'll see about that. Marlowe! Keep shooting, Saxon, in the dark. You got four shots left. You filthy maggot! Only one now, Saxon. That's number six. You're through, Saxon. By the time he and his boys, plus a half a dozen very anxious team men got into the room, Saxon was already coming apart at the seams. And after a half hour of steady questioning, he split wide open and led us all to a basement hideout where the team men went wild over a few thousand sheets of A1 counterfeiting paper. But an hour later, after Peel, who admitted murdering Lou Horner, and Saxon, who was ready for the nearest straitjacket, were both in a the lockup, there was still the problem of the glib lass from San Francisco. But finally, when Shelley, Lieutenant Ibar, and I stood under the green light of the globe in front of police headquarters, I knew that the girl who technically was only guilty of withholding information from the police was not going to spend any time in the pokey. Because, after all, I was more or less guilty of the same thing. Besides, Lieutenant Ibarra was still interested in the others. 
Well, Marlo, it looks like the whole business actually boils down to a single transaction between Clay Saxon, who had the counterfeiting paper, and Lou Horner, who was supposed to buy it. That's right, Ibarra. But Horner, who must have made his contact with Saxon via some middleman in San Francisco, only had a telephone number and the password, the orange dog of Poe, to work on here in L.A. But how'd you get hold of that number, Phil? From the message the T-man left before he died. You mean you actually called someone named Mary? No, honey. I just dialed Marion. M-A, Madison. R-I-O-N, 7466. Madison, 7466. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> Another one of Horner's screwy memory tricks. Like the rubber band on his tenth finger. Hey, that's pretty good, Phil. Oh, it's an old gimmick, really. I read it in a dozen detective stories. What do you know? And maybe I ought to read some of those. <laughs> well, good night, fella. Look for you tomorrow. Good night, Lieutenant. Now, Shelley, do I, uh, do I show you the way home? No, Marla. Aren't you hungry or thirsty or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess I am at that. Well, I know just the place for us, darling. Oh? It's a cute little place right smack in the middle of Chinatown. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Francis Robinson, Edgar Barrier, Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, and Ed Begley. Lieutenant Detective Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I was hired to find a blackmailer, and I did. But first I found a badly beaten Adonis, a Jezebel with an accent, and a man who had been an easy mark for murder. Mr. Markham. Well, come in, Miss Henderson. What is it? Mr. Markham, they're here again in the outer office. Irma and Sarah Wakefield. Oh, no. Yes, sir. And they insist on seeing the district attorney. They say it's very important. All right, Miss Henderson. Ask them to come in. Yes, sir. Would you come in, please? Yes, of course. Of course we'll come in, Miss. Thank you. Go right in, Sarah. Indeed I will. Indeed I will. Please sit down, ladies. Indeed we will, indeed we will. Mr. Markham, we've done it again. Sarah and I have done it again. Have you? Yes. yes. Hmm. And what is it you've done this time? Listen to her murmur. What have we done this time, young man? Don't you read the papers? Yes, I believe I do. Well, didn't you read this morning of the gangster Eddie Rogers who was shot and killed last night? Didn't you read that, young man? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. The police have arrested the killer. Did you hear that, Irma? <laughs> the police have arrested the killer. <laughs> How could they have arrested the killer, Mr. Markham, when Sarah and I killed that gangster? <laughs> Didn't we, Sarah? Indeed we did. Indeed we did. just had to call you up and tell you about it, Vance. The two old girls were so serious about thinking they murdered Eddie Rogers, I had a hard time convincing them that they didn't. I'm not sure I understand <laughs> about them, Markham. It's simply this. They're both spinsters, have no family we know about, and they sit at home and worry about all the evil men in the world. Then they pick out some public enemy and concentrate on his death. In the event that a gang bullet ends that gangster's career, 
they come in to confess. <laughs> and they've done it twice before, is that it? Yes, they're perfectly serious, Vance. <laughs> they apologize for the potency of their concentration and insist they're quite willing to accept the consequences. <laughs> Apparently, a district attorney meets almost as many eccentric characters as a private investigator. <laughs> <laughs> well, Markham, uh, what about dinner tonight? Busy? No, why don't you call me later? I will. Bye. Bye. You and the DA are pretty friendly, aren't you, Vance? Who are you? How did you get into my office? The name's Sterling, Joe Sterling, and I walked in. Any more questions? What do you want? Why didn't you knock? You don't seem to understand, Vance. I said I was Joe Sterling. I don't knock on doors. When I want to get in somewhere, I walk in. How'd you like to get thrown out? Now, wait a minute, Vance. Take it easy. I'm not looking for any trouble. Besides, you don't throw clients out of your office, do you? You're not my client. I'm just about to be. Vance, I run the 19th Ward. I'm what the papers call a political leader. Well? I control a lot of votes, and I'm pretty important in my territory. Mm. I still say, well? I want to hire you to shadow somebody. Who? There are a lot of people I have an interest in, Vance. A lot of people who have an interest in me, good and bad. Fellows like my political opponent, Frank Allen, for instance... The man I want you to shadow happens to be the most important interest I have. I want you to shadow me. Let me see now. In the fifth ward, we're a cinch. We figure to cup the sixth and we'll hold our own in the seventh. That doesn't sound too bad. If you do your part in the other districts, I'm liable to be elected at that. Well, that's just the point. Joe Sterling controls the other districts, and I mean controls. People in those districts would vote for a cow if he was in back of the cow. Ah, it's no good, Edgar. Not the way it stands, I'll grant you that, but we can do something about Sterling, can't we? Any suggestions? Oh, I'm not supposed to think. I'm just the candidate for office, Frank. You're the one with the brains, so I've been told. Don't get sarcastic, kid. Look, you've got everything in your favor. Public sentiment, for one thing. The orphan boy who studied at night and worked 18 hours every day to get through law school. You're young, good-looking. That's not enough. And so you keep telling me you're my campaign manager. Don't you have anything to suggest so we can lick Joe Sterling and win his district? The only thing I can tell you is his people will vote the way he wants them to as long as he's alive. Well, why can't something be done about that? in the newspapers, Sarah. Indeed there is, indeed there is, Irma. Everybody's writing about the election. Yes, of course, the election. How does it look? Does the paper say? Indeed it does, yes. Indeed it does. It says the candidate being presented by Mr. Joel Sterling seems to have the election in... The paper says, in the bag. That isn't good, is it? No. This Mr. Joe Sterling is a very evil man. Indeed he is. Indeed he is. Don't you think we ought to do something about him? I'll gladly do anything. What did you have in mind? Don't you think you and I ought to concentrate on his dying? The way we did about that gangster, Eddie Rogers, and the other bad men? Yes, don't you think we ought to do the same about Mr. Joe Sterling? Indeed I do, Irma. Indeed I do. And at once. No, 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 no. I don't think so. No, I'm going down to check my districts. I'll keep in touch with you here at the office. Very good, Mr. Sterling. Now, the opposition may have something cooking. You keep your ear to the ground, see that I'm kept posted, Danny. Yes, sir. Now I'll call you in an hour. You better leave this door open so you can see your way down the stairs, Mr. Sterling. The light in the hall is out. Good enough. And don't leave until I call here. Hey, you're right. About what, sir? About it being dark. <laughs> Just make out the stairs. Seems to me. What? There's somebody at the bottom of these stairs on the street. Danny, come here. Oh. Mr. Sterling! Philo Vance speaking. Mark Vance. We've got a murder. Well, that shouldn't be hard for you to solve. 
The Wakefield sisters ought to be in to confess the crime as soon as they read about it in the papers. Please, Vance, this is serious. The dead man was rather important politically. He was Joe Sterling. Oh. Well, Markham, he thought he was going to be killed. And he thought he knew who was going to kill him. Who was that? Frank Allen. Oh, campaign manager for Edgar Lessing, eh? Yes. Allen and Sterling were pretty bitter rivals. After what you've told me, I think I'd better have Sergeant Heath pick him up. I wish you'd wait an hour or so, Markham. I want to see him first. All right, we'll wait an hour. Good. Uh, what were the circumstances of the murder? Well, Sterling was found at the bottom of the steps leading to the street from his office. He'd been shot, presumably as he was about to go out the street door. Mm -hmm. The only witness, and he isn't a witness exactly, was Danny Moore, who worked for Sterling. What about him? Well, he was in Sterling's office when he heard the shots. We're holding him incommunicado. I don't want any newspapermen to get to him before we question him thoroughly. But the papers do have the story. Yes, headquarters reporters arrived with the homicide police. There'll be an addition on the street very soon, carrying all the details we know. I see. All right, Markham, thanks for calling and telling me about it. I'm going to see Frank Allen right now. He's a campaign manager. I guarantee I'll find out if he elected Joe Sterling dead. <laughs> If you want to come with me to see that nice Mr. Markham, Sarah, please hurry. Indeed, I do want to come with you, Irma. Indeed, I do. But I'll only be a moment finishing this collar I'm crocheting. Pretty, isn't it? Look. Hmm. You're very handy, Sarah. Very <laughs> handy. <laughs> Thank you, Irma. And I do want to come with you, so just wait one minute and we'll go down to Mr. Markham's office and tell him that we killed Mr. Joe Stern. Hmm. I'll wait for you. Are you going to wear your new collar? Indeed I am, indeed I am. I don't want Mr. Markham to see me in this same old dress without something new on. Look, leave me alone, Edgar. I gotta think. All right, Frank. There doesn't seem to be anything to think about. Oh, you belong in politics, all right. You don't know from nothing. How do we know how the public's gonna take Joe Sterling's death? Isn't it a little late for you to be thinking about that? Wait a minute, you little dope. You're not trying Get to say... Get your it. hands off me. Take them off. I'll keep that mouth of yours shut, then. Remember this. Remember it now, and remember it when you're elected, if you're elected. You don't do any talking, you don't do any thinking, you just follow orders. You understand that? I know what you're trying to say, if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Now, with Joe Sterling out of the way, I think you're a cinch. But you just go through the motions when you get elected. I'll do the thinking. You think you're smart enough to remember that? Yes. Uh, now that you're smart enough to remember that, see if you're smart enough to forget about how important Joe Sterling's removal is to us. Or what I want... Who could that be? How do I know? Go and see. Supposing it's the police. Supposing you had a head on your shoulders. Or is that supposing too much? Never mind. You stay here. I'll go to the door. Stupid characters I get hooked up with. Why don't I turn honest and learn to steal? Yes? Hello. My name is Vance. Philo Vance. Thanks for asking me in. Oh, so you're Vance, huh? I've often wondered what you looked like. And now you know. Aren't you lucky? What do you want here, Vance? I want to see Frank Allen. Well, you've seen him. That's me. Aren't you lucky? Who's the other individual? Well, wait a minute. I recognize him from those campaign posters all over the city. He's Edgar Lessing, isn't he? I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Vance. Look, Edgar, you don't have to shake hands with everybody. Just the people I tell you to. Now, go on back over there and sit down. Hmm. When you throw him a bone, does he bark? Okay, Vance, what's up? What are you doing here? I came to find out one little fact, Alan. Mm, what's that? I want to know whether you killed Joe Sterling. <laughs> Is that all you want to know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's why you didn't have to come all the way over here for that. You could have phoned. I'd have been delighted to confess to you over the phone. Cute, aren't you, Alan? That isn't what my mirror tells me. Well, listen to what I tell you. I tell you that Joe Sterling believed you'd try to kill him. And I tell you something else. I tell you that if you did, I'll find a way of proving it. Look, Vance, I don't stand inside a doorway and shoot guys as they're about to walk out in the street. What is your type of murder? I better teach you a lesson. I just better. That's all. A lesson like this. Is that all you have to teach me? You'd better learn something yourself. Oh. 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 Come on, get up. You're not hurt too badly. Get up, Alan. Okay. Okay, big man. Now what? Now I repeat what I told you before. That if you killed Sterling, I'll find a way of proving it. And if you do, they'll pin a rose on you, won't they, Vance? Well, I got news for you. If you try, you aren't going to get a rose. You're going to get a whole bouquet laid right on your chest. This is 
District Attorney Markham. The Sterling murder case opened with the finding of the body of Joe Sterling, political boss. Vance's principal suspect is Frank Allen, who is sponsoring a candidate in opposition to Sterling's. We have no clues to the murder as yet, but we'll have a confession in a moment. A confession from two old ladies, the Wakefield sisters, who feel it their duty to confess to every major crime that's been committed in this city in the last three months. They're in my office now, and I've got to... So you see, Mr. Markham, we're quite ready to be sent up the river. Indeed we are, aren't we, Irma? Such a vulgar expression. We're ready to pay the penalty for killing Mr. Sterling, Mr. Markham. That's what Sarah means. Uh, so I gathered. Well, ladies, I appreciate what you're doing, but... Uh, let me ask you a question. By all means. You wouldn't consciously try to make my job more difficult, would you? Why, Mr. Markham? That's what I thought. You see, I have a lot of problems concerned with Mr. Sterling's murder, and only one of them is finding the murderer. I don't think I understand. Legal technicalities. Habeas corpus, ipso facto, we pluribus unum. Very involved legal procedure. Do you understand? Oh, indeed we do. Good. My sister and I didn't mean to bother you. We just wanted you to know that we wished Mr. Sterling dead, and poof, he was dead. Yes, poof. You was dead. Poof, he was dead. Well, thank you very much. And now, ladies, if you'll excuse me, I have a lot of work to do. Of course. If so, fact two and all, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you understand, don't you? Indeed we do. Indeed we do. Come, Irma. Goodbye, Mr. Markham. You let us know when you want us, won't you? Indeed I will. Indeed I... I mean, of course. Good day, ladies. Good day. Good day. You know, Irma, I don't think Mr. Markham can be bothered with confessed murderers today. Okay, Edgar, now look. In a few minutes, we'll have this truck right in the middle of our district. There'll be a big crowd there. We've got a couple of singers entertaining them for an hour. And I'm going to make a speech over the loudspeaker. Okay, Frank, I know. I know the speech I'm going to make. I'll have them in the palm of my hand. You better. There's just a slight chance they'll resent Joe Sterling's death. Now, this was his district, too, you know. Mm, how well, I know. If it weren't, and if you could control it instead of him, he'd be alive today. Look, I don't want to hear talk like that, especially from you. You're running for office because I put you up. I'll break you in a minute if you get out of line. Don't ever forget that. All right, all right. Hey, is that the mom I got to talk to? What's the matter? You scared? I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, be sure. Be sure you're not. All right, go on. I'll tell him something to make it good. Well, doesn't somebody introduce me? You tell them who I am? They've seen your campaign pictures, haven't they? Who could miss that cute mustache, that blonde wavy hair? They'll know you, all right. Maybe you'd better introduce me, just to make sure. All right, all right. Give me the microphone. Okay. Here. You are. I'm ready whenever you are. My friends? My friends? Friends, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the man whom you're going to choose to represent you because he does represent you. The man who came up the hard way, who struggled just as you struggled, so that he knows each and every one of your problems. The man you're going to elect to office, Edgar Lesson. Go ahead, Edgar. It's all yours. Friends, I'm not going to stand up here and make a long speech. I'm not going to do what most candidates for office do when they're campaigning. I'm not going to make you a lot of promises. My purpose in coming to talk to you today is simply this. You, every one of you, have a right to representation. And I have only this to tell you, that if I'm elected... You're going to get it. Sure, like Joe Sterling got it. Just a moment, please. Just a moment. You wait, Lessing. Joe Sterling was our friend. We don't like what happened to him. We don't like what's going on here. We don't like you. Let's get this guy out of here. What do you say, man? We better get out of here. Johnny, get that motor going. Hurry up, can't you, Johnny? We'll be mobbed. Come on. Okay, we'll be all right now. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea as I thought. Maybe killing Joe Sterling wasn't such a good idea as you thought either. Would you care for another cup of tea, Sarah? Now, let me think. I, 
I, I, I just don't know. You don't mind if I have another cup? Indeed, I don't, Irma. Indeed, I don't. He should be here almost any time now, don't you think, Irma? You mean Mr. Vance? Yes. Yes. When he phoned, he said he'd be here at four o'clock. And it's almost that now. <laughs> He's a nice man. I like well, him. He's wonderful. He's the kind of a man I should have married. No sense getting that particular at our age, Sarah. I think... Oh, that must be Mr. Vance. I'll go. Oh, no, I'll answer the Irma, door. please. I'm the younger sister. I'll go. I'll go fix some more tea in case Mr. Vance would like some. That will be nice. Good afternoon, Miss Wakefield. Uh, yes, indeed it is. Indeed it is. Come in, Mr. Vance, please. Thank you. Uh, where's your sister? Oh, she's in the kitchen. She thought you might like some tea. Oh, she shouldn't have bothered. Mm, hmm. This is a wonderfully homey room. <laughs> well, we try to make it that, Mr. Vance. Irma and I don't have much else. You're sure you wouldn't care for some tea? Positive. Uh, uh who's that gentleman whose picture's on the wall? Uh, that... Well, that's Uncle Martin. He's been dead for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a picture of his son over there on the mantelpiece. Uh, th that's what you were looking at, wasn't it, Mr. Vance? Yes. Fine-looking lad. About 15 when this was taken, wasn't he? I think so. Hmm. Miss Wakefield, this is kind of a business visit. I hope you don't mind. Oh, indeed we do not. Uh, what is it you want to know? Well, now let me see. As I understand it, there have been several murders in this city in recent weeks... You and your sister have confessed to all of them. That's right. Of course we confessed. We killed all of the men. Hmm. Why? And how? Well, we killed them because they were evil. And we just willed them to death. Irma and I just sat right down and willed them to die, and they did. You did that to Joe Sterling, too. Oh, of course. He was a very dishonest man. When we read in the papers how he had hurt other people... We just couldn't stand it. So we sat down and willed him to die. And do you know something? At the very moment when the paper said he was killed, Irma and I were sitting right here. Yet we could see him tumbling to his death. Is that so? Yes. Well, Miss Wakefield, you've answered my questions very nicely. I know you told everything you just told me to Mr. Markham previously, but I wanted to hear it. Oh, are you leaving so soon? Yes, I'm afraid I must. I'm a little late. Oh, do you have an appointment with someone, Mr. Vance? Not exactly, although I am going to see Mr. Markham. I'm a little late in solving this case, is what I meant. <laughs> Vance, will you tell me what on earth you're doing? Certainly, my friend, but not at the moment. That's what I like, information. You come breaking into my office with a campaign poster in one hand and a photograph in the other, and you proceed to make my desk look like an art gallery. How am I doing with this pencil, Markham? From all I can see, you're drawing a mustache on that photograph of the young fellow you brought in with you. Mm -hmm. Is that your idea of fun, Vance? It's a lot of other people's, Markham, but not mine. I'm deadly serious. Look at this campaign poster. I'm looking. Huh. Nice-looking young fellow. Big type says, vote for Edgar Lessing. Describe, Mr. Lessing. Well, nice-looking. Wavy blonde hair. Little mustache. Fine. Now, look at the photograph I've been working on. I saw it when you brought it in. It was a picture of a young fellow about 14, wasn't it? Mm hmm Let me see it now. Now that you've put a mustache on him and fixed his hair with that pencil. Here you are. Look. Uh-huh. What? Well, that's a picture of Edgar Lessing as a boy. The likeness is unmistakable now. That's what I imagined. The Sterling murder case is practically over, Markham. Well, it's nice of you to let me know that. Now, who killed Joe Sterling? I have only one question to ask you, and then I'll tell you. All right. Sterling was found dead on the ground floor of his office building. His office was on the second floor. There was no elevator, right? That's right. You told me he was shot as he was about to go out into the street. Have you had any reason to revise that theory? Well, yes, I've had time to question the man who was in Sterling's office. He told me Sterling had been shot at the top of the stairs and fell down them to the ground floor. What does that prove? Well, I imagined it would. That you can, without any hesitation, arrest the Wakefield sisters for murder. Sarah, 
that you could have gotten away with your very clever plan if you hadn't made one mistake. What mistake did we make, Vance? I'll get to that in a moment. We know now that Edgar Lessing was your nephew, that you knew you could control him if he were elected, and that he could never be elected as long as Joe Sterling were alive. So, these two women did kill Sterling. But Vance, how about the other killings they confessed to? Mm -hmm. That was their plan, Markham. They thought this out months ago when they decided to kill Sterling. They came to your office on several previous occasions and admitted murdering several individuals who had been found dead. Yes. That was just to throw you off. It did throw him off, too, didn't it, Sarah? Indeed it did. Indeed it did. And if it weren't for Mr. Vance, nobody would ever have suspected us of killing Mr. Sterling. We were just two harmless old women who hated anything evil. Or so you wanted us to think. What I want to know, Vance, is why you took that young fellow's photograph from the Wakefields' living room in the first place. You must have been suspicious of them to do that. I was. It was something Miss Wakefield here said to me that gave me the clue. So far as anybody knew, Joe Sterling was killed on the ground floor of his office building. Yet she mentioned that she saw him tumbling down. Tumbling down, Markham. Oh, I see. That's why you asked me if Sterling had been shot at the top of the stairs. Right. I thought he might have been, after I heard what Miss Wakefield said. Uh-huh. Only the murderer would know a thing like that, Markham. It wasn't in the newspapers. Well, all I had to do then was find the motive, which we know now. Yes. And the career of the Wakefield sisters was at an end. The career of these two women, Vance, and also the Sterling murder case. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. I just talked to Mabel on phone. Mm. She works in the sleep shop, you know, mm. next to the knobby knit. Yeah. And she says they advise their nightmare customers to put a heating pad under the kidneys. Oh. And a bit of milk toast, just a little beef broth and some warm wine. And pine oil. In the wine? No, in the broth. I mean, the brass. A uh, bath, Sam. <gasps> oh! Sam, look at you. Black eyes and scratches. Your lips cut. You didn't go home at all. I did so. When you promised me you were going straight home for that much-needed rest. And all the time you knew you were going straight to some sordid barn. Get into a brawl. I even bought these things from the sleep shop. Next door to the knobby net. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Medical authorities agree that lost sleep can never be made up. From Samuel Spade, license number... Uh, 17596. Fatigue is cumulative. Subject, the insomnia caper. Dear Dundee. Honest, Lieutenant. This is how I got into that mess last night, honest. I've been feeling a little rocky for two or three days. There was nothing much wrong with me, but as my secretary, the ineffable Miss Perrine, said... Sam, what you need is a good night, please. Which, Lieutenant, is how I happen to be at home, in bed, at 10.30 in the p.m., wearing a sleep shade, earplugs, and quiet pajamas. At 10.45, my right arm went to sleep. I turned over. 
That's when one of the earplugs fell out. I tore off the sleep shade, dug the plug out of my other ear, stuck my head under the pillow, and was just beginning to drowse off, but... I sat up and lit a cigarette. The city plunged again into the silences of the night. The fog was creeping in on little cat's feet. Then all was peace and quiet again in Post Street. Nothing but the sound of foghorns way out in the bay and the rhythmic throb of the cable car mechanism under the California Street incline. This time I almost made it and then. I went over to the window and peered out. The room was on a level with mine in a building just across the alley. I had had occasion to scrutinize said room and its occupant on happier occasions. She was young, red-haired, and also had a nice profile, which I had observed in silhouette against the window blind when she did her nightly setting up exercises. I now observed that she had a boyfriend, and he seemed to be angry. Not wishing to pry into her affairs, I closed my window. Drew the blind, went back to bed. It was stuffy with the window down, but quieter. I actually fell asleep. I dreamed I was home in bed and somebody was knocking on my door. How true. Please, <coughs> open the door, let me in. Who is it? Uh, Evie? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, oh! What? Please, don't be angry. May I come in for a minute? You're in. Oh, thank you. I know this seems peculiar, a perfect stranger. I saw you in the window. That makes us even. I have the apartment across the alley. Yeah, I know. And you saw him. You saw him strike me. No. Well, you must have heard. I heard a lot of stuff breaking. Well, my ship models, he threw them all over the room, broke them to bits. They weren't especially valuable, and besides, they were presents from him. So... Ah, now I get it. Now, you came here to tell me all about your collection of ship models. I think that that's real neighborly of you, Miss... Uh... Dubar. Doreen Dubar. Yeah, well, it was nice meeting you. Drop in again sometime, and I'll show you my collection oh, of trout flies. Please, don't send me away. I'm deathly afraid of him. His name's Dan McCrae. He's a merchant seaman. His boat just got in today, and... Yeah, but why me? Well, I've seen you in the window so many times, I somehow felt I knew you. I suppose, I suppose... I don't even know your name. Look, sweetheart, if you think you're going to rope me in as a witness to that lover's quarrel... Oh, please, no. It's more than that. Believe me. I can't tell you everything, but... Why tell me anything? Okay, I'm sorry. Pardon me for living. I know it's wrong of me to want to stay alive. I don't want to be hard-hearted about it, but if you're really afraid of the guy, you ought to go to the cops. But you don't understand it. Sorry! Sorry, are you in there? Dan. Dan Badger, no doubt, from the game of the same oh, name. Open it! Look, chum, before you say anything, let me put you straight. You picked the wrong sucker. Uh, so you're the guy, huh? The old lady said you were good-looking in a cheap sort of way. Well, I think I'll fix that part of it right now. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, so you're going to make it easy for me, huh? Okay, okay. No. Ooh. Yeah. What have you done to him? He'll be all right. Loosen this pie. I'll go get some water. All right. Is he coming around? Well, where'd she go? Hey, uh, hey, uh, Dan, uh, wake up. Uh, Come on. Swallow it. Uh, what'd you hit me with? Where, where's Doreen? She dissolved. Come on, get up. Okay. Okay, Shepard. This is your round. Who? Not that it matters, Danny boy, but who? You're Frank Shepard, ain't you? You stupid. Can't you read? The name's on the door. Spade. Here's my card. Huh? A detective. What was she doing here? Her story was that she was running away from you. Now beat it, will you? It can't be too fast for me. I'm sorry, Spade. I've been at sea too long, I guess. The old lady over there told me Doreen was seeing this guy every night. Channel fever or something. I blew my top. Yeah. No hard feeling, Spade? Ah, forget it. 
But when you do catch up with that guy, Shepard, watch your left. You telegraph it. Homicide. Shepard's power. Uh, reach. Up to tip the halls of So that baby. Let it ring. Huh? Spade? This is Dan McCray. Who? The guy you you beat up on. Uh, look, look, I just got to sleep. Now, call back tomorrow. Uh, better yet, don't call. Listen, you gotta listen to me. I found Shepard. Not much of a fighter. I marked him up a little anyhow, just to scare him. Go on back to the bar. Have one for me. Listen, I'm okay now. I sobered up like a shot. I only came back here to phone. Makes sense, will you? When I got back to the ship, he was there in my cabin. What? He's dead. Who? Shepard? Yeah, he's dead. Hit him too hard? I don't think so, but I've got to know. You're a detective. Now, look, I haven't got much money, but... Then start earning some. This is going to cost you. Hello, Dan. Well, you got here quick. I'm a real fast sleepwalker. This the ship? Yeah, yeah. Come on, I'll take you aboard. Give me the rundown. Shepard took your girl while you were away at sea. You slapped her around a little, broke her toy boats, and generally behaved like a bad boy. We'll skip that little exhibition match in my apartment. Then what? Come on, up this ladder. About those ship models. One was missing. She acted funny about it, and guess where it was? In Shepard's hotel room. The Boston Hotel up on Broadway. Crumb dump. I shook the address out of that old lady. Never mind that now. So you went there, went up to his room, worked him over. But he was alive when I left there. That's clear. Then I had drinks in a lot of different places. I think I was in some other fight. Yeah, you look it. I don't know who with just spaces, a lot of blurs. I don't even know where all I went. Then I don't remember anything till I'm in an all-night beanery down here on the Embarcadero and a cab driver's holding me up on the stool pouring coffee into me. Then I came aboard. Yeah? Come on, come on in my cabin. I'll show you. There were a few bruises and ring marks in the face, but they'd been cleaned up and smeared with methylate. I know you're not supposed to touch anything until homicide gets there, Lieutenant, but this one had ab- obviously already been tampered with, so I didn't think you'd mind if I rolled him over just enough to peek at the back of his head. There was a tiny cut on his scalp near the base of the skull, not more than a quarter of an inch long. It hardly bled. I pushed the pockets. In his wallet, $38, identification card, Frank R. Shepard, Boston Hotel, San Francisco, and a snapshot of Doreen sailing a model Chinese junk in a pond someplace. In his cigar case, cigars. Around his middle, a tooled leather belt with hammered silver buckle. It was a popular type Hickok belt, but something about the buckle didn't quite figure the prong of the silver buckle wasn't silver. It was tempered steel. And instead of being pointed, the end was flattened out and ground to a sharp cutting edge. There were two notches on either side of it. It didn't look like they'd been put there for decoration. I took the belt off, rolled it up, and put it in my coat pocket. Well, what do you make of it? You touch it? No. Why? A man falls forward, not back. The cops will say he was killed someplace else and brought here. Then I'm in the clear. Yeah, unless they form a theory that you brought the body down here to dispose of it. Then why didn't I? Maybe you lost your nerve. Maybe you sobered up. How? What killed him? I don't know. Maybe internal injuries, maybe a head injury, or both from that beating you gave him. Maybe he just dropped dead, heart attack. That's for the police medical examiner to find out. You mean you're going to call the police? I have to. But I called you to... I, I thought you could clear me before... Now, wait a minute. You told me yourself you drew a blank. You don't know where you were or what you were doing. What are you going to do? Call the police. Now, wait. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose you have to. I do. You first. Yeah. I must say you're taking it pretty well. Uh. I, uh, had a small dream. Abstractions, you know. Uh, cubes and circles. Uh, nothing worth describing. But after I'd given homicide the rumble and crawled home to my own trundle, I did better. I dreamed I was Wild Bill Hickok, the belt tycoon. 
I was working on a promotion scheme for a new combination belt buckle, toothpick, and murder weapon. Sam Spade, sleepyhead. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Nuts. Sam? Unique garage, Harry speaking. Yeah, this is Dundee, Sam. Okay, Lieutenant, you got me. What time is it? It's, uh, wait a minute, I... Ten after three. Any sign of dangerous Dan McCray, that rat, my client? Uh, not a whiff. Hey, about that girl, Sam. Dubar, Doreen L., Balboa, apartment, Sutter Street. Can yeah. you give me that description again? Go over and take a look at her. I'm in her apartment now. She says she never heard of you, and she doesn't know anybody named Dan McCray. And she says she only went out once tonight to a drugstore to get some batteries for her hearing aid and some elastic stockings. All right, Dundee, if you want to swallow a pack of lies, all we right. Check the drugstore, and she's wearing them now. I bring her over there, Sam, but she's a little feeble. Okay, Dundee, I'll be right over. <laughs> Hello, Dundee. Come in, Sam. I want you to make sure, Sam, this is the apartment. Yeah. That's my window just opposite. You can see the bed that I just got out of to come over here in response to your untimely call. Uh, uh... Will you come in here, Miss Dubar? Certainly, Lieutenant. I'm very anxious to make that man's acquaintance. He was about 65 years old with a pleasant motherly face, gold-rimmed bifocals, hearing aid, and snow-white hair. Over his shoulder, I could see into the kitchen. Sitting at a table facing away from me was an old man. In front of him on the bench were three ship models in various stages of disrepair. Broken masts, rudders, and with a mallet and a tiny chisel, he was shaping a piece of wood. I guess that it was a broken spar from one of the hulls. Well, Sam, you still say this is the same apartment? Yeah. Same apartment, different people. But you must be mistaken, young man. My brother and I have lived in this same apartment for nearly 20 years. She's lying, Dundee. Have you checked the janitor, the building manager, anybody? The janitor says she's been living here since he took the job in 41. We're trying to locate the building manager now. According to your story, Sam, the girl and McCray had a big row in here, busted up a lot of furniture stuff. I don't see any sign of it. They could have cleaned it up. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, Sam. Okay, I dreamed the whole thing, but those ship models, I didn't dream them. McCray mentioned them, the girl mentioned them. Busted ship models. There they are on the table in the kitchen. Hey, uh, goodness. What seems to be the trouble now, Dory? You surprised this young man so excited about my models. I declare, then uh, I can't make head or tail of it. Something about a girl with the same name as mine and a young man, I forget his name, oh. who seems to have killed somebody named Shepard, I believe it was. Oh, you're so it about the ship model, young man. Uh, Dory, could it be the girl who brought these over to me to repair? Uh, what was her name? It's just on the tip of my tongue. Who did she say sent her then? Wasn't that Shepard? There, no. I with all know. due respect to your age, nuts! I'm getting out of here, Dundee, while I can still remember my own name. I gotta get some sleep. Well, uh... Hey, wake up. <laughs> oh, oh, Sam. Get out of my bed. I'm sorry. I was beat. I didn't know where else to go. You can go to jail. Their beds don't have inner springs, but it's a free flight. Listen, I had to make that break. It would have been a murder rap for sure. You mean your memory came back? I had a funny feeling I'd seen that guy Shepard somewhere before. And just before I slugged you while we were standing there in the companionway, it came back to me. That guy Shepard, he came aboard ship yesterday when we docked. He flashed a badge on the gangway watch and asked to see the ship's carpenter. The one that made those ship models for you? Yeah, yeah. But don't you see? Manslaughter is one thing, cop killing is another. This ship's carpenter, what's he look like? Oh, thin, around 65. Lame. Talks like a Swede. City morgue. 
Uh, Maxie, Sam Spade. That uh, uh, stiff tag, Shepard? Uh, Shepard, yes, Sam. Just got him back. I think it's all there. Those autopsy boys. Careless. What killed him, Maxie? Puncture wound. Base of the skull. Small, hmm. sharp instrument. Uh, anything new on his ID? Well, Shepard seems to be a phony handle, Sam, but it'll have to do till the retail comes along. Sergeant Polhouse let it drop that the boys at his hotel thought he was a detective. Uh-huh. The funny thing about Sheppy boy, Sam, no belt, no suspenders, very loose trousers. How'd he keep them up? By the, by the time I got to him, it didn't matter. Hey, I figured he wore a belt, and somebody swiped it off him. That's an interesting theory, Maxie. I'll see what I can do with it. I tucked Danny Boy back into my bed, locked him in, and gumshoot around the block to the Balboa apartment. Just to be mean, I woke up the janitor and checked his statement on the old couple in Doreen's apartment. He worked three buildings, was sure of the old woman that backed down a little on the man, which is what I expected. Was sure of the floor, but not of the apartment number. Didn't know any tenants by name, which goes to show, Lieutenant, what police statements are sometimes worth. I thanked him, stole his passkey, and went upstairs. I didn't expect to find anybody home in Doreen's apartment. I was half right. Sven, the old carpenter, was sitting in a chair, staring straight ahead of him. He looked as though he were in a daze. I walked over to him. Even close up, he didn't look dead. But he was. Body still warm, no visible wounds. But he was wearing a tool leather belt with a hammered silver buckle. The prong of the buckle was tempered steel and had the same peculiar shape as the one in my pocket, the one I had taken off a shepherd's body. The ship models were gone. What was left of them I found in the fireplace. And in the charred remnants of what had once been the hull of a toy Chinese junk, I found something that hadn't burned. It was a small metal cylinder with two pins projecting from it on either side about the middle of it. It looked like a miniature lock mechanism, which it was exactly. The key, you guessed it, was the prong of that belt buckle. The cylinder was empty except for a few white grains that looked like sugar. I tasted them. It was not sugar, but in the dope traffic, they sometimes call it that. About then, I heard footsteps outside in the hall. I ducked into the closet, leaving the door cracked enough to see out. Stand over there, Doreen. Don't try anything. I won't shoot you unless I'm forced to. No. You didn't shoot Fred Frank Shepard, did you? Don't ever mention that name again. Uh, Well, Sven, don't just sit there staring. We've just time to catch the boat. Then, answer me. I don't think he can answer you, Mrs. Brownlee. Oh, what are you talking about? Sven! Sven! He's dead! He's dead! Oh, oh God, what, you got a gun! Hand it over. Hand it over, Grandma. You won't need it anymore. You killed him! Yes, I'm a desperate character. Hand it over. Come and get it. It should be easy for you. Such a strong young man, and I'm such a weak... Old woman. Now, look, you don't have your glasses on, and this forty-five is too heavy for an elderly tripe criminal. Now, sit down and keep quiet. Oh, Sam, I thought you'd forgotten all about me. I've been trying to all night. Where were you? They locked me in a closet in her apartment. Next door? They were going to take me with them, get rid of me on the boat. After what they did to Frank, they had to get out fast. Shepard. Who was Shepard, anyway? I can't tell you that. He was a federal narcotics agent, wasn't he? How did you know? You just told me. Now, tell me the rest of it. Well, honestly, I didn't know anything about it till about a month ago. I was dusting the ship models and knocked one off the shelf. It broke and something spilled out of it. Mrs. Bronrig was here when it happened. She rushed for it and ran out of the room with it. She said she'd take it and get it repaired for me. And then this girlfriend of mine came by while I was sweeping the white powder up. She's a nurse. She tasted it, told me it was dope. Well, I didn't want to do anything until I talked to Danny, but she reported it. And that's when Frank Shepard came to see me from the narcotic squad. He told you to play along with them? Yes. They arrested the man Mrs. Brownrigg was selling it to, and Shepard told her he was taking the man's place so he could spy and get evidence, you see. She believed it because of the belt. This the belt? Yes. Yeah. That that thing on the belt, it's really a little key that fits in a little... Yeah, yeah. Now that, that fits in a little lock that releases the little mechanism that makes the false bottom fall out of a little boat. When did she find out that Shepard was a narcotics agent? I didn't. I saw them together so much that I began to think they might double-cross me. Then I thought about that sailor, Dan, that roughneck boyfriend of hers. So I went to Dan and told him I thought his girl had taken up with Shepard while he was away at sea. And I had to let Dan think the worst because I was sworn to secrecy. But Dan's so violent and jealous, he said he'd kill Shepard, so I came to you. 
You were a witness that Dan hit me, and I thought we might have him arrested so nobody else would get hurt. But, uh, I guess you were too sleepy to care. Uh, what? Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, I must have dropped off, uh, uh to sleep. <laughs> Period. End of report. But, Sam... Yes, Angel? Didn't you arrest that terrible old Mrs. Earwig? Brownwig, Effie? Wasn't it Brownwig, Sam? Uh, one of her aliases, no doubt. In reply to your previous question, yes. Who killed Mr. Shepard, Sam? And, and, and how? Look, if you'll recall that uh, Sven was shaping a piece of wood with a small chisel and a mallet. The uh, fatal wound, you recall. Oh, and who killed Sven? Sit down. I want to have a serious talk with you. Oh. Now, over here. Stop twisting your handkerchief. Yes, Sam? Effie, sometimes I think you've been a detective secretary too long. Warps the outlook. Sam, are you trying to tell me that my services are no longer required? You see, that's what I mean. You jump to conclusions, as in the instance of the death of Sven. I only asked who killed him, Sam. Exactly. Did it ever occur to you that some people, especially old, feeble people, just die? Yes. Quietly? Sitting in a chair sometimes? Yes. Sometimes in bed in their sleep? That'll never happen to you, Sam. Check. But it did happen to Sven. Perhaps the excitement of his criminous activities, fear of discovery, his impending flight were too much for his heart. On the other hand, it might have just been old age. Of course. The point is, Effie, it does happen. Yes. Never in detective stories, only in real life. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that's all. Good night. Sam, you're not sleepy. Nevertheless, I'm going home to bed. Oh. Well, uh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Time now for Rocky Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan, and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> I had spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, 
and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front payphone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the payphone? Hmm, shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh, and there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? Oh, uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Oh, our specialty. Now listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Tom and King. Tom and King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Enough, sir. I will show you what I think of the Café Tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin, now we go bye-bye. Come on. Stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine... I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I've forgotten about you. I am a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, Willoughby, told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh. Well, uh, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I... sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting? Oh, very, very. Uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hide behind every lamppost. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... If you'll excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk, and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one in sight except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. Hey. Hey, Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you got to remember. I left you here to watch the money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. Then I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. We'll have a look. Well, 
do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had to look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Greco of the Cairo Police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Oh, Greco? Where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. <laughs> One moment. I must make a full report. Now, how much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but if somebody... You please. I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you to survive. Now, if you'll just Now, leave... Mr. Jordan, did you strike No, me? I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch, uh, I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Who? Oh, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, it is not at all cooperative. What? Uh, so? Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. Yes, I will handle everything at once. Of course... Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? Well, don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, oh, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino, shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan? Here you are, Greco, and you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? He has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Hey. Ah, another gun, George. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Ah, two shells missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. So bland if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances, you, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night... You'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour, each Sunday evening, is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. I was on my way to an Ace High Straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack who didn't wait for me to answer. A loud Egyptian named King and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my street. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic, recently fired, turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sapphire sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, sir? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the front phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. 
Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tommen King started a phony one-man riot in the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tommen King. And the third? Well, after I got rid of King... <sighs> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, George. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Tobias speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught a mouse, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. I'm surprised. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you to the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam could change his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen... As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Uh, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. I could phrase it a different way. See, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things on my mind. Like murder? Oh, please, worries. Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. Mm, it's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. Would uh, 100 pounds be sufficient? 100? That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Then, well, uh, give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell no one? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. <laughs> He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, Maxie. Uh, oh, hiya, Rock. Watch your turkey coming up. Watch it. See? Thirteen. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Of course, something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fish to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know it. Ace is dead? Yeah. Twenty-three this time. Watch it. What do you know about the killing? I tell you, Rock. Uh, watch it now. Twenty-three coming up. Twenty-three, just like I said. Come on. What do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who are his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He met her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband to show up. You know what the husband's name was? Let's see. Uh... No, I forgot. Four this time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King. That's it. How do you know? I didn't. Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Game. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back to back with a king. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of fiascas, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. Get in there, 
Uh, you like my rug? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thing of it. Oh, not interested, sorry. I see. You bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother me. Effendi, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait. Wait, come back. Tara! Tara! By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere. I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. Across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. By... by Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this... Uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but he had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No. No, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque Al-Azhar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm I was wrong. It was the Ahmed Ibn Tulun. Stupid of me, though. But think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. Well, I found Tom and King's address, a large brownstone modern apartment house. But King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, I never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, survey. Ah, right, just a minute. You said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten dollar beer. Ten dollar beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace high straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. Then I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabi at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. Who is it? The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I can't... Sorry, Blue Eyes, i got to talk to you. But who did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight, it's... Oh, well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but uh, you see my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh, why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? <sighs> to, uh, to find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, I, well, I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. You had better go, Mr. Jordan. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Oh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? A camel stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer... I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry-up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam, it's Rocky. 
Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King at 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? Uh, this is news, Jordan. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain that? Damn, if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time. Still following me. The veiled native woman who limped. But this time I figured I knew who she was. She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cards collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. This time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step, I picked up another native bent on mayhem. And there we went. The veiled woman, followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims, right through the bizarre pirate. <laughs> Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top-flight adventure mysteries. Rocky Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler, top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the beggars and the snake charmers and the street vendors of the crowd of the czar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path. Pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and 30 more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let's go. Let's go. Let's Turn around. Go. Turn around and face me. No. No. My veil. Coming off quick and everything. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Look her over, folks. She's not a native and she's not a woman. He's Uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. This is most convenient. I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Mr. What Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. Natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The husband Rocky. doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. So you killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angel's planning to kill her after I left. You're a little slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Well, just to you... clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen. 
Your child of nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. <laughs> I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, yes, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh, what? Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail? No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I told you. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dived to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Savaya started pounding on the front door. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open window. Open it up! Jordan, you here. Where's Milton Queen? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Draco! Get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Greco. But, but, uh, all right. But... Don't worry, Greco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about Angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. She's passed out. I must have stepped on a sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She is suffering only mild shock. No, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it. Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, presents The Case Book of Gregory Hood, starring Elliot Lewis, with our guest star, Gail Storm. In just a moment, you'll hear tonight's story, Fifth Avenue, with Gail Storm at Night of Mine. Say, do you know who's the best judge of wine in all this world? Well, as far as you're concerned, you are. That's right. What other person can decide what kind of wine you're going to like? So here's my suggestion. Try Petri wine. You know, Petri wine is the one and only wine for thousands of people. But the only way you can be sure it's the wine for you is to try it. Once you've done that, I'm pretty sure you'll agree that Petri wine is the wine to suit your own particular taste. And the reason it's so good is because the Petri family took time to bring you good wine. Many generations of knowledge, skill, and experience go into the making of every bottle of Petri wine. Only the finest of luscious, big, sun-ripened California grapes are used. And Petri wine is always made in the Petri family's own honored tradition. So Petri wine is a wonderful buy, a real wine value. Why don't you try a bottle of Petri wine tomorrow? Those five letters on the label, P-E-T-R-I, are your assurance of good wine. Petri wine. Well, it's that time again. Time to join Gregory Hood and his friend and attorney Sanderson Taylor for another story from Greg's casebook. Greg and Sandy are in New York City on business for Greg's world-famous importing house. It's a bracingly cold night, 
But in spite of the cold, Greg has insisted that he and Sandy climb aboard a Fifth Avenue bus and settle down for a tourist's eye view of the famous thoroughfare. The bus is deserted except for a very beautiful young lady sitting across the aisle from him. Sandy is complaining bitterly about the draft. This is the craziest thing we've done in the last five years, Greg. Could be in a nice warm cab, where they keep the doors closed. Oh, you've lost the spirit of adventure, Sandy. Yeah. We're going back to California tomorrow night. A little cold weather will do us good while we can get it. Improves the circulation, puts a sparkle in your eye. Uh, hey, what's the matter? Look, there. That mansion. You recognize it? Huh. That one? Yeah. Well, it does look familiar, Greg. Familiar? We spent two of the happiest hours in our lives or thereabouts in that house, Sandy. Night before last. Are you losing your mind? I've never been in that house. Night before last, Roy Del Ruth invited us to that screening, his latest picture. Well, that's what I mean. That's the mansion that Aloysius T. McKeever spends his winters in. Remember? Oh. Well, of course. And that picture, it happened on Fifth Avenue. That's right. Oh, yeah, sure. That's that. Well, I'll be done. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see Victor Moore and his hobo get up going through that hole in the fence. Oh, what a wonderful character. <laughs> I don't know when I ever enjoyed a picture as much, Sandy. I'd like to see it again. You'd like to? Boy, I'm going to. I'm going to take Mary to see it as soon as it opens in Berkeley. You know, Charlie Ruggles has always been a favorite of hers. Oh, wait till she sees him in this part. He was one of them. Oh, the whole cast. I fell in love with Gail Storm. I've always been mad about Ann Harding. Everyone gave swell performances, especially the leading man, Don DeFore. Yeah, he sure did. You know, it must be a lot of satisfaction to make a picture like that. Yeah. Roy Del Roots made a lot of fine pictures, but this tops them all. I... Oh. Uh, excuse me. Allow me to pick your bag up for you. Oh, nothing much to fill down. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. I don't want to seem inquisitive, but why are you carrying that gun? I... Please, give me my bag. Look, I'm not just being nosy, but if you're scared to death and carrying a gun, that's a bad combination for a little girl like you. Give me my bag. My name is Gregory Hood. If you're in trouble, I want to help you. I'm not in any trouble. Give it here and please go away. I don't want to talk with you. Okay, Miss Miles. You know my name? Yes, on this envelope in your bag. <laughs> I'm very observant. You might be sorry you noticed that. Now, please go away. I'm getting off the bus at the next stop. Do you want me to get off with you? Bodyguard? No. Now, go away, please. I don't want to talk with you. Okay. Well, you didn't make uh, much of an impression on that young lady, did you, Greg? Yeah, I'm afraid not. Something the matter with that girl, Sandy? Ah, because she didn't throw her arms about you? No, cynic. Because it's a little unusual for a girl as lovely as that, draped in that many thousand dollars worth of mink, to be carrying a thirty-two automatic pistol in that full-grown alligator bag. An automatic? Yeah. And she's scared silly. She's getting off, Greg. I'm going to follow her, Sandy. I'm not going to get off at the same time she does. We'll jump off in the middle of the block, and we'll keep our eye on her. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Uh, Greg, Hmm? uh, that girl, she left a package on the seat there. Oh, yeah. Well, give us an excuse for chasing her. I'll get it. I'll take that package, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to return it to the young lady who left it here just a minute ago. Give it here. Don't be a hero. Look out, Greg. Just hang on to that gun arm, Sandy. Give me that gun. I have to have that package. It belongs to me. Grab him, Sandy. Yep. Oh, stop him, Sandy. Hey, wait until the bus stops. Get away. He got away, Greg. Yeah, I lost my balance when he let go of the gun. Come on, Sandy. I don't want to lose that girl. Let's get hey, off this bus. What are you trying to do? Break your neck. Now jump, Sandy. Come on. Hey, what's the matter with you two jumping off that moving bus? You're crazy. What happened to the man who jumped off just ahead of us? Hey, he ran across the street against the light, the idiot. What's all this about? What's going on? Oh, look, officer, nothing's going on. A young lady left a package on the bus. I jumped off to return it to her, that's all. She got off at the corner back there. Small girl, brunette, mink coat. You notice her? You think I got nothing to do but watch who gets off the bus? She didn't jump. I didn't see her. Thank you. Come on, Sandy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see her? Mm-hmm. No, I don't. Now she's gone, Greg. Mm-hmm. Well, I know her name. Come on, let's go back to the Waldorf try to locate her. This package she left behind must be pretty important. Oh, Sandy, there's no night of miles listed in the city directory or telephone book. I guess the only thing to do is buy an ad in a paper and advertise the fact that we have that package. Yeah. What do you suppose is in it, Greg? What does it feel like? 
Feels like a leather box, Sandy. Because that's what it is. Uh, that's not much of a help. Take it down and ask the clerk to put it in the safe, will you? Aren't you going to look and see what's in it? Why, Sandy. Surprised at you. I'm the one who's surprised. Hmm? Well, I'll take it down, Greg. Meet you in the lobby in a half an hour. Yeah, I'll be ready by then. Quick shower and shave. Wish I could locate that Miles girl. I want to get this package back to her. And... She was a very uh, pretty girl, then. Really. Oh, well, it's fat, too. Uh, be within a half hour, sir. Okay, in the men's bar. Right. Neither. Hello, operator. Uh, this is Gregory Hood in the tower. Yes. Uh, I want you to check all the Class A hotels for me. I have a friend named Nida Miles. Miss Nida Miles. I know she's in town, but I don't know where she's staying. <laughs> yep, that's right. M-I-L-E-S. Hmm? And uh, there's a $20 bill in it for you if you locate it for me. <laughs> well, you're welcome if you find it. Right, and thank you. Nida. Oh, darn it. Nida? Just step back in that room, Mr. Hood. I don't want to have to use this gun. Oh, no, not you again. Sorry. I've been waiting to see you alone, Mr. Hood. I've been telling you ever since you grabbed that package this afternoon. You shouldn't have done that. Why? It wasn't yours. But the boss wanted it. The young lady wanted to have it. Hmm? You waste your way in where you weren't wanted, Hood. Now, where is it? I haven't got it. Get it. I can't right now. It's too bad. Now, Mr. Hood, we're going to take a little trip. Boss wants to see you. Look, you're out of a book. Go away. This is the Waldorf. You can't kidnap me out of here. Don't go betting your life on that. There's a car waiting downstairs. Walk through the lobby and get in it. I'll go with you just to keep you from making any mistakes. Well, this is ridiculous. Isn't it? Come on, get moving. I don't take it too hard. You'll be in good company. We're entertaining a dame there called Nida out of the place. What? Yeah, she's waiting for you. If you don't arrive, it might kill her. So don't be tricky, Mr. Hood. Just keep moving. As soon as we get past this light here, Joe, twist it over to Lexington. Right. I want to put the blinders on Mr. Hood here. You're going to blindfold me, huh? Yeah. I hate to cover those pretty blue eyes of yours. Well, thank you. There's not much sin in the room. Oh. Anyway, it's anyway. Oh. I didn't do anything. The half-witted cab jockey behind me ran me. Come on, the light's changing. Take out of here. Yeah. Uh, lock bumper. <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing, isn't it? Just take this seat. Uh, no, I think I'll get out and help on the hey, lock you... bumpers. You wouldn't want to do any shooting in all this traffic. <laughs> so long, Clancy. See you later, Lucky. Hey, hey, Greg. Greg. Huh? Oh, Sandy. Uh, what happened, Greg? Where'd you come from? Well, I, I saw you leaving the hotel with that fella. Huh? Looked to me like he was holding a gun on you. So I grabbed the cab and followed you. How come you always do the right thing? I was in a little trouble, Sandy. Well, that's what I figured. So I gave my driver $20 to lock bumpers with the car you were in. Oh, sheer and... genius. Now, well, let's get back to the hotel and get my suite changed. I want privacy when I take a look at what's in that confounded package. <laughs> girl that left this package in the bus, night a mile. Did the operator manage to find her registered one of the hotel? No, and please stop taking words out of my mouth. <whistles> Alligator jewel case with a sterling silver coat of arms. Uh, black pearl. Beautiful, Sandy. A fortune's worth of black pearls. Most beautiful strand I've ever seen. Now, what in the devil was that Miles babe carrying them around with her for on a bus? Well, even I can answer that. Hmm? She was making a rendezvous with somebody on the bus to pick them up after she left them on the seat. Sandy, well, you're getting to be a great deducer. This strand of pearls must be well known. The manager of our branch here probably be able to tell me who they belong to. That's the next move. You think the pearls were, uh, were stolen? I don't know what to think, but we're in it. We might as well find out what it's all about. Tell you what, get on the phone for... Mm -hmm. Who is it? Mr. Hood? No? 
Yes, who is it? It's Miss Miles, Nida Miles. Huh. Speak of the angels. Mm-hmm. Hello, I'm... Uh, hey! Get back into the room, Mr. Hood. Please don't make me use this gun. Well, okay, but... but, but... Back up. Yes, ma'am. Now, give me those pearls and get into that closet, both of you. And don't try to get help for five minutes. Well, you're welcome to the pearls. They're yours, I suppose. Get in the closet. Forget about me and the necklace. If you don't, you're going to be killed. Greg Hood and Sandy are riding on a Fifth Avenue bus in New York City when Greg notices that the young lady sitting opposite them has left a package on the seat. He picks up the package intending to return it to her when a large gentleman attempts to get the package away from him. Greg manages to hang on to the package, is kidnapped, rescued by Sandy, and returns to the Waldorf to see what it contains. He opens it, finds a priceless string of black pearls, is admiring them, when the girl from the bus comes in, gun in hand, locks Sandy and Greg in the closet of their room, and leaves with the warning to forget all about her and the pearls. Not Greg. Released from the closet, he goes to see the manager of the New York City branch of Hood and Company. Now, it, it was the most beautiful strand of pearls I've ever seen, Mac. Graduating from the size of a pea up to the size of a... Ooh, as big around as a penny. Hmm. They were in an alligator jewel case about eight inches long by about, oh, three inches wide. There's a crest on the case. A coat of arms, two tigers rampant against a wreath. And a shield. Some Latin words I don't remember. Here. It looked like this. I'll try to draw it. I know about the pearls, Gregory. Oh? I know the man who owned them. I've seen them many times. We restrung them for him several years ago. Oh, who is it? The gentleman who owns them is named Carruthers. Huh? Charles P. Carruthers. Has an apartment in Park Avenue. Fine gentleman. Very old family. The pearls, as a matter of fact, have been in the family for several hundred years. Had been. Uh, look, Mac. Could you call him and make a date for me to drop over to see him? Tell him I, uh... Well, I want to buy the pearls. Or if he won't sell them to me, at least I want to see him. I'm sure I can arrange that, Mr. Hood. Just a moment. Oh, fine. Get me Charles P. Carruthers on the phone, please. I hope you don't think this is just idle curiosity, Mr. Carruthers. No, indeed I don't, Mr. Hood. As a matter of fact, I'm quite flattered that a collector of your prominence would be so interested in my pearls. I admire the tone of your phonographs, too. Uh Of course, uh, there could be no question of my selling them. They've been in the family for hundreds of years. Oh, I can understand that. I would like to see them, though. Black pearls just happen to be one of my hobbies. Uh-huh. Hood and company have sort of specialized in them for a couple of generations. Yes, I know. I'll get them for you. Oh, thank you. I keep them here with me in this wall safe. I like to look at them sometimes, even when I'm here alone. No? I've had them out more than usual lately because of my approaching marriage. Oh, I... Didn't know about that. You getting married soon? Yes, in two weeks. To a very lovely girl. One will wear these pearls as they should be worn. Proudly. Uh, that's her picture there on the radio. Beautiful. Uh, you're a lucky man, Mr. Carruthers. Indeed I am, Mr. Hood. Here they are. The Carruthers pearls. Yes. I see. They are everything I expected, Mr. Carruthers. Mm. Uh, I wonder if I could borrow them for a few hours. I know the request is a bit unusual, but I'm leaving for the coast in the morning, and I would like to have them photographed before I leave. Well, uh, Mr. Hood... I'm I... writing a book on famous jewels, the ownership of them, or their history. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't be complete without a mention and an illustration of your pearl. Uh, tomorrow morning, Mr. Hood. Well, look, uh... you know me. If you don't, you can establish that I am not an imposter by checking with the New York police and Mr. McIntosh, my local manager. Well, I, I have to have these pearls for just a few hours. Uh, 
Grace. Oh, quiet, Sandy. Mind your manners. I'm on the phone. Here. Now, how did you get that necklace back, Grace? Well... Howdy, desk. Eileen Kilroy. Ah, hello, Kilroy. Greg Hood. Now, what makes me so lucky? Uh, what do you want to know now? Uh, Charles P. Carruthers of the Park Avenue Carruthers is this. Is engaged to marry a girl named Nida Miles. Well, now that's startling news. I had it in my column a month ago. What paper do you read anyway, Greg? Oh, I love you, Kilroy, and we'll discuss that fact at great length later. Right now, I want to know where Miss Nida Miles lives. Well, just a minute. I've got it right here in my file somewhere. Uh, hang on, Hanson. Oh, flatter. What is it all about, Greg? Mm, oh, well, Sandy, it's pretty involved. I can't explain the whole thing to you while I'm talking to somebody else. You should c- try to curb that urge to be inquisitive. She uh, lives in an apartment at... Uh... 26 East 72nd Street. Uh Uh-huh. Now, what else do you want to know? Uh, what do you know about the background of the Miles female? Where'd she come from? Well, there you have me, Greg. Why? What's up? Well, if I tell anybody, I'll tell you first. There may not be anything to tell. You must have something on her background. Where did she meet and capture the Wiley Carruthers millions? Well, she was singing in a nightclub when that happened. Huh? The club, uh, Managua. Oh? Old Charles P. saw her, loved her, asked her to marry him, and she said yes, being very much in her right mind. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, Managua. That's Dude Defoe's joint, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll take you to lunch tomorrow. Good night, sweetheart. Come on, Sandy. We're going to take a cab ride over to East 72nd Street. Clerk? Uh, yes? Uh, what apartment is occupied by Miss Nida Miles? Uh, Miss Miles just went out a minute ago. I'm surprised that she didn't pass you in the entrance. Oh, thanks. Well, where are we going now, Greg? I don't know, but I expect to find out. Come on. Uh, uh, Dorman? Yes, sir? Did Miss Miles just take a cab away from here a minute ago? Yes, sir, she did. Would $10 help you to remember where she asked the driver to take her? No, uh, let me see. I have a very important message for her. I have to locate her right away. All right, Pirate 20. Oh, yes, sir. Mm. She asked to be driven to the Club Monogamy. Well, thank you very much, sir. That's okay. Is there any additional charge for whistling me up a cab? No, sir. <laughs> I just hope we get there in time to do some good, Sam. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Uh, Club Managua on 52nd. Can you make it in five minutes for a dollar a minute? I can make it in four minutes for two dollars a minute. It's a deal. Get us there fast. Uh, take a look inside, Sandy. Maybe she beat us here. All right, Jake. Yeah. There you are, driver. Hello, Miss Miles. Fancy meeting you here. Come on. Where are you taking Well, let's me? just drop in this restaurant for a minute before we go to the Club Managua, shall we? No, I have Come to... Come on, or I'll call a policeman. I want to talk with you. All right. I couldn't be in any more trouble anyway. Uh, here, let's take this corner booth. Get in there. All right. Now, we talk. I'll bring you up to date. You're engaged to marry a lot of money, the Carruthers millions. Somebody's blackmailing you. Who is it? I can't tell you. I'll tell you. It's Dude Defoe, isn't it? What's he got on you, youngster? Why should I tell you? Because I want to help you. What's he got? Letters? Pictures? Yes, both. I have to get them back. Oh, we'll get them back, all right. Let me see your purse. No. Yes. Give it here. Ah, still got the black pearl. Gonna give him the dude. He planned this whole thing, didn't he? It would take a crook like him to plan anything as clever as this. I had to do what he told me to. I had to. You can think whatever you like, but I'll be a good wife to Charles. He's good to me. He has respect for me. I'll make him happy. Look me right in the eye and tell me that, baby. All right. I'll be a good wife. I'll make him happy. I love him. He's good to me. Okay. Come on, let's see Dude and give him those pearls, shall we? office, huh? All right, let me handle it. Oh, hello, Nida. Hello, dude. Why'd you bring 
this guy with you, fool. I'll answer that. I'm here to see that she gets a square deal. Where are the letters and pictures? Where are the pearls? Give them to me, Nina. All right. Thank you. Let's have your material now, hot shot. There you are. Look them over, Nina. See that they're all there. All right. Uh, you look familiar. Huh? The name's Hood. Gregory Hood. I've got news for you, dude. After we finish our little deal here tonight, if Miss Miles ever is bothered by you again, she gets in touch with me and you talk it over with the police. I stand pretty good with them, you know. Yeah, I know. I've heard about you, Hood. How come uh, you're mixing into this caper? Dull evening. Oh. Just remember, next time you'll be dealing with me and not a scared little singer. They're all here, Mr. Hood. Okay. Here are your pearls, dude. Okay. All buttoned up. That finishes it, Hood. Thanks, Nida. You're not welcome. But you can have them this time. Tear those letters and stuff up, Nida. We're going to use them as a burnt offering to the god of matrimony. Right here in dude's ashtray. Okay. Well, Greg, now maybe you'll tell me why you gave those pearls to that blackmailer. I know some things I think you do. Hold on, I'll make it simple. Jude Defoe knew about that black pearl necklace Charles T. Carruthers owned. He also had a fine stack of blackmail literature on the girl Carruthers was going to marry. So he had her get the pearls one day. He had a paste copy made up of the strand and a duplicate alligator case made. Oh. Oh, I see. Good. So... The next opportunity Nida had, she switched the phonies for the real pearls. Uh-huh. She was supposed to leave the real ones in her seat on the bus where one of Dude's gorillas could pick them up. We interfered, and that started all of the, uh, excitement. Mm, well, it's a little clearer now, but I... I'll take you all the way. I had in my pocket the phony pearls, which I borrowed from Carruthers, when I met Nida outside the Club Managua tonight. Uh-huh. While we were in the restaurant, I switched them for the real pearls while Nida was looking into my eyes. Right now, I've got the real pearls in my pocket. Huh? Dude's got the phonies in his safe, and Nida has burned up all the evidence he had to blackmail her with. I return the real ones to Charles P. Carruthers in a few minutes, and everybody will live happily forever after. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be there when Dude finds out he has his own pearls. Well, well my goodness, Greg. That, well, as usual, everything has worked out all right, and you, you've managed to escape alive, but... There's a law of averages, you know. That... Hey, it's 11.30. I have to get these pearls back to the owner, and we have a date to meet Roy Del Ruth and Gail Storm at 21 at midnight. <laughs> I want to tell them my story about it happened on Fifth Avenue. Uh, no, I don't think I will. They'd never believe it. <laughs> Why does everything happen to happen to me, Sandy? <laughs> Interesting story, Greg. You do let beautiful women lead you into the most amazing adventures. Oh, I'm easily led, her. I, sh- I should think you'd have been scared. After all, she was carrying a gun. Oh, but that's it. I like my women with arms. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I'll let that one go. And what's our story going to be about next week, Greg? Well, Herb, next week I'm going to tell about an adventure Sandy and me and Ray Driscoll, the designer, had in San Francisco a few months ago. It concerns a good-for-nothing son-in-law... An irascible father-in-law, and fifty thousand dollars in a suitcase. We call it ransomed. See you next week, Herb. The Case Book of Gregory Hood is written by Ray Buffum. Original music composed and played by Dean Fossler. Elliot Lewis plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Howard McNear. Gail Storm was heard as Nida Miles. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. 
The Case Book of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Herb Allen saying good night for the Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine. Makers of epic pure sunflower oil, purine and fresh cooking fat, yum yum peanut butter, maple, margarine, niblet cheese twists, halverine bread spread, and blossom yellow margarine present the epic case book. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. I don't think that there has ever been a newspaper account of a murder trial that has haunted me for so long as the recent case of a young South African girl who was thrown overboard from a British merchant vessel and of the young merchant seaman named Stephen Marley who was charged and convicted. The trial was given full coverage by the South African press, and rightly so, not because of the victim's nationality, but because the whole dreadful story contained circumstances almost beyond belief. Obviously, I don't propose to dwell on the sensational and garish evidence which came out at the trial, but one cannot help wondering as to how these two girls, for if you've read the account of the trial, you will know there was another stowaway on board, how they came to choose the sort of life they were leading before they boarded the vessel. The judge commented on the fact that these two girls could stow away on a vessel with such ease, and understandably suggested that stricter precautions were necessary. Yet, keeping away unauthorized persons from a boat which is about to sail is not easy. I'm not claiming to be an authority on a ship and those that sail in her, but I did have to investigate very thoroughly the procedure and routine adopted when a ship leaves harbor. What's more... A stowaway figured prominently in my investigation. You see, the master of a vessel called the Dolphin was found murdered whilst the vessel was still on the high seas. She was sailing under a British flag, registered at Southampton. Let me tell you about it. I called my story No Holds Barred. Pick a pack of blossom, get it from fresh taste today. When your breakfast gets them waking in the morning, blossom. For the sandwiches you're making in the midday blossom, for your roast and baking in the evening blossom. Pick a pack of blossom, blossom yellow margarine. Pick a pack of blossom. For sandwiches that burst with health and farm fresh taste. Pick a pack of blossom. For frying eggs to a golden turn. For dabbing on your vegetables, carrots, peas, potatoes. Pick a pack of blossom. For baking and roasting and spreading on crisp, warm rolls. And satisfying your family with its farm fresh taste. Blossom helps a busy mum. Make sure today you're choosing it, using it. Blossom, blossom. Pick a pack of blossom. Pick a pack of blossom. The Dolphin was a cargo ship returning to home waters from New York when the murder was discovered by one of the crew. The incident was radioed to the head office of the Transatlantic Shipping Company, who in turn communicated with Scotland Yard, since their head office was in Leadenhall Street. Car. Operations here, Inspector. Murder on the high seas, sir. Are you reporting an incident or telling me of a movie you've seen, Ops? <laughs> Sorry about that dramatic opening, Inspector. Couldn't resist it. Mm. The general manager of the Transatlantic Shipping Company has telephoned to say that the master of the vessel called the Dolphin has been murdered six miles out of sea, sir. Yeah? Where's the Dolphin based? Southampton, sir. Well, it's a matter for Winchester, surely. It comes under Hampshire CID. 
Mr. Hamill, he's the general manager, sir, says that he communicated with the Southampton police who say that the murdered man's home is in Barking. That comes under the metropolitan area. And he thought it was a matter for the murder squad's home. Huh. Case of passing the buck, if ever I heard one. All right, when should you do the dock? According to Mr. Hamble, in about half an hour from now, sir. The docks are heavily congested and they expect some delay. Oh, then I'd better get down to Southampton docks right away. Are you the pilot ready to take me out to the dolphin? That's right. If you're the man from Scotland Yard I've been told to look out for. Good, and that's the way. My name's Carr. Captain Amy, at your service, sir. Here, let me give me a hand down. Thanks. All right. Ah. Yes. Very misty, isn't it? Certainly is. Look at them through the mist. They're waiting their turn to enter the docks. The dolphin among that lot? No, she's been told to drop anchor and await your arrival. There she is. See where I'm pointing? Huh? About 45 degrees in the starboard bow. Oh, good. Then let's go. All right, Harry, we're away. <coughs> I don't know how you've seen all this, miss. Oh, well, this is nothing. You should see it when there's a real pea super. Then it gets tricky. She's getting a bit clearer now. See that yellow funnel through the fog? That's her. Do you know why we're going out? I'll say. It's all over the docks. They say there's been a mutiny and the skipper's been done in. Wouldn't surprise me. Real old martinet is Bill Timbalt. Oh, is that the reputation he had? So they say. There's many a man who's refused to sign on the dolphin because of Timbalt. Mind you, they also say there was no finer sailor on the seven seas. Oh, now you can see her, that's her. There's three black stripes on the funnels. That's a transatlantic shipping company's ensign. Hello! Right, Easy as he goes, off, Ed. Off, really, please. Steady! Right! You climb a rope ladder, Mr. Carr? Well, reasonably well. I don't know whether that's the right answer in these choppy waters. Order! Right. Port five! Stop! Stand by to take a line aboard! Mm -hmm. Oh, you, Charlie! How are you, mate? Is that a cop, video? Cop! One! Chief Inspector Carr, New Scotland Yard! Let me see. That's Charlie Hughes, first mate. Up you go, sir. I'll steady the rope ladder. Yeah. <coughs> My instructions are to await a radio message. Looks as though the dolphin will be held up here for a couple of hours. Oh, thank you, Captain Andy. I'll send the message to as soon as I'm ready to return. Course off! <coughs> There was a distinct swell, and the slight sway of the rope ladder didn't help matters. But within a matter of a moment or so, I was aboard the merchant vessel Dolphin. Hughes was a big, burly man in a rather dirty jersey and a uniform cap on the back of his head. As we shook hands, I could see groups of sailors staring at me. Was it the fact that one of the crew was a murderer and therefore all were suspect? Was that the reason I sensed an atmosphere of hostility bordering on hate? I wish I was welcome. You were born under more personal circumstances, Chief Inspector. All right, what are you all staring at? Haven't been paid off yet. Get back to your duties. Oh, Lot of lazy swine. Oh, you there! Tell Sparks the radio the Chief Inspector cars aboard. You've got to tell the Southampton the police. Oh, oh, aye, aye, sir. Uh, the skipper's lying over there. Covered him with a tarpaulin. There's somebody else aboard you want to question. I don't understand that cryptic remark, Mr. Hughes. I'll need to question everyone. Well, there'll be one more than you bargained for. Stowaway. How they managed to smuggle her aboard. Do you mean there's a girl aboard this vessel? Girl? <laughs> more like your grandmother. She's mixed up in this somewhere or another. You mark my words. Uh, things weren't like this in my day. Here, I'll take you to see the skipper. Uh -huh. He's over there, bottom of the ladder. By the foreign well, they. Anybody guarding the body? Aye. Able Seaman Drake. Hmm? All right, Drake. Back to your quarters. Well, this is the skipper. I decided not to move until I got your instructions. Quite right. Let's take a look. No. Gosh, eh? Whoever cracked that skull must have used a lot of force. 
to look around for a murder weapon. Not well, that anyone's likely to leave it about when it would be a simple matter to throw it overboard. All right, Mr. Hughes, let's start from the beginning. When and how did it happen? Well, just about halfway through the middle watch, I decided to go on deck. Middle watch? Yeah, about uh, two o'clock in the morning. Go go on. And I saw someone in oilskins running away. I didn't know why he was running or who he was. I come here to investigate. I saw the skipper. He'd obviously just been attacked. That crack on the skull must have killed him instantly. I shouted to the lookout to raise the alarm. All hands on deck! All hands on deck! Come on now! Someone's covered a skipper. He's dead. Look at him lying there. Great suffering catfish. Now I know the skipper got his number because of the stowaway. It's murder now, and if you won't talk, she will. You, George Ramsey, where have you been for the last half hour? On me bunk where I should still be. I've told you before, I know nothing about that woman, and I'll tell you again. You address me respectfully. I'm in charge of this vessel now. If you don't watch your step, I'll have you in iron. Of course, no one admitted a crack in his skipper's head wide open. Now, this stowaway, where is she? The skipper gave instructions for her to be kept locked up in the Sparks' cabin. He's bunked in with the chief engineer. Is she American? No. We searched her handbag. She's got a British passport. You want me to take you to her? Yes, please. Yeah, I unlocked the cabin this morning. There's no point. I mean, there's nowhere she can go. I just told her to stay put. What's all this talk of mutiny? Uh, the old man threatened that everyone would lose this evening stick it when he found out about that stowaway. We're on a straight run from New York. She must have been smuggled aboard then. Now she's in here. Don't you knock when you enter a lady's apartment. I understand that you're an unauthorized passenger on this vessel, that you left New York without going through customs and immigration. What's that got to do with the price of eggs? I'm a British subject, and I've got a British passport. Well, don't mind I'm... that now. How'd you get aboard this vessel? I just waited until no one was looking. Then I just ran up the gangway and hid. She's lying. Somebody must have brought her food. Was this cabin locked all last night? Locked? The rotten swans kept you in here like a caged animal. Yes, it was locked. Well, who locked this woman in? Who I did. Keys? An instruction on the skipper. I come and unlock the cabin door. And about, about time, too. Uh, where, where was, was this I... woman hiding when she was discovered? She was in the hold. We ran into some bad weather. The skipper was told that some of the cargo had shifted because of a bad list of port. They're one of the worst squalls I've experienced for years. You there. Go on, George. Secure those cracks over there. If that stuff breaks away, we've had it. Well, what's that doing over there? That looks rather dicey. You don't think we ought to last? Blimey. How'd you get in here? Oh. Hey, we've got a stowaway, oh. Miss Hughes. What are you doing in here? Oh, oh, leave me alone. Just leave me to die. Poor old girl. Oh. You'll be all right, Ma. Oh. The worst of the squall's over. Oh. You'll feel better once you get up on oh. deck. Better? Wait till the skipper is this. How did you get aboard? No question her now. She needs a doctor. She's going to be a bit pushed. Oh. She ain't got no ship surgeon. Water. Water. I need some water. You were in a bad way, weren't you? Bad way? I thought I was never going to get out of the old alive. What happened? Were you taken to the captain of this vessel? I wasn't taken to him. I was dragged. The way he carried on, you'd have thought I was trying to blow up his wretched boat. When did all this take place? Night before last. So, you've been aboard the Dolphin ever since she left New York Harbor? Well, I wasn't dropped onto the ship by a parachute. I don't think there's any need to be funny, madam. The captain of the Dolphin has been murdered, and you are implicated. <laughs> Take a pack of blossom, get it from fresh taste today. When your breakfast gets from waking in the morning, blossom. Whether spread on toast or frying eggs to a golden turn, blossom yellow margarine tastes the way your family loves it, light and fresh. All the sandwiches you're making in the midday blossom. If you're busy, hungry family, their sandwiches with Blossom, they can taste the farm fresh flavors, good and healthy. For your roast and baking in the evening, Blossom. When your family's at supper, they'll enjoy a roast with the touch of Blossom. They'll love it on their vegetables and spread on crisp, warm rolls. So give them all the farm fresh taste of Blossom. Blossom helps a busy mum. Make sure today you're choosing it, using it, Blossom. 
Blossom. Pick a pack of blossom. Pick a pack of blossom. For the first time, this very tough-looking lady, if lady is the right word, showed some signs of fear. Although, had she been locked in the cabin, as the first mate stated, the woman could hardly be accused of murder. You... eh? You don't think... You don't think... Never mind that now. I understand you have a passport. Please hand it over. It's my property. No, no, I don't think you realize sufficient of the situation you're in. I'm a police officer and it's my duty to arrest you for illegally boarding and traveling on this vessel. And no doubt by the time the dolphin arrives at Southampton docks, more serious charges will be leveled at you. Now, where's that passport? There, in my bag. Thank you. Oh, I see that your name's Sadie Bowden, that you're a widow, that you're born in London. How long were you in the United States? Five years. I went out to join my sister. Then I decided to come back to Britain. Look, all right, so I tried to get a free trip back to Southampton. Is that so terrible? I'm taking possession of your Give handbag. it back to me. You can't do that. Dear me, you seem to have a considerable amount of dollars for the woman who needs to hide in a ship's hold. As I say, you can consider yourself under arrest. You mean I'm not going to get locked up in here? Well, there's no point, unless you're the suicidal type, and I don't think you are. Where's the wireless cabin, Mr. Hughes? Which of these messages would you like me to send first? This one. To New York, and then get through to the Southampton CID and give them this message. Right, sir. But before you start sending these messages, Sparks, there was a rumor in the docks that some kind of mutiny was taking place aboard this ship. Now, you're the only one who could have started that rumor. Unless somebody else has the use of your wireless cabin. I'm sorry about that, sir. I'm in hourly contact with our Southampton office. Once we're in the three-mile limit, yeah. I reported the stowaway, and as Fred Challen was receiving the message, I jokingly said that the ship's crew were mutinous because the skipper was locking this beautiful girl in the cabin and having her all to himself. Have you seen the stowaway? No, sir. But three of the crew digged. I understand she's no chicken, but something of a hellcat in spite of her age. So there's no question of any of the crew being mutinous? Well, I wouldn't say so, sir. Naturally, some of them resented being accused of helping her to stow away in the old. What chance would she have had of getting ashore if she hadn't been discovered? Oh, not very difficult. It was a million to one for the cargo to have shifted as it did. The crew would have been signed off. The immigration and customs would come aboard. Well, they wouldn't have started unloading for at least 24 hours. Whoever was helping her would wrap a great sou'wester around her. And what with all the mist and the fog, oh, well, she would have got ashore all right. You talk as though this sort of thing's been done before. Of course it has. Well, I don't say it's done often, but you go and mix with the ship's crews along the dockside pubs. You'll hear some stories and make your hair stand on end. Uh, well, if you excuse the expressions, sir. Uh, All right, Sparks. Send off those messages as soon as you can. Right away, sir. Oh, and let me know as soon as you get a reply from New York. Right, sir. Oh, excuse me, sir. There's a message coming through. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Gar. I've arranged for you to use the captain's cabin. Good. I want to question every single member of the crew. Oh, very good. Well, have you a ship's plan, you know, where the sleeping quarters are, galleys on? Oh, aye. Yeah, in fact, you'll find it on the wall of the cabin. It's a chart of the dolphin. Good. A message for you, Mr. Mate. Mm-hmm. Harbour Master says that we can get ready to weigh anchor. We can expect the signal to proceed in about a matter of minutes. Right, Sparks. I tell you, the tugs are standing by. Yes, Mr. Mate. Well, if you'll kindly show me to the captain's cabin... My aim was to question every member of the crew, particularly as to where they were and what they were doing at the time when the captain was murdered. But in so doing, I hoped to find out which of the crew conspired to get the woman into the hole. I was fast asleep on my bunk, to be sure. There was four of us in that cabin. Myself, Taffy Evans, Monty Fisher and Harry Fraser. Were you dressed for any emergency? Fast. If you mean must be wearing pyjamas. Oh, no, no. Our vest and underpants are good enough for the likes of us. I didn't mean that, Mr. Collins. As soon as Mr. Hughes realized what had happened, he raised the alarm. What happened? Who woke first? It was Taffy Evans, to be sure. When I'm asleep, it takes more than an alarm bell to wake me. Four of the crew able to give each other an alibi. And so it went on. And with the interrogation came the depressing thought that finding the culprit was going to be no easy task. I left. George Ramsey at the last. I understand it was you who found the stowaway. Yeah. 
I wouldn't have noticed her if I uh, didn't hear some strange voices coming from behind those crates. Huh? Well, that means you're in the clear as far as the stowaway is concerned. Who brought her aboard? I don't know. Honest, I don't. But she must have heard talk. She'd been down in that hole for over eight days. Somebody must have brought her food, water. Well, come on, who was it? I tell you, Governor, no one goes down into the number two hold. It, it was only that the cargo was in danger because of the ship's list. I've never seen a storm like it. But how did anyone know that the cargo was in danger of becoming loose? We didn't. That is, no one except the skipper. It was our man was Captain Timbolt, but no finer a sailor existed. I was on the foredeck during a storm. We were all making fast under the supervision of the first mate. Respected you, Skipper. But who hated him? Who hated him so much as to kill him? No one. I don't believe it. They say he was found at the bottom of the ladder. The game was pretty rough. He might have fallen. You wouldn't say that, Mr. Ramsey, if you saw the body. All right, thank you. I seem to be getting nowhere fast. Oh, tell Mrs. Bowden I want to see her. Aye, aye, sir. Mrs. Bowden, I now know why you had to stir away on a ship. Although you've got over $2,000 in your bag, this has just come down from the wireless room. I'll read it to you. British subject Sadie Bowden disappeared in New York precinct whilst awaiting charge being concerned with attempted extortion conspiracy bail forfeited. The rest doesn't concern you. Listen, I can explain. It was all a mistake. You see, this girl now went save to... save your breath, Mrs. Bowden. If the New York police want you for an extortion rap, that's their affair. I shall be handing you over to the Southampton police on stowaway charges. Or I might take you with me to book you on a charge of conspiracy to an act of murder. Murder? Murder? Why, you're crazy! Am I? One night you're discovered by the master of this vessel acting as a stowaway. The following night he's found with the back of his head stove in. It's no good, Mrs. Bowden. It's too great a coincidence. I swear it, it isn't true. All right, I'll tell you. These two sailors were in the blue domino on the battery. The battery in New York? Yeah. I knew that if I tried to skip the country, I'd have been caught before I got to a railway station, let alone an airport. I was on bail, on condition that I didn't leave Brooklyn. So I got two of my girls to chat these sailors up. They were off the Dolphin. Told us it was due to sail at dawn that morning. Dawn? Well, they got me a jersey and trousers and a cap, and the three of us staggered onto the docks, all pretending to be drunk. One of them went up to chat for a lookout, and the other sneaked me aboard and took me down to that terrible place where they kept all the cargo. Well, what are their names? Oh, come on, woman. Can't you see the position you're in? I don't know their full names. One was called Chip. Suppose he was a carpenter. The other? He was called Harry. Sam Hart and Harry Lester. Well, they've admitted it. I got them both on a close arrest. I understand you're ready to sail. Yeah. What are you going to do with these murderers? We don't know that they are the murderers. Why else should the skipper be killed? Well, my difficulty is that there doesn't seem to be any motive. Motive? Do you realize what these men can get for assisting a stowaway? The point is, Mr. Hughes, that had they killed the stowaway, then their guilt might never be known. Why kill Captain Timbolt? They were safe so long as the woman never talked. Oh. Yes, Bart? Orders to sail, sir. Excuse me, Inspector Carr. I want it up the bridge. <laughs> So the merchant vessel Dolphin sailed into Southampton Harbour and was then guided by two sturdy tugs into the docks. The stowaway was handed over to the Southampton police and I felt that there was no point in keeping the ship's crew on board. It was with a certain amount of reluctance that I told the first mate that they could go ashore, providing each member of the crew left an address where they could be contacted. I set up headquarters at the Transatlantic Shipping Company's dockside office. Well, there's no need to keep you any longer either, Mr. Hughes. I understand the barking police are breaking the sad news to Mrs. Timbo. Well, they should have done what I suggested. Buried him at sea. That's what he would have wanted. Possibly. But that would be impossible. At this very moment, the senior police surgeon at Southampton is examining the body. 
are. This is Southampton General Hospital. Yes? The result of the examination is you requested, Chief Inspector. Estimated time of death between 8 and 10 p.m. Repeat that. Between 8 and 10 p.m. Thank you. Mr. Hughes, I think it'll save time if we go over your statement again. You've got quite a long journey in front of you. Now, you say that... About halfway through the middle watch, you went out on... Now, look, can't I do this some other time? No, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hughes. If I can complete your statement, I can get back to London. Now, you say that you were on deck halfway through the middle watch when you saw a man running away. Right, yes. And it was obvious to you that your captain had just been killed. Yes. Impossible. We've just heard that Captain Timbolt met his death between 8 and 10 o'clock that night. Where were you between 8 and 10? What's all this about? I've been asking the wrong sort of questions, that's what. You saw someone running away. What was he dressed in? Like any sailor. Jersey, his cap. I told him it was too dark to see. I'm arresting you, Mr. Hughes, for the murder of Captain William Timbold, and I must warn you. (laughs) All right, Mrs. Barton. You're being moved to the magistrate's cells. Whatever you're charged with, it won't be murder. Hughes has confessed. You're not implicated at all. It seemed that the first mate and the captain quarreled violently. Timbolt went on deck and saw Hughes about to enter the cabin where they'd placed Sadie Bowden. He asked him what he was doing. Hughes made some sort of obscene suggestion. And the captain warned him that he would be reported to the shipping company. Hughes followed the captain to his cabin and struck him with an axe taken from the fire precaution cupboard. Once I proved to him that his first statement contained an inaccuracy, he made another contradicting his original version as to how he came across the dead body. Did you notice it? Not sure? Then listen to the commercial, and I'll be back to tell you. Take a pack of blossom, get it from fresh taste today. When your breakfast gets them waking in the morning. All the sandwiches you're making in the midday blossom. For your roast and baking in the evening blossom. Take a pack of blossom. Blossom, yellow margarine. Pick a pack of blossoms For sandwiches that burst with health and farm fresh taste Pick a pack of blossoms For frying eggs to a golden turn For dabbing on your vegetables, carrots, peas, potatoes Pick a pack of blossoms For baking and roasting and spreading on crisp warm rolls And satisfying your family with its farm fresh taste Blossom helps a busy mum Make sure today you're choosing it, using it, Blossom, Blossom. Pick a pack of Blossom. Pick a pack of Blossom. Well, we know that Hughes lied when he said that he saw the killer run away at 2 a.m., since Timbolt was murdered some hours earlier. But where did his second statement disagree with his first? Simply this. Originally, Hughes said, I saw someone in oilskins running away. But when we were on land, he said, oh, What was he dressed in? Like any sailor. Jersey, cap. Of course... His statement about quarreling over Sadie Bowden was nonsense. He knew that with Timbold out of the way, he'd at last realize his dream and be able to use his master's ticket. He saw the stowaway as an opportunity to cast suspicion on everyone aboard the Dolphin except himself. He proved to be wrong. Good night. The Epic Casebook was produced by Michael Silva for the makers of Epic Sunflower Oil, Maple Margarine, Yum Yum Peanut Butter, Niblet Cheese Twist, Halverine Bread Spread, and Blossom Yellow Margarine, with Hugh Rouse as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our 
Epic Casebook. Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Grace. Well, I'm glad you called. I'll have to cancel out tonight, Angel. I'm all jammed up. Mm-hmm. Some girl I know just brought me a very unusual proposition, and I'll be hanged if I touch it. The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now, join him on the air when the Falcon solves the case of the talented twin. And now, the case of the talented twins. It's late evening in New York, and the yellow convertible tears down Riverside Drive. At the wheel is George Alexander, who operates the car as though he owned the streets. Yeah, Mr. Alexander is a big operator. And the blonde alongside of him knows him. You warm enough, Masha? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Alexander. My friends call me George. Now, why don't... Oh, you passed it. Huh? You should have turned right on 76. What for? Well, that's where I live. Oh, I'm not taking you home, Masha. Now, really, Mr. Alexander... George. The only reason I consented to go with you was because Mr. Kemp introduced us. You like singing at Mr. Kemp's club? Yes, of course. What's that got to do with it? It's got everything to do, sweetheart. I own the joint. Oh. Sure. Whose idea do you think it is for Kemp to give you a job in the first place? Uh, I didn't know. Well, any time you don't know something, Masha, you just ask George. He's got all the answers. Well, if you don't mind, Mr. George... I'd like to go home. Really, I've got a splitting headache. That's okay. I have my boy fix you up something at my place. Why don't you sit a little closer? I'm perfectly comfortable over here. Nice. Oh, Too far away. Please, Mr. Alexander, you better look where you're going. <laughs> Come on, Masha. Be sociable. What do you want to sit there all look by... Look out! Huh? You're going to hit that man! Ah! You're not going to leave him lying there. Why not? He may be dead. And we can't do him any good. Let me out. Get your hand up that door, Marsha. I'll let you go when I'm good and ready. And I'm not ready yet. Yes? I'm looking for Michael Waring. Well, you've come to the right place. Are you the one they call the Falcon? When they can't think of anything worse. Come on in, Miss... Uh... Davis. Ruth Davis. Sit down. Thanks. Now, what can I do for you? I'm not quite sure. Did you happen to notice an item in this morning's paper about a man being killed in a hit-and-run accident last night? Yes? Yeah. That man was my father. Oh, I'm sorry. I want you to find the driver of that car. Why? Well, isn't it obvious? That man murdered my dad. He murdered him just as surely as if he used a gun. I don't care what it costs. Well, you should, Angel. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that anything you invest in a case like this, it'd be money thrown down the sewer. As I recall, the police don't have a single lead. Oh, yes, they do. There was a man named Arthur Crane who witnessed the accident. He might know more than he's told them. What makes you think so? Call it a woman's intuition. Well, you know, that's greatly overrated. And... Maybe, but there's no harm in trying. Mm-hmm. What did you say this witness's name was again? Arthur Crane. Arthur Crane. All right, Angel, I'll do what I can. Uh, 
here it is, Artie. Uh, Alexander George Real Estate, 1792 Belmore. It's uh, Elwood O6742. wonder if that's the right Alexander. Well, it has to be. Didn't the license bureau tell you that was the name of the party who owned the car? Yep. Well, it's the only George Alexander in the book. All right, hand me the phone. Right. What's that number again? Uh, Elwood O6742. See who that is, man. You expecting anyone? No. Too early for Jack to drop around. Just a second. Yeah. You want the crane? No. Well, is he in? Who is it, Pete? Uh, it's some guy who wants to see you. How do you do, Mr. Crane? How do you do? My name is Mike Waring. I'm a private detective. Private detective? Yeah, at the moment I'm working for Ruth Davis. Who? Ruth Davis. She's the daughter of the man who was killed last night in that hit-and-run accident. Oh, oh, well, sit down, won't you? Pete, Thanks. see if we got any beer on ice. Yeah. Uh, don't bother, Mr. Uh... Uh, Jordan. Pete Jordan, and it's no bother at all. Yeah, go on, Pete. Now, uh, what can I do for you, Warren? Well, according to the police blotter, you were the one who discovered Davis's body after the accident. That's right. I was coming home from a club date. Club date? Mm-hmm. I'm a musician. Oh. I play piano with a small combo around town. Mm-hmm. Well, go on. Well, just as I got out of the subway, I saw this guy Davis laying in the gutter. What time was that? Oh, it must have been around uh, quarter past three. First, I thought it was just some stew bum, you know. Mm-hmm. So I saw that briefcase under his arm, then I realized it must have been an accident. Well, you couldn't have gotten there much after it happened. That's what the cops told me. You didn't notice any sign of a car around? Nope. Well, there couldn't have been too many cars out of that hour. This is very important to my client. Look, Waring, if there was any way I could possibly help you, I'd be glad to. Any driver who pulls a stunt like that ought to get it in the neck. Yeah, sure, but uh, you can't tell me any more than you have, huh? Not a thing. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Well, here's your beer, gents. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to ask for rain check, Jordan. You going already? Yeah, I got to. But uh, I'll leave my card. If you think of anything... Just leave it to me, Waring. If I think of anything, I'll know what to do. <laughs> Mr. George Alexander around? Who wants to know? My name is Artie Crane, but uh, I don't think it'll mean much to him. Just say I'd like to talk to him about a yellow Buick convertible. You what? Tell him I admire his taste in cars. You're nuts. Mr. Alexander doesn't own any convertible. That's not what the license bureau told me. Uh, maybe you better come in, Buster. Yeah, maybe I better. Sit down. I'll get Alexander. Hey, that's a nifty-looking piano he's got there. Mind if I try it? Just so you don't break it. That's very pretty, mister. You like? Yeah. What do you call it? I've got those gimme, gimme blues. It's a very original title. I'm a very original guy, Mr. Alexander. How so? Well, 99 guys out of 100 who know what I know would have spilled everything to the cops. But not you, huh? Mm Mm-mm. Little Artie knows when to keep his mouth shut. For instance... Skip out of this, Vince. Go on, Crane. Well, for instance, last night I was coming home late and I saw a car bowl over some character who was crossing the street. Fortunately, I had enough presence of mind to copy down the license number. And you think this car belongs to me? Mm Mm-hmm. You're wrong. Okay. I'm perfectly willing to leave it to Mike Waring. The Falcon? That's right. He's working for the daughter of the poor slob who got hit. He was around to see me this afternoon, wanted to know if I could help him. And you told him? Not a thing. I thought I could help you more. How much more? About ten thousand dollars worth. Why, you dirty little let, boy. let go. Should I throw him out, George? Calm yourself, Vince. Don't be so free with your hands. You Mr. shouldn't blame him, Marty. Vince never liked that. Ah, well, that little pushing around is going to cost you another five, Alexander. Why? Take it easy, Vince. You think the money was coming out of your pocket? So now you want fifteen thousand dollars, eh, Artie? Otherwise, I go straight to Waring's and from there to the cops. Well, I wouldn't want you to make such a trip on my account. Then you better get it up. Okay, Artie. You leave it to me. I'll take care of you. And when I get through, I bet you don't complain.
Now back to the adventures of the Falcon. Two hours have passed since Artie Crane made his little call on Mr. Alexander. Now we find Mike making a call of his own. Only his isn't nearly as successful. So when you come right down to it, Mr. Waring, you've made no progress at all. Well, I could give you a big song and dance, Ruth. No, thanks. I'm in no mood for entertainment. You see, the truth of the matter is I'm stymied. The only potential witness we had was this musician, Artie Crane. And he couldn't tell you anything? No, not a single solitary... Th- oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? That briefcase your father was carrying... That won't help you. They found it clear across the street where it was knocked by the car. Well, if it was knocked there by the... Say that again. Why? This Artie Crane character told me he realized that it wasn't some drunk sleeping it off when he noticed the briefcase under your father's arm. Well, what's wrong with that? Hey, you just said it, Angel. The car sent that briefcase flying. If Crane saw it under your father's arm, it could only have been while your father was alive. Then Crane was lying. That he was. Well, you think... I think I ought to have another little talk with that boy. Oh. Let's see if we can get him up here. He, he won't suspect anything? Not if it's put to him the right way. Well, what are you telling me? Now, don't you worry, Ruth. I'll add lib something. Uh, hello, I'd like to speak to Artie Crane, please. Who wants him? Mike Waring. Well, Artie isn't here. This Pete Jordan? No, Pete isn't here either. Well, where is everybody? Unless there's been a change in plans, you might try the morgue. Hello, you still there, mister? Yeah, I'm just waiting for the top right. Ra- hey, wait a minute. Is this Sergeant Corbett? Sure is, Mike. All right, Corbett. Give it to me gently. Who did what to whom? Well... Whom is your friend Artie Crane? The what was a half dozen slugs through his head. As far as the who is concerned, we got no idea. Have you, Mr. Waring? Okay, okay, I'm coming. Hello, Pete. Oh, hi, Mr. Waring. Well, I drop around and redeem that rain check. Rain check? I asked for one the last time I was here. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you heard about Artie. Mm Mm-hmm. That his piano? Yeah. To think he'll never touch it again. Mm. Just how good was he on it? Oh, you can have the Duke and Count Basie. I'd have taken Artie any time. You a musician, too? Yeah, but I wasn't in his class. I I used to sing a little. Oh. Well, how about an audition? What do you mean? Well, you never can tell, Pete. I may want to sponsor you. So let's hear how well you do in the voice department. Who killed Artie? Now, look, you can't talk to me like that. Come on, Pigeon. Sing. <laughs> Artie, ouch. I wouldn't try that. If your big brother was around. Let me go. Not before we have a solo. Now, who killed Artie? How should I know? You should if anyone would. Who had it in for him? No one. Everybody liked him. Uh-huh. So one of his admirers pumped six slugs into his face so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. Incidentally, how did you? There wasn't a thing on the body. Well, I, I found him here. Might have been a visitor from Mars. Yeah, but he had a, a flag tattooed on his shoulder. A patriot, no less. Who was the hit-and-run driver who killed Davis? I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do, Pete. Artie must have told you everything. He saw the car that killed Davis. No, no, he didn't. You know, you won't look so good singing without those dazzling white teeth. <laughs> well? It's a fellow named Alexander. Does this fellow have a first name? George. George? You mean Arthur tried to shake down George Alexander? You know him? Well enough to realize that Artie made a serious mistake trying it. Let's hope we all profit by his example. That's you, Vince? Yeah. How you make out? Just look. All right, beautiful. Inside. Stop that! Inside. Hello, Marsha. You're not going to get away with this, Mr. Alexander. I told you my friends called me George. You want to be my friend, huh? No. You're fooling. Sit down, baby. You can't keep me here. You can't keep me here. You can't do this. You can't do that. Why don't you give that tongue a rest? All right, that's enough, Vince. <laughs> Marsha and me, we understand each other. Well, don't we, sweethearts? What do you want? I just want to make sure you didn't tell anybody about our little ride there. Get it, Vince. What about Marsha? What's the matter? Can a gentleman invite a lady up to his apartment? After all, we got you for a chaperone. All right, all right. Hold your horses, will you? Hello, is George Oh, I see he is. Wait a minute, Buster. Not so fast. It's okay, Vince. This is the pork and his old friend of mine. 
Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Am I interrupting something? No. Marsha, meet my query. How do you do? Well, generally I do all right, but I see George does even better. <laughs> Cute kid, eh? Yes, indeedy. Well, if you gentlemen are through discussing me, I'll say goodnight. Hold it, sister. Hmm. He's got a hypnotized. Vince just thought maybe I want to tell us something. It's okay, Marsh. I'll give you a call later. All right, George. <laughs> you wish you were in my shoes, eh, Mike? Hardly, George. I wouldn't care to face a murder rap. I'm afraid I don't understand you, Wary. Well, it stems from the manslaughter charge. Manslaughter? Mm-hmm. For killing Ralph Davis with your car last night. You know, Mr. D.A. could tell this story very effectively. It's got a wonderful moral, how one crime leads to another. Now, the opening scene would show you driving along. Get out. But... Well, you might let me finish, George. It's got great dramatic possibilities. You heard him. Get out. Who's this, little Sir Echo? If you're not out of here by the time I count through... You mean you're not interested in how my little script ends? No. And you keep up like this, Mike, and you won't be around for the end. Dear Mr. Waring, but what happened after that? That's all there was, Ruth. You mean you know who killed my father and you let him go? I mean he let me go. He bought you off. No, no, no. Wait a minute, oh, Angel. I'm sure I was a fool not to see it before. Well, we'll see what the police think. Now, about... sit down. Oh. You listen to me, Ruth. I walked out on Alexander because there wasn't a thing I could do. You know he ran over my father. Yeah, sure I do, but where's our evidence? There isn't any way I could tie it to him. The only witness was murdered. Well... Well, what? You know he murdered Arthur Crane. Can you prove that? Well, it stands to reason... Look, Angel, you can build as good a case against several other people. Uh, who, for example? Well, for example, you. What? Sure. You knew Artie Crane could identify the man who killed your father. And when he refused to give you any information, you murdered him. That's the most ridiculous piece of... Yes? Well? That's right. My name's Marsha West. I don't know if you remember me. Oh, you underestimate your charms, Marsha. You're the kind of a girl my kind of man could never forget. Well, I'd like to talk to you. Well, what would be the point? I thought you were a close friend of Alexander's. Well, I was in his car last night. You what? Yes, he was taking me home when he killed that man. Where are you now? At the place where I work. It's called the TikTok Club. When can I expect you? Just open your door, Angel. I'm practically there now. Come on, you creep. Snap into it. We haven't got all night. The show goes on in a few... Yeah, what do you want, mister? Where's Marshal West's dressing room? The first one on your left. This one here? Yeah, that's right. I don't keep her too long. She's on in ten minutes. Come on, girls. Don't stand. Marsha? Marsha? She ain't here, Waring. What? No, just stay like you are, Falcon. Lock the door, Vince. All right. Where is she, George? Where is Sue? Marsha. She called me from here not more than 15 minutes ago. You say, Vince? Was it uh, that old hag with the mop? Well, you boys ought to try television. That's a great act you've got there. I'm glad you like it. What am I should tell you on the phone? Who? Don't be smart. And I just wanted to show you that two could play that game. What you tell him? Enough. You know, I wouldn't need much excuse to paste you one right now, Buster, so don't tempt me. What do you say, Mike? I say you boys aren't very smart. There are a dozen people out there. And they all work for me. So start talking. Well, <coughs> why, you... Careful, chum. Now, why you want to knock him down for Vince? <laughs> you only got to pick him up again. That's all right, Alex. I'm in very good shape. I can keep this up all night. <laughs> well, sleeping beauty, I didn't even have to kiss you to wake you up. Huh? Yeah, this isn't the Prince's Palace. It's Bellevue Hospital. Uh, no kidding. Okay, Mike, who slugged you? First, I want to know where you found me, Sergeant. On West 8th Street. Well, how did I get down there? I can tell you one thing. I don't think you made it on foot. Uh, someone must have given me a lift. Oh? A character named Vince, working at the behest of George Alexander. What do they want to do that for? Because Alexander was the one who drove the car that killed Ralph Davis last night. Last night? Well, isn't it Sunday? Where have you been? Don't bother answering, I know. All right, all right. What day is it? Monday. Mon... Holy smoke. Where's Marsha? Who? 
Marsha West. She was in the car when Alexander killed Davis. She tell you that? Yes, and I wouldn't be surprised if she knew all about the Artie Crane killing, too. Is that tied up with this? Definitely. You see, Crane tried to blackmail Alexander, and he... That's so fast. Can you prove that? No, I can't hear, Corbett. So let's go where I can. Back to the adventures of the Falcon. A half hour has passed since Mike Waring set out with Sergeant Corbett to try to tie the case together. Their destination, the apartment of George Alexander. You're a pretty sick man, Waring. You don't know what you're saying. No, it's no use, George. We've got all the evidence we need. Right, Sergeant? Right. So why don't I hear from the district attorney? You will, shortly. You're still bluffing, Mike. Admit it. All right, then how do I know you paid off to Artie Crane? You know? Yes, and I can prove it. How about that, Mr. Alexander? Well, you see, it's like this, Sergeant. It was no shakedown. I gave Artie the money. Oh, because you were impressed by his musical talents and wanted to see him further his career? Well, Mike, you take the words right out of my mouth. Oh, no. Something wrong? You don't think the DA will buy that? Why not? If it's okay for me to help young ladies interested in musical careers, why not young men? Sounds logical. Oh, come on, Corbett, be smart. You don't believe that? I didn't say it did. I just said it sounded logical. That's all I ask. Where's Vince? What? I want to talk to him. You're going to have a long wait. Vince leaves town Friday night. Friday? Yeah. Uh huh. I suppose that was his double who bounced me around backstage at the TikTok club on Saturday. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, sure. Next you'll say you never heard of a girl named Marsha West. Of course I have. Oh, sweetheart. Call me, George. Marsha. Is this the girl you mean? All right, never mind the act, George. Listen, Marsha, this is Sergeant Corbett. I want you to tell him everything. Everything? Yes, beginning with your call to me on Saturday night. My call to you? Don't you remember? I don't see how I could be expected to, Mr. Waring, seeing this is the first time we've met. What? But it's been a real pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> You know, Mike, maybe we ought to go back to the hospital. It's not a bad place. They got a couple of good-looking nurses there. Okay, okay, so I'm nuts, Sergeant. But just humor me a couple minutes more. I still don't see what you're going to accomplish with Pete Jordan. I tell you, he knows that Artie Crane went to see Alexander. That still don't prove anything. Crane could have gone to see Alexander for a million reasons. Well, suppose Pete's willing to swear that he... Yeah? Well, if it isn't the gay troubadour. Hello, Pete, remember me? Now, look, Waring, I'm busy. Yeah, sure you are. This won't take much of your time. Did Artie Crane tell you he saw the car that killed Ralph Davis in that accident? Well, uh... Well, didn't he? Yeah. Get your coat, Jordan. We're going downtown. Uh, now, don't rush him, Sergeant. You might break the spell. As long as Pete's in the mood for singing, maybe he'll be willing to croon you something else. I told you everything I know. Not quite. There's one song you forgot. The one that goes, I killed my best friend and am I sorry. What are you talking about? The murder of Artie Crane. You know enough about that to give us a complete chorus. So start singing, pigeon. (laughs) No, girls, that's the whole story. Alexander goes up for manslaughter and Pete Jordan for murder. Any questions? I have one, Mike. So have I. Uh, I think Marshall's first, Ruth. All right, go on, Marsha. Well, first, I think I owe you an explanation. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Alexander made me say I didn't know you. He and Vince caught me phoning you that night. Yes, I figured as much. I was afraid of what he might do, not only to me, but to you. Well. I thought she had a question to ask. Oh, well, all I wanted to know is what made you suspect Pete Jordan. Very simple thing, Angel. As you recall... When the police found Artie, there was nothing on him. So? So the question arises, Ruth, what happened to the hush money Alexander paid him? I don't get it. I pulled one bluff on Alexander that worked. The only reason he admitted giving money to Artie was that he thought I could prove he did. And you couldn't? No, because there was no money found on the body. And it stood to reason that Alexander and Vince didn't remove it. Otherwise, they would have known I was bluffing. So I figured maybe this was just a plain, everyday murder for money. And once you realized that, it was just a matter of picking out the only party who had the opportunity. That's right. And that gave me Pete Jordan. 
But I'll tell you one thing this business taught me. What? Never take a case where two beautiful women are involved. Makes for complications. <laughs> How so? Well, it's too much of a good thing. You know the old saying, two's company, three's a crowd. He's got a point there, Ruth. He certainly has. No, 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 don't fight. I'm sure we can settle this peaceably. I'm sure we can. That's the spirit. Now, how are we going to work it? That's easy. Mm -hmm. Good, Good night, night, Mr. Mr. Waring. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Now, these chairs in the front, any of them? Oh, yes, sir. Can I smoke, Lieutenant? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, thanks. Just put one on. How is the woman? Well, they operated this morning. She's pretty low. And the man who owned the car? We picked him up. Did he do it? That's what we want you to tell us, Mr. Dell. <laughs> well, I got a good look. I know. Uh, I can tell you all right. I hope so. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> you people on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. Oh, sure, I can tell you all right. If you're I hope sure so, Mr. Dill, sure I hope so. Suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the bathroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. <coughs> the questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. Okay, okay, move it along, move it along. That's good. Now turn and face front, hands to your side. Look straight ahead. You, you raise your head. Okay. Number one, Albert Bartok. That's all. Where do you live, Albert? 19137 Fuller. What's your business, Albert? You couldn't make it, Al, could you? What's your business, Albert? I'm not working. Why did you hit your wife? Because I'm not working. She keeps reminding me. For two years, she reminds me. Morning, night, and noon, she reminds me. It depressed me. You hit her with a chair. It was the nearest thing. Every time I tried to sit down, she grabbed my hair. She wouldn't give me no peace, so when she grabbed my hair, I grabbed the chair. Number two, Henry Ingram, vagrancy. Oh, the sergeant. This is twice this month, Henry. Uh, yes, sergeant. I just got out. <laughs> Why were you trying to catch the duck? I was walking through the park. I saw the duck. I wasn't trying to catch it. I was trying to pet it. I like ducks. You ruined the whole flower bed trying to pet it. Yes, sergeant. Number three, Martin Cerruti, theft. I told you to keep your head up. Okay, okay. Where do you live, Cerruti? I'm from Denver. We know that. Where do you live here? I don't. I just got off the train. You stole a coat from the wheelwright department store. I forgot to take it off. All right, you've got a place to live now. Number four, John Wolcott, armed robbery, murder. Hey, Lieutenant, where can I put out my cigarette? In the floor. What's your business, John? I run a gas station. Where, John? Corner of 105th and Sutton Place. On the night of November 12th, you held up the Albert Candy store. No, I didn't, Sergeant. You and another unidentified man shot the owner, Mr. Gus Alver, and his wife, Dora. I had nothing to do with it. That's the charge, John. Yeah, uh, Lieutenant, yeah. uh, that's him. Yeah, he's the Are one I chased. Are there any questions sure? oh, yeah, that's him. I'm from the audience? Lieutenant? Yeah. I think Any he's the questions one. or identifications uh, yes, from the audience? Sergeant Graham. Yes, Lieutenant. Number four, hold for interrogation. <laughs> Sit down, John. All right. I'm liable to be a little rough on you. I didn't do anything. I told you before, I didn't do anything. One witness and Mr. Dill chased a man, saw him climb into a station wagon, got the license number. It turned out to be your car, John. In the lineup this morning, Mr. Dill identified you as the man he chased. He's wrong. Two other men and a woman also identified you. They all agree they saw you run out of that candy store with another man. 
The owner of that store died last night. I'm sorry. His wife's in bad shape, but she'll live. Look, I've never been in that candy store. I didn't shoot anybody. You live with your brother? Yes. George Walker? Yes. Where was he that night? You keep asking. He went to a movie. And he didn't take the station wagon? I told you, no, he didn't take the station wagon. Does George have a key to the station wagon? How many times do I have to tell you? Does he have a key? No, no, no. He didn't take the car out of the garage that night. Somebody did, John. All right, all right. Somebody took it out. I didn't. George didn't. Go find out who. When Mrs. Albert is better, when the doctors say it's all right for us to see him, we'll ask her for an identification. Okay. Two men held up a storm, killed her husband. Four witnesses have already identified you as one of the men. Mrs. Alba will know for sure. She won't forget who killed her husband. Okay. I, uh, got the brother in your office, Ben. All right. Nothing? Not yet. Take this one back upstairs. Uh Uh-huh. George. Hello, Lieutenant Guthrie. George, your brother's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I know. He sticks with his story. Says he didn't leave the house that night. Says he didn't use the station wagon. Says you didn't either. I didn't. You went to a movie. That's right. The Rivoli, wasn't it? I gave a long statement this morning, Lieutenant. I signed it. Somebody used that station wagon. When the arresting officers got to your house, the motor was still warm. I didn't use it, and I know my brother didn't. You think somebody could have gotten that car out of the garage without your brother hearing it? I don't know. Maybe they could. Hold up a candy store, shoot two people, bring it right back to the garage? I don't know. I just know I didn't use it, and I know my brother didn't either. He doesn't hold up a candy store or shoot anybody. My brother wouldn't do anything like that. Uh, What time did you get home? I have to keep telling you. You have to keep telling me. (sighs) Around 12 o'clock, or maybe a little after. There was a cop waiting for me. He'll remember what time better than I do. You went to the movie? Yeah. What time did you get to the movie? Mm -hmm. After 8 sometime. What was playing? Two pictures, Mr. Lucky and a Lady Takes a Chance. They're reissues, aren't they? I saw them before, a long time ago. They're good ones. I wanted to see them again. Your brother runs a gas station, doesn't he? Yeah. How late does he work? Usually, around 7. How does your brother do in his gas station? He does all right. Makes pretty good money. You don't work? No, no, I've been looking for a job. How old are you, George? Twenty-two. John's twenty-eight? Yeah. When did your mother and father die? Mom died when we were kids. Dad, about five years ago. And John's been supporting you? I told you I was trying to get a job. It's not easy. And I want to talk to you again. Stick around home. Sure, Lieutenant. My brother didn't do it, Lieutenant. Awful lot of evidence, George. But he didn't. We'll talk about it later. Bye, George. Good night, Lieutenant. Howard? Yes, Lieutenant. George Walcott's coming out. Put a man on him. Right. <sighs> What's the matter, Ben? You look unhappy. I'm tired. You want some coffee? You got it made? No, but it'll only take a second. Well, you won't have time. The hospital call. It's all right to see Mrs. Albert. Oh, okay. Hey, here's uh, the report on John Walcott. On good months, he averages about 300 clear, pays $85 a month on the mortgage. A lot of people doing a whole lot worse. Let's get Walcott and take him down to the hospital with us. Mrs. Albert. Mrs. Albert. Hmm? Yes. What is it? This is Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Greb. They want to talk to you. All right. We won't take long. All right. We want you to tell us if you've ever seen this man before. Move up, John. Right in here. Mrs. Alba? I don't know. I'm not sure. Could he be one of the men who held up your store? I don't know. He looks... I don't know. He isn't the one who shot us. The one with the gun. He isn't? No. He's not that one. You sure? Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Well, Mrs. Alba, several people say they saw this man run away from your store. I don't remember the other one too well. The one who stood by the door. It happened so quick. The man with the gun... He's the one I remember. 
He was in the middle of the room. It all happened so quick. The other one I didn't really notice. I think that's about enough for now, Lieutenant. My husband's dead. And we'll do everything we can, Mrs. Elmer. What can you do? He's dead. That's all. I hope you didn't have anything to do with it, young man. I hope for your sake you didn't. It's a terrible thing. Thanks, man. Yeah? They're here, Lieutenant. Oh, all right. Uh, send in Mr. Dill first. Well, is the coffee all right? <laughs> Whew, hot. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Dill, Lieutenant. Uh, come in, Mr. Dill. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? You met Sergeant Graham? Yes. Uh, hello, Sergeant. Hello, Mr. Dill. Have a seat. Thank you. Mr. Dill, we know definitely the man you identified this morning wasn't the one who actually did the killing. He was one of the men who ran away from that storm. Well, we're interested in the other man now. What did he look like? Uh, well, it all happens fast. Like I told you, I was just walking by when I heard the shot and then the scream. The door to the store flew open. Two men came out. They were running. The first one, the one in front, was the one I pointed out the lineup. You didn't uh, notice the other man? No, not exactly. I got to kind of a look at him, but it all happens fast. I guess I was more interested in the other one, the one I recognized. You don't think you could identify the other one? Well, they separated, like I told you. They started running in different directions. I went after the one who climbed in the station wagon, and I got his license number. You went right after him? Well, I took a look in the store first. I wanted to see what was going on. Then you went after him. Well, I went after the one with the station wagon, yes. I saw the two people lying on the floor, blood. Well, I I just went after him. How far did you chase him before he got in the station wagon? Oh, about a block, I guess. And how far away from him were you when he drove the station wagon off? Oh, I don't know. Guess about uh, 50 feet. Uh, uh, Were you across from the station wagon or behind it? I was behind it. I was chasing him. Yes, I know, but uh, he didn't cut across the street? The station wagon wasn't parked on the other side of the street? No, he just ran up the block. The station wagon was parked on the same side of the street. Uh, well, did he turn around and look back at anything? Well, I don't remember. I don't I don't think so. He just ran up to the car and drove off before I could catch him. But you recognize Oh, him. sure, the man this morning in the lineup. You yeah. don't remember anything about the other one? Mm, no, 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 I'm sorry. I don't. <sighs> all right, Mr. Dell. Uh, is that all? Yeah, that's all, and thank you. Oh, sure, any time. Uh, Mr. Dill. Uh, yes? If this man was running away from you, you were behind him the whole time. You were about 50 feet away behind the wagon when he drove off. Now, I should think it would be a little hard to tell much about a man under those circumstances. Well, I got a good look. Oh, a darn good look. You said he didn't turn around. Well, no, I, I, I don't think that. I don't remember that well. I got a look at him when he ran out that door. Oh, he went right past me. Oh, I got a look at him then. Yeah. All right, Mr. Dell, that's all. Yeah, well, he was the guy. I got a good look. Yeah. Oh, oh then. You think you'll want me again? We'll call you if we do. What are you doing, Ben? Trying to get a description of the man who used the gun. Yeah. And while you're doing it, you practically made Dill a liar. The way he tells it, or I should say the way you got it out of him, he couldn't have made a positive identification of a man who ran past him through a doorway, then showed him his back for the rest of the time. Yeah, I know, I know. In the lineup this morning, Dill and the others didn't say a word until they heard you read off the charges. But before they went in, they knew whoever we had was the one who owned the station wagon. Okay, okay, explain me the station wagon. Dill got the license number. The car was still warm. Yes, I know, I know. Well, then what are you trying to do? I'm trying to find out who killed the man in the candy store. By making a liar out of the best witness you've got? Who's making a liar? Well, you're trying pretty hard. Well, do you mind if we find out what the other three witnesses have got to say? Well... You don't have to get jumpy. I don't. Oh, swell. Yes, Lieutenant. Send in Mrs. Evans. I'm, uh... I'm sorry, Ben. Maybe you'd better put some more sugar in your coffee, huh? Two fellows who certainly know their way around the popular music world will be guest experts on songs for sale tomorrow night on CBS. Join Frank Sinatra and Johnny Mercer with Jan Murray and the others on songs for sale this Friday night. 
And also be listening for that hour of top drama with Up for Parole and Broadway's My Beat. They'll all be here on most of these same CBS stations. Okay. Okay, nobody remembers the second man. Everybody remembers the first. Everybody remembers the first. Everybody claims they recognized the guy as he came out the door. Running. Yeah, running. So maybe because they knew Wolcott owned the station wagon, they jumped to identify him. Yeah, we've had wrong identifications before. Yes, but that's the station wagon. That's the car one of the hold-up men jumped into. Four people, four people, three men and a woman, claimed they recognized the guy. So suppose they really didn't get a good look at him. It was Wolcott's station wagon. Dill got the license number. Two of the other witnesses saw Dill chase the guy, saw the wagon pull away. One of them even identified the make of the wagon. <coughs> yeah? Sergeant Quine on the phone, Lieutenant. Okay. Quine's tailing George Walcott. Yes, Quine. You ever see the man? Uh, what's the address of the pool? Uh, uh, who's the girl? Paul? Uh-huh. But all right, stay with him. I'm going out for a while. Oh, what do you got? I don't know. I don't want to check it. Quine says George Walcott met a man in a pool room, talked with him for a long time, and then went over to see a girl named Hall. It may be nothing, but I'm going to do some checking. <laughs> Sure, I know Walcott. Plays snooker in here all the time. Hey, you know his brother? No, didn't know he had one. Uh, George met a man in here today. He, he left, went across the street to get a shoe shine. Tall, thin man, dark, wearing a brown jacket, light pants. Rudy. Rudy? Rudy Garvin. He plays in here all the time, too. Buddy of George's. They pal around a lot. Rudy Garvin. You know him? Yeah. I don't like him. Slimy kind of a guy. He's a bad boy. Yeah, I, I, I kind of remember him. Well, you gave him a shine. Tall, thin, dark man, brown jacket like pants. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, with a younger fellow, brown hair. Yeah, 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 about an hour ago. Uh, pay any attention to what they were saying? No, sir, I just shine the shoes. Yeah? Miss Hall? Yeah. Lieutenant Guthrie, police. Oh. What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. Come in. Apartment's a mess. You know George Walcott? Yeah. You done something? He came to see you a little while ago. Sure, I know him. We're just friends. You done something? You know Rudy Garvin? Yeah. Friend of George's. What did George want? Just say hello. We just stopped by to say hello. How well do you know him? Not too well. We're just friends. You know his brother? No. Never met him. How well do you know Rudy Garvin? Like I know George. Say, what is this? Where were you last night? Last night? Home. I stayed home all night. I was going to clean the apartment, but I got to read in a book. Did you see or talk to George or Rudy any time last night? No. Gee, I sure would like to know what this is all about. Did the boys do something dishonest? You just forget about it, Miss Hall. You just forget about talking to me. Sure. Thanks for your help. Anytime. Sure sorry the apartment's such a mess. the file on Rudy Garb and Ben and his pictures. Uh -huh. Yeah, a dozen arrests, two convictions, petty theft and possession. A cheap hood with a nasty disposition thinks he's tough. Yeah. Here's uh, Quine's last report on George Walcott. Tailed him from the girls to the east side of town where he met the same man he met in the pool hall. Rudy Garvin. Young Walcott's in his house now. Quine staked out across the street. Check on this Miss Hall. Here's the address. 
Put a man over there to watch him. Right. I'll check back. I'm going down to the hospital and show this picture of Rudy Garvin to Mrs. Albert. She's a lot worse. She's had a bad time. Is she conscious? She was. Mrs. Alba. Yes. Mrs. Alba, the lieutenant's here again. He wants to talk to you. Hello, Mrs. Alba. Oh. Hello, Lieutenant. I won't take much time. I want you to look at this picture. All right. Lieutenant. Yes? Lieutenant, that's a man. You're sure? That's a man with a gun. The one who shot me. That's the one. He killed Gus. Fine brought in George Wolcott about five minutes ago. Uh-huh. What about Rudy Garvin? Well, we're checking. Oh, George. Hello, Lieutenant. What's this all about? I'll stay in the chair, George. What's this all about? Why'd that cop bring me in? Well, we wanted to talk to you some more, George, about your brother. Oh. A couple of things have come up. Made us kind of change our mind about him. You mean you don't think he did it? We're pretty sure he didn't. Well, I told you so. He wouldn't stick up a store or shoot anybody. No, I guess not. He just isn't the kind. He knows who did stick up that store, though. He knows who was using that station wagon. Well... Why doesn't he tell you? Oh, he's probably protecting somebody. You think it's me? You think I stuck up that store? Somebody took that station wagon. Yeah, well, I didn't. I told you that. I told you I was on a show. What show, George? I told you. The Riverly? Yeah. You're a pretty good snooker player, I hear. Snooker? How long have you known Rudy Garvin, George? Oh, about... Oh, I don't know, a couple years, I guess. Why? What do you want to know about Rudy for? What were the two movies you saw, George? Lady takes a chance and Mr. Lucky. What time did you get to the theater? About eight, I guess. You sure? Yeah, about eight. You met Garvin today at a pool hall. So what? You talked with him and then you went over to see a girl named Hall. Yeah, that's right. What's the matter with that? Do you have a key to that station wagon, George? Well, yeah, John and me, we both got keys. What do you want to know about Rudy for? He's got a record. He's a tough boy to get mixed up with. I didn't know he had a record. What time did you leave the house before you went to the movie, George? Uh, around seven. Seven. Rivoli's not far from your house. What did you do from seven to eight? I uh, stopped in the pool hall and shot a game. You run into Rudy Garvin? No, 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 I didn't see him that night. You didn't drive the station wagon? No, I sure didn't. Your brother's a pretty nice guy. He's all right. Look, I didn't do this thing. Why do you think I had something to do with it? What picture was playing when you got to the movie? Uh, Mr. Lucky. They had a newsreel, I suppose. Yeah. Your brother's been supporting you for a long time, hasn't he? Yeah, I told you I was trying to get a job. You went out looking for a job? Yeah. Where'd you go? Who'd you see? Why, well, I, I saw a lot of people. I don't remember all of them. Name a couple. Well, gee, in the last couple of weeks, I haven't been looking What so did you hard. see the girl for today? Betty? Last name's Hall. Yeah, Betty Hall. What'd you see her for? Why, well, just went over to see her. For nothing, just to see her. What part of Mr. Lucky did you get in on? What part? Yeah, what part was happening, you know, what was happening in the story when you walked in? Well, have you seen it? Yeah, we've seen it. Well, you remember the part when they had the big gambling party? Yeah. Well, that was the part when I walked in. Cary Grant had all that money wrapped up in... Where did the newsreel come in? End of the show? Between pictures? Between the pictures. What time did you get out of the show? About 11.30, I guess. I I got back to the house around 12, and I I met the cop who took me down here. And you didn't drive the station line? No. And you didn't see Rudy Garvin? No. The woman who was shot identified Garvin as the man who shot her. Well, I can't help that. I wasn't with Rudy. I didn't see him You saw both pictures? Yes. You've seen them before, haven't you? Yeah, they're old pictures, but I liked them. I saw them again. I told you that, Lieutenant. You didn't take a message from Rudy Garvin to Betty Hall? No. No, I left Rudy, and I I just decided to stop by and see What was the newsreel about? The newsreel? Yeah, what was it about? Well, I, I don't know. I, uh, I, I left in the middle. You left in the middle of it? No, no, I didn't mean that. Well, what was it about? I don't remember. You can't expect me to remember everything. You remember the two pictures? Well, yeah, sure. Then you should remember the newsreel. Have something about Korea? Why? Truman? Last week's football games? 
I don't remember. You can't blame me for that. The candy store was robbed about nine. That would be about the time the newsreel went on. I don't remember the newsreel. I, I, I think I went out to get some popcorn. You were out for the whole newsreel? Maybe I was. What went on after the newsreel? The other picture. Didn't they have any coming attractions or anything? They usually do. Yeah, they had coming attractions. What were they? I don't remember that either. You remember both pictures, but you don't remember the newsreel or the coming attractions? No. Which was first, the newsreel or the coming attractions? The newsreel. How do you know that? Because I, I, I saw it start, and, and then I went to get the popcorn. How did it start? I don't remember. Then the coming attractions went on? Yes. I thought you said the other picture went on after the newsreel. I think you better tell us where you really were, George. Okay. Get a stenographer, man. Right. Cigarette, George? Yeah. Where can we find Rudy Garvin? Over at Betty's apartment. That's why I went by to tell her that Rudy would be by around nine tonight. They're leaving town. Will you let my brother go now? There's two cars at the end of the street. Quine and Asher are around back. Two men at each side of the building. Quine and Asher moved everybody out except the girl. She's still in there, hasn't left her room. Uh, what time is it? Nine o'clock. Well, Rudy's late. We take him on the street? No, he's got a gun. Better wait. Quine said the landlady was a little unhappy, afraid she was going to get her place shot up. Well, I hope she doesn't. There's a... There's a cab. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's Garvin. Let him get into the building. All right, let's go. Second floor. Third door. Yeah? Who is it? George. What do you want? What do you want? <coughs> the government! <laughs> Garvin's pretty bad. You uh, better get an ambulance. Boy, we sure wrecked this place. Uh, don't worry about it. Betty never cleans it anyway. Lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? <coughs> Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call out their number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of a suspect, The lineup stars William Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Raymond Burr, Sam Edwards, Clayton Post, High Averback, Jeanette Nolan, and Jean Tatum. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, two of radio's top reporters, Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas, are heard on most of these same CBS stations. Backed by the resources of CBS' famous worldwide news-gathering organization. Ed Murrow and Lowell Thomas bring you the facts of the day's events, plus the color and background they've gathered in years of world travel and reporting. Get the news first and best from Ed Murrow and Lowell Thomas each weekday evening on CBS.
This is CBS, the star's address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. When it started, it was simple, just a lawsuit for damages. But before it was over, it was far from simple, and the damages were murder. All because of a red-headed woman, a ghostwriter with ambition, and a match that burned with a bright green flame. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Green Flame. It had been the kind of early start, late finish, crowded in between day that had made breakfast coffee, lunch a ham sandwich on the run, and dinner nothing. So by the time it finally ended, it was pushing nine o'clock. And I was both a little tired and a lot hungry. All of which made the feast I could imagine spread out in front of me over an emerald green tablecloth something better than good enough to eat. Blue point oysters on a half shell, a Caesar salad. Veal scallopini topped with mushrooms the size of silver dollars. Oh, I was ready for it. Yes. Yes, well, the oysters once again became a blue ashtray. The scallopini a notebook. A green cloth underneath all... My desk blotter. Hello, Marlowe speaking. Jody Whitmore, Marlowe. Ever hear of me? I have. I've also heard you own half a dozen screen magazines, a local radio station, and a daily published for the motion picture industry called The Hollywood Trades. Is that covered? Not quite. Today I acquired something else. A libel suit for 100000 that was just slapped against the trades by a has-been actor named Bradford Colby, which, Marlowe, is the reason I'm calling you. Oh? So drop whatever you're doing, boy, and get over here to the Whitmer Building. Whitmer Building? We're on El Centro near Gower and closed tomorrow Sunday, no addition. Figures. When the night watchman lets you in, turn left, keep walking till you get to an office number 116. You got that? Yeah, 116. But if you don't mind, Miss Whitmer, I'd like to do something. I'd like to eat first. Make a coffee and a ham sandwich at the outside and get over here fast. Coffee? Look, Miss Whitmer, I'm starving. Hello. How much do you get a day? Twenty-five in expenses. Why? I'm willing to pay a hundred and twenty-five, and you keep track of the expenses. Now, what do you say, boy? Boy says coffee and a ham sandwich will leave him stuffed. Goodbye, Miss Whitmar. Come in, Marlowe. Sit down over here, and if you smoke cigars, don't. I can't stand them. Drink? No, thanks. Marlowe, our A1 gossip columnist, Stanley McGrath, had this to say in today's edition of The Trade. Mm -hmm. The sometimes actor, Bradford Colby, won't call it quits. When refused a part by an independent producer who's short on funds, Colby offered to hawk all and come up with 20000 if the producer would change his mind. The producer wouldn't. End of quote. And beginning of noise from Colby, huh? Yes, a clamor that we can only silence by proving that McGrath, what he said, is true. Which shouldn't be impossible, because Max was a thorough man and never heard of the word rumor. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean, was a thorough man? He died of a stroke, Marlow, at five this morning, en 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 route to the hospital, age 61. Mm. His column, as usual, arrived here yesterday afternoon in the mail. He always wrote from his home, which is a junk-filled cracker box, upon North Brunson. And now you're being sued by Colby for damages, huh? The late Mr. McGrath isn't around to prove what he said is true. You catch. And <laughs> being very unpopular with producers myself these past 30 years, Marlowe, <laughs> I have no chance of any help from the one who actually turned Colby down for that part, whoever he is. All of which makes my job what? Precisely this. Fine, max source of information. Come in, Larry. Larry North, Marlowe. My editor and anybody's Napoleon. Larry, meet Mr. Marlowe. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Doty, I've just found out that old Max only Lakeman, a queer duck named Leonard Phipps, left town sometime yesterday for San Diego. May or may not be back by now. Where's Marlowe going to start? Well, I think... At old Max's place. Larry and I have already checked there, Marlowe. 8312 North Bronson. 
Maybe you'll grab onto something that we overlooked. Here's the key. Thanks. Mac lived alone. Don't get wrapped up in his notes. That gibberish. And remember, my lawyers are sure that we lose this case if we can't prove what Mac said was the truth. Well, yeah. All as soon as you get a lead, and if I'm out, Larry will be in his office next door. And Mallow, don't waste any time. There's a lot at stake, boy. <laughs> Dodie Whitmer had labeled a cracker box turned out to be a five-room, slightly beat-down, almost square house set back some 50 carelessly landscaped feet from a high stucco wall that said the late Mr. McGrath had lived alone and liked it. And when I entered and went to his study where I turned on a desk lamp, I saw what my client had meant by junk. There were the odds and ends that a man collects in a lifetime. On his desk, a tarnished loving cup for excellence in reporting, dated 1927. Beyond that, on the mantle, an autographed picture of Teddy Roosevelt, and next to it, a paperweight from Niagara Falls. And then... And then an item I hadn't expected. In a shadowed corner of the room, there was somebody else. A tall, gaunt somebody else, wearing horn-rimmed glasses and papers sticking out of every pocket. He was slowly, an inch at a time, backing off from the edge of the circle of light in which I stood. I took one casual step toward the desk, and then... <laughs> Get your hands off me. Why? Take a start running, Mr. Leonard Phipps. How do you know my name? I'm psychic. I also know you just got back from San Diego. What I don't know is what you're doing here. Now, come on. Talk. Is that, don't leave me alone. I'll talk. I've got nothing to hide from the right party. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private detective, was working for Dodie Whitmer, a lady impatient to know which producer McGrath was talking about. In that article on Colby this morning, now do I qualify? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Of course, we'll... Both after the same piece of information, Mr. Marlowe. Oh? I want to find that answer, too, and then whisper it into Dodie's ear. Just to save her a hundred thousand bucks? No. Just to get a chance to fill McGrath's shoes. And don't laugh, because I've been ghosting that column for the past month now. Didn't McGrath write this morning's column himself? No, he didn't. I did. But the piece on Colby was not mine. McGrath must have added that himself, the fool. Well, you don't sound like you're happy in your work, Phipps. I wasn't. Mac was a tyrant. I put up with him because he promised sooner or later to let Dodie Whitmar know that I was doing his work. Don't be too bitter, Phipps. Mac couldn't have known exactly when he was going to die. Well, what if he But to get die? back to the subject, have you any idea where we can get a hold of something real to go on? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, out there in the living room. Oh. Follow me, Marlowe. If you can, in the dark. Come back here. I'll see. <laughs> By the time I got to my feet, Phipps was gone. I found another lamp in the dark, turned it on, and started for the telephone. But then I stopped. In the center of the floor, where it must have fallen when the leg man made his wild break, was a wrinkled piece of paper. When I picked it up and turned it over, I was suddenly glad that Mr. Phipps had gotten away because, in his hurry to leave, he had dropped his checkoff list for Operation Bradford Colby. There were a half a dozen producers crossed off above the notation Max Place, but below that, and not yet discounted, was a name I'd never heard before. Sherry Sheldon. At that, I called Dodie Whitmer, gave her a quick rundown on what had happened with Phipps, and then tossed the name Sherry Sheldon in. She talked it over with Larry North before she answered. But when she did, I knew that finally we were all getting someplace. Marlo, this is good. Larry tells me that Sherry Sheldon is the ex-Mrs. Bradford Colby. Oh? And better than that, a redhead with temperament to match. That kind will talk. Mm-hmm. Any idea where this item lives? Yes, a bungalow on Sheremoya. 5,800. 5,800, huh? Larry says it's a quiet, dead-end street, but not to let that throw you. Because from what he's heard about the lady herself, she's very much alive. So play it smart, boy. You're probably in the big time now. Good luck. Only a furlong plus the bungalow on Sheremoya, so when I pulled up and parked away from number 5,800, I was still wondering exactly what play it smart, boy, meant. When the lady in question was known far and wide as a shock of red hair capping so much dynamite. But a minute later, as I walked toward the house, I labeled that thought introspection, dismissed it, and concentrated instead on an acre of tweed jacket that was unfolding out of a long, honey-colored sedan parked a little ahead of me. When it straightened up to something over six and a half feet, slammed the car door shut and stomped inch-thick sold brogans off in a king-sized huff, I knew that this was an angry man. And in the next second... I knew that it and the thespian Bradford Colby were one and the same. When Colby got to Sherry's doorbell and jabbed at it impatiently for attention, I ducked below a hedge nearby. 
When the door opened and then slammed shut again, I left the hedge in favor of an on-the-bias palm tree that bowed toward my lady's chamber where I could both see and hear what had to be an exciting reunion. You said that you knew something that couldn't fail to intrigue me on this of all days. So now that I'm here, start intriguing Sherry, darling. All right. How's this for a starter? I want to the penny exactly one half of the money you're going to get from Dodie Whitmark. Oh, oh, Sherry, how droll. <laughs> now, why in the name of the great American dollar do you think I'd give you so much as a sly glance at that delightful little fun? For two reasons. The first, I deserve it for putting up with both you and your abominable conceit for exactly <laughs> one year. Oh, still droll, darling. <laughs> Go on, keep laughing, Mr. Colby. Keep <laughs> laughing while I light my cigarette with one of these matches, <laughs> these cute ones that burn with what? a green flame. Where did you get those? <laughs> In a little no known lodge out beyond Malibu called the Green Flame. Don't you remember, darling, I, I ran into you there one day last week when you were having lunch with a mysterious stranger whom you tried to keep me from seeing. You nasty little sneak, Sherry. When you were so engrossed in keeping yourself between me and your guests that, that you left this souvenir book of matches at the bar after you graciously lit my cigarette for me. And what of it? They give those matches out by the foul. That they do, but Brad, dear, they all don't have numbers penciled on the inside. Numbers? Ah. Uh -huh. What numbers are you talking about? <laughs> now, who's being drawn? What are you getting at, Sherry? This. I had a call a minute before I got in touch with you from a delightful gentleman who's very interested in what I'm getting at. So here, take your stupid book of matches and get out. No. I, I don't need them anymore. No, wait, Sherry. Now, please. Fred, I am going to have exactly one half of that easy money that's coming your way. And after the gentleman I mentioned and I get together... I may want more. So don't say anything you'll be sorry for later on. Oh, Just Sherry. get out now. And don't come back until I send for you, dear Brad. It was the better part of a minute before Colby the actor quit running the gamut of theatrical expressions indexed on the hate, and Colby the man stopped biting down hard on his lower lip. And without another word, he slammed out of his apartment, ran to his car, and started off. I waited long enough for steam in the room to condense, and then I walked to the front door and rang the bell delicately, the way I imagined a delightful gentleman like Mr. Leonard Phipps might. Yes? Can I help you? I think so, Miss Sheldon. It's only a matter of a simple question. Did you give that Brad Colby story to McGrath yesterday? Wait a minute. Who are you? Why, Leonard Phipps, of course. I talked to you on the phone, remember? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was only half an hour ago, Mr. Phipps, and, and yet in those 30 minutes, it's surprising how your voice has gone from tenor right down to bass. Good night. Not so fast, baby. It's out of my shoe shine. All right. Come in. I, I'll tell you what you want to know. I did give that story to McGrath. I, I did it for revenge. I hate Colby. Uh-huh. And when your revenge boomeranged and the ex came out 100,000 ahead of you, you decided to cut back in. Is that it? Yeah, that... Wait a minute. You've been listening. How else would you know all this about Brad and me? Same way I know you're a liar about giving McGrath that story. You're in, honey, is strictly something different like a book of matches that burn with a green flame and accidental meeting at the lodge of the same name. Let's take it from there. Huh? Yes, why don't you? Right outside where both you and it belong. Good night, mister. Marlowe, Marlowe, Philip Marlowe, Sherry. But tell me, why the hurry? Anxious to party your nose before Mr. Phipps arrives? Frankly, Philip... I'm anxious to do just about anything that doesn't involve talking to... What? what is this? Somebody's head, come on. He's over there near the curb. The car didn't stop, all of No, and that scream sounded pretty... Pretty bad. Oh. Oh, he's... Dead, isn't he, Marla? Yeah. That could mean only one thing to you, baby. To me? Why, who, who is it? Your late date, Sherry. One Mr. Leonard Phipps. In just a moment, the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, on the special program, One Great Hour, later tonight on CBS, President Harry S. Truman will be joined by Gregory Peck, Isla Lupino, and Quentin Reynolds to tell the story of what American religious groups are doing to bring relief to the world's war-stricken people. Be sure to hear One Great Hour tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time 
over most of these same CBS network stations. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Green Flame. Red-haired, sophisticated knives tear down at what seconds ago had been Leonard Phipps. The sound of the powerful car that had slammed the life out of him whirred into silence far down the street. All that was left of Stanley McGrath's overambitious leg man was a twisted, broken scarecrow, sprawled over the curb and half up on the sidewalk. It wasn't pretty. And the sight of it cracked Sherry's self-assurance like a rock through a window pane. When she stopped pressing the knuckles of one hand against her mouth and looked at me, she was scared. Clear through. Marla, this horrible thing. It was an accident, wasn't it? Oh, sure, sure. But as accidental as if they'd use a sledgehammer on him. Oh. Oh, yes. You only wish it was an accident because you're next in line and you know it. Remember, he was on his way to see you when this happened to him. I don't know what you mean. I mean, it's a high price game, baby, and they're playing for keeps. So you better level with me and fast. What's so important about those green matches? I don't know. You're a liar. You're going to wind up looking like Phipps here before the sun comes up. No, no, And tell me the truth, you little fool. Come on. I am, I swear. Phipps called me because he, he thought I might have given McGrath that story on Brad, but I didn't. And why was Phipps still interested? Why did he want to talk to you? Because I, I told him I'd seen Brad with someone at the Green Flame last week, and, and that Brad was very upset when he found me there. All right, who is he with? I don't know. That's not the impression you gave your ex-husband, beautiful? I was swinging in the dark, Marlowe. Five people left the Green Flame at the same time. I, I, I couldn't tell which one had been with Brad, but I'd know them if I saw them again, and... Phipps thought that together we could figure out who it was. Go on. What about the numbers in that book of green matches? What were they? Eight, one, one. Eight, eleven? Yes. What does that fit? A hotel room? Oh, I don't know that either. You mean it was just another swing in the dark? Yes, but it connected, Marlowe. It scared him when I mentioned it, so it must be important. Yeah? Take another look at Phipps, baby. See how important it is. Now try again real hard. Remember what eight, eleven means. Marlowe, I just don't know. Please believe me. <sighs> Maybe you're just thick. Maybe you got too much nerve, but I'll tell you one thing, Sherry. I wouldn't be in your spot for ten times a hundred grand because I don't think you're going to live until morning. Oh, I, I didn't think that Brad would go this far. What, what, what I've told you is the truth. Wait a minute, wait a minute, shut up. Somebody's coming. It might be Bradford. Now you get out of here. Well, I, I don't have my car. Take mine, that coupe. Here are the keys. Go down to the office of the Hollywood Trades. He won't show his face around there. Find Larry North or Doty. Well, all right, but what about go you? Go on, will you beat it? I stepped into the shadows of the trees that bordered the walk and waited. I heard Sherry slam the door on my car and burn five bucks worth of rubber off my new fist tires getting away. A second later, the visitor I was expecting showed up, but it wasn't Brad Colby. It was Larry North. He ran three bustling steps out into the street and watched my coupe scoot out of sight. Then he spotted the corpse. His mouth fell open and he tiptoed slowly toward it like he was afraid he might wake it up. When I moved out into the light, he saw me and turned. That's him, Marlowe. Do you know about this? Who is it? It's Leonard Phipps. Phipps? A grass leg man? Yeah. Driver didn't so much as look back. Watch our stinking break. Phipps in a hit and run accident at a time like this. Look, you jump to your conclusions north, and I'll jump to mine. Eh? What do you mean? Phipps knew something fishy about that item in McGrath's column. And Sherry Sheldon knew something fishy about Colby. So from where I stand, Colby couldn't afford to let him get together. No accident? That's a daring observation, Marlowe. For a hundred thousand bucks, I know plenty of guys who do a thing like this every day in the week. You can buy a lot of distance with that kind of money. Hey, you're right, of course. What exactly does the Sheldon girl know? Did you find out? Only partly. Bradford's mixed up with someone else on this deal. Sherry doesn't know who, but if we can get the other tie-in, she'll be able to identify that person on sight. Uh, did she... Or did she have, have anything else? Number 811 in the book of matches mean anything? 811? That's... Hey, no. hey, 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 come on, North. Quit hey. staring at him. You're making yourself sick. Let's get out of here. Yes, yes, yes. All right, but I, I guess I'd better. And Bradford Colby must be out of his mind. Maybe. I'll let you know. I'm going to drop in on him now before the cops do and check my theory over with him. Where does he live? Yeah, on Wilcox, a villa in the Midcliff Gardens. Marlo, I'm going in and talk to Sherry. Maybe I can find out who Colby's working with. Uh, she's not here. I sent her down to the paper in my car to stay with you or Doty until things yes, cool off. Yes, but Doty isn't there. She went out for some reason right after you called. There's no one there now but the night watchman. Oh, great. <clears throat> now, look. Drop me off at Colby's place. 
And you get down there and find Sherry. She's worth a hundred thousand bucks to Doty Whitmer, but only if she lives. Now, let's go. While the natty little Napoleon in an elevator scurried off to fetch his car, I ran inside. Put a fast call through to the police and submitted the shortest report on record of a hit-and-run death. By the time I got back, North was waiting at the curb with the door open. I piled in beside him, and ten minutes later, we glided to a stealthy stop on Wilcox at the ivy-covered archway over the Midcliff Garden Gate. Neat slices of amber light poured through a big Venetian blind on the window of a villa at the rear of the court. Miss North identified as Colby's. And the same breath reminded me that the actor was a strapping 6'6 six, six and a desperate man. He urged me to be careful, and I urged him to hurry, and as he left, I walked toward the big window and saw Bradford inside, slumped deep in the lap of a suede easy chair, doing a solo with a bottle of Paul Masson champagne, and looking about as desperate as a sleepy St. Bernard. I walked around to the front door, decided to try the shock treatment to blast him out of his blasé attitude. Yes, what do you want? Get inside. Go on, move. Well, take your hands off me. You might have gotten away with that fucked up suit for damages, Colby, but you're not going to get away with murder. You killed Leonard Phipps, didn't you? What are you raving about? Who's Leonard Phipps and who are you? Name's Marlowe, and I'll tell you something, Colby. The only reason I'm not busy knocking your head off at this minute is because I want to hear the whole story right from the top. Now, first, who wrote that item in McGrath's column for you? Are you you mad? McGrath wrote it himself, the venomous little creature. He and Donnie Whitmer used that to damage my reputation, and now they're going to pay for it. Oh, stop it. You knocked your reputation into a cock's head every time you step in front of a camera. Well, Your damage suits are phony, and you know it. Now, where's that book of matches with the famous 811 inside? 8... 811? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, yes. Those that burn with a green flame. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, You've been yeah, talking yeah. with my imaginative ex-wife, I see. She's burning with quite a green flame herself, isn't she? How that woman hates to see me get any... Never mind. Where is it? If you'll allow me, Marlowe, I'll just answer this. Mm. Bradford Colby speaking. Mm. I see. Yes, I heard. That's right. Well, I'll do my best, darling. At least ten. Now, goodbye, Helen. Just an old friend, Marlowe. You can let your eyebrow down again. Helen, huh? You know, you always were a lousy actor. I'm getting a little sick of you, Colby. And I've got a hunch I'm due for quite a stall, so start talking, huh? Where's that book of matches? Easy, Marlowe. Take it easy. Here it is. Come on, let's see it. Of course. Here, take a good look. Oh. <clears throat> what a character. Up to your chin in trouble and you make way. You lousy snoot. Oh. Oh. That does it. Tough guy. You're not leaving, Molly. You're staying right here. And just to make sure... Oh, you don't call me. You sucker. Should have loosened your corset. I waded through the chunks of blaze ceramics that Kobe had smashed on my head and worked hard to hold back the the wave of darkness that kept rising up under me until I made it to the kitchen, where I splashed a few quarts of cold water on my face. Then I went back. Colby was still holding down the hooked rug he landed on, and the book of matches that had started the argument was on the floor beside him. I picked it up and opened it. The number was there, inside, written in blue wax pencil. But I thought I'd made a mistake. Until I realized that maybe Sherry Sheldon had made the mistake. When that idea hit me, it brought another one along, and I remembered oh. that Colby had received orders by phone to delay me. Oh, my. Then I knew I'd better hang onto my head and move, but fast. I... Rolled him over and found the keys to his car. I was halfway out the door when he came to. Uh, stop. Come back. You can't leave here. It's my exit, not yours, Hambone. Good night. It took all of five minutes to get from Wilcox to El Centro and Colby's long, honey-colored sedan. And on a hunch, I drove down the alley to the back door of the Whitmer building. The hunch paid off. Because... I had stopped and turned on the parking lights. When the door opened and I saw exactly what I'd expected. The watchman was on the floor out cold. And the little Napoleon in elevated shoes was staging a big exodus with his arms full of a very limp redhead named Sherry Sheldon. As soon as he saw the honey-colored car, he started talking. Brad! Brad, you idiot! I told you to stay home! You do it! No, she's only unconscious. There wasn't time. We'll have to finish it someplace else. Put her in the back seat. All right. Here, 
Now, let's get out. Move. Don't move, little man. I'm too tired for any more trouble. I'll shoot first. So you're the boy on the inside with all the brains, huh? You cope this whole thing up with Colby. He gets liable and sues Doty Widmer for damages, and then you two split the settlement between you. Correct me if I'm wrong, North. You got your chance when McGrath died after turning in his copy. All you had to do was write that one libelous item included in McGrath's column, and nobody could ever explain where the story had come from. That stupid fool, Bradford. I could never trust him to do anything right. Is that why you killed Phipps? Yes. And if Brad Colby had held on to you for another five minutes, I would have had time to get out of here. Yes. And so would I. Sherry, are you all right? No, not yet. Hey, hey, go! Oh. Oh. Where he and Brad are going, Marlowe, I'd never get another chance to even the score. Oh, baby. <gasps> you handle a spiked heel like Babe Ruth handled a bat. <laughs> He's out. Yeah, but Phil, you should see where he, what he hit me with. Oh, brother. <laughs> Come on, beautiful. It's time to turn out the lights, get in touch with Doty, and call the law. Let's go. Uh, thank you, Mr. McMahon. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm glad those cops and the cigars are gone. Here, kids, help yourselves. You both look like you need it. This you can say again. How I need it. <laughs> Marlo, you could have slid me through the hole in the lifesaver when you said my own editor, Larry Knopf, was it. Yeah, it gave me a joke, too, Doty. Yeah, and me. <laughs> the hard way. But, Phil, I, I am sorry about that mistake I made. I could have saved us some trouble. What mistake is this? Well, you see, honey, we knew that whoever was working with Colby had written down a number for him in a book of matches. Sherry here thought it was 811. But when I saw it, it was upside down from that, so it came out 118. 118? Mm -hmm. Why, that's Larry's office number and phone extension. Check. Yours is 116, and his was right next door, I remembered. So, 118 was it. That, coupled with the fact that it was written in blue pencil, which... The standard equipment for all editors gave me the tip. Honest now, Phil. Hmm? Did you figure that out, or was it luck? Uh, well, it's a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know something? I missed dinner tonight. You know I'm starving? Well, uh, I know a wonderful place. Uh -huh. They have uh, matches like this, uh -huh. see? It burns with a green flame. Will you join us, Dodie? Yes, yes, we uh, would love to have you. You'd rather have whooping calls. <laughs> Go on, you. Get out of here and good night. Good night, Dodie. Oh, and it will be from here on in. I guarantee it. A wonderful supper was waiting for us at the Green Flame Restaurant. It was all arranged by a call from Doty. And it waited until it got cold because we didn't show up to eat it. <laughs> there was something about the moonlight glinting on the ocean. And a certain stillness in the morning air that made food seem somehow unimportant. So when I finally dropped Sherry off at her place on Sheremoya, went home to my apartment on Franklin... It was either very late or very early, depending on the viewpoint. There was just one lonely sardine and a cold baked potato in the refrigerator. So I ate. And then I sat down on my bed to light my last cigarette. But I wasn't disappointed when the match flared into an ordinary yellow flame. Happy Marlowe. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Faye Baker, Larry Dobkin, Myra Marsh, Howard McNear, and Parley Bear. The special music is by Richard O'Runt. Be 
sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a grim joke that started when six heirs came to an ugly house on a rain-swept island to hear a madman's will. But the joke soon turned to murder. And in the end, it was hard to tell who had the last laugh. Tomorrow night, Helen Hayes stars in the famous comedy The Farmer Takes a Wife on CBS's Electric Theater. And Eve Arden stars as America's favorite schoolmistress, Our Miss Brooks. You'll delight in the expert comedy of these two great feminine stars when the Electric Theater and Our Miss Brooks come your way tomorrow night over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. No, don't try to sneak open the door, Pam. Look through the keyhole. That's what I did. What'd you see? An eye. A human eye? Well, I hope it was human. Because if I saw it, it it must have seen me. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Murder Mismanaged. The man in the unpressed suit is still a little unsteady as he rises heavily from his bed and consults a mirror on the bedroom wall. It's almost noon. The effects of a late night spent at a neighborhood bar have lingered into the morning after, leaving him with a pair of red-rimmed eyes and a handful of shaky fingers. Sally... Sally, what time is it? Oh, you up, Arnold? Yeah, I'm up. What'd you think I was doing in here? Walking in my sleep? Uh, a cup of coffee in the house? Yes, Arnold. I'll get it for you. Make it snappy, will you? I gotta throw some water on my face, get down to the store. I'm late. Uh, maybe you better not go to the store today. I, I mean, looking the way you do, maybe you better stay home. Sure, sure. Just take the day off. Just like that. The old man would have a fit. Oh, no. Well, wouldn't he? You don't have to stick up for him because he's your father. I know what a cheapskate he is. Darling, I don't want to argue with you about father. Well, then tell him to quit saying he's supporting me. Tell him to quit saying I married you for your money. Why did you marry me, Arnold? For the same reason you married me. Because you loved me. You thought it would work out. Only you didn't know I'd never amount to anything. Honey, I still love you. And I still think it can work out. If you just stop drinking so much and try to make a fresh Honey, start... will you stop it? W- I gotta get down to the store. No, wait. I gotta get down there, I tell Arnold, you. Arnold, please, don't go to the store today. Stay with me. You crazy? Stay with me, Arnold. You've got to. My father doesn't want you to work for him anymore. Doesn't want me... He told you that? Well, he... See, he thinks you'd be better off in another kind of job. After all, a jewelry store sure, is not... Sure, sure. A... a jewelry store is risky business. With all those diamonds lying around, you've got to be careful who's working for you. He didn't say that. I don't care what he said. That's what he means. He doesn't trust me no more. Thinks I'm stealing from him. Arnold, listen. So what? Now, let go of my arm, will you? I'm going down that store no, and i No, please, you'll have a fight. All right, then I'll have a fight. Now, let go of me. Arnold, you. you're not going down there. Let go of me, I no. said. Honey, you hurt me. All right. I'm sorry. Next time, don't get in my way. One four one zero. Hayden's Jewelry Store? Yes, this is Mr. Hayden speaking. Oh, Mr. Hayden, uh, this is Mrs. North. I'm calling about my husband's watch. I left it with your son-in-law the other day, and he didn't seem to know when it'll be ready. Why, it's ready right now, Mrs. North. You can pick it up any time you like. Well, Mr. North and I'll be over a little later on. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Hayden. You're quite welcome. Uh, Yes? uh... Oh, it's you. 
Hello, Pop. Surprised to see me? Surprised isn't the right word, Arnold. What is? Well, I don't see any reason why we have to have an argument about it. Didn't Sally tell you I don't want you to work for me anymore? Yeah, yeah, she told me. Then why did you come down here? I want to find out what's behind it. What's the, what's the real reason you're firing me, Mr. Hayden? I want to know the truth. The truth is very simple. I can't stand the sight of you, Arnold. Never could. And when I think of what you've done to my daughter's life and mine, it, it makes me sick inside. Is that all? No, there's more. I'm going to take Sally away from you, Arnold, if it's the last thing I do. I'm going to take her away and put you where you belong, behind bars. Uh, I thought you'd be coming to that. And I thought you could be trusted. Until I realized you were a thief, a common, ordinary thief. Keep your mouth shut! You... Another crack like that and I'll forget how old you are. Slapping me won't do any good, Arnold. When I've got the proof, I'm going to the police. You're not going to do nothing of the kind. And if I catch you calling up the police... We'll, uh, we'll finish this later on, Pop. Somebody just came in the store. Oh. No. Can I help you, sir? Well, maybe you can, mister. I'm looking for a ring. For yourself or for a... What are you doing? Stay where you are, Grandpa. This is a stick-up. What? You too, mister. Don't move. I've got you covered. I- I'm not moving. All right, then keep your trap shut. Do like I tell you. These trays over here, get them out. Come on, come on, hurry it up. You help him, Grandpa, and keep your hands away from that burglar alarm. I'm not fooling. I, I didn't think you were. Okay, trays on the case and turn around. Turn around, I said. But that's what I'm doing. Hey, you! Pop, look out! Look out! Going, Pam. The jewelry store's over here. Oh, that's right. I-, I was thinking we were on 6th Avenue. Now, don't tell me you gave my watch to the wrong place. Oh, no, no. This is right, dear. I spoke to Mr. Hayden about an hour ago. Only I... Only what? For goodness sake, look at the crowd, Jerry. Hey, something must have happened inside the store. There's a policeman outside. Keep moving, please. Move right along. Oh, somebody must have been hurt. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. You can't go in there. Oh, oh, but we have to. My husband has a watch in there, and uh, Mr. Hayden's a very special friend of ours. Oh, my Thank orders... Thank you, it... officer. We won't be in the way. Uh, come on, Jerry. All right, dear. All right. Give me a chance. We shouldn't have come in here anyway. Mr. Hayden's been hurt. Ask the doctor what happened to him. Go ahead, Jerry. They're, they're just standing there. Oh, darling, will you stop pushing? I'll ask Mr. Hayden's son-in-law. What happened, Mr. Ranson? Huh? What happened? Oh, I I, I didn't recognize you, Mr. North. We, we, we had a robbery in here, and I'm still kind of shaky about it. The old man was almost shot. Good heavens, how? Oh, oh he, he got rattled, tried to set off the burglar alarm, so the stick-up man hit him with a gun. Yeah, he knocked him cold. What a shame. Yeah, I, I may have to take him to the hospital. I don't think that will be necessary, Arnold. Mr. Hayden, are you all right? I am now. The doctor says I can go home if I want to. Well, uh, maybe. M- maybe you better. Maybe you better get right into bed. You you, you stay here, Pop. I'll, uh, I'll get the car and we'll both go home together. No, no, I... I, I it won't take a minute. I'll be right back. Mr. North, don't let him take me home. I, I don't want to be alone with him. Why? What's the matter, Mr. Hayden? I'm afraid... Afraid of what he might do to me. He's tried to kill me already. What do you mean? My head, this blow I got. It wasn't from the stick-up man. It was Arnold who hit me. Hello? Hello, honey. This is me. Arnold, where are you? I've been worried about you all day. Why haven't you called me? Well, I would have, baby, only we had a little... Trouble down at the store. Trouble? With Father? No, not that kind of trouble. Uh, somebody robbed the place. Oh, no. Yeah, hold up, man. He got away with three trays. He didn't hurt anybody, did he? Well, your old man got pushed around a little, but he's okay now. A couple of friends of his, uh, Mr. and Mrs. North, are driving him home. And where are you? Well, I stopped off for a little drink, honey. Oh, Arnold, please, come home, darling. Oh. Now, don't you worry about me, baby. I'm turning over a new leaf. Honey. New leaf, I tell you. For a while there, I thought your old man wasn't going to let me, but after what happened today, everything's going to be fine. Fine and dandy. I'm so 
so glad you could drive me home, Mr. North. I, I needed this chance to talk to you. Well, if you think Arnold was the one who hit you, Mr. Hayden... It's the truth, I tell you. For months now, Arnold's been stealing from the store, substituting cheap imitations for valuable diamond rings. You're joking. He's a thief, Mrs. North. And this robbery today was a deliberate attempt to cover it up. You mean he wanted the store robbed? Wanted it and made it possible for the hold-up man to do the job. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Hayden. That's a pretty broad statement. It's not a statement, Mr. North. It's the only explanation for what happened. And if he's gone this far, he'll go the rest of the way. He'll kill me. He won't do anything if you can prove what you just told us. But I can't prove it. Now that the jewels are gone, it's my word against his. Well, we'll see what we can do, Mr. Hayden. In the meantime, just be careful. And keep away from Arnold. Arnold. Yeah, Arnold. What took you so long to get home? You left the store before I did. Well, I had a long talk with Mr. and Mrs. North. And then I stopped off to see Sally at your apartment. What about? About you. And what happened this afternoon? That's what I thought. You're doing everything you can to turn her against me, ain't you? Am I? I don't think she needs any help from me. She knows it all now. Knows what? What you tell her? The truth about you and what happened today? I don't know what you're talking about. Now stay where you are, Arnold. I'm ready for you this time. I have a gun. I don't care what you got. You're not going to blame me for something I didn't do. But you did hit me, Arnold. And you were stealing from the store. And I can prove it. You're crazy. How could you prove a thing like that? By the man who held up the store, I have his name right here on this piece of paper. His name and his address. And I... Look out, Arnold. This gun is loaded. All right, then go ahead and use it. Go ahead. Shoot me. I will if you come any nearer. Oh, no, you won't. Arnold, drop that gun. Drop it before... Mr. Hayden. Well, come right in, Lieutenant Wigand. It's nice to see you. Oh, hello, Jerry. Been waiting for me? Almost an hour, Bill. Don't you ever come back to your office? Not when there's work to be done. Now, what's on your mind? Well, I don't suppose this is exactly your line, Bill, but you might be able to help us out. Out of what? Well, it could be murder eventually. But right now, it's only the threat of it. With whom? A man by the name of Hayden. He's a jeweler, Bill. And his son-in-law is thinking of killing him. Are you kidding? No. Why? Well, I just came from Hayden's apartment. His son-in-law shot him in the shoulder. Shot him? When was this? Oh, about three quarters of an hour ago. It was just a flesh wound. Well, that's enough, isn't it? This afternoon, he robbed Mr. Hayden's store and, and hit him over the head with a candle holder. Yes, Mr. Hayden was telling me. I... Well, you're going to do something about it, aren't you? I mean, a guy like that should be put away. He was put away, Jerry. You arrested him? No, we didn't have to. He was dead. Arnold? Mm, Mr. Hayden's son-in-law? That's right, then. We found his body in a dark alley about two blocks from where he lived. Somebody shot him. <laughs> This way, Jerry. The policeman said we'd find Arnold's apartment at the end of the hall. Well, I don't know why we came here, dear, or what you expect to prove. I I don't expect to prove anything, dear. I'd just like to know a little bit more about Mr. Hayden's daughter. But she isn't home. The police haven't been able to find her. Well, then maybe we'll find something that'll help us find her. What? Uh, Never mind, darling. Just try the door. The policeman said they left it open. They did. Only I feel awful funny about barging in here. Why? Bill told us it was all right. I'll bet anything he'd like us to get him a good lead on this case. Then why don't we go see Mr. Hayden instead of fooling around here? After all... Wait a second. That's the phone, Jerry. Well, what are you going to do? Answer it, of course. Hey, Pam. Hello? Hello, Sally. Uh, yes. i got to see you right away. Who is this? Me, hey, Manny. I've been laying low, like you told me. Only I didn't expect no double cross. What do you mean? You know what I mean. What's the idea of send your husband around to see me? Arnold? Who else? How many husbands you got? Uh, well, I, I don't understand. In a pig's eye, you don't understand. He had my name and address on a little piece of paper. You know what he threatened to do? What? Tell the cops. 
He said I was in this just as much as he was. And if I made one move, it squad. Bam, who is it? Shh. Well, what's the idea, Sally? What are you trying to pull? Uh, nothing. Well, you've got a lot of explaining to do. You better do it fast. Look, I'll meet you over at my place in about an hour. Just as soon as I make sure it's safe. Oh, well, um, uh, where do you live? Oh, you know where I live. On the second floor over Mulroy's bar. Now, be there. Okay, Manny, I'll be there. See you later. Yeah. Now, what did you get yourself into? Oh, well, nothing yet. But as soon as we find out where Mulroy's bar is, we're going over to Manny's place. Only we're going a little earlier than he expects us. Who in the world is Manny? Oh, I haven't the faintest idea, Jerry. But that's what we're going to find out. Quiet now, Jerry. We mustn't let anyone know we're here. Well, where are we? I don't see any apartments on this floor. Shh. This door right here. And if I'm not mistaken... Yes, it is. What is? Is what? Manny's place. His name's on the card. Uh, take it easy. There may be somebody in there. Well, there shouldn't be. But there is. <gasps> Who's there? Jerry, it's Mr. Hayden's daughter. What? Sally, what are you doing here? Well, uh, I, I was waiting for someone. I had a message to meet somebody here. Who? Well, uh, I don't know what his name is. is but, uh, Sally, I... I think you'd better tell us the truth. The police are looking for you. Yes, I know. I've been hiding from them. I suppose it's wrong, but there's something I've got to find out before I tell them. Tell them what? About Arnold? About everything. I've got to tell somebody. I'll go out of my mind if I don't. There's nobody I can turn to. Is it because you killed him? No! I didn't kill him. I tried to help Arnold, but everything turned out so badly. And then when I saw my father tonight, when you dropped him off in my apartment, I made a terrible mistake. In what way? I told him about Manny. The one who lives here? Yes. I, I never should have talked. If I hadn't said anything, Arnold might still be alive. But my father kept pounding at me, so hammering at me. As soon as he walked in the door, he accused Arnold of being a thief. He said he had proof that Arnold had struck him. That the whole robbery... <laughs> I tell you. He struck me when I reached for the burglar alarm. And what's more, he planned to do it. Planned the whole thing with that stick-up man. Father, it's not so. You're always against Arnold, no matter what he does. Oh, Sally, Sally, how can you defend this man? How can you go on protecting him when he treats you the way he does? There isn't an ounce of decency in him. I love him, Father. And he loves me. Does he? Is that why you stick to him? Well, then maybe you'd better know the truth. Maybe you'd better know what he does when he doesn't come home to you. Father. He's no good, Sally. For three weeks, I hired a private detective to follow him wherever he went. And every time he didn't come home, he was out with another woman. That's a lie. That's a matter of record, Sally. I have the names and addresses of every one of the women he went out with. And some of them he gave presents to. Expensive jewelry that he probably stole from my store. Then it's true. He doesn't even love me. Not what I call love. I'm sorry, darling. I thought I could spare it's you all this, right, but... Father, I would have known sooner or later, and I'm glad you told me. But you're wrong about Arnold at the store today. Wrong? He might have struck you to cover up the fact that he'd been stealing. But he had nothing to do with the holdup. How do you know? I know. Because I was trying to cover up for him, too. I hired that holdup man myself. <laughs> I made. I never should have told him. I never should have given him Manny's name. Manny is the man who held up the store? Yes, I hired him because I thought it would help my husband. Well, then he might have killed Arnold. When I spoke to him on the phone, he said your husband had been over here. That's what I wanted to find out. If Arnold knew him, if Arnold had been to see him. See who? Manny. What's going on here, Sally? Who are your friends? We're Mr. and Mrs. North, Manny. And before you reach for that gun of yours, I might as well warn you that the police know we're here. What else do they know? Enough to want to see you down at headquarters. I think it would be a good idea if Sally had a chance to identify you. And I think it'd be a good idea that three of you took a trip to the morgue. 
On a stretcher. That'll make a lot of noise. Uh, it'll make a lot more noise if I give you a chance to open your mouths. Why? What have we got on you, Manny? Nothing, sister. You ain't gonna get nothing, neither. Now stand up. All of you. Face the wall. What's the idea? Face the wall, I said. Manny, please don't shoot. Who's gonna shoot? I'm gonna beat it, Sally, and I ain't ever coming back. Oh, well, now, don't be upset, Jerry. I know you couldn't help letting Manny get away last night. I'm just glad you didn't get hurt. Well, we might have if we tried to hold him. Hey, where are you taking us, Bill? Oh, in here for a while. It's a lineup. We had the net out this morning, and it's just possible we picked up your friend Manny. He's not our friend. Well, if you see him, just let me know. All right, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come on, you guys. Stand up straight. When you hit the light, face front. I'll tell you when you can go. Holy mackerel. Where in the world did you find these guys? No, Manny. Not yet. Try the next bunch, Sarge. All right. Come on now. Keep moving. Move along. He's a short man, Billy. Short and stocky. You see him? Not yet. Hey, wait a minute, Pam. Isn't that him, the second one from the left? Golly, I, I don't know, Jerry. We only saw him for a minute last night. That's him, all right. Look how he's trying to hide. Hey, you. No, no, no. You. That's right. Say something. I didn't do nothing, Lieutenant. I just blew in from Cleveland. That's right, Jerry. That's him. No, it's not. That's enough, Manny. Come on on down here. But I tell you, I didn't... That's do... enough, I said. You think Mr. and Mrs. North are lying? I've got some other people down here to identify you. Well... Come on in, Mr. Hayden. Thank you, Lieutenant. You recognize this man? Which one? Well, this one over here, Manny. Isn't this the guy who held up your store yesterday? Why, no. I've never seen this man before in my life. lying, Bill. He's lying to protect his daughter. That's why she won't say anything either. But why? How can Hayden protect his daughter by saying that this Manny guy didn't rob the store? Well, that makes sense. If he denies that Manny robbed the store, it's the same as saying that somebody else robbed it. Somebody who hasn't been found yet. Somebody who will never be found and who will never be able to testify. Oh, I see. Hayden's convinced that Manny's testimony will convict his daughter. And since she had a good motive for the murder... Her father's willing to commit perjury to protect her. But how is her father so sure that Sally's guilty? How does he know that Manny didn't kill Arnold? I'll tell you how he knows. He knows because he killed Arnold himself. Mr. Hayden? Well, he must have, Jerry. I I hate to say it, but it's the only logical answer. Hayden killed Arnold? But for what reason? Oh, for any number of reasons, Bill. Because of what Arnold was doing to his daughter. Because Arnold had ruined her life and she was still in love with him. There was no other way to get rid of him. Then Mr. Hayden wasn't protecting his daughter. When he refused to identify Manny, he was protecting himself. Was he? Only the murderer could have known that Manny wasn't guilty. And only the murderer would have refused to identify him. Oh, fine, fine. But how am I going to prove it? You know, you two are just talking in the air. No, they're not, Lieutenant. They're telling you the truth. What? Well, how careful what you say, Mr. Hayden. This can be held against you. It doesn't matter. I've written you a full confession. Why? What made you change your mind? I knew you'd have broken me down sooner or later. I'd have broken myself down. A man like me can't live with murder in his heart. I'm too old and too tired to have resisted you. I realized that as soon as I lied to you this morning. Mr. Hayden, No, no, I... no. Let me go on now. I made a great mistake, and I'm willing to pay for it. That's why I'm giving myself up. You killed Arnold? Yes, I killed him. Last night, after he left my apartment, I followed him and shot him. Because his life was taking two of ours. But that wasn't my mistake, Lieutenant. My mistake was not killing him sooner. I've got to be at the office early this morning. What time is it? It's 8.30 in here, darling. Oh, what time is it in there? Well, that's why I asked, dear. The kitchen says 9 o'clock and the living room says 7.30. Well, that's about right. What's about right? 
How is it we've got seven clocks in this house and nobody can ever tell the right time? Don't say nobody, dear. I can always tell the right time. How? Well, uh, first of all, I look at my watch, (laughs) if I can find it. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, I know it stopped anyway because I must have forgotten to wind it. Then? Uh, Then I take ten minutes off the kitchen clock, uh, add ten minutes to the living room, and and average them out. uh, Unless the current's been turned off uh, because they're electric. But how do you tell the time? Well, if those two systems don't work, I have one way that never fails. What's that? I call downstairs and ask the doorman. The adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Hi. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Good to hear your voice, Patsy. Thought you were transferred to Baltimore. That's where I am. Say, John, can you handle one for me? What kind of one? It's a life and accident policy. Eastern Fidelity paid off five years ago. A man named John Reardon was the insured party. He died in 1950. Wife was a beneficiary. It's a crazy one. Well, go on. Eastern wants us to look into the matter QT. One of their officers has reason to believe Reardon is still alive. Why would he think that? Because he saw him two days ago. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item one, $22.75. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Baltimore. I arrived at 3.15 in the afternoon at Friendship International Airport. It was a cold gray day. I took a cab directly to Pat Callahan's office. <laughs> Good to see you, John. He was ten pounds heavier. Outside of that, he looked swell. Ah, uh, we'll have to have dinner once a week, my wife. Where are your bags? You didn't go to a hotel. I checked my stuff at the airport, Patsy. I didn't know how long I'd be here. Over the Alleghenies on the plane, I got to thinking about the number of alive but dead reports I've investigated at one time or another. They happen all the time, or they never pan out. Yeah, well, this one isn't like that, John. Sit down. Thanks. You no, know, and a man like Paul Coombs, chairman of the board for Eastern Fidelity, not to mention vice president of two oil companies and one construction company, when he romps in here and says somebody's still alive it's supposed to be dead, we got to listen to him. Sure you do, Pat. It's your job. Your job now. Coombs claims he not only saw Reardon, but talked to him. I'll go into that later. Policy was issued in 1944. Mm-hmm. My wife's a beneficiary. Yeah. Elizabeth Jane Reardon, $10,000. 20, John. Double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. Well, look, I'll look at this stuff later. Maybe you'd better tell me about that first. Okay. John Reardon was lost in a boat accident out on Chesapeake Bay. When? August 13th, 1950. 
There were four people in the party. They went out for the afternoon on a power cruiser, and the thing exploded in the middle of the bay. Oh, yeah, I may have read about it. Was there a man named Sharpston involved? Yeah, yeah, uh, Sharpston owned the boat. He and his wife were aboard, and another man named Blaine. Did all of them go down? That's right. They recovered Mr. and Mrs. Sharpson's body and Blaine's. They never found John Reardon. What caused the explosion? No explainable reason. It was never determined. Oh, there's always a reason. Yeah, well, that probably blew up with the boat, too. As it happened, we conducted the investigation for Atlantic States Limited. They held the insurance on the Sharpstons and the boat. These are our findings in the matter. We found no reason for Atlantic not to honor the claim made by Sharpston's estate. Mm Mm-hmm. How about the other man who was killed, Blaine? His case was adjusted by another company. So that leaves us John Reardon. Yeah. About a month after the accident, his wife filed claim for payment. Our investigation was ended by then. We notified the insurance commissioner of the circumstances of his death and requested a judgment. Routine. Did it go through all right? Yeah. The appellate court declared John Reardon legally dead after the required three-year waiting period. Pretty standard when there's no body. Sure. Eastern honored the claim and paid Mrs. Reardon $20,000. So, that's about it. Except that now somebody thinks he's alive. Not just somebody. Paul Coombs. Yeah, yeah. And if that's so, Eastern's been swindled for $20,000. Tell me about the beneficiary. <laughs> Mrs. Reardon? Mm-hmm. Nice woman. Met her a couple of times. She didn't need money, I can tell you that much. Oh? Yeah, worth over $200,000. Never married again. You say she didn't file her claim until a month after the accident. That's right. She ever give any reason for waiting that long? Well, she was pretty broken up about it. The money wasn't important particularly. Maybe she just forgot. Pat, I've got a question. What's that, John? How can you forget (laughs) $20,000? Expense account item two, $10. For drinks I had with Pat Kelleher while we talked some more about the Reardon case. At 7 o'clock that night, I had on a fresh shirt and a press suit. They seemed to impress Paul Coombs, vice president, chairman of boards, etc. Dollar? That's right, Mr. Coombs. Universal adjustment. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come in, come in. I talked with Mr. Kelleher there. He sent you? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I recall your name now. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we can sit here, Mr. Dollar. Now, you hear about John Reardon, of course. That's right. I'm glad they sent a man like you. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it. You puzzle me, Mr. Coombs. No, I don't. And that's a compliment to your perceptive abilities, young man. As a matter of fact, you're here because you're only curious about me. You want to have a look at the man who thinks he saw John Reardon alive, right? I suppose so. You don't believe he is alive? I didn't say that. Hmm. I admire your caution. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it because, well, John Reardon was a close friend of mine. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I knew him for a number of years. And Mrs. Reardon... He was a fine, sensitive man. I'm sure you'll know how to handle him when you meet him. You sound very certain that I will meet him, Mr. Coombs. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Three nights ago at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver, Colorado, I saw John Reardon. I walked up and spoke to him. I talked with him for 15 or 20 minutes. I know it was him. He didn't admit it. He denied it completely. He told me his name was Frank Bauer and that he had lived in Denver ever since the war. Frank Bauer? Yes, I was so certain it was John Reardon, I insisted. He laughed at me. Seemed good-natured about it. Even bought me a drink. I see. I asked him where he had lived before Denver. He said something about Toledo. Uh I asked him if he'd gone to college there. He told me he'd gone to Ohio State. Told me he was an engineer, a mining engineer. Everything he told me seemed plausible and reasonable, except that all the time I knew he was lying. I knew his name wasn't Frank Bowers. That was John Reardon. How did you leave it with him? Well, the whole thing unnerved me somewhat. I'm afraid I looked like rather a fool. I simply caught my limousine out of the airport and came back here to Baltimore. Did you get his address in Denver? No. Any of his business connections, anything like that? No. Was he alone when you met him? There was no one with him. At the bar, he even ordered his drink the way John always ordered it. You know, like this. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people make that signal for two fingers of bourbon. Wore clothes the same way, too. Have you spoken of this matter to anyone outside of Pat Kelleher? No. No, I thought it should be looked into before I called up Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Reardon, John's widow. Oh, yes. It'll do no good bothering her just now. I'm afraid she'll have to be bothered. Why? Can't you investigate the information I've given you without upsetting everyone? With this kind of information, somebody's bound to get upset. 
Look, uh, don't put restrictions on me, Mr. Coombs, or we won't get anywhere. You say John Reardon was a close friend of yours. Yes. I presume his wife was, too. That's right. A lovely, lovely person. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind when I talk to her. Uh, maybe you aren't the man for this. You can get somebody else, Mr. Coombs. No, no, no. It's just that I suddenly had a strange feeling about it all. Depressing. If John Reardon is alive, and you seem to be certain of it, then I understand your feeling. How's that? <laughs> your friend's party to a $20,000 fraud, not to mention his wife. Possibly he's not as sensitive, and she's not as lovely as you thought. I spent the rest of the evening with Pat Kelleher and his wife, hoping to see the bright lights and listen to some laughter. We picked a couple of fancy bistros and started the rounds to watch champagne flow and eavesdrop on the happy stories of success, promotion, and love. But it didn't work. Like the place, John? It's swell. You're as low as a cricket's ankle. Well, today a man kept telling me a friend of his was alive who's supposed to be dead. He told me what a fine fellow this friend is, or was. Yeah. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, I tell him to go jump in the lake, but... Paul Coombs comes under the title Reliable Witness in anybody's book. Give me a match. Here. How you fix for plans? Start somebody looking into Frank, whatever his name is, in Denver, who's supposed to be Reardon. I'll start with a beneficiary. But... Miss Reardon? Yeah. I'll march out and say, uh, let me look at some pictures of your husband. What kind of a guy was he? Did you enjoy each other or try to kill each other? Did you ever, uh... uh... Why didn't Coombs look into it himself? Why didn't he go out to the widow and tell her about his meeting the guy in Denver? Because he came to us, John. Yeah, I know, Patsy. I'm sorry. But the prospect of going to somebody, anybody, with a flimsy story like that makes me sore. It might get her hopes up that her husband's alive. And that's a lousy thing to do. Reliable or not, Coombs is probably all wet. Probably. Sour racket. Sour racket. You being a parrot... Just being agreeable, John. If you want to be sad, I'll be sad with you. <laughs> we both know situations like this are part of the trade. Oh, I should have been a... Oh, let's have another belt. Sure. Waiter. Well, John, mm -hmm. maybe another way to handle Mrs. Reardon with that. That's her over there at the bar. Nice, isn't she? Hey, she is lovely. Hmm? Not nothing. She looks a little tight. Yeah, well, I hear she gets that way quite a bit these days. Say, John, you want me to introduce you like a friend? It might make it easier. No, I'll handle it myself. Who's with you? Beats me. He's looking for a phone booth. Pat. Yeah? I may be able to find out what I want and not let her know what it's about. You mean right now? I mean right now. Hello. You're Elizabeth Reardon, aren't you? Oh, well, yes. Oh, probably you don't remember me. My name's Johnny Dollar. We met some time ago. I'm afraid I don't remember, Mr. Dollar. I'm in the insurance business. Don't remember? Well, where was it we met? <laughs> no, I can't remember. May I sit down? Well, I'm expecting someone who'll be back in a minute. Yes. Would you care for a drink? I have this one. Thank you. Oh. How's John these days? John? Your husband, Mrs. Ridden. His name is John, isn't it? My husband's been dead nearly five years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I I mean, it must be... <laughs> this is very awkward. That's all right. Five years. I could have sworn it was just three years ago I met you and John. In Denver. It couldn't have been. We were never there. Oh, well, pardon me. I I sit here making bad conversation with you, and it's it's very apparent you're distressed. Look, I'm, I'm very sorry I upset you. Is there anything I could do? No. No, Mr. Dolly, you didn't upset me. You look like a very nice person. How long are you going to be in Baltimore? A few more days. Perhaps you'll come out to the house for a drink before you go back. Say tomorrow. Oh, I'd like that, Mrs. Ridden. You can call me. I'm in the book. Mrs. John Ridden? Yes. I will. Again, I'm sorry that I brought Do up... me a favor, Mr. Dollar. When you come to my house for a drink, call me Elizabeth. And please, don't mention my husband's name. I'd appreciate it very much if I never heard it again.
There will be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little talk to a widow who might not be a widow at all. And a strong feeling that a smile can sometimes be more dangerous than a gun. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Pat Gallagher at Universal. How'd you make out with Miss Reardon? I met her. She thinks I'm an insurance broker or something. I told her I knew her husband when he was alive. Industrial hazard lying. Part of the business, John. Did you find out anything that'll help you? I found out she's pretty upset about everything in the world. That's the only report you have for Universal Adjustment Bureau? Oh, she invited me for cocktails. I'm going to call her later this afternoon and keep the date. Maybe I'll get some information then. Cocktails, say You made out okay. Oh, shut up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item three, $23.60, long-distance telephone call to George Hanley in Denver, Colorado. George is an old friend of mine in the private detective business. I told him about the report that John Reardon was still alive and living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. I requested him to gather information that would help in determining whether Bowers was really John Reardon or not. I spent the remainder of the day reading over the facts of the case as supplied to me by Pat Kelleher of Universal Adjustment. Expense account item four, ten cents, another phone call. This one to John Reardon's widow. Hello? Mrs. Reardon? Yes. This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. You're the man who used to know John? Uh, yes. I asked you over for a drink. I hope you're coming. What time? Seven would be fine. I was at her home at seven o'clock, knocking on the door. It was a nice home, and she seemed like a nice person. Even nicer than the night before. I asked you to call me Elizabeth, Mr. Dollar. I remember her. Yes, you also asked me not to mention your husband's name. I wish you'd forget that. I was upset last night when we met. Forgive me? How's your drink? Not swell. I don't know why, but I feel I should explain myself a little more about saying what I did about John. I... I was very shocked at his death. I suppose I still am, even though it was five years ago. It always disturbs me when I'm reminded of it. Yet it's good to be reminded, I suppose. To know that he really is dead. 
That he won't come through that door anymore. That he won't telephone me from the office or make any plans with me. Does that make sense? I suppose so. Oh, we can drink another one. Sometimes things make more sense with a few drinks. <laughs> Sometimes they don't make any sense at all, Elizabeth. That's right, too, Johnny. You know, I like you. I like you. Tell me about your business. You said insurance? Yes. You're a broker? Well, uh, not exactly. A salesman? No. I'm an investigator. That must be terribly interesting work. I suppose you travel everywhere. Have you ever been to she had a nice mouth. Soft, frank, wide open eyes. A couple of times I was on the verge of telling her exactly what I was working on and why I was talking to her. But I didn't. Somehow I felt comfortable in the house. Over the drinks and music, we eventually got around to John Reardon. She told me of their four years' marriage that ended with his sudden death. Gave me everything I could possibly want to have. Why do I tell you all this? I never talked to anybody about it. Well, I don't know. Possibly because you just want to talk to somebody about it. You're easy to talk to, Johnny. I was 19 when I was married. I'd never known another man. It was wonderful at first. Wonderful all the time, I suppose. I, I just wasn't grown up enough to realize it. Can I ask you a question? Surely. Did you really love him? Yes. I'm not convinced. Why? Oh, just a feeling. Well, I did. I'm not so sure he loved me. That's an awful thing to say. No, I don't think so. It's probably been on your mind a long time. You don't know me from a load of coal, but we've sat here and talked an hour. I think I know you. I think so, too. You still seem very despondent about his death. Yet you aren't sure he loved you. I loved him. Oh. <laughs> here I am explaining things again, I suppose, because they sound so foolish. Once, we both loved each other. Very much. But we kicked it away. We just didn't get along. He was out spending his money on other people, and I was taking up this pastime. Can you tell when I've had too much? No. Thank you. Thank you awfully. Oh, Hugh. Elizabeth. Johnny, this is Hugh Bryan. This is Mr. Dollar, Hugh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. How's your drink, Liz? Fine. Now tell me again, who is this? This is Mr. Dollar. What's your business, Mr. Dollar? I haven't seen you around before. Obviously, you just met Miss Reardon, or you'd never, never start drinking with her. I wouldn't. No. That's true, Liz, isn't it? He was a friend of John's, Hugh. Well, that's nice. I don't think I ever heard him mention your name. I was a friend of his, too. As a matter of fact, his attorney. Hugh, you don't have to do this and in front of And since John is no longer here, I've undertaken to look after some of the problems he left behind him, as an old friend would. Elizabeth, say goodnight to Mr. Dollar. Now, look here, Hugh. Say goodnight you... to him. He's just leaving. Maybe it's better right now, Johnny. Good night. Do you want me to leave? She just said it would be better. I'll call you at your hotel. Good night. Good night, mister. No, no, you still have something in your glass. Finish your drink. Okay. Huh. An old friend of John's. That's good. Very good. It is? She picked you up in a bar last night. I saw her. I was with her. You never knew John Reardon in your life. You have no business being here. And I don't like cheap opportunists invading her home. Evidently, you can talk to her any way you want to, and she'll take it. Why, I don't know. But don't talk to me that way. I don't have to take anything. You were just leaving, weren't you? Hugh Bryan was a large, bristling sort of man with a smooth manner. I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. Expense account item five, eighteen dollars. Even cab fares, lunches, etc. In and about Chesapeake Bay, talking to the principals connected with the boat explosion death of John Reardon. One of these was Lieutenant Jack Halverson, United States Coast Guard. You want some coffee? If I have to go out in that wind to get it, no. Make it right here for just such occasions. 
Just a sec, I'll plug her in. There. Oh, brother, someday. It's nice in the summertime. Now, what can I do for you? Tell me about the boat going down. You made out the report for the Coast Guard. You mean the Sharpston's boat? Yeah. We have a reliable witness who thinks that one of the passengers, a man named John Reardon, didn't go down with it at all, that he's still alive. You said you had my report. Those are the facts. But you picked up three bodies. Why not the fourth? Why not Reardon's? Well, we searched the bay for a solid week looking for his body. We used every piece of equipment at our disposal. We did everything we could. But you didn't find him. First you come in here complaining about our weather, now you're mad about the way we run the Coast Guard. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a very lousy-sounding apology. What do you want to find out? How that boat exploded? Why you couldn't find Reardon's body if you found the others? Now, look, if a bunch of rich jerks want to take a high-powered boat out and they don't know the first thing about high-test fuel or engine running, they're doing it at their own risk. That help? Yes, some. I wish you could have put it on the report. That's my ideas, buddy. The report just has the facts. Now... For the other, about finding Reardon. I don't know why. He blew up, went down, or drifted out to sea. If his body had been in the bay, we'd found it. Was there a chance he might have survived and been rescued? All we had left of the boat was pieces of wreckage. And if he was rescued, it was never reported, and I wouldn't know about that. Could that have happened? Sure. I could be an admiral tomorrow, sir. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when I got to Elizabeth Reardon's house. You. Hello, Mr. Bryan. Is Mrs. Reardon in? No. Then I'll wait. It's important that I see her. I thought I made it clear to you last night I didn't want her being molested. You did make it clear and cruel, Mr. Bryan. Now, I'm here... Any business for her comes to me first. I'm an insurance investigator. I know that, she told me. But she didn't tell you because she didn't know and I didn't want her to know that I'm working on a case that involves her. What? I have a report that her husband might still be alive. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have to admit that Hugh Bryan's concern was as genuine as his surprise. He led me into the house and we sat at the bar. Only this time, no one had a drink. He listened while I told him about the report of Paul Coombs, that John Reardon was living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. Do you think there's any truth to him? It doesn't matter what I think, Mr. Bryan. I have to investigate it. Yes, of course. And if he were alive, it'd be the best thing in the world. Would it? Of course. She's been lost without him all these years. She needs him, Mr. Dollar. She always needed him. This little bit of drinking has been going on too long. These tearful little episodes with one man or another. Oh, yes, I mistook you for one of those last night. I apologize for that sincerely. Actually, Mr. Dollar, she... She's been quite a task. Uh-huh. Well, maybe I better talk to her now. Uh, do you have to? There's certain information I'd like to get. I think she's the only one who can give it to me. You'll have to tell her about the report? Yes. And there's probably so much talk... But it'll give her a terrible kind of hope. All right, I'll get her. No, you'd better mix one for her. She'll need it. Wait a minute. Yeah? I need vital statistics on Reardon. Pictures, handwriting samples, everything. Could you help me gather them? I'll do anything I can. Well, then there's no need to bother her, is there? You're a gentleman, Mr. Dollar. I don't know why. I do. You don't want to hurt her any more than I do. An hour later, I was back in my hotel room. The next day, I had an appointment to meet Hugh Bryan and get all the material I had asked for. I was more depressed than ever about the case. About then, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny? Yes. This is Elizabeth Reardon. Please. Please don't look for him. What? Just forget it. Did Hugh Bryan tell you what I was about? I overheard you two talking. Don't bother with it. John's dead, and that's that. Promise me. Promise you won't do anything else. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I have to investigate it. Johnny, is is that final? I'm sorry. I don't have any choice. Elizabeth? Elizabeth! There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a trip to Denver and a look at a man whose gun makes it pretty emphatic that he doesn't want to be looked at. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hugh Bryan, Mr. Dollar. How are you this morning? Not so good. I didn't sleep very well. How'd you do? I think I have about what you want on John Reardon. Well, if you haven't, I can get it from Mrs. Reardon. What? Well, I thought you didn't want to tell her about the report, that her husband might still be alive. She knows. She overheard us talking last night. Oh. Well, what do you want to do? I might as well look at what you have and get this over with. How about an hour from now? I'll be waiting for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item six, dollar and a half. One collect telegram from Denver, Colorado. I've located Frank Bowers as per your request. Cursory investigation discloses little evidence that would lead me to believe he might be the John Ridden of Baltimore. Looks like a ham bone to me, Johnny. What do I do now? Sign George Hanley, George Hanley Investigations Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Item seven, two dollars, same thing. Telegram from me. Things are about the same way here. Sit tight, I'll see you in a day or two. Love, Johnny. Once the telegrams were out of the way, I walked three blocks from my hotel to the office building of Hugh Bryan. It was an impressive place full of lawyers and doctors. Hugh Bryan looked a little haggard when I saw him. It took me a while to get all this together. Half the night. There wasn't that big a rush. Oh, get it out of the way. The sooner you have what you need, the sooner you can make sure, and the sooner I won't worry about it anymore. Uh, did you talk to Elizabeth yet today? No, just last night. Oh, I thought maybe she might have called you this morning. I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry for that girl. Well, don't feel too bad, Mr. Bryan. We both did everything we could to keep the report that her husband might be alive from her. Awkward as it was. Yes, I know, I know. I still don't understand it, I guess. Well, a man named Coombs, an insurance official, thinks he saw Reardon in Denver last week using the name Frank Bowers. He's sure that Bowers was Reardon. If he turns out to be Reardon, the insurance company's been taken for $20,000 they paid to Elizabeth Reardon. Just to set you straight. Well, that'd make Elizabeth party to a fraud. And John... Lord knows that's silly. Well, silly or not. Yes. Well, here's what I have. Now, this is one of the last pictures taken of John Reardon. Mm-hmm. Have the negatives? Yes. Uh, here. And these are some vital statistics on him. The physical part I got from his doctor. Mm -hmm. He stood an examination about a month before the accident. This the doctor's name here? Yes. Now, these other things are in his background and education. Uh, here, a copy of his marriage license, birth certificate. How did you get hold of these things? Well, I handled a lot of business for John, filed a lot of his papers for him. These were just packed away. It took a while to find them. Hey. Hmm? A copy of his fingerprints? Well, would those help? More than any of this other stuff. Fingerprints aren't standard papers in anybody's file. 
Before John went in the army, he did some engineering work for the proving grounds in Aberdeen. Oh. He was fingerprinted there. It was a gag at the time. He had a set of his own blown up and put on the wall in a picture frame. You know, just a joke. Oh. I dug them out of his personal things. Now then, here's a copy of his financial records, tax returns and whatnot. I spent about an hour in Hugh Bryan's office going over material that would help me in the investigation. The pictures and fingerprints were the most helpful items. After I'd finished, I went back to my hotel, packed my bags, and checked out. Expense account item eight, $398. My hotel and incidentals in Baltimore and plane fare to Denver. I got there at nine in the morning. The air crisp, thin, and full of sunshine. I rented a car at the airport and drove into town. A half an hour later, I was talking to my detective friend, George Hanley. How do you like Denver, old pal? I haven't been here for a few years. Doesn't look the same. Bigger and better, huh? They're thinking of putting up buildings as big as those mountains over there. I love it. So does the wife. I'm glad. You ought to try a place like this for a while, Johnny. Uh, maybe I will. Ought to find yourself a girl and settle down. Uh, let's us settle down, Georgie. Huh? Oh, sure. How'd it go? You asked me to look into Frank Bowers. I looked into him as much as I could without talking to him. There you are, Johnny. His bank account, his friends, his troubles, his enemies, everything. Mm -hmm. How about his police record? One traffic violation two years ago. Never been in any kind of trouble around here. Gets along fine with everybody. Well, tell me about everybody, Georgie. His laundryman, the milkman, the guy who tends bar in his neighborhood, the man he buys gas from. I talk to all of them. How about the people he works with? Well, he don't do much of that as far as I can see. He's got an office downtown, calls himself a consulting engineer. Goes there once or twice a week to pick up his mail. Well, now, that's a very nice way to be able to live. Is he starving to death, Georgie? No, he's got a good bank account. Makes regular deposits. Money comes from a New York bonding firm. He owns a little two-bedroom house out beyond Park Hill. Paid $38,000 for it. Wow. Sleeps in one bedroom. Uses the other one for a kind of studio. Putters around with clay, oils. And according to the nosy dame who lives across the street, he tries to write. How about his friends? Lots of them. Pays his bills. Gets drunk now and then. Normal. Tell me about his wife. He hasn't got one. Lives alone. Find out who he goes with, Georgie? No. As much as I could find out, he doesn't go with anybody. Enemies? Well, the guy in the cleaning shop hates his guts. Bowers doesn't like his shirts with starch. <laughs> Did you check out the residency business? As far as I could. He bought that house out in Park Hill in 1951. Paid cash for it. Record of the sale gives his former residence is Toledo, Ohio. Well, how long has he been a resident here? As near as I can figure, and this is just rough... Four or five years ago, the first financial transaction was the house he bought. The next was a car. He could have been here a long time before that, though. Well, the time element would fit for Reardon. What do you think, Georgie? I think you're probably wasting a lot of money investigating this guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who's hiding out from anybody. Here. <clears throat> Look at this photo. Is this Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. 5'11", 170, olive complexion, no scars, no glasses, brown hair, about 35. Could be him from that, yes. This is a picture of John Reardon. And the description is Reardon's. What do you want to do now? Keep on it. I got George Hanley busy making a check with some people in Toledo who could find out whether or not a Frank Bauer had once lived there. Then I took my rented car and drove out to the address Hanley had given me. It was in the east side of the city near the airport. A one-story frame house, a 53 Merc in the driveway. I'm looking for Mr. Frank Bowers. Oh, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I'm Frank Bowers. Well, I'm an insurance investigator, Mr. Bowers. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, come on in. Huh? Thank you. Take chair anywhere, huh? Sign your mind. Just making a routine check, Mr. Bowers. Thought perhaps you could help me. Well, I don't know anything about my neighbors, if that's that kind of thing. No, I'm running down a report that came across our office in Baltimore. Baltimore? Ever been there, Mr. Bowers? No. Swell place on Chesapeake Bay. Well, I like Denver. <laughs> What's this all about? Well, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were at a place called the Ship's Tavern? Well, if that's in the Brown Palace. This was uh, last Friday, to be exact. <laughs> Should I remember? What I do, steal an ashtray or walk out on a check? Oh, a, a man from Baltimore was there that day, Mr. Bowers. His name was Coombs. Paul Coombs. You met him. Well, did I? Yes, right at the bar. You had a drink or two with him. Well, I might have. I don't know whether to admit it or not. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand this. I know it seems confusing. Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. 
Now, hmm. you must admit, you look a great deal like the man in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I do. Well, I'll be darned. Hey, I'd do it that. You know, this could be a picture of me. That's why I'm here, Mr. Powers. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. His name was John Reardon. He was lost in a boat accident in Chesapeake Bay five years ago. The Mr. Coombs who met you at the bar here last week thought you were John Reardon. Well, I don't blame him. But I'm not. Close, though. Now, want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Coombs was a lifelong friend of John Reardon's. I have his sworn statement here about that meeting with you and the certainty of his identity. You do? Yes, right here. Would you like to see it? <laughs> not particularly. I understand you went to Ohio State. What year did you graduate? I didn't go to Ohio State. Look, what is this? Huh? Well, that's what you told Mr. Coombs. It's in the statement. Oh, I remember that bird now. Oh, I might have told him anything, Mr. Dolly. You know, he's one of those inquisitive kind, real sure of himself. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Look, don't tell me they sent you all the way out here from Baltimore. They did. On that guy say so? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's funny. Did you go to college, Mr. Powers? What? Huh? I'd like to clear up that detail. Did you go to college? Well, yes, yes. I went to Carnegie Tech, 36 through 40. You haven't lived all your life in Colorado, then. Where else have you lived? Look, do you have any right to ask me questions like this? No, no, but you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them. Well, why not? Okay, I've lived in New York, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Toledo, around the country. Came here a few years ago. My health seemed good to my asthma. Ever been married? Once in 1942. It didn't last long. Oh, what else you want to know? Well, if you in a hurry, I can come back later. No, no, it's not that. It's, well, look, you seem like a nice guy, Dollar, but it just makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Bauer. Please understand, it's a matter of establishing identity. But you know who I am. I just told you. That's true. I don't like this business much. Is there, is there any way you can eliminate it? The most positive identification would be from fingerprints. Oh? Uh -huh. Now, Mr. Bauer, I'm not so much interested in who you are as in proving that you're not John Reardon. If you volunteered a set of fingerprints, it'd save me a great deal of work and you a great deal of trouble. Well, sure, why not? <laughs> We drove downtown together to George Hanley's office and used the portable fingerprint kit. I took a complete set of Frank Bauer's prints he attached. I thanked him for his time and trouble, and he left. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversational reactions. There had been a moment when I was sure he wasn't Frank Bauer. On the other hand, I was sure that he wasn't John Ridden. That cuts it, Johnny. Right thumb and index prints don't match at all. Oh, not even close, George. And I thought I was getting somewhere. I found out he was never in Toledo, or at least never registered or licensed as an engineer. Well, these prints do it. When are you going home, Johnny? Oh, uh, I don't know. There's no reason to stick around any longer. This is crazy. You proved your case with the prints. He was too anxious to help me prove it, Georgie. You ask any ordinary man on the street two personal questions about himself, and he'll tell you to go jump in the lake. You ask him for his fingerprints, and he's liable to smash you. So? Get on him. Stay with him 24 hours a day. Get a couple of other men. It'll cost you money. Get busy. Expense account item nine, $200, detective service. I didn't believe Frank Bowers. I didn't believe his background. And most of all, I didn't believe his fingerprints. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, another man comes to Denver. He doesn't check in a hotel or carry luggage. At least not much luggage. Just a thirty-eight Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Western Union, Mr. Dollar. Message for you from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, go ahead. Received your air special regarding investigation of the Chesapeake matter. You've proved Frank Bowers of Denver is not John Ridden of Baltimore. Fingerprints don't lie, therefore logical to believe John Ridden really dead. Come on home, your expenses are running too high. That's signed Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Or should I mail this to you? No, that's all right. Can I send an answer? Yes, sir. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. Fingerprints don't lie, but people do. All the time. For all sorts of reasons. It may be finished as far as you're concerned, but I'm just beginning. Love, Johnny. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. I'd sent out to prove that John Reardon had not died back in 1950 in a boat accident on Chesapeake Bay. To prove that he was still very much alive in the person of one Frank Bowers, currently living here in Denver, Colorado. Everything, all I could learn of the man's history, reports from his neighbors, friends, even his fingerprints, everything indicated he really was Frank Bowers. And yet, for some fool reason or other, I wasn't convinced. Expense account continued. Item 10, 63 bucks for one overcoat. Denver can be a very cold city when the wind comes in from the north and it decides to snow. Almost as cold as the damp wind off Chesapeake Bay on a certain day back in 1950. Hi. Hiya, George. How's it going? Well, I washed Bowers' house from six last night till two this morning. He read a book last night in the living room. He made a phone call, and then he went to bed. And then I went home and went to bed. How many men have you got working? Two others beside myself. We're keeping an eye on Bowers around the clock. I go on again at six. Okay, good. I don't know why, Johnny. He isn't your guy, and you know it. Fingerprints proved it. We can watch him from now till doomsday, and nothing's going to change that. Oh, look, don't you start, Georgie. Huh? I got a wire from my home office this morning telling me to close it up and come on home. Why don't you close it up and come on home? I like to make dough. I'm in the private detective business, but I hate to see an old pal doing a lot of work on nothing. Why don't you shut up? Sure. We can go on like this forever, can't we, Johnny? Ah... Goodbye, Johnny. I walked around the streets of Denver trying to enjoy the sights. But mostly, I wasn't enjoying anything. I was thinking about the whole case from beginning to end. And my only reason for hanging on and being stubborn about it was the fact that Frank Bowers had been too anxious to cooperate. Too anxious to help me prove so easily that he was not John Reardon. And then something else happened. He got anxious once more. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, this is Frank Bowers. Oh, hello. You didn't tell me where you were stopping. Phoned everywhere in town. <laughs> Wondered how you made out. Made out? Yeah, with my fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they don't match at all. Oh, then I'm not your man. Guess not, Mr. Bowers. Well, I was just curious. Didn't hear from you after you took the sample of my prints. Well, that was pretty nice of you to help me out. Uh, how can I thank you? Buy me a drink if you want to. Hey, you're on. All right, meet you at six at the ship's tavern. It was the voice of a confident man again. An overconfident man. The kind who sandbags in a poker game. Who knows about a boat ride and a horse race. And so help me, I knew I was right about him. Expense account item 11, $14. Booze. For Frank Bowers and myself in the ship's tavern. The same bar, incidentally, where a week before, a close friend of the deceased John Reardon had run into Bowers and sworn he was John Reardon. When Bowers came in, he was followed by George Hanley, as per my instructions. 
I saw George pick a stool at the far end of the bar. Well, I suppose you'll be packing up and leaving the old Mile High City pretty quick now, huh? Did I say that, Frank? No, no. But I just suppose it. You will, won't you? Oh, I haven't decided yet. What do you think I should do? Huh? I said, what do you think I should do? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, maybe I'm just kidding myself. But you don't seem like the kind of fellow you should be somehow. No, I don't. Huh? No. Now, you were too nice about answering questions when I came out to your house the other day. Too nice about letting me fingerprint you so I could compare the samples with John Reardon's prints. Too nice about calling up and asking how it all came out. Came out bad, thank you. <laughs> I'm a pretty nice fella. <laughs> yeah, that's what the book says. <laughs> uh, what book? I had a private detective friend make one up on you before I even got here. Friends, enemies, money, and whatnot. All very nice. Mm, of course it is. You know what your trouble is, Dolly? You, you don't trust anybody. I'm a nice fella, and you don't trust me. You don't believe what you see. I believe the fingerprints don't match, if that's what you mean. You're the bird I don't believe. Hey, should I get sore? If you want to. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know why? Because I'm a nice fella. Sure you are. But you ought to get mad when a man calls you a liar. Oh, uh, you didn't call me a liar. I meant to. You're a liar. You know what? I'm not a nice fella all the time. I'd kind of like to hit you in the face or something right now. You're needling me. Am I? Uh-huh. I think I better call up a girl I know, see what she's doing for dinner. Well, see if she's got a friend. No, no, you're too nasty, friend. You sit tight. Order me a drink. I'll be back in a jiffy. He's a little drunk. Sure he is, George. He's also worried. Any particular reason for getting him that way, Johnny? Yes, he's using the booth in the lobby. Scoot out there and see if you can get a line on who he might be calling. Right. A long ten minutes later, Frank Bowers came back to the bar. He was weaving a little when he got on the stool next to me. George Hanley followed him back inside and took his place at the end of the bar again. Uh, she's busy. Took her a long time to tell you that. She's a girl who takes a long time with everything. Oh, what's her name? Ma? Huh? What's her name? The girl you just called. Oh, Rita. Rita. Well, here's to Rita. Come on, drink up. You might have to eat with me. I don't want to drink to Rita, and I don't want to have dinner with you. What do you think of that? Huh? I thought you were a nice fella, remember? God of places. Hold on. Hey! You may have something with this bird at that. How come, George? That call he just made long distance to Baltimore. I got that much. He said he'd never been there. Didn't know anyone there. Keep an eye on us, Georgie. You betcha, pal. Hey. Hey, Frank. Hey, hey, look. What's the matter, friend? I just left you. I thought for good. Oh, come on. I'll buy you dinner. You buy me nothing, Dollar. Go on back to Baltimore. Why don't you? What? Why don't you go back to Baltimore? What's that supposed to mean? Just what it means. Well? Uh, maybe we better talk some more. Fine, fine. My car is in the lot here. Okay. You're after me, aren't you? Well, let's say I met you yesterday to get some facts. Let's say I drank with you tonight to find out what kind of a guy you are. I've done most of the talking up to date. Now it's your turn. Uh-huh. Well? I don't know whether I got anything to say to you. Oh, make up your mind, will you? Look, suppose I were John Ridden. I'm not. But suppose I were. I can't tell you what a court would do about an insurance fraud. No. No, you're just a clumsy ox stumbling around for some answers and you haven't got any yet. Get out of my way. Wait, wait a minute. Hey! Hey! Oh. Oh. He's a very handy fella. I didn't want to interfere, Johnny. Stay on him. See where he goes, what he does, Georgie. Hurry. You all right, pal? Sure. Hurry. I wasn't all right at all. Frank Bowers was not only big but fast, and he caught me off guard. I went back through the hotel lobby up to my room and lay down on the bed, and I waited for the phone to ring. 
Sooner or later, it would be George Hanley or Frank Bauer's tale reporting some development that had solved the whole case. But the phone didn't ring. Nothing happened. No one phoned. No one came by. I went to sleep about one o'clock. The next morning, George Hanley called and asked me how I was feeling after the punching session in the parking lot. He reported that Frank Bowers had jumped in his car, driven straight home, and gone straight to bed. Expense account item 12, 48 cents, postage. Cost of mailing a sample of Bowers' fingerprints to Washington, D.C. At 8 o'clock that night, I had another phone call. Hi, baby. This is George Hanley. How do you feel? Okay. What's up, Georgie? I'm still keeping my eye on Frank Bowers. He's nervous, all right. Been staying in the house all day. I can see him walking back and forth in the living room. He must have smoked a package of cigarettes every hour. Uh Uh-huh. Has he used the phone? Yeah, yeah. Looks like long-distance stuff again. You know, place the call, hang up, then wait for the operator to call back. Hmm. Possibly Baltimore again. Possible. How about it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Where are you? Right across the street from his house. Be right out. The heater in my rented car wasn't working that night. I remember that part very well. My feet and hands were numb with the ten below weather when I flicked off the lights and pulled up alongside George Hanley, stationed across the street from Frank Bauer's home. Uh, it's some weather. Yeah. How's Bauer doing? I think he's got a visitor with him now, Johnny. Must have showed up while I was calling you. Big guy wrapped in an overcoat. I've seen him move around the room a couple of times. George, let's go in and shake him up. I'm tired of all this. You think he's reared? I don't know, but I want to wind it up one way or the other. Okay. You want to wait for his friend to leave? Nope. Oh, it's a nutty thing. You're the one who's nutty. You already proved he isn't John Reardon. That's all you wanted. I know, I know. Now I want to prove I'm getting old and crotchety and don't believe what I see in here. Bear with me, Georgie. Sure, pal. You're crazy, but I love you. Hey. Huh? Visitor's leaving. Make him? No. An overcoat and a hat aren't much to go on. He's... Georgie, come on! Hey, Johnny, look out! down, the gun of the man in the overcoat had gone off a couple more times. The nearest bullet came six inches from me. Without my gun, all I could do was hug the ground for cover and try to stay out of his line of fire. The shot deafened me for a moment. When my hearing came back, I heard someone very close to me. It was Georgie. He was dying. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proof that an insurance case is one thing. Murder of a pal is something else. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator. Ready with your call to Mr. Pat Kelleher in Baltimore. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Pat. I got your wire. What's all this? What happened? We're still trying to find out. The man calling himself Frank Bowers was killed an hour ago. George Hanley, one of the operators I had watching him, was killed too. We've got a vague description of the killer. Are you all right? 
Yeah, but I'm going to be tied up with the police here. Well, you need money for bail or anything like that, just draw a draft on the company. I'll confirm it. Thanks, Pat. Too bad about your friend. Yeah, he was a good guy. I want to find out who killed him. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account continued. Item 13, a quarter for some aspirin. It turned out to be a long night. Several homicide officers arrived at the double murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the business at hand. Frank Bowers had been shot to death. George Hanley had been shot to death. Lieutenant Tom O'Neill was in charge, a big blonde man who seemed to know what he was about. Okay, let's see that ID again. Here you go. Ah, insurance investigator, hmm? That's right. Okay. What was your business here with these two men? My home office in Baltimore had reason to believe that Frank Bowers was really a man named John Reardon. Reardon was supposed to have died five years ago. I was sent out here to investigate it since there had been a $20,000 claim in the matter. Sure, sure. I hired George Hanley to help me out. He was keeping an eye on Frank Bowers. I came out earlier tonight to give my hand and the shooting began. Any idea who did it? A big man in a top coat and a hat. I really didn't get a look at him, Lieutenant. I was busy with George Hanley. Sure. You carry a gun? Sometimes. I didn't have one tonight. You tried to chase the killer? I said I was busy with my friend. Yeah, that's right, you did. Well, how was your investigation coming along? Frank Bauer's fingerprints didn't match the samples I had for John Reardon. But it didn't satisfy me. There were a lot of things about him personally I couldn't accept. I harassed him a little last night, and he got pretty excited and slugged me. This was after I found out he'd been trying to call Baltimore. Who in Baltimore? I don't know. Well, tell me about this harassing. You'll make a check with the phone company. Well, I needled him purposely, trying to scare him into a blunder. I think I was doing pretty good. I'll never know now. Uh huh. What else you got to say about your case? Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. It is, huh? Well, that's all I got to say because that's all I know about it. Next time, be careful with your needling tactics. Boy. I was doing what I thought best on the case. Sure you were. You were doing swirl. You let a friend of yours get shot down in front of your eyes. Not to mention the other guy. You can't give us a description of the killer or a hint at the motive. Now, maybe George Hanley wasn't a friend of yours at that. Why, you... Dad, yeah, take it easy, kiddo. Take it easy. Remember to blow the bell. I'm sorry. You've had quite a night. Nobody in your business or mine knows what's behind the door when he kicks it in. I'm just a cop trying to get straightened out, so I push too hard sometimes. We'll get it taken care of. Nobody walks in a man's house and shoots him down without somebody hearing something or seeing something. I mean, somebody besides you. Now, my men will cover every house in the block, in this whole area, if we have to. Bound to be somebody somewhere. The dogged Lieutenant O'Neill turned out to be 100% correct. In fact, he turned out to be 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murders of Frank Bowers and George Hanley. The first was a man named Randall who had lived across the street. He had seen Bowers open his front door and admit the unknown killer. He said he wore glasses. The second was a paper boy who had come to collect while the killer was there. He stated that the killer and Bowers were arguing when he came up to the door. The third witness, a housewife, gave the most important information as to the man's description. He was a good deal taller than Mr. Bowers. How much taller? Mm, Three, four inches at least. I saw him standing in the doorway from here. He had on a brown tweed top coat. My husband has one just like it. How old would you say he was? Mm, Forty-five. Have you ever seen him before? No. Would you know him if you saw him again? Yes, anywhere. You got that good look at him, huh? Yes, the porch light was on. Here's something, Dollar. Lieutenant O'Neill had issued an all-points bulletin based on the combined descriptions given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men had checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to Frank Bauer's home at 8 o'clock in the evening. The cab driver verified the housewife's description of the suspect and added the important information that he'd picked up the man at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had come in on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Oren Williams. Expense account item 14, $8.95. Another long-distance phone call to Baltimore and Pat Kelleher. Well, I'll be tired. Do you have to stay there, John? Of course I have to stay here. I'm a material witness. 
Not to mention the fact that a pal of mine was shot down. Don't get on your high horse, John. It was just a question. Have any idea what it was all about? Well, at the moment, I'm just sure a guy named Oren Williams flew in, shot up two people, and beat it. If we had Williams, I'd give you the whole thing on a silver platter. You're awfully touchy. Well, this thing has gotten out of hand. Well, I won't press you on it anymore, John. You do what you think is best. As far as the company's concerned, it's really not our business anymore, is it? It's our business until it's cleared up. Well, I mean Bowers. He wasn't John Reardon. Dollar? Hold it, Pat. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Here. Let me see. Pat. Yeah? It is our business after all. Huh? The lieutenant here sent a hurry-up request to Washington on some of Bowers' fingerprints I mailed a couple of days ago. They check out. I don't get it. Bowers was John Reardon. Oh. Well. Well, where'd you get the samples of Reardon's prints that didn't check out? From Hugh Bryan, Reardon's attorney. Well, I better call him. Don't you dare. Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Tell me about this fellow, Hugh Bryan. According to the phone company, that's the man Bowers was trying to call in Baltimore. I told him all I knew. And Lieutenant O'Neill listened thoughtfully. It became apparent from that point on, since Bauer's true identity had been established through Army records, that the bulk of the case could be concluded not in Denver, but in Baltimore. Expense account item 16, $216, plane fare and incidentals, Denver to Baltimore. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, checked with the Baltimore police who had been informed of the case by Tom O'Neill in Denver. At his request, they'd taken no action as yet. From the police station, I went directly to Hugh Bryan's residence. The house was English, conservative, and expensive. The fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Elizabeth Reardon did not look so cheerful. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mrs. Reardon. Didn't expect to find you here. No, I suppose not. I never expected to see you again. Elizabeth, I have something to tell you. Don't tell me now, Johnny. It's about your husband. All right. I want to tell Mr. Bryan, too. He's upstairs in his study. Oh, wait. Look, I've done what I thought best about all this, and I'm trying to do what's best now. It doesn't make any difference, Johnny. I'm a married woman again. Huh? Yes. You and I were married this morning. Excuse me. I walked in and watched John Reardon's widow, alias Frank Bauer's widow, now Hugh Bryan's bride, disappear up a column stairway. The news that she had married Hugh Bryan cleared up some of the small doubts in my mind. When Bryan came back down the stairs with her, he looked anything but the happy bridegroom. Hello, Dollar. You're a late caller. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, How did you come out in Denver? Everything okay? No, everything's not okay. Well, uh, what's the matter? Do I have to tell you... I'll run along upstairs, Hugh. It's getting terribly late. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Bryan. There'll be some men out to see you pretty soon, Bryan. Policemen. Oh. Liz. Yes, dear? I think you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Hugh. I wasn't in Philadelphia yesterday, Liz. I was in Denver, Colorado. What? I flew there to see John. He's been alive and living there all this time. You. I'm sorry. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When it gets into court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brian? John Reardon didn't die in that boat. No. He was picked up in a bay by a fishing boat on his way to Florida. They didn't have a radio on the fishing boat. The first port they came to was Charleston. John phoned me from there and told me all about it. Now, this was ten days after we all thought he was dead. That part was all accident. Sure. The rest of it was a little different. Liz, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? Not showing up ever again. Letting everyone think he was really dead. Making you a widow. I don't believe it. He hated his life here. Everything about it. He was in debt right up to his ears... Of course, there was your money, but he... Well, I flew down to Charleston to talk to him. He was like a crazy man. Kept saying there was a way out. I didn't know what he meant at first. Then he came right out and said it was his chance to get away from all the things he hated. 
He knew how I felt about you then, how I feel about you now. He said I could have you for a price. What was the price? Those checks he got every week from a New York bonding concern? Yes. What did they come to? 25000 a year, regular weekly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Liz. Did he come right out and tell you he hated me? He just said he wanted to get away from everything. And it went that way for five years. I believe I asked you to marry me every six months. Yes. But that didn't work out either. And then, one day, along came Johnny Dollar. How does it feel to be so efficient, Mr. Dollar? We don't have to go into that, do we? No. I'll admit you did everything to throw me off. And it threw me off. Especially the fingerprints you provided. Didn't John Reardon insist his name was Frank Bowers and do everything he could to make you believe that was true? He did too much to make me think it was true. Where is he now? Where's John? He's dead, Mrs. Bryan. Oh. Truly dead now. He was shot to death last night by Mr. Bryan. Mr. Bryan also shot a friend of mine, didn't you, Bryan? Yes. John got scared, called me, said he was going to tell everything to Dollar, blow the whole thing. You... All I wanted out of this was you, Liz. He didn't want you. I didn't. Last week, you decided to marry me. It took you five years to do that. And it took him one afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. The proof that John Reardon's widow is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent insurance claim is a matter for Eastern Fidelity to decide. The matter of Hugh Bryan and two murders is a matter for the courts. Expense account, item 17, same as item 1. Expenses from Baltimore to Hartford. Item 18, $89 even. Car rentals, miscellaneous, etc. Expense account total, $1,124.98. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, a quiet, sleepy little town in Mexico and a beautiful senorita that... Well, things didn't stay quiet and sleepy for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, D.J. Thompson, High Everback, Will Wright... John Daner, Tony Barrett, Paul Dubov, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. our office doesn't handle only murder cases. Sometimes, as in this one, the case is a little less physical, but still, it's interesting. You don't have to convince me that being a district attorney isn't dull, Markham. <laughs> uh, this Joe Somer, whom we're going to see, just what is the charge against him? 
His partner is accusing him of grand larceny. Oh. I happen to know Somer pretty well, and before an indictment is handed down, I want to talk to him. I liked him. Quiet, always considerate. Uh, nice of you to come with me, Vance. I'm glad of the chance to get out of the office. Good. Well, this is the street you said Soma lives on. This house should be that one. There's a crowd around that house, Vance. Something's happened. No doubt about that, my friend. Let's find out what. Well, there's a police officer over there, Markham. Yes. Let's find out about this. I'm with you, Vance. Hey, right, stop killing, will you? Yeah. Pardon me. Sorry. Excuse me, please. Get back, everybody. Get back there. Hello, officer. I'm District Attorney Markham. Oh, sure. I recognize you, Mr. Markham. It's quite a thing we have here. A fellow lives here. A man named Joe Somer jumped or fell from the roof of his house. What? He was dead when he hit the ground. Joe Somer, Markham. That's the man you wanted to see. Not right now. It was suicide, all right, Mr. Markham. Almost hit a couple of people when he jumped. That's awful. I uh, found a suicide note in the house. There wasn't anybody home, but the note was right where I couldn't miss it when I went in. I'll uh, turn it in with my report. All right, officer. Well, Vance, I promised you a case. All right, it looks like it's over before it even began. That, my friend, is a matter of opinion. Perhaps there is no larceny case. But I have an idea that instead of it, we're going to have a murder investigation. Miss Anderson, uh, DA in his office? Yes, he is, Sergeant. He's, he's on the telephone, though. Well, oh, that's okay. He'll want to see me. No, but I'll let you know oh. something develops. Bye. Hello, Heath. Hi, DA. Just got a report on that suicide note found at Joe Somer's house. Yes. Completely legitimate, DA. We had our experts check the writing. There's no question but that Joe Somer wrote it. He wrote a suicide note? And apparently jumped from the roof of his house. What do you mean, apparently? Well, Father Vance thought it might be murder. Oh, he did? Yes. That guy thinks everything is murder. I'm waiting for the day when there's a murder case that he'll say is suicide. You'll have a long wait, Heath. Vance doesn't often make mistakes. Ah, everybody makes mistakes, D.A. Even I do. Not you, Sergeant Heath. Yeah, me. And if I can make him, I guess Vance can make him once in a while, too. The possibility is there, undoubtedly. Well? The only thing is, I can't ever remember Vance being wrong... For any length of time. I don't imagine I'll be too long, Mrs. Somer. Thank you for letting me use this desk. Uh, It's quite all right, Mr. Vance, but just what are you writing? Nothing, really, just scribbling. Are there any more pens in this house? You've tried all of them that I could find, including Joe's fountain pen. What's the big idea? I won't know whether or not it's a big idea until later. Right now, I'm... Oh, there's someone at the door. Excuse me. Oh, go right ahead, Mrs. Somer. Please don't let me disturb you. Any more than you have, you mean. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dale. Mrs. Somer. Uh, may I come in? Why, yes. Yes, of course. I have company, as you can see. Oh. Follow Vance, the private investigator. Mr. Vance, this is Alfred Dale, my husband's partner. How do you do? Hello, Vance. It took Joe's death to get you over to our house, didn't it, Mr. Dale? Well, I... Too bad you didn't find time to come here while he was still alive. Mrs. Somer, I assure you... Excuse me, please. Mrs. Somer, I'm finished with those pens. All right. Now, can you tell me what your husband was doing on the roof? I'm trying to find out if he deliberately went up there to commit suicide, or if he got the idea while he was on the roof. He left a note, the papers say. Doesn't that indicate he went up there to jump? Not necessarily. And I believe I was asking Mrs. Somer. Oh, Sorry. When I left the house yesterday morning, Vance, I asked Joe to fix the radio aerial on the roof. That might have given him the idea. Yes, it might. May I go up and see the roof? If you like. Wait till I throw a coat over my shoulders and I'll go up with you. Might just as well see the place where poor Joe jumped. Like to come up, Mr. Dale? Uh, all right. This way, gentlemen. Up these steps to the second floor, then we go up through the attic to the roof. Be done. There's a light at the top of these steps. I'll turn it on. Uh. You gentlemen might have a little trouble in the attic. There's no light there, and I'm afraid there are a lot of trunks lying around. There are in practically every attic. Go right ahead, gentlemen. I'll turn on this light. I'll see you, Dale. Certainly. Very well. You know, there's something about this procession that reminds me of the three little Indians. Isn't that ten little Indians? Not after seven of them were killed. You're perfectly right, of course. Careful now. It's pretty dark up here. Indeed it is. Just walk straight ahead, Mr. Dale. There are a few steps leading up to the roof. You know, there are times when I... Oh! oh. oh. Sorry, I must have kicked one of your trunks. It can stand it. 
find the steps all right, Mr. Dale? Yes, yes, yes. Huh. Good thing you brought your coat, Mrs. Summer. Yes, I. How's it is? Well, so this is the roof from which your husband jumped, fell, or was pushed to his death. Pushed? My husband killed himself then. There, see, there's the aerial I told you about. Look over here on the other side of it. You see where there's new wire around the insulator? Yes, I do. Apparently, your theory was right, Mrs. Somer. I imagine so. Hmm. Well, what else do we do now that we're up here? Not a thing. We've done everything I wanted to do. But what's more important, I've found out everything I wanted to know. <laughs> I'm just about to go to bed, Markham, but I thought I'd call you and report what happened today at the Somers' house. You know, I'm very anxious to hear. What'd you find out? Well, first of all, I met Joe Somers' partner, Alfred Dale. You did? We went up to the roof. What? Vance, what's happened? That was a shot. Vance, are you there? What happened? It's all right, my friend. Good. I'm lying here on the floor, out of reach of any second bullet. Besides, there's no light in the room now. Somebody fired at me from the fire escape and got the lamp instead. But, man, how can you be that calm? Somebody just tried to kill you. Yes, I know. And that means you were right. That Somers' death wasn't suicide, but murder. And the murderer was just close to you. That isn't the only thing the shot meant, Markham. It also meant that I am very close to the murderer. You're a smart dame, you are. Your husband knocks himself off, and what do you do? You come running to me. Tony. What is this, a playground? Tony. Tony, Tony. What do you expect from me? Oh, Tony. You think I'm going to knock myself out crying? I get smart. You're cute and I like it, but keep away from me for a while. But I don't understand why. I don't understand why. I'll tell you why. You inherit a lot of dough. That special clause about suicide in your husband's insurance takes care of you. Me, I'm a mug. All right, so you go for me. So the cops find out. So what'd they say? What can they say? What can they say? They can say I knocked off your old man so I could get you in that dough. But Tony... But Tony, you can butt Tony me for now. So, there's... Well, I got you two to get him. All right, now, Lila, take it easy. Well, this is the dame that took my place. I was hoping I'd find her here. I'm going to turn her inside out. I'm going to... Oh. <gasps> out. Now, you heard me. I said out. Oh, no, you don't. I don't get rid of easy. Nobody's moving in till I get ready to move out, and I'm not ready yet. No, no, no. Get out of here, Lila. Why? Because you slapped me? Come on. You slapped me before, and I stayed. What did yeah, you... Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop pushing me. When I say out, I mean out. Tony, you'll be awfully sorry sure, about this. Sure, sure, sure. I'll make you... Out. Tony, I'm sorry, sweetie. I guess Lila's got a temper. Tony, you guess she has. You're a pretty good guesser. I hate to think what that girl would have done to me if you hadn't stopped her. Right now I'm thinking about what she's going to do to me because I did. Now look, Mark, you listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I don't doubt that, Miss... Uh... Uh, just call me Lila. I'm going to hand you the murder of Joe Soma. Hand him to you right on a silver platter. That's all very well, Lila, except that indications are that Soma committed suicide. He left a note. I don't care what he left. I know a guy who wanted him dead. Just fool around with that. <laughs> Wishing someone were dead rarely is fatal to a victim. Huh? Well, Tony didn't only wish. He gets what he wants. And he wanted Mrs. Soma. Joe Soma was in a way. Tony got rid of him. I don't know how, I just know he did. All right, Lila. Let's concede for a moment that you know he did. How do you prove it? That isn't my job. You're the district attorney, aren't you? Well, I was, when I looked last. Oh, very funny. Now, just a moment, I want to call Fido Vance. Well, you'd be better off calling a cop and having him pick up, Tony. Up until now, Lila, I've been a pretty good judge of my own welfare, thank you. Hmm. Hello, Vance speaking. Uh, Markham Vance, listen, there seems to be more and more confirmation of your murder theory about Joe Somer. Well, hey. I'm glad to hear it, Markham. Actually, and originally, it wasn't a theory, merely an idea, despite that suicide note. Which has never been explained. But which will be. Good. Now, what's the extra confirmation you called me about? Well, there's a girl in my office. Markham. A girl named Lila, who is the ex-girlfriend of a racketeer named yes. Tony Lester. She's been superseded by... Guess who? Mrs. Somer. Oh, now, Van. Well, it had to be Mrs. Somer, or it wouldn't have had any connection with this case. In which event, you wouldn't have called me. Reasonable? Reasonable, understandable, and accurate. That's what it is, Vance. 
Now, this girl claims Tony is the kind of character who wouldn't let a mere murder stand in the way if he wanted something. All right, that is. Please, Lila. What? Uh, nothing, Vance. I wasn't talking to you. Oh. Well, I thought I'd let you know about this development. Well, thank you. Now I'll let you know something. Yes? Despite the suicide note, which I'll explain some other time, I'll repeat that it definitely was murder. And I'll tell you something a little more important. And that is? That I also know who pushed Joe Somer off the roof. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The rooftop murder case began with the apparent suicide of Joe Somer. Vance, believing Somer was murdered, has found substantiation of his theory despite the presence of a bona fide suicide note. Inasmuch as Vance insists it is a murder, I know we have three suspects. Tony Lester, a racketeer, Alfred Dale, Somer's partner, and Somer's widow. To continue our investigations, I have met Vance in the office shared by Somer and Dale. Well, Vance, I found the partnership papers right here in the desk drawer. Uh, Vance, you're not listening to me. Oh, yes, I am, my friend. I was just trying out all the office pens. Are you through now? No. There. You now have my undivided attention. Good. What does the partnership contract say? Uh, that in the event of death of one partner, the other partner takes over completely. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, is Alfred Dale the murderer? I've just found his motive. Yes, you most certainly have. <laughs> Issue properly evaded. <laughs> Very well, tell me this. What are you trying all those office pens for? I tried all of the pens at Somer's house. With the cooperation of the homicide department, I borrowed the suicide note Somer left. And I can tell you definitely, none of the pens wrote that note. In fact, I don't believe any of the pens in this office were used either. But the note was definitely written by Somer. So you keep telling me, and I agree that it was. What's the answer? You think Somer wrote a suicide note? The murderer knew he wrote it with the intention of killing himself, but acted regardless? Hardly. What? what? Well, what's going on in here? Oh, hello, Mr. Dale. This is District Attorney Mark. How are you? How do you know? We've been using your office. So I see. We have a search warrant, Mr. Dale. It's entirely legal. It's a little embarrassing. You'll have to admit that. Legal enough. Mr. Dale, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about any embarrassment that might be caused you in this office. But what do you mean? Yesterday, when you and I and Mrs. Somer were on the way to the roof, the attic was very dark. It was that. You were in the lead, but you avoided a trunk that I promptly bumped into. What? Yes, that's true, now that I recall it. Mrs. Somers said you'd never been in that house before. Yet you avoided the trunk. Oh, I have the... Uh, I have very good eyesight. Or a good memory. What do you mean? I just don't want you to resent our being here, that's all. We do have good reason, don't you think? I don't think I have anything to say. Well, that, Mr. Dale, is probably the smartest thing you've said since you came into this room. What does that mean? That I'm due to be arrested any moment on suspicion of murder? I wouldn't say that. Not any moment, Mr. Dale. I want to be very sure of my proof before Mr. Markham makes any arrest in this case. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, You'll never know how sorry I am. I went to the district attorney. She's sorry. She rats on me. Now she's sorry. Look, I'm getting tired of kicking you out of my apartment. I'll beat it, Lila. Oh, let me stay, Tony. I won't be any trouble. Just, just let me hang around. Out. Oh, you're expecting that summer day. She's going to be here. Shut up, you. Don't you talk about it. Don't even say her name. Oh, I'm not good enough to say her name, huh? I'll say it. I'll scream it so that everybody can hear it. Shut up, I said. All right, get out. Get out fast before I change my mind and start tossing you out. Why are you gone? Tony. Tony, darling. Tony, Tony, darling. You make me sick. How did I ever go for a dame like you anyhow? Sometimes I think I'm... Oh. Okay, Lester, open it up in there. Who is it? Sergeant Heath, oh, homicide. Open up. Oh, you really did it to me, didn't you, Lila? i got to get out of here. I can't stand a pinch right now. Tony, Tony, I left the door unlocked when I came in. Oh, you dope, you. Okay, Lester, hold it. You're not going anywhere. According to you. According to me, I'm leaving right this minute. Hold it, I said. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for the warning shot. I can take a hint, Heath. You want me to go with you? I I go. No, Tony, don't. Come to think of it, even oh. you'll be better company than this. What is it you wanted now, Mr. Vance? All the clippings you have on a man named Joe Somer. I don't imagine there'll be too many. 
Well, if his name was ever in our paper, we'd have the clips in an envelope. You don't want the stuff on a suicide, do you? No. Ah, oh, it's a good thing those clippings haven't been filed yet. Uh, T to T U T U to S S S E S E S E S U. Oh, here we are. Silly, Savansky, Skelly, Small. Oh, small. Oh, here we are. Summer, Joe. Here's his envelope, Mr. Vance. He feels kind of thin. Well, I expected that. Now, let's see what's in it. Mm hmm. Two clippings, one dated yeah. five years ago. A little item about the marriage of Joe Somer and Dorothy Blaine. The other... Mm. Interesting, huh? Mm, very. This first clipping is even more revealing, however, in the light of the second one. Listen to this first one. Introduced only three months ago at a beach club, Dorothy Blaine and Joe Somer culminated a whirlwind romance in marriage at the home of so-and-so last night. Couple left for a honeymoon in Bermuda. Well, that's not too unusual. In view of this, it is. Listen, here's the second clipping. Uh-huh. Joe Somer, local businessman and partner in the firm of Somer and Dale, was taken to Mercy Hospital this morning, suffering from a nervous collapse. Yeah, yeah. According to Alfred Dale, only his fortunate earlier arrival at the office prevented his partner's suicide. That, that means something, huh? It does to me. It's going to mean a whole lot more to Alfred Dale. <laughs> Oh, it's you. Tony, I waited out here in the street to find out what would happen to you. So what? I heard you were arrested. You heard I was arrested. Sure, I was arrested, but I'm out. Did they think you killed my husband? How do I know what they think? All I know is I'm getting out of town. I'm going with you. I don't be a dope. I need you like I need a hole in the head. You're taking me. I'm going home to pack right now. I'll meet you at the airport in an hour. Now, listen. You better take me, Tony. It'll be so much better for you if you do. <laughs> I'm a busy man, Vance. I can't be running around town just because you call me and want me to be somewhere. You won't be bothered very much longer, Mr. Dale. That's good. I wonder why Mrs. Somer doesn't answer her bell. You'd better try it again. Did it ever occur to you that perhaps she isn't home? Did it ever occur to you that this house might be watched? And if she weren't home, that man across the street, who happens to be Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Department, would have told me... But I still have... Mr. Vance. Yes, and Mr. Dale, your husband's partner. You two remember each other, of course. Naturally. We're coming in, Mrs. Somer. Yes, of course. I really don't know what I'm doing here, Mrs. Somer. I don't either. What is it you want, Vance? We want to go into the living room, for one thing. We'll talk out here, if you don't mind. Oh, but I do. Well. Well, what's that I see in the living room? A trunk. Going somewhere, Mrs. Somer? Come in, gentlemen. Yes, I was going somewhere. I was leaving town. Any objections, Vance? Definitely. Mrs. Somer, do you own a gun? Of course not. What kind of a question is that? Figure it out. You see, the person who killed your husband fired a shot at me the other night. You're convinced that someone killed my husband? Yes. That he didn't commit suicide? That's right. Dale, do you own a gun? Why, I... I... Oh, come now. It'll probably be on record if you do. All right, Vance. I own a gun. And I carry it. I'll take it if you don't mind. Here you are. Thank you. Pardon my back a moment, Mrs. Somer. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Vance, what are you trying to Stop do? Stop right there, Dale. I want you to remember something for me. Just one second while I lay your gun down on the table. Now. Now what? Mr. Dale, do you recall that about six or seven years ago your partner tried to commit suicide? Yes, I do. You left a suicide note at that time. What happened to it? Why, I... I don't know. I do. It's the same suicide note the police found in this house just after Mr. Soma was pushed off the roof. It had to be. There wasn't a pen in this house or in your office that matched the pen or ink used in that letter. The police found the first suicide note, planted here to indicate Soma really did it the second time. What are you trying to prove? And if it's the fact that I murdered my husband, let me inform you that I never even knew him when he tried to kill himself the first time. That's correct. You didn't. Oh, I see what you're driving at. That's good. I took the note six years ago, kept it... Killed Soma the other day and left the note here, and you thought I was in this house before when you discovered I didn't trip over the trunk in the darkened attic. Is that what I'm driving at? Well, it, it must be. But I won't stand for it, Vance. I, I won't be framed for murder. Stop right where not... you are, Dale. Do yourself a favor. Don't make me force you to stay. Mrs. Soma. Yes? You killed your husband, of course. So you say. So I say and so I can prove. And you know I'm not bluffing, don't you? You knew you gave yourself away up on the roof the other day. 
That's the reason you tried to kill me in my apartment. Yes. I know you're not bluffing. I realize what I did. And I realize that I've got to kill you now. You realize that too, don't you? Vance, she's picked up my gun. She won't use it. Oh, no? Now, Mrs. Somer... I won't use it, huh, Vance? That's what you think. Vance, my gun's loaded. He knows. And he must know that I'm going to shoot both of you now. The gun won't fire, what? Mrs. Somer. I took out the bullets when I turned my back on you a moment ago. Now I'll take that gun away. Thank you. That will be all, Mrs. Somer. All that is, except my explaining to Mr. Markham how I knew it was you. Well, Vance, I guess there isn't anything more to tell in this case except the most important thing of all. How did you know it was Mrs. Sommer? First of all, we know from her confession that she found her husband's old suicide note. Vance, please, how did you know she was the murderer? Well, Markham, she claimed she was not at home when her husband allegedly jumped to his death. Yes? She said he went up to the roof to fix a radio aerial. And that's what gave him the idea to come down, write the suicide note, then go back and jump. That was her story. She said she hadn't been on the roof after her husband was killed until she went up with Dale and me. Yet she knew the aerial was broken. Well, she could have known that without going up there, Markham. A yeah. wire dangling, bad reception if a radio set were in good order, a number of ways. There was one thing she couldn't know, though. What was that? How it had been fixed. She walked right over to the spot where a new wire had been wound around the insulator. Yes. Yeah. Now, the only way she could have known that was if she had been there when her husband was fixing it. Or, of course, immediately after, which wasn't likely. It couldn't have been immediately after that. She had to leave the house after pushing him off the roof. She probably left by a back exit, went shopping, and returned in time to hear the bad news. Undoubtedly. Yeah. When she walked to the aerial, she knew she'd made a mistake. But she wasn't sure that I knew what she had done. Oh? She tried to kill me so as to be on the safe side. But then, when I let her alone for a while, she thought perhaps I hadn't noticed her error and she didn't try to kill me again. Yes. I let her alone, as you must realize, because I wanted to be absolutely sure about her. I know that. Her motive was money. Money and her love for Tony Lester. Vance, one thing has always puzzled me about this case. You never knew Joe Somer. All you saw was his covered body the day we went up to his house. Yet, you didn't believe it was suicide even then. Why? Something you said, Markham. Something I said? Something you and the police officer said, rather. You told me how considerate a man Joe Somer was as we were driving over to see him. Yes, that's right. The policeman said that Somer narrowly escaped hitting some people who were walking in front of his house when he jumped. Oh, I see what you mean. A considerate man would have made sure he wasn't going to injure anyone else even though he had decided to do away with himself. That's right. Uh -huh. Of course, I wasn't sure. But subsequent events convinced me I was right. All I can say is that fortunately for us, we had you to get to the bottom of this murder. Thank you, but that's completely unimportant. The only thing that matters is that when we reached the bottom of the murder, we reached the end of the rooftop murder case. P-E-P-S-I. That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and 
the broad. Tonight, the case of the magic murder. A thrilling counter-spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by delicious Pepsi-Cola. And now, another report to the American people. In your family's interest, listen to these findings, recently released by the United States Testing Company, Incorporated. After thorough and impartial tests, Pepsi-Cola proved of highest purity. Pepsi-Cola has more quick food energy and value, ounce for ounce, than any other leading nationally known cola. Yes, tested, compared against all other leading nationally known cola drinks, Pepsi-Cola won out. You get the best, and twice as much, in delicious Pepsi-Cola. And now, to Counter Spy. Oh, this would be Mr. Peters, would it not? Good evening, Professor Cabarrus. Good evening. I appreciate you seeing me this evening. Uh, please, come in. Thank you. Uh, this chair by the desk, Mr. Peters. Thanks. <sighs> well, you were lucky to find such a nice little house so near Washington, Professor. <laughs> it was your chief of the counter spies, Mr. David Harding, who helped me find it, Mr. Peters. The three rooms are sufficient for my personal needs. I have turned the cellar into a fine laboratory for my homework. <laughs> of course, you'll be working most of the time at the government laboratories, won't you, sir? Yes. The development of turbojet engines for land vehicles is a big project. Mm -hmm. I'm honored to have been brought to this country by your great government to work on it. By the possibilities of jet engines for land use, I'm... <laughs> but you did not come for a lecture on engines, Mr. Peters. <laughs> not quite, Professor. The main purpose of my visit is to have you fill out this questionnaire. Ah, that is what you mentioned on the telephone. Yes. Now, by law, the counter-spies are responsible for the safety of distinguished visitors from abroad. The more information we have, the easier our job is. But no one means me any harm, Mr. Peter. We hope not. But in these days, there's no knowing. Oh. Now, will you fill in these blanks? Uh, now then, uh... Do we have the full name correctly, Professor? Uh, of the University of Maslava. First name, Jan. Uh, middle name, Fyodorovich. Yes, and last name, Kabarus. C-A-B-A-R-R-U-S. Uh, correct. It's an odd name, sir. Uh, but common in my part of Europe. Oh. Now, our records already show that you hold five degrees. Yes. And before the last war, you were a scientific consultant to the government of your own country. <sighs> Those were happy, fruitful days, Mr. Peters. But today, my country is in the hands of... My feelings on that point are very strong, Mr. Peters. Uh, please, go on. Now, as to your experiences during the war and immediately after, our records require some more information. Well, I shall do my best. In 1939, when the Germans first... <laughs> Operator. Operator, give me counter spy headquarters at once. Professor Cabarrus? Uh, somewhat shaky, Mr. Harding. I'm much more disturbed over Mr. Peters. It's me, too. He's very seriously wounded in the head. Oh. He's been taken to the counter spy infirmary. The shots seem to come, you said, from that glass door to the sunroom. Yes. It must have been opened quietly by someone as Mr. Peters and I were filling out this. Oh. By the way, here it is. Or the questionnaire. Oh, Professor, did you by any chance get a glimpse of the man who fired the shots? Just as it were, out of the corner of my eye. Well, can you recall anything at all? Try to recreate the image of that moment in your mind, if you can. Let me see. I was here. And Mr. Peters was there. You were at right angles to the sunroom door. Yes. And then the door must have opened. Ah, he wore a black velour hat. Oh? And, uh... He must have been holding the pistol in his left hand. Left-handed. Now, go ahead. 
I believe he was tall, wearing a dark coat and, and yes, a mustache. Uh-huh. Black or dark brown. And one other thing. Yeah. In my mind, the picture of that man is like death. Death. He seems like a skeleton. Sunken eyes. A thin, thin face. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Harding. This may be all a waste of time. Beg your pardon, Mr. Harding. Oh, yes, Edward. Did you and the boys find anything? Uh, yes, sir. The attacker apparently entered the sunroom from outside the house. Cut out a square of glass above the lock on the door from outside into the sunroom. Let's see. Professor Cabarrus, with your permission, my men will keep working here. We can't even tell now whether the shots were meant for you or for Mr. Peters. Edwards, bring all the data with you later. Yes, sir. I'm going to headquarters to see how Peters is. Peters is still on the operating table, Mr. Harding. The man who fired the shots was very accurate. All three hit Peters. One raked a furrow along the top of his head. I expect Edwards will find that bullet buried in a wall at the house there. And a second bullet lodged at the side of his neck. We've removed that one. There'll be no serious after effects. What about the third bullet? Lodged in his skull. We're studying the x-rays now. Doctor, Harry Peters is not only my assistant, but he's my friend as well, and I, I hope... Oh, we're, we're doing our very best, Mr. Harding. I... Would you excuse me? Harding. Edwards, Mr. Harding. I've returned with all we found at the professor's house. I'm in the identification section now. Thank you, Edwards. I'll be right down. We couldn't find any trace of footprints around the house, Mr. Harding. The grass is all pretty well grown. Well, what about car tracks? Oh, no, sir. Well, then, let's add up what we know about the attacker. Now, that that bullet you dug out of the wall... It's a thirty-eight caliber, sir. Uh, from an automatic. All right. Man using a thirty-eight caliber automatic. He fired at a distance of about 20 feet... In imperfect light, that suggests he's a good marksman for a gunman. If he was aiming at Peter. And we know he gained entrance to the house at the back through the uh, sunroom by cutting out a square of glass above the door lock. Yeah. I guess then he reached inside and let himself in. This complicates the problem, Edward. It's a burglar's technique. It's not often you find a professional gunman who uses burglar techniques. Or vice versa. All right, Edwards, let's get to work. Now, if you'll be good enough to handle the loudspeaker system to the floor below there. First fact, gunman, 38 automatic. Gunman, 38 automatic. Next. Left-handed. Left-handed. Next. Technique of entry. By rear of establishment. Technique of entry by rear of establishment. By door. By cutting out glass. By door. By cutting out glass. Next. Appearance. Mustache. Black. Or dark brown. Appearance, mustache, black, or dark brown. Next. Eyes, black or dark brown. Eyes, black, or dark brown. They got something, Edward. Yes, sir. It's coming up here to the booth on the teletype. Here you are, sir. Well. Outside wire, please. This is very strange, Edward. Yes? 
Hello. Professor Cabarrus, this is David Harding. Uh, yes, Mr. Harding. We've located the name of a man answering the description you gave us. And so quickly. It's amazing. The name is Bones Cleburne. We could have him in our hands inside of two hours. I'm so relieved, Mr. Harding. There's only one difficulty. He was in an automobile accident in Florida. He's been dead for eight months. Dead? Well, then, I'm afraid my recollection of the attacker's appearance was not accurate enough. Uh, how's Mr. Peters? Well, I'm very hopeful that when Mr. Peters regains consciousness, he'll be able to give us a vital clue in this case. But how is he, Mr. Harding? The doctors are waiting for the shock to subside before operating. He will live? I'm told his chances are only 50-50. We just don't dare operate, Mr. Harding. We just don't dare. I don't understand, Dr. Delano. Well, the bullet lodged in the frontal lobe. Probably the frontal gyrus. Just missing the lateral cerebral artery. Oh. Now, the removal would be a most delicate operation. None of us here on the staff knows the technique well enough. Well, who does? Only one man, I'm afraid. A great brain surgeon who just this past year de developed a new technique for this type of brain operation. Get him over here, Dr. Dillon. Well, he's Dr. K.T. Holborn of Central Hospital, Colby City. Colby City? That's a thousand miles away. Well, let's yeah. get on the phone, Dr. Peters. has got to be saved. Operator, this is Mr. Harding. Yes, Mr. Harding. I'm going to be here on Dr. Dillon's line in the infirmary for some time, and I want you to keep it clear for fast work. Certainly, Mr. Harding. I want to place a call to Colby City, Central Hospital, Dr. K.T. Holburn. That's H-O-L-B-U-R-N. Colby City, Central Hospital, Dr. K.T. Holburn. Right, and rush it. Long distance. Operator, this is Counter Spy Headquarters. I want Colby City, 6. Seven hundred. Colby City, six seven hundred. Doctor K T Holburn. Doctor K T Holburn. What is your number, please? Equator one thousand. Will you hold the line, please? No, Harding speaking. Mister Harding, Doctor Holburn is not at the hospital. Oh. Let me speak with the long distance operator, please. Surely. Hello. Hello, sir. Dr. K.T. Holborn is not at the hospital. Well, does the hospital know where he can be reached? Now, this is vitally important. I am sorry, sir. They say Dr. Holborn's not in Colby City at all. Where is he, then? He's on a medical research trip to South America. South America? Well, do you know where he is right now? According to the schedule he left with the hospital, he's in Caracas, Venezuela tonight. A two-hour stopover. Venezuela? Well, how is he traveling? By plane, sir. Commercial Airlines of South America... The Rio de Janeiro flight. Well, thank you very much, Operator. Holborn's in Venezuela, Mr. Harding. Well, that's a bad blow to Peter's chances. I'm not giving up yet, Dr. Dillon. Yes, Mr. Harding? I find that Dr. Holborn might be reached in Caracas, Venezuela, at the Commercial Airlines Airport. Rio de Janeiro flight. I've got to do everything possible to reach him. Will you put a call through there, please? Hello, Miami. This is Washington, long distance. Will you give me your overseas operator? Overseas. Hello, overseas. The ticket, Washington, equator, 1000. Mr. David Harding, counter-spy headquarters, calling Dr. K.T. Holborn at Commercial Airlines Airport, Caracas, Venezuela. Washington, equator 1000. Mr. David Harding, counter-spy headquarters, Calling Dr. K.T. Holborn, Commercial Airlines Airport, Caracas, Venezuela. Will you ring the w number, Washington? Counters by headquarters. This is the overseas operator. Let me speak to Mr. Harding, please. Harding speaking. On your call to Caracas, Venezuela, due to the number of calls already on hand, the next available time is tomorrow afternoon. Will that be satisfactory? Tomorrow afternoon, operator Dr. Holborn's a brain surgeon. We must reach him for an important operation. We'll try to complete your call as soon as possible. Caracas. Miami overseas operator, a ticket. A ticket. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Mr. David Harding. Mr. David Harding. 
calling Commercial Airlines Airport. Commercial Airlines Airport. Rio de Janeiro flight passengers. Rio de Janeiro flight passengers. Dr. K for Kenneth, a T for Thomas Holborn. Dr. K, T, Holborn. The call is wanted as soon as possible, Caracas. It's in connection with the surgical operation. We will hurry. The serial number is 14979. Serial 14979. Commercial Airlines Airport. This is the overseas operator in Caracas. Mr. David Harding in Washington, D.C. is calling a passenger on your Rio de Janeiro flight, Dr. K.T. Holborn. Rio de Janeiro flight, it has not yet come in. What time is it due? It was delayed over the Caribbean by bad weather. It is due in two hours. We can give Dr. Holborn a message when the flight arrives. Please do so. Have him call the overseas operator. It is in connection with an important surgical operation. Two hours, Mr. Harding. And there's nothing we can do for Peters. There's got to be. Yes, Mr. Harding. Connect me with the airport in Caracas, will you please? Put the call through no matter what. In a moment, back to Counter Spy, presented by delicious Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it's a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Twice as much and better, too. Yes, twice as much and better, too. You know Pepsi gives you twice as much. You know Pepsi's better, tastes better. But now I want to make sure you know which cola drink is of proven highest quality. Listen. Impartial tests were made comparing all the leading nationally known colas. And here's the news. Delicious Pepsi was rated tops for quick food energy and honest-to-goodness value, ounce for ounce. Yes, more value and quick food energy in every tasty sip of Pepsi. That's why Pepsi's so refreshing. Why you feel so good. Why you're on the beat. Why people call Pepsi their favorite treat. When the quality's proved tops and the taste is so delightful... So refreshing that you bubble and the quantity is double. Say, is it any wonder Pepsi's America's big, big favorite? Insist on tasty Pepsi wherever you may be. At the fountain, say, Pepsi, please. At the stand, say, Pepsi, please. And at the store, get Pepsi in the money-saving carton of six big bottles. How about getting a carton tonight of delicious Pepsi-Cola? Delicious Pepsi-Cola, delicious Pepsi-Cola, delicious Pepsi-Cola, delicious Pepsi-Cola. Now back to Counter Spy. Caracas Airport to Flight 598. Caracas Airport to Flight 598. Flight 598. What is it, Caracas? Do you have a Dr. K.T. Holborn aboard? Dr. Holborn? Uh, yes. Yes, we have. There is an emergency telephone call for him from Washington, D.C. You are due in one hour and 45 minutes, but at the request of the chief of the United States counter spies, we have obtained special permission for you to come in ahead of time, if you can do it. We can try. You give us the airline and landing clearance. We will arrange everything. Come in with all possible speed. I can be over the field at 23.30. Bring me in fast. Doctor. How's Peters? Resting comfortably, but every minute counts. Pilot, uh, where will I find a telephone? On that side entrance to the administration building, Dr. Holborn. Thank you. Overseas operator, Caracas. And this is Dr. Holborn. I understand you have a call for me? Yes, sir. One moment, please. Overseas Miami, your call to Caracas, Venezuela. Washington, your call to Caracas. Equator 1000, your call to Venezuela. We are ready. Harding. Dr. Holborn in Venezuela for you, Mr. Harding. Go ahead, please. Dr. Dillon. Talk to him. Yes. 
Hello, hello. Holborn speaking. Uh, Dr. Holborn, this is Dr. Henry Dillon, Chief Medical Officer of the United States Congress Party. Oh, yes, Dr. Dillon. We have a serious case here that requires your technique, the Holborn incision. And none of us here is familiar with it. I suppose I'd fly right back to Washington. Well, I'm afraid there isn't time for that now, Dr. Holborn. Uh, could, could we do this? If I acquaint you with the X-rays, could you then direct me in the operation over the phone? We'll have the phone connected right in the operating theater. Ready, Dr. Holborn? Ready, Dr. Dillon. Anterior, posterior, and lateral x-rays show the bullet to be midway between the third ventricle and the cella turcica, with the head of the bullet approximately two millimeters from the anterior aspect of the lateral ventricle. Well, then, make your incision starting at a point 35 millimeters from the zygomatic tubercle and 12 millimeters from the Tarian suture line, parallel to the superior temporal line and distal to the sphenoidal sinus. And distal to the sphenoidal sinus. Sphenoidal sinus. A lateral x-ray shows the nose of the slug to be two millimeters from the anterior aspect of the lateral ventricle. Two millimeters. We then... Uh... Bring your incision up at a 45-degree angle towards the superior temporal line. Angle of incision. 45 degrees toward the superior temporal line. 45 degrees toward superior temporal line. Right. That next step, Holborn. Make the incision no more than three centimeters in length. Incision three centimeters. Right. Scalpel. Scalpel. All right, Holborn. I'm making the first incision. Hello, Peters. Hello, Dave. Hey, that was pretty close, fella. The doc said you tore up the international phone well, system. Peter, trying... now, the main thing is you're going to be all right now. Well, I may miss a couple of days, Chief. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Well, I guess my time's up. Now, Dr. Dillon wasn't even going to let me in at all. Dave, about Professor Cabarrus. Mm -hmm. Did you get the questionnaire finished? Finished? Well, it was finished before the man opened the sunroom door and fired. Professor Cabarrus gave it to me. Man? Sunroom door? Yeah. Well, the shots came from behind me, Dave. I was sitting at the uh, desk Easy, and... easy, Peter. You better take it easy. Uh, look, I'll come back this afternoon. We'll talk about it. You go to sleep. Well, Edwards, Professor Cabarrus isn't here, but we can work anyway. Yes, Mr. Hardy. Now, Peter said that... He was sitting here at the desk. I faced him right at the sunroom door. Professor Cabrera said that that's where the attacker appeared. Now, but Peters was looking right at the door and saw no one. And another thing, the three bullets that hit Peters hit him in the back of the head. That means then that the bullets came from behind him. And there's only the fireplace behind the desk. This one filing cabinet. Of course, when I spoke to Peters, he was still foggy from the operation and the anesthetic. Look out! Thanks for knocking me out of the way, Edwards. Where those shots come from? As I was looking at the filing cabinet, the little metal flap covering the lock on the second drawer moved aside. Behind it, I saw the muzzle of a pistol. Now, let's see. Locked. Hand me that poker from the fireplace. All right. Thanks. We'll pry the drawer open. An automatic. What's that apparatus, Mr. Harding? That looks like a photoelectric cell. Yes, projecting a photoelectric beam across the chair at the desk. To actuate the firing of the automatic. But uh, why didn't it go off the moment you sat down there? I can't tell offhand. We may find it's a delayed action system taking maybe a minute. And... Ah, Mr. Harding. Oh, hello, Professor Cabrera. Uh, your man at the front door told me you gentlemen were here. I take it you've discovered, sir. The filing cabinet, Mr. Harding. An ingenious murder scheme to kill Peters while he sat at that desk. To kill Mr. Peters? Then he's dead? Somebody wanted him dead. Dreadful. Dreadful. Who could have used my house to try to murder him? I have only one suspicion, Professor. It was someone who wanted to conceal certain facts about himself. Edwards, that questionnaire, please? Yes, sir. 
Professor, you told me you and Peters had completed filling this out before the shots were fired, but Peters tells me you'd only reached item seven just before the questions concerning your activities in Europe during the war. I'm sure Mr. Peters is mistaken, Mr. Hart. No, he's not, because this reveals the motive for the murder attempt. Peters might have asked pointed questions, and they would have shown that during the last war you were not in exile or in the underground, but in the pay of the very people you pretend to despise. Oh, ridiculous, Mr. Hart. Not at all. But this morning I talked to our attaches in your capital, and these answers here are false. You gambled. Nobody would check them. You'd be safe to work on American scientific projects and steal vital information. Edward, search him. Yes, sir. Mr. Harding, I protest. You will have every liberty to in court. Because I'm charging you now with the attempted murder of Harry Peters. I'm very happy to say you failed all around. Ah, delicious Pepsi Cola. Bring it on now. Enjoy that bubbling, tangy, tasty treat. Sure hits the spot. At parties, it's a wonderful idea to serve delicious Pepsi. That extra quick food energy gives folks that bounce, that zing. And Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottles go twice as far. You get a carton of six bottles, and you serve 12 full-size drinks. So save that money, get the best, and get twice as much in delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Twice as much and better, too. Pepsi Cola is a drink for you. That's it. Delicious Pepsi Cola. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen on Thursday for the exciting case of the bootleg buttons. High-grade gold, purified in the white heat of flame. A criminal scheme forged in the heat of greed. Yet your counter-spies were able to apply the heat of the law to a trio who dealt in death and double-cross. Listen on Thursday to The Case of the Bootleg Button on counter Spy. <laughs> Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York and was directed by Leonard L. Bass, dramatized by Paul Milton, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. This is Jay Jackson speaking. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some delicious Pepsi tonight. <laughs> Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the cafe tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. Before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers Three. I made a dry run down the boulevard by Kiel, and sure enough, the stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. 
This is a very personal matter. All right, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now, just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. You want to stay with that story or try another one? <sighs> Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now, you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then. Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend, but very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? You have the dough with you? Certainly not. There's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Uh, shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan. At the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And hey, what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Mo, Mo. Yeah, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work night. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. I always wants to know what happened. What? Oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, no, that's Morgan. Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosion salvaging operation. Off the coast of Ross el Hard. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. <laughs> no, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I, I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Uh, why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tournay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tournay was arranging for me to give someone a massage uh, at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? i got reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! <laughs> I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. 
I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat down in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Yorton? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Yorton. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Yorton, I saw you talking to a man named Fedor Brahms. Nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan, but I can guarantee you he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Yorton, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms under. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? I'm sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Mala wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room, and the dresser upside down. Looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh, what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's, maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter, and it read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address, 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Bronze. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, Sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh, please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes. Everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. Shh. I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fedor Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild, and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with a gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. 
On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium. And Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? The telephone book. Uh, Same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Yeah. Meet Philip Tony, my bodyguard. We've already met twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside our phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three. Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they're... You're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe I better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I've, I'm beginning to see what you mean. Same as there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent of your promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Oh, Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. You hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there. Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. (laughs) I'll have a little left. Yeah. Here you are. $15,000. $15,000. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm gonna show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs, trying to decide what I was going to tell fate of Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut, and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator when we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I I walked into the room and and there there he was. There's no doubt about it this time. (sighs) Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I am afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He's missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? 
Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my doll. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look them up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But, um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three thumb you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, Jordan? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open-air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have, too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I got to find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open-air market on Farron Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Jordan! I'm coming in, Tonya. Yes, yes, of course. I, I thought you were in jail. Oh, weren't we all? There, uh, there is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd right, start leveling with me, Tonya. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky. But I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. But try these for size. John Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus Fader and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Russell Hud. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. <laughs> Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door. But I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fader Brahms again, or Svensson, or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fader Brahms. Sure, I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face, it hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Well, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck, and I heard oars fading into the fog. It was Angus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. 
Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get him together. You... You know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner, then I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. Wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got... Uh, what, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Seeker and Elmo Dar in half an hour, I'll produce him. Jordan, go home and go to bed. But Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, Jordan. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it, a quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. <laughs> Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. Pistol blazed almost in my face, and everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Sabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, the Sharon again. Why here? We, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. Feather Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, and Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. Oh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. 
When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Maury. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Maury, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Maury, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, oh no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Jordan, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for hire. front of my office reads that way. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, there's no way to dress it up. If you're in business down on the San Francisco waterfront, everything but murder is a parlor trick. If you rob a few graves, you can pay the rent. Nobody cares if you got sore eyelids. You get that way from winking at too many things. Oh, it's a good living if you don't run short of bail bonds and Benzedrine. I discovered that Friday night... After the fight broadcast, I wound up in a little whiskey barrel on Powell Street. I had a Glasgow farmer out of the red when they closed the bar, and I drifted across the street for a cup of coffee. When I came out, it was raining, and the street was deserted. I stood in the doorway and watched the dull neons through the rain. They looked splotched and dim, like watercolors rubbed with a damp rag. It was beginning to rain harder, and... I started out of the doorway when she ducked in and bumped up against me. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, just wait for your blockers on the next one, huh? I guess I bumped into you. Don't go out on a limb. Oh, I'm very sorry. I, I guess I didn't know where I was going. You seem to be headed in the right direction. How do you mean? Forget I noticed. It's raining awfully hard. Hmm. I wonder if you ever noticed how... When it rains, you feel lonely and lost? Yes. Yes, that's it. How when it rains, you feel lonely and lost. Yeah, well, we're both great readers, so if you'll let me get by, I want to get a cab. Yes, I... I wonder if I could ask you something funny. The bars are closed. No, I... I meant coffee. I'll pay for it. All right. In here? Sure. Come on. The counter will do. All right. What's it gonna be? Hey! You back again? Yeah, two coffees. How come? I'm nervous. Two coffees. You like a bear claw, maybe? You know what we want? Two coffees? Yeah. Be right with you. Thank you. I know it's funny asking you in here, but... I have to talk to someone. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't argue. I've been away a long time. I guess a long time. Yeah, the kids will be glad to see you back. Huh? Stop it, will you, sis? Get to the point. Put the show on the road. Yes. I think I've lost my memory. At least it seems that way at first. Who are you? I don't know. I suppose you don't believe it. No, but I convince hard. Here you are. Two coffees. Everything all right? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I'll be down here if you need anything else. You thought up a name yet, Buster? You'd be crazy to believe me. Guess you'd be crazy, but I can't remember anything. I guess. Now well, look, lady, if you got amnesia, see the police. But you don't believe me. I don't know. Maybe you are leveling. But if you're off your rocker, go to the police. But suppose. Suppose there's something that happened before and. The police would be looking for me. Please, would you try to help me? How bad are you? Do you know what town you're in? Yes. Have you been here before? Do you live here? I think maybe. It seems like a place I've been. All right, I'll put you in a cab. You go see the police. No. I feel funny. I, I think I'll go outside for a minute. I don't want Hilda to know. Please, I'm... I'm going to... Oh, please, help me. Mister, your girlfriend's on the floor. Yeah, any suggestions? No, she's your date. All right, here, give me a hand, will you? Well, where are you going to take her? The hospital. She's an amnesia case. I hope your memory's good. Huh? You'll need it for answers. Your girlfriend's passed out for good. Don't tell me. I feel a pulse, mister. You're going to have to start over. Because she's all used up. Oh, that's good. You got a wailing wall? Sure. Use the counter. While I call homicide. It didn't take 2020 vision to see I was in trouble. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it wasn't. I didn't have any idea why she keeled over there, but with a figure like hers, I knew it wasn't old age. That call to homicide meant Hellman was going to be in the picture soon. And then I'd stand about as much chance as a cornfield in a stone quarry. Well, I went through the girl's stuff. She had no identification. There were a couple of snapshots of her, but no name. I told the waiter my name and where Hellman could find me. And then I got out of there. I looked up Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor who liked his booze pretty well. Smart guy, but he used a mason jar for a jigger. I finally found him holed up in some after-hours joint on Geary Street. He was talkative. Hello, Patsy. A small jug for Mr. Novak, waiter. I want to talk to you, Jocko. Patsy, you shouldn't be here. It's after-hours. Yeah, look, Jocko, I need some help. What do you know about amnesia? Oh, a temporary blessing. I thought I had it myself once. Oh, stop it, will you? But it just turned out to be a case of bad bourbon, a peasant's drink, I've decided. Get up the street level long enough for me to talk. I'm in trouble. Yes? I met some blister tonight who took a dive after one cup of coffee. Oh, I see. She had amnesia, or she thinks she did. Oh, well, she's dead. Why worry about amnesia? <laughs> it's a minor ailment. Because Hellman's going to think I had something to do with it. She picked out my lap. Don't you see how it's going to add up? I have high hopes. i got to do something in a hurry. 
Was she a nice girl? Yes, I guess so. How come you met her? What difference does it make? Tell me about amnesia. Could she phony it? Maybe. Not for long. What makes you think she did? I don't know. She acted like a butterfly with a jag on, and she headed straight for me. It just doesn't add. No. What cell block can I find you in? You can get off your spine and go to work for me. You know the hospital circuit. Hit them all and find out everything you can about recent amnesia cases. Well, how far back do I go? Until you find one that jibes with this girl. It's impossible. Where do I start? I feel like Noah when they told him to beat the flood. She's blonde, blue eyes, expensive clothes. How big? Just the right size for a good dream. Start checking now and give me a ring at my place. No identification? Uh, None. She only said one thing when she fell. Oh, something crude? No, she mentioned a gal by the name of Hilda. That should be easy to trace. Sure. Just look it up in the phone book. You will find it uh, somewhere between Hellman and Homicide. Right, lover? Well, there wasn't anything I could do for the next few hours except sublet from an ostrich. I had to keep undercover because all I had to work on was a couple of snapshots and a girl named Hilda. Neither figured to get me out of this mess. Hellman was bound to ask a lot of questions because I had as much business being with a dead girl as Lucky Luciano in a finishing school. After I left Jocko, I took a C-car downtown and I went home to grab some sleep. When I walked in the apartment, the lights were out. and That didn't make any difference. Hellman's badge was shining like a lake in Ireland. He was making himself at home with my ice cubes. Hello, Novak. Put the light on so I can watch you turn pale. All right, Hellman, get to the point. Sure. Who was your girlfriend? I don't know. She was the coy type. So are you, Novak. You're going to look good sucking your thumb in the gas chamber? I suppose your coroner is full of good news. She died of an overdose of sleeping pills. The coroner's report is murder. How about the space mark suicide? No dice. You don't take sleeping pills, then tour the town for a spot to take a nap. So she died in a coffee joint. What am I supposed to do, carry a stomach pump? You're supposed to tell me who she is. We'll go from there. I don't know, neither did she. I've got that down as a lie. You file it any way you want, Hellman. She was amnesia. So are you, Novak. All right, hire a medium then. I told you. She came into the restaurant a total stranger. We got social, but she died a total stranger. How are you going to prove it? I don't know. If I knew who she was, I wouldn't play footsie with you. Do I have to draw a map? She came in trying to sort out her marbles and never got there. I see. What did you find out? How about clothes markings? That's your department. How about laundry marks? I don't know. I guess she washed her own. Look, Novak, you're a big boy now. You're in a spot. If you want to help, now's the time to do it. You got everything I know. From here on, you work the ball downfield. All right. You just answer the doorbell from time to time. When you see a guy grinning out there, that'll be me coming to pinch you for murder. Well, that'll take lots of doing, mister, and lots of proof. You remember that. I'll try, Novak. But I may get amnesia. Good night, big shot. <laughs> When Hellman left, I backed into my headache and went to bed. Oh, sure, I was in a spot now. The scorecard said murder, and I was the medalist on the first round. If the police didn't know who she was, that meant she had no record we could work on. I still had the funny hunch about that gal pulling a phony. But if it was phony, I was worse off. I had all the best arrows in town pointing to me, and once Hellman began to build a case, I could throw away those vacation folders. I slept until about nine. The phone began to ring, and I rolled over, expecting to hear Gabriel on the other end of the line. It was just Jocko. Hello, Novak talking. This is Jocko. I've been working all night. We'll build a monument later. What'd you find out? The morning paper says the girl was murdered. Yeah, Hellman gave me a preview. What'd you find out at the hospitals? I've got a complete list of amnesia victims. I know more lost souls than a Hong Kong bartender. Yeah. Most of them are men uh, trying to get away from the little woman. Well, you're a big help, Jocko. Don't hang up till you hear about the girl. Go ahead. Nothing on file for the last eight years. In 1941, a 17-year-old girl walked out of California General Hospital. She hasn't been heard of since. How's the description? It's like last year's bathing suit. She was Marcia Halpern, the daughter of Emery Halpern. Yeah? Who's he? A pocket-heavy guy down on Montgomery Street. I'll get right down there. Thanks, Jocko. You saved my life. Well, I hadn't intended to go that far. See you later. Well, it was my one. 
one chance, even if the odds looked bad. I called up Halpern's office. He said he wasn't in to try him at home. It was listed for a place up on Pacific Heights, so I took a cab over there. When I walked in the lobby, I could tell old man Halpern was making as much money as you can without your own printing press. The apartment made Buckingham Palace look like something George had picked up at a fire sale. The doorman was a sober-looking specimen, the kind of guy that breathes every other Tuesday. He gave me the fish eye as I went up the elevator to the third floor. Halpern's apartment was at the east end. The butler showed me in, and I waited in the living room. It was a real cozy place, about the size of a small rugby field. A door opened on the side, and 200 pounds of Regency oozed into the room like a wet ghost. Good morning. I'm Mr. Taylor. I'm Novak. Where's Halpern? Well, Mr. Halpern is away on a business trip. I'm Mark Taylor, the family lawyer. <laughs> I believe that's the phrase. Oh. Well, I'll drop by later, huh? Uh, perhaps I can help you. I take care of most of Mr. Halpern's business now. Did you know his daughter? Uh, yes, yes. It was quite tragic. That's what I hear. She was a victim of amnesia. She forgot all the details of her home. Must have been a temptation. Did the police ever do anything on her? Well, the police were not advised. Mr. Halpern hired private detectives, but she was never found. Yes, it was quite tragic. You wear your mourning a long way, Taylor. She'd be about 25 now, wouldn't she? Taffy hair, blue eyes, nice figure. I believe she had leanings in that direction. Why, Mr. Novak? I think I may know where she is. You don't know what that would mean to this family, Mr. Novak. You don't know what it would mean to me, Mr. Taylor. Here's a snapshot. Yeah, let me see it. Well, Taylor, this is not a B movie. This is a picture of Marsha Halpern. You sure? I don't make many mistakes, Mr. Novak. All right, if you've used up your quota. She's downtown. I'll get in touch with Mr. Halpin right away. No, take your time. She's dead. She... When? Last night, she got sleepy. When? Yeah, that's right. Somebody gave her enough sleeping pills to stock a drugstore. I see. After all these years, to come back, and then this. Uh, it was most... Most tragic? Yes, yes, I was about to say that. It'll be a great blow to Mr. Halpin. It'll be a very great blow to Mr. Halpin. Have the police any ideas? A few. Do you know anybody named Hilda? No, why? I'm no, just sweeping out the corners. When's Halpin due? This afternoon. I have arranged an... Excuse me, please. All right. Hello, this is Mark Taylor. No, that can't be right. Well, when did it happen? Uh, yes. Yes, please keep me advised. You ought to wear a purple suit, Taylor. I have bad news, Mr. Novak. Brace yourself. I'm lightheaded. Go ahead. Mr. Halpern was killed in a motor accident last night. His car plunged down a ravine near Sacramento. Mm -hmm. That's very strange. Yeah. That must have been a great blow to Mr. Halpern. <laughs> there and went downstairs. All the way down, I had the funny feeling that something was wrong, the way a person feels when he goes into a doctor's office with an incurable disease. It may have been Taylor. I don't know. He seemed all right, but I still had that feeling that something was out of place, like a broken line in a perfect picture. I crossed the street and called Hellman. It was too early in the day because he was as sad as a tap dancer in moccasins. Hellman talking. This is Novak. How's the case? You look better every How's the identification? We're moving slow. So far, we know she's a woman. That's right. Her name's Marcia Halpern. She disappeared in 1941 with amnesia. San Francisco? Yeah. She's the daughter of Emery Halpern. Uh, we'll check with old man Halpern. You better send your best man because he rolled a car and killed himself last night. Where? Sacramento. I got news for you, too. Yeah? We got a statement from that waiter. Who wrote it? He says you brought that girl in for coffee. Also, you were nice and chummy. I knew her for five minutes. With you, that's a lifetime. The guy said you were good friends. That's the way our story's gonna read. You suit yourself. I'm busy. Yeah? Where are you going? Same place you are, Hellman, Sacramento. If I didn't move fast, I was deader than a Philadelphia nightclub. When they start taking statements, you can wire for flowers. I called Jocko and told him to check up on old man Halpern's estate. I borrowed a car and drove up to Sacramento. The accident was just outside of there. When I got to the spot, Hellman was already in charge. 
He's going to make a fight for the job at last judgment. They were down in the ravine, and Hellman was beating around the bushes, making more noise than a Venetian blind in a typhoon. Hello, Hellman. Did you find anything? Get your own haystack. I'm busy. Where's the body? You get the blues if you don't see one corpse today. He's up in town. Did you notice those tracks up there in the road? Yeah. Double tracks don't mean a thing. Oh, sure. Maybe two cars fell down and one got lost. Wake up, Hellman. If he drove over the side, he sure had a tough time making up his mind. When you're through on that pipe, I'll send over another. I'm going over to the car. Hellman went over to the car, and I started looking through the bushes. I don't know what I expected to find. Maybe an old boy scout. After about ten minutes, I shifted over to the other side, and it showed up right near the ground under a bush. Hellman must have seen me because he came right over. Hey, what is it? What'd you find? A handkerchief. Oh. Hmm. That's funny. What's funny about it? So it's a handkerchief. The old man had a nose, didn't he? Well, he must have loved it then. His hanky's loaded with perfume. Take a whiff here. Yeah. Recognize it? Sure. I don't know about you, but I smell a rat. Things began to move. This was the first break, and Hellman knew it. I went back to town, and I tried to get in touch with Jocko, but he was running up a tab somewhere, so I drove over to see Mark Taylor again. When I got to the apartment, I found out he wasn't in, but the pinch hitter was all right. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling like a melted cheese sandwich. She was standing there in a dark, silk evening gown. It was strapless and she had no worries. When she spoke, it was like saying, put another log on the fire. Good evening. Taylor in here? Won't you come in? Sure. Mr. Taylor won't be in for a while. I'm waiting for him myself. I see. I'm Pat Novak. Is it urgent? Anything I can do? If it were, you'd get my vote. Who are you? I'm Hilda Travis. I'm a friend of the family. Which family? Would a drink take off the rough edges, Mr. Novak? It might. Good. I'll make one. I brought Taylor a present. How nice. A girdle, maybe? Or am I being catty? No, a handkerchief. This one. Do you like it? Should I? I thought you might want it for a keepsake. I found it in a ditch up in Sacramento about ten feet from Emery Halpern. Poor Emery. Here's your drink. Thanks. Poor Emery. It's full of perfume. You want to smell? That wouldn't do any good. You want to know if it matches my perfume? It's your idea. Go ahead. All right. Now, closer. That's it. See? Yeah. It's early in the evening, Mr. Novak. Don't blow a fuse. I won't until I find out who killed Marcia Halpern. Good luck. For everybody's sake. By the way, the uh, police think you killed her, don't they? Did Taylor brief you? A little. I asked him this morning if he knew a girl named Hilda. He must have forgotten. Yeah, everybody's got amnesia. Just to make things easy, did you kill her? Just to make them hard, did you? I see. Well, just tell Taylor I called. Don't be a savage, Mr. Novak. You haven't finished your drink. And it's raining outside. I'll finish this one. That's good. Sit down beside me here. We'll finish our drinks and pray for a cloudburst. She turned out to be an old-fashioned girl. She had about eight of them before I got out of there. I tried to pump her, but she wouldn't talk about Marcia Halpern. I just became a family friend. After I left, I ducked into a drugstore and started phoning Jocko. I finally caught him at the hunt room. He'd worked his way below the label already. Hello, Patsy. I'm having a wonderful time. Yeah, what'd you find out? I just heard a funny story. It's old. What about Halpern? He barely changed his will after the girl died. The whole estate goes to her. Who's next in line? A fellow named Mark Taylor. That's the new part of the will, drawn up three weeks ago. Good boy, Jocko. So I looked up the dope on Mark Taylor. He's a family friend. It's a new club. Go on. Looks all right. Some funny bank book stuff, though. For instance? Well, he drew 3,000 bucks out last month for a Lisbon passage. A girl named Helen Dupre. Maybe she's a foreign cinema discovery. Oh, he's no talent, Scout. Meet me down in Homicide in ten minutes, Jocko. If we're lucky, we'll show Hellman something. What? How to draw to an inside straight. Hurry up and don't stop for a bracer. Well, just don't smell my breath. See you soon, lover. I 
I'd explained everything I could to Hellman when Jocko got there. I went over it for him and sent him out on an errand. He was to meet Hellman and come up to Taylor's apartment. I went on ahead. It was about 11 o'clock when I knocked on the door. Mm, Mr. Novak, so soon. Yeah, I'm coming in. Hello, Taylor. I won't say you're wearing out your welcome, Mr. Novak, but it's getting very thin. You better take time out and pack your bags. Is that nice, Patsy? Because a guy named Hellman wants you for murder. We've been over that once, Mr. Novak. Yeah, but we got a whole new infield this time. Hellman thinks you killed a girl named Helen Dupre. I don't know a girl named Helen Dupre. The bank vouchers say yes. They say you brought her over here six weeks ago. Wait a minute, Patsy. Oh, you made the team too, Angel. They got you all fixed up for old man Halpern's case up in Sacramento. Get out of here, Novak. I left a drink here. Find a bar there. Get out of here. I wouldn't want to jam this gun through your face. Come on in, Hellman. Did you bring him with you? Yeah. Come in here, fella. Is that the girl? Yeah, that's her. Where'd you see her before? Sacramento last night. He's crazy. It's a plant, Mark. Tell him more, Junior. You sure she's the one? Yeah. She was on the road, and I seen her at the car with this old fella. Hang on, lady. The road gets bumpy from here on. My lights were out, so I guess she didn't see me. Take this little guy out of here. I got a story. I seen you hit the old fella, then start the car down the bank. I didn't hit him on the head. I told you that, Mark. Yes, you did. Tell him, Mark. Tell him I was here. How can I when you tipped our mitt? That's right, Taylor. Get out while you can. Tell him I was here, Mark. Well, you little fool, don't you know you've told them already? You're a bum guy, Mark. You've been a bum guy all along. I keep my mouth shut. I'll give you a chance to talk. I'll tell you about him, Novak. Shut up, you little half witch. You're all right on the straightaway, but you're a bad guy on the curves, Mark. Keep still, Angel. For a tin horn punk like you, I'll talk lots. You'd better say it fast. Yeah. You get any prize in the house, Taylor. Take your choice. Are you working for a living, Hellman? Yep. All right, then, let's go. Yeah. See you downtown, Novak. Is she all right, Jocko? I'm out of practice. Well, Patsy. You like it this way, baby? No complaints. I've always gone first class. I wouldn't like it the other way. Yeah. I could have used a little more time. But I'm not greedy. It's still raining out, Patsy. No. It stopped raining. It's beginning to clear up and over... Come on, Jocko. I'm talking to myself. Well, it seems that Marcia Halpern was dead for years. Somewhere on the other side, a girl named Helen Dupre got the story out of her. She looked a lot like Marcia Halpern, so she waited until after the war and contacted this Mark Taylor. They cooked up a hoax and the pot boiled over. She was supposed to fake amnesia and stumble into the hospital. The pictures in the wallet would be printed. Mark would identify her as Marcia Halpern. The same night they planned to kill the old man the way they did. That way, Helen Dupre and Mark could split the dough. But they figured it wrong. Another girl named Hilda Travers had the story, too. She put the squeeze on Mark, and he blundered. He found out he didn't need a phony Marcia Halpern after all. The new clause in the will gave Mark the dough. So he loaded Helen Dupre with sleeping pills while Hilda gave the old man his last ride. All he had to do was... Wait for the dough and then split with Hilda. A few things went wrong. Sometimes it only takes one. Helen did her part, but she was no Bernhard. And then at the last minute, she knew something was wrong and mentioned Hilda. I kind of began to wonder when Mark identified that picture so fast. After more than eight years, he identified it immediately. And then there was that handkerchief. From there in, it was freewheeling. All we had to have was a witness. Oh, that guy from Sacramento? Well, he was some actor that Jocko picked up in the hunt room. Hellman finally cleaned up the mess. Taylor's in the clink, and... Of course, the girl already picked up her end of the check. Oh, she was nice, too. If you don't mind claw marks. Well... 
It all worked out, and Hellman's happy. Except that actor keeps calling him up for parts. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the third of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Jaco Madigan is played by Jack Lewis. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basim Ablam. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.